The Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna by Mahendranath Gupta, His Disciple Introduction by Swami Nikilananda Sri Ramakrishna, the God-man of modern India, was born at Kamarpukar. This village in the Hooghly district preserved during the last century the idyllic simplicity of the rural areas of Bengal. Situated far from the railway, it was untouched by the glamour of the city. It contained rice fields, tall palms, royal banyans, a few lakes and two cremation grounds. South of the village a stream took its leisurely course. A mango orchard dedicated by a neighboring Zamindar to the public use was frequented by the boys for their noonday sports. A highway passed through the village to the great temple of Jagannath at Puri, and the villagers, most of whom were farmers and craftsmen, entertained many passing holy men and pilgrims. The dull round of the rural life was broken by lively festivals, the observance of sacred days, religious singing and other innocent pleasures. About his parents Sri Ramakrishna once said, My mother was the personification of rectitude and gentleness. She did not know much about the ways of the world. Innocent of the art of concealment, she would say what was in her mind. People loved her for open-heartedness. My father, an orthodox Brahmin, never accepted gifts from the Sudras. He spent much of his time in worship and meditation, and in repeating God's name and chanting his glories. Whenever in his daily prayers he invoked the goddess Gayatri, his chest flushed and tears rolled down his cheeks. He spent his leisure hours making garlands for the family deity Raghuvir. Kudaram Chattopadhyaya and Chandradivi, the parents of Sri Ramakrishna, were married in 1007, 199. At that time Kudaram was living in his ancestral village of Darapur, not far from Kamarpukur. Their first son, Ramkimur, was born in 1805 and their first daughter, Kadyayani, in 1810. In 1814 Kudaram was ordered by his landlord to bear false witness in court against a neighbor. When he refused to do so, the landlord brought a false case against him and deprived him of his ancestral property. Thus dispossessed, he arrived at the invitation of another landlord in the quiet village of Kamarpukur, where he was given a dwelling in about an acre of fertile land. Pops from this little property were enough to meet his family's simple needs. Here he lived in simplicity, dignity, and contentment. Ten years after his coming to Kamar Pukur, Kudaram made a pilgrimage on foot to Rameswar at the southern extremity of India. Two years later was born his second son, whom he named Ramswar. Again in 1835, at the age of sixty, he made a pilgrimage, this time to Gaya. Here from ancient times, Hindus have come from the four corners of India to discharge their duties to their departed ancestors by offering them food and drink at the sacred footprint of the Lord Vishnu. At this holy place Kudaram had a dream in which the Lord Vishnu promised to be born as his son. And Chandra Devi too, in front of this Shiva temple at Kamarpukar, had a vision indicating the birth of a divine child. Upon his return the husband found that she had conceived. It was on February 18, 1836 that the child, to be known afterwards as Ramakrishna, was born. In memory of the dream at Gaya he was given the name of Gadadhar, the bearer of the mace, an epithet of Vishnu. Three years later a little sister was born. Boyhood. Gadadhar grew up into a healthy and restless boy, full of fun and sweet mischief. He was intelligent and precocious and endowed with a prodigious memory. On his father's lap he learnt by heart the names of his ancestors and the hymns to the gods and goddesses, and at the village school he was taught to read and write. But his greatest delight was to listen to recitations of stories from Hindu mythology and the epics. These he would afterwards recount from memory to the great joy of the villagers. Painting he enjoyed, the art of molding images of the gods and goddesses he learnt from the potters. But arithmetic was his great aversion. At the age of six or seven Gadadhar had his first experience of spiritual ecstasy. One day in June or July when he was walking along a narrow path between paddy fields, eating the puffed rice that he carried in a basket, he looked up at the sky and saw a beautiful dark thunder cloud. 
As it spread rapidly enveloping the whole sky, a flight of snow-white cranes passed in front of it. The beauty of the contrast overwhelmed the boy. He fell to the ground unconscious and the puffed rice went in all directions. Some villagers found him and carried him home in their arms. Gadadhar said later that in that state he had experienced an indescribable joy. Gadadhar was seven years old when his father died. This incident profoundly affected him. For the first time the boy realized that life on earth was impermanent. Unobserved by others, he began to slip into the mango orchard or into one of the cremation grounds, and he spent hours absorbed in his own thoughts. He also became more helpful to his mother in the discharge of her household duties. He gave more attention to reading and hearing the religious stories recorded in the Puranas. And he became interested in the wandering monks and pious pilgrims who would stop at Kemarpukur on their way to Puri. These holy men, the custodians of India's spiritual heritage, and the living witnesses of the ideal of renunciation of the world and all-absorbing love of God, entertained the little boy with stories from the Hindu epics, stories of saints and prophets, and also stories of their own adventures. He on his part fetched their water and fuel and served them in various ways. Meanwhile, he was observing their meditation and worship. At the age of nine, Gadadhar was invested with the sacred thread. This ceremony conferred upon him the privileges of his Brahmin lineage, including the worship of the family deity, Raghivir, and imposed upon him the many strict disciplines of a Brahmin's life. During the ceremony of investiture he shocked his relatives by accepting a meal cooked by his nurse, a Sudra woman. His father would never have dreamt of doing such a thing. But in a playful mood Gadadhar had once promised this woman that he would eat her food, and now he fulfilled his plighted word. The woman had piety and religious sincerity, and these were more important to the boy than the conventions of society. Gadadhar was now permitted to worship Raghavir. Thus began his first training in meditation. He so gave his heart and soul to the worship that the stone image very soon appeared to him as the living Lord of the universe. His tendency to lose himself in contemplation was first noticed at this time. Behind his boyish light-heartedness was seen a deepening of his spiritual nature. About this time on the Shivaratri night, consecrated to the worship of Shiva, a dramatic performance was arranged. The principal actor who was to play the part of Shiva suddenly fell ill, and Gadadhar was persuaded to act in his place. While friends were dressing him for the role of Shiva smearing his body with ashes, matting his locks, placing a trident in his hand, and a string of Rudrakasa beads around his neck the boy appeared to become absent-minded. He approached the stage with slow and measured step, supported by his friends. He looked the living image of Shiva. The audience loudly applauded what it took to be his skill as an actor, but it was soon discovered that he was really lost in meditation. His countenance was radiant and tears flowed from his eyes. He was lost to the outer world. The effect of this scene on the audience was tremendous. People felt blessed as by a vision of Shiva himself. The performance had to be stopped and the boy's mood lasted till the following morning. Gadadhar himself now organized a dramatic company with his young friends. The stage was set in the mango orchard. The themes were selected from the stories of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Gadadhar knew by heart almost all the roles having heard them from professional actors. His favorite theme was the Vrindavan episode of Krishna's life, depicting those exquisite love stories of Krishna and the milkmaids and the cowherd boys. Gadadhar would play the parts of Radha or Krishna and would often lose himself in the character he was portraying. His natural feminine grace heightened the dramatic effect. The mango orchard would ring with the loud curtain of the boys. Lost in song and merry-making, Gadadhar became indifferent to the routine of school. In 1849 Ramkumar, the eldest son, went to Calcutta to improve the financial condition of the family. Gadadhar was on the threshold of youth. He had become the pet of the women of the village. They loved to hear him talk, sing, or recite from the holy books. They enjoyed his knack of imitating voices. Their woman's instinct recognized the innate purity and guilelessness of this boy of clear skin, flowing hair, beaming eyes, smiling face, 
and inexhaustible fun. The pious elderly women looked upon him as Gopala, the baby Krishna, and the younger ones saw in him the youthful Krishna of Vrindavan. He himself so idealized the love of the gopis for Krishna that he sometimes yearned to be born as a woman, if he must be born again, in order to be able to love Sri Krishna with all his heart and soul. Coming to Calcutta At the age of sixteen Gadadhar was summoned to Calcutta by his elder brother Ramkimar, who wished assistance in his priestly duties. Ramkimar had opened a Sanskrit academy to supplement his income, and it was his intention gradually to turn his younger brother's mind to education. Gadadhar applied himself heart and soul to his new duty as family priest to a number of Calcutta families. His worship was very different from that of the professional priests. He spent hours decorating the images and singing hymns and devotional songs. He performed with love the other duties of his office. People were impressed with his ardor. But to his studies he paid scant attention. Rankumar did not at first oppose the ways of his temperamental brother. He wanted Gadadhar to become used to the conditions of city life. But one day he decided to warn the boy about his indifference to the world. After all, in the near future Gadadhar must, as a householder, earn his livelihood through the performance of his Brahminical duties, and these required a thorough knowledge of Hindu law, astrology, and kindred subjects. He gently admonished Gadadhar and asked him to pay more attention to his studies. But the boy replied spiritedly, Brother, what shall I do with the mere breadwinning education? I would rather acquire that wisdom which will illumine my heart and give me satisfaction forever. Breadwinning Education The anguish of the inner soul of India found expression through these passionate words of the young Gadadhar. For what did his unsophisticated eyes see around him in Calcutta, at that time the metropolis of India and the center of modern culture and learning. Greed and lust held sway in the higher levels of society, and the occasional religious practices were merely outer forms from which the soul had long ago departed. Gedadhar had never seen anything like this at Kamarpukur among the simple and pious villagers. The sadhus and wandering monks whom he had served in his boyhood had revealed to him an altogether different India. He had been impressed by their devotion and purity, their self-control and renunciation. He had learnt from them, and from his own intuition that the ideal of life as taught by the ancient sages of India was the realization of God. When Ramkumar reprimanded Gadadhar for neglecting a breadwinning education, the inner voice of the boy reminded him that the legacy of his ancestors, the legacy of Rama, Krishna, Buddha, Sankara, Ramanuja, Chaitanya was not worldly security, but the knowledge of God. And these noble sages were the true representatives of Hindu society. Each of them was seated, as it were, on the crest of the wave that followed each successive trough in the tumultuous course of Indian national life. All demonstrated that the life current of India is spirituality. This truth was revealed to Gadadhar through that inner vision which scans past and future in one sweep, unobstructed by the barriers of time and space. But he was unaware of the history of the profound change that had taken place in the land of his birth during the previous one hundred years. Hindu society during the eighteenth century had been passing through a period of decadence. It was the twilight of the Muslim rule. There were anarchy and confusion in all spheres. Superstitious practices dominated the religious life of the people. Rites and rituals passed for the essence of spirituality. Greedy priests became the custodians of heaven. True philosophy was supplanted by dogmatic opinions. Pundits took delight in vain polemics. In 1007, 157 English traders laid the foundation of British rule in India. Gradually the government was systematized and lawlessness suppressed. The Hindus were much impressed by the military power and political acumen of the new rulers. In the wake of the merchants came the English educators and social reformers and Christian missionaries all bearing a culture completely alien to the Hindu mind. In different parts of the country educational institutions were set up and Christian churches established. Hindu young men were offered the heady wine of the Western culture of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, and they drank it to the very dregs. 
The first effect of the draft on the educated Hindus was a complete effacement from their minds of the time-honored beliefs and traditions of Hindu society. They came to believe that there was no transcendental truth. The world perceived by the senses was all that existed. God and religion were illusions of the untutored mind. True knowledge could be derived only from the analysis of nature. So atheism and agnosticism became the fashion of the day. The youth of India, taught in English schools, took malicious delight in openly breaking the customs and traditions of their society. They would do away with the caste system and remove the discriminatory laws about food. Social reform, the spread of secular education, widow remarriage, abolition of early marriage, they considered these the panacea for the degenerate condition of Hindu society. The Christian missionaries gave the finishing touch to the process of transformation. They ridiculed as relics of a barbarous age the images and rituals of the Hindu religion. They tried to persuade India that the teachings of her saints and seers were the cause of her downfall, that her Vedas, Puranas, and other scriptures were filled with superstition. Christianity, they maintained, had given the white race's position and power in this world and assurance of happiness in the next. Therefore Christianity was the best of all religions. Many intelligent young Hindus became converted. The man in the street was confused. The majority of the educated grew materialistic in their mental outlook. Everyone living near Calcutta or the other strongholds of Western culture, even those who attempted to cling to the orthodox traditions of Hindu society, became infected by the new uncertainties and the new beliefs. That the soul of India was to be resuscitated through a spiritual awakening. We hear the first call of this renaissance in the spirited retort of the young Gadadhar, brother, what shall I do with a mere bread-winning education? Rankimer could hardly understand the import of his young brother's reply. He described in bright colors the happy and easy life of scholars in Calcutta society. But Gadadhar intuitively felt that the scholars, to use one of his own vivid illustrations, were like so many vultures, soaring high on the wings of their uninspired intellect, with their eyes fixed on the charnel pit of greed and lust. So he stood firm and Rankumar had to give way. Kali Temple at Dakshin's War At that time there lived in Calcutta a rich widow named Rani Rasmani, belonging to the Sudra caste, and known far and wide not only for her business ability, courage, and intelligence, but also for her largeness of heart, piety, and devotion to God. She was assisted in the management of her vast property by her son-in-law Mathur Mohan. In 1847 the Rani purchased twenty acres of land at Dakshin's War, a village about four miles north of Calcutta. Here she created a temple garden and constructed several temples. Her Ishta or chosen ideal was the Divine Mother Kali. The temple garden stands directly on the east bank of the Ganges. The northern section of the land and a portion to the east contain an orchard, flower gardens, and two small reservoirs. The southern section is paved with brick and mortar. The visitor arriving by boat ascends the steps of an imposing bathing ga, which leads to the Chani, a roof terrace, on either side of which stand in a row six temples of Shiva. East of the terrace and the Shiva temples is a large court paved, rectangular in shape, and running north and south. Two temples stand in the center of this court, the larger one, to the south and facing south, being dedicated to Kali, and the smaller one, facing the Ganges to Radha Kanta, that is, Krishna, the consort of Radha. Nine domes with spires surmount the temple of Kali, and before it stands the spacious Natmandir, or music hall, the terrace of which is supported by stately pillars. At the northwest and southwest corners of the temple compound are two Nahabats, or music towers, from which music flows at different times of day, especially at sunup, noon and sundown, when the worship is performed in the temples. Three sides of the paved courtyard all except the west are lined with rooms set apart for kitchens, storerooms, dining rooms and quarters for the temple staff and guests. The chamber in the northwest angle, just beyond the last of the Shiva temples, is of special interest to us, for here Sri Ramakrishna was to spend a considerable part of his life. To the west of this chamber, 
is a semicircular porch overlooking the river. In front of the porch runs a footpath, north and south, and beyond the path is a large garden and below the garden the Ganges. The orchard to the north of the buildings contains the Panchavati, the Banyan, and the Bell Tree associated with Sri Ramakrishna's spiritual practices. Outside and to the north of the temple compound proper is the Kuthi or bungalow, used by members of Rani Rasmani's family visiting the garden. And north of the temple garden, separated from it by a high wall, is a powder magazine belonging to the British government. Shiva. In the twelve Shiva temples are installed the emblems of the great god of renunciation in his various aspects, worshipped daily with proper rites. Shiva requires few articles of worship white flowers and bell leaves, and a little Ganges water offered with devotion, are enough to satisfy the benign deity and win from him the boon of liberation. Radhakanta The temple of Radhakanta, also known as the temple of Vishnu, contains the images of Radha and Krishna, the symbol of union with God through ecstatic love. The two images stand on a pedestal facing the west. The floor is paved with marble. From the ceiling of the porch hang chandeliers protected from dust by coverings of red cloth. Canvas screens shield the images from the rays of the setting sun. Close to the threshold of the inner shrine is a small brass cup containing holy water. Devoted visitors reverently drink a few drops from the vessel. Kali The main temple is dedicated to Kali, the Divine Mother, here worshipped as Bhavatarini, the Savior of the Universe. The floor of this temple also is paved with marble. The basalt image of the mother, dressed in gorgeous gold brocade, stands on a white marble image of the prostrate body of her divine consort Shiva, the symbol of the Absolute. On the feet of the goddess are, among other ornaments, anklets of gold. Her arms are decked with jeweled ornaments of gold. She wears necklaces of gold and pearls, a golden garland of human heads, and a girdle of human arms. She wears a golden crown, golden ear rings, and a golden nose ring with a pearl drop. She has four arms. The lower left hand holds a severed human head and the upper grips a blood-stained saber. One right hand offers boons to her children, the other allays their fear. The majesty of her posture can hardly be described. It combines the terror of destruction with the reassurance of motherly tenderness. For she is the cosmic power, the totality of the universe, a glorious harmony of the pairs of opposites. She deals out death as she creates and preserves. She has three eyes, the third being the symbol of divine wisdom. They strike dismay into the wicked, yet pour out affection for her devotees. The whole symbolic world is represented in the temple garden the trinity of the nature mother Kali, the absolute Shiva, and love Radha Kanta, the arch-spanning heaven and earth. The terrific goddess of the Tantra, the soul enthralling flute player of the Bhagavata, and the self-absorbed absolute of the Vedas live together, creating the greatest synthesis of religions. All aspects of reality are represented there. But of this divine household Kali is the pivot, the sovereign mistress. She is Prakriti, the procreatrix nature, the destroyer, the creator. Nay, she is something greater and deeper still for those who have eyes to see. She is the universal mother, my mother as Ramakrishna would say, the all-powerful, who reveals herself to her children under different aspects and divine incarnations, the visible God, who leads the elect to the invisible reality and if it so pleases her, she takes away the last trace of ego from created beings and merges it in the consciousness of the Absolute, the undifferentiated God. Through her grace the finite ego loses itself in the illimitable ego Atman Brahman. Rani Resmani spent a fortune for the construction of the temple garden and another fortune for its dedication ceremony, which took place on May 31, 1855. Sri Ramakrishna henceforth we shall call Gadadhar by this familiar name came to the temple garden with his elder brother Ramkumar, who was appointed priest of the Kali temple. Sri Ramakrishna did not at first approve of Ramkumar's working for the Sudra Rasmani. The example of their orthodox father was still fresh in Sri Ramakrishna's mind. 
He objected also to the eating of the cooked offerings of the temple, since, according to Orthodox Hindu custom, such food can be offered to the deity only in the house of a Brahmin. But the holy atmosphere of the temple grounds, the solitude of the surrounding wood, the loving care of his brother, the respect shown him by Rani Rasmani and Mathur Babu, the living presence of the goddess Kali in the temple, and above all the proximity of the sacred Ganges, which Sri Ramakrishna always held in the highest respect, gradually overcame his disapproval and he began to feel at home. Within a very short time Sri Ramakrishna attracted the notice of Mathur Babu, who was impressed by the young man's religious fervor and wanted him to participate in the worship in the Kali temple. But Sri Ramakrishna loved his freedom and was indifferent to any worldly career. The profession of the priesthood in a temple founded by a rich woman did not appeal to his mind. Further, he hesitated to take upon himself the responsibility for the ornaments and jewelry of the temple. Mathur had to wait for a suitable occasion. At this time there came to Dakshins where a youth of sixteen, destined to play an important role in Sri Ramakrishna's life. Hrde, the distant nephew of Sri Ramakrishna, hailed from Siwar, a village not far from Kamarpukur, and had been his boyhood friend. Clever, exceptionally energetic, and endowed with great presence of mind, he moved, as will be seen later, like a shadow about his uncle and was always ready to help him, even at the sacrifice of his personal comfort. He was destined to be a mute witness of many of the spiritual experiences of Sri Ramakrishna and the caretaker of his body during the stormy days of his spiritual practice. Hrde came to Dakshins were in search of a job and Sri Ramakrishna was glad to see him. Unable to resist the persuasion of Mathur Babu, Sri Ramakrishna at last entered the temple service on condition that Hrde should be asked to assist him. His first duty was to dress and decorate the image of Kali. One day the priest of the Radhakanda temple accidentally dropped the image of Krishna on the floor, breaking one of its legs. The pundits advised the Rani to install a new image, since the worship of an image with a broken limb was against the scriptural injunctions. But the Rani was fond of the image, and she asked Sri Ramakrishna's opinion. In an abstracted mood he said, This solution is ridiculous. If a son-in-law of the Rani broke his leg, would she discard him and put another in his place? Wouldn't she rather arrange for his treatment? Why should she not do the same thing in this case too? Let the image be repaired and worshipped as before. It was a simple, straightforward solution and was accepted by the Rani. Sri Ramakrishna himself mended the break. The priest was dismissed for his carelessness, and at Mathur Babu's earnest request, Sri Ramakrishna accepted the office of priest in the Radhakanda temple. Sri Ramakrishna as a priest. Born in an orthodox Brahmin family, Sri Ramakrishna knew the formalities of worship, its rites and rituals. The innumerable gods and goddesses of the Hindu religion are the human aspects of the indescribable and incomprehensible spirit, as conceived by the finite human mind. They understand and appreciate human love and emotion, help men to realize their secular and spiritual ideals, and ultimately enable men to attain liberation from the miseries of phenomenal life. The source of light, intelligence, wisdom and strength is the one alone from whom comes the fulfillment of desire. Yet, as long as a man is bound by his human limitations, he cannot but worship God through human forms. He must use human symbols. Therefore Hinduism asks the devotees to look on God as the ideal father, the ideal mother, the ideal husband, the ideal son, or the ideal friend. But the name ultimately leads to the nameless, the form to the formless, the word to the silence, the emotion to the serene realization of peace in existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute. The gods gradually merge in the one God. But until that realization is achieved, the devotee cannot dissociate human factors from his worship. Therefore the deity is bathed and clothed and decked with ornaments. He is fed and put to sleep. He is propitiated with hymns, songs, and prayers. And there are appropriate rites connected with all these functions. For instance, to secure for himself external purity, the priest bathes himself in holy water and puts on a holy cloth. 
He purifies the mind and the sense organs by appropriate meditations. He fortifies the place of worship against evil forces by drawing around it circles of fire and water. He awakens the different spiritual centers of the body and invokes the Supreme Spirit in his heart. Then he transfers the Supreme Spirit to the image before him and worships the image, regarding it no longer as clay or stone, but as the embodiment of spirit, throbbing with life and consciousness. After the worship the Supreme Spirit is recalled from the image to its true sanctuary, the heart of the priest. The real devotee knows the absurdity of worshipping the transcendental reality with material articles clothing that which pervades the whole universe and the beyond, putting on a pedestal that which cannot be limited by space, feeding that which is disembodied and incorporeal, singing before that whose glory the music of the spheres tries vainly to proclaim. But through these rites the devotee aspires to go ultimately beyond rites and rituals, forms and names, words and praise, and to realize God as the all-pervading consciousness. Hindu priests are thoroughly acquainted with the rites of worship, but few of them are aware of their underlying significance. They move their hands and limbs mechanically, in obedience to the letter of the scriptures and repeat the holy mantras like parrots. But from the very beginning the inner meaning of these rites was revealed to Sri Ramakrishna. As he sat facing the image, a strange transformation came over his mind. While going through the prescribed ceremonies, he would actually find himself encircled by a wall of fire protecting him and the place of worship from unspiritual vibrations, or he would feel the rising of the mystic Kundalini through the different centers of the body. The glow on his face, his deep absorption, and the intense atmosphere of the temple impressed everyone who saw him worship the deity. Ramkimar wanted Sri Ramakrishna to learn the intricate rituals of the worship of Kali. To become a priest of Kali one must undergo a special form of initiation from a qualified guru, and for Sri Ramakrishna a suitable Brahmin was found. But no sooner did the Brahmin speak the holy word in his ear than Sri Ramakrishna, overwhelmed with emotion, uttered a loud cry and plunged into deep concentration. Mathur begged Sri Ramakrishna to take charge of the worship in the Kali temple. The young priest pleaded his incompetence and his ignorance of the scriptures. Mathur insisted that devotion and sincerity would more than compensate for any lack of formal knowledge and make the Divine Mother manifest herself through the image. In the end, Sri Ramakrishna had to yield to Mathur's request. He became the priest of Kali. In 1856 Rankumar breathed his last. Sri Ramakrishna had already witnessed more than one death in the family. He had come to realize how impermanent is life on earth. The more he was convinced of the transitory nature of worldly things, the more eager he became to realize God, the fountain of immortality. The first vision of Kali. And indeed he soon discovered what a strange goddess he had chosen to serve. He became gradually enmeshed in the web of her all-pervading presence. To the ignorant she is to be sure the image of destruction, but he found in her the benign, all-loving mother. Her neck is encircled with a garland of heads, and her waist with a girdle of human arms and two of her hands hold weapons of death, and her eyes dart a glance of fire. But strangely enough, Ramakrishna felt in her breath the soothing touch of tender love and saw in her the seed of immortality. She stands on the bosom of her consort Shiva. It is because she is the Sakti, the power inseparable from the Absolute. She is surrounded by jackals and other unholy creatures, the denizens of the cremation ground. But is not the ultimate reality above holiness and unholiness? She appears to be reeling under the spell of wine. But who would create this mad world unless under the influence of a divine drunkenness? She is the highest symbol of all the forces of nature, the synthesis of their antinomies, the ultimate divine in the form of woman. She now became to Sri Rima Krishna the only reality, and the world became an unsubstantial shadow. Into her worship he poured his soul. Before him she stood as the transparent portal to the shrine of ineffable reality. The worship in the temple intensified Sri Rima Krishna's yearning for a living vision of the mother of the universe. 
he began to spend in meditation the time not actually employed in the temple service, and for this purpose he selected an extremely solitary place. A deep jungle, thick with underbrush and prickly plants, lay to the north of the temples. Used at one time as a burial ground, it was shunned by people even during the daytime for fear of ghosts. There Sri Ramakrishna began to spend the whole night in meditation, returning to his room only in the morning with eyes swollen as though for much weeping. While meditating he would lay aside his cloth and his brahminical thread. Explaining this strange conduct, he once said to Hriday, Don't you know that when one thinks of God one should be freed from all ties? From our very birth we have the eight fetters of hatred, shame, lineage, pride of good conduct, fear, secretiveness, caste, and grief. The sacred thread reminds me that I am a Brahmin and therefore superior to all. When calling on the mother one has to set aside all such ideas. Hriday thought his uncle was becoming insane. As his love for God deepened, he began either to forget or to drop the formalities of worship. Sitting before the image he would spend hours singing the devotional songs of great devotees of the mother, such as Kamala Kanta and Ramprasad. Those rhapsodical songs, describing the direct vision of God, only intensified Sri Ramakrishna's longing. He felt the pangs of a child separated from its mother. Sometimes in agony he would rub his face against the ground and weep so bitterly that people, thinking he had lost his earthly mother, would sympathize with him in his grief. Sometimes in moments of skepticism he would cry, Art thou true mother, or is it all fiction mere poetry without any reality? If thou dost exist, why do I not see thee? Is religion a mere fantasy and art thou only a figment of man's imagination? Sometimes he would sit on the prayer carpet for two hours like an inert object. He began to behave in an abnormal manner, most of the time unconscious of the world. He almost gave up food and sleep left him altogether. But he did not have to wait very long. He has thus described his first vision of the mother. I felt as if my heart were being squeezed like a wet towel. I was overpowered with a great restlessness and a fear that it might not be my lot to realize her in this life. I could not bear the separation from her any longer. Life seemed to be not worth living. Suddenly my glance fell on the sword that was kept in the mother's temple. I determined to put an end to my life. When I jumped up like a madman and seized it, suddenly the blessed mother revealed herself. The buildings with their different parts, the temple and everything else vanished from my sight, leaving no trace whatsoever, and in their stead I saw a limitless, infinite, effulgent ocean of consciousness. As far as the eye could see, the shining billows were madly rushing at me from all sides with a terrific noise, to swallow me up. I was panting for breath. I was caught in the rush and collapsed unconscious. What was happening in the outside world I did not know, but within me there was a steady flow of undiluted bliss, altogether new, and I felt the presence of the Divine Mother. On his lips when he regained consciousness of the world was the word Mother. God intoxicated state. Yet this was only a foretaste of the intense experiences to come. The first glimpse of the Divine Mother made him the more eager for her uninterrupted vision. He wanted to see her both in meditation and with eyes open. But the mother began to play a teasing game of hide and seek with him, intensifying both his joy and his suffering. Weeping bitterly during the moments of separation from her, he would pass into a trance and then find her standing before him, smiling, talking, consoling, bidding him be of good cheer and instructing him. During this period of spiritual practice he had many uncommon experiences. When he sat to meditate, he would hear strange clicking sounds in the joints of his legs, as if someone were locking them up, one after the other, to keep him motionless, and at the conclusion of his meditation he would again hear the same sounds, this time unlocking them and leaving him free to move about. He would see flashes like a swarm of fireflies floating before his eyes, or a sea of deep mist around him, with luminous waves of molten silver. Again from a sea of translucent mist he would behold the mother rising, first her feet, then her waist, body, face and head, finally her whole person. He would feel her breath and hear her voice. 
worshipping in the temple, sometimes he would become exalted, sometimes he would remain motionless as stone, sometimes he would almost collapse from excessive emotion. Many of his actions, contrary to all tradition, seemed sacrilegious to the people. He would take a flower and touch it to his own head, body, and feet, and then offer it to the goddess. Or, like a drunkard, he would reel to the throne of the mother, touch her chin by way of showing his affection for her, and sing, talk, joke, laugh, and dance. Or he would take a morsel of food from the plate and hold it to her mouth, begging her to eat it, and would not be satisfied till he was convinced that she had really eaten. After the mother had been put to sleep at night, from his own room he would hear her ascending to the upper story of the temple with the light steps of a happy girl, her anklets jingling. Then he would discover her standing with flowing hair, her black form silhouetted against the sky of the night looking at the Ganges or at the distant lights of Calcutta. Naturally the temple officials took him for an insane person. His worldly well-wishers brought him to skilled physicians, but no medicine could cure his malady. Many a time he doubted his sanity himself, for he had been sailing across an uncharted sea with no earthly guide to direct him. His only haven of security was the Divine Mother herself. To her he would pray, I do not know what these things are. I am ignorant of mantras and the scriptures. Teach me, Mother, how to realize thee. Who else can help me? Art thou not my only refuge and guide? And the sustaining presence of the Mother never failed him in his distress or doubt. Even those who criticized his conduct were greatly impressed with his purity, guilelessness, truthfulness, integrity, and holiness. They felt an uplifting influence in his presence. It is said that samadhi or trance no more than opens the portal of the spiritual realm. Sri Ramakrishna felt an unquenchable desire to enjoy God in various ways. For his meditation he built a place in the northern wooded section of the temple garden. With Hride's help he planted their five sacred trees. The spot known as the Panchavati became the scene of many of his visions. As his spiritual mood deepened he more and more felt himself to be a child of the Divine Mother. He learned to surrender himself completely to her will and let her direct him. O oh Mother, he would constantly pray, I have taken refuge in thee. Teach me what to do and what to say. Thy will is paramount everywhere and is for the good of thy children. Merge my will in thy will and make me thy instrument. His visions became deeper and more intimate. He no longer had to meditate to behold the Divine Mother. Even while retaining consciousness of the outer world, he would see her as tangibly as the temples, the trees, the river, and the men around him. On a certain occasion Mathur Babu stealthily entered the temple to watch the worship. He was profoundly moved by the young priest's devotion and sincerity. He realized that Sri Ramakrishna had transformed the stone image into the living goddess. Sri Ramakrishna one day fed a cat with the food that was to be offered to Kali. This was too much for the manager of the temple garden, who considered himself responsible for the proper conduct of the worship. He reported Sri Ramakrishna's insane behavior to Mathur Babu. Sri Ramakrishna has described the incident. The Divine Mother revealed to me in the Kali temple that it was she who had become everything. She showed me that everything was full of consciousness. The image was consciousness, the altar was consciousness, the water vessels were consciousness, the door sill was consciousness, the marble floor was consciousness, all was consciousness. I found everything inside the room soaked, as it were, in bliss the bliss of God. I saw a wicked man in front of the Kali temple, but in him also I saw the power of the Divine Mother vibrating. That was why I fed a cat with the food that was to be offered to the Divine Mother. I clearly perceive that all this was the Divine Mother even the cat. The manager of the temple garden wrote to Mathur Babu saying that I was feeding the cat with the offering intended for the Divine Mother. But Mathur Babu had insight into the state of my mind. He wrote back to the manager, let him do whatever he likes. You must not say anything to him. One of the painful ailments from which Sri Ramakrishna suffered at this time was a burning sensation in his body and he was cured by a strange vision. During worship in the temple, following the scriptural injunctions, he would imagine the presence of this sinner in himself and the destruction of this sinner. 
One day he was meditating in the Panchavati, when he saw come out of him a red-eyed man of black complexion, reeling like a drunkard. Soon there emerged from him another person, of serene countenance, wearing the ochre cloth of a sannyasi, and carrying in his hand a trident. The second person attacked the first and killed him with the trident. Thereafter Sri Ramakrishna was free of his pain. About this time he began to worship God by assuming the attitude of a servant toward his master. He imitated the mood of Henniman, the monkey chieftain of the Ramayana, the ideal servant of Rama, and traditional model for this self-effacing form of devotion. When he meditated on Henyman his movements and his way of life began to resemble those of a monkey. His eyes became restless. He lived on fruits and roots. With his cloth tied around his waist, a portion of it hanging in the form of a tail, he jumped from place to place instead of walking. And after a short while he was blessed with the vision of Sita, the divine consort of Rama, who entered his body and disappeared there with the words, I bequeath to you my smile. Mathur had faith in the sincerity of Sri Ramakrishna's spiritual zeal, but began now to doubt his sanity. He had watched him jumping about like a monkey. One day, when Rani Resmani was listening to Sri Ramakrishna singing in the temple, the young priest abruptly turned and slapped her. Apparently listening to his song, she had actually been thinking of a lawsuit. She accepted the punishment as though the Divine Mother herself had imposed it, but Mathur was distressed. He begged Sri Ramakrishna to keep his feelings under control and to heed the conventions of society. God himself, he argued, follows laws. God never permitted, for instance, flowers of two colors to grow on the same stalk. The following day Sri Ramakrishna presented Mathur Babu with two hibiscus flowers growing on the same stalk, one red and one white. Mathur and Rani Rasmani began to ascribe the mental ailment of Sri Ramakrishna in part, at least, to his observance of rigid continence. Thinking that a natural life would relax the tension of his nerves, they engineered a plan with two women of ill fame. But as soon as the women entered his room, Sri Ramakrishna beheld in them the manifestation of the Divine Mother of the Universe and went into Samad, he uttering her name. Helad Hari. In 1858 there came to Dakshans where a cousin of Sri Ramakrishna, Halad Hari by name, who was to remain there about eight years. On account of Sri Ramakrishna's indifferent health, Mathur appointed this man to the office of priest in the Kali temple. He was a complex character, versed in the letter of the scriptures, but hardly aware of their spirit. He loved to participate in hair-splitting theological discussions, and by the measure of his own erudition, he proceeded to gauge Sri Ramakrishna. An orthodox Brahmin, he thoroughly disapproved of his cousin's unorthodox actions, but he was not unimpressed by Sri Ramakrishna's purity of life, ecstatic love of God, and yearning for realization. One day Halad Hari upset Sri Ramakrishna with the statement that God is incomprehensible to the human mind. Sri Ramakrishna has described the great moment of doubt when he wondered whether his visions had really misled him. With sobs I prayed to the mother, Canst thou have the heart to deceive me like this because I am a fool? A stream of tears flowed from my eyes. Shortly afterwards I saw a volume of mist rising from the floor and filling the space before me. In the midst of it there appeared a face with flowing beard, calm, highly expressive and fair. Fixing its gaze steadily upon me, it said solemnly, Remain in Bhavamukha, on the threshold of relative consciousness. This it repeated three times and then it gently disappeared in the mist, which itself dissolved. This vision reassured me. A garbled report of Sri Ramakrishna's failing health, indifference to worldly life, and various abnormal activities reached Kemarpukur and filled the heart of his poor mother with anguish. At her repeated request he returned to his village for a change of air. But his boyhood friends did not interest him any more. A divine fever was consuming him. He spent a great part of the day and night in one of the cremation grounds in meditation. This reminded him of the impermanence of the human body, of human hopes and achievements. It also reminded him of Kali, the goddess of destruction. Marriage and after. 
but in a few months his health showed improvement, and he recovered to some extent his natural buoyancy of spirit. His happy mother was encouraged to think it might be a good time to arrange his marriage. The boy was now twenty-three years old. A wife would bring him back to earth. And she was delighted when her son welcomed her suggestion. Perhaps he saw in it the finger of God. Sarah Damani, a little girl of five, lived in the neighboring village called Jerambati. Even at this age, she had been praying to God to make her character as stainless and fragrant as the white tuberose. Looking at the full moon, she would say, O oh God, there are dark spots even on the moon. But make my character spotless. It was she who was selected as the bride for Sri Ramakrishna. The marriage ceremony was duly performed. Such early marriage in India is in the nature of a betrothal, the marriage being consummated when the girl attains puberty. But in this case the marriage remained forever unconsummated. Sri Ramakrishna lived at Kamarpukur about a year and a half and then returned to Dakshin's war. Hardly had he crossed the threshold of the Kali temple when he found himself again in the whirlwind. His madness reappeared tenfold. The same meditation and prayer, the same ecstatic moods, the same burning sensation, the same weeping, the same sleeplessness, the same indifference to the body and the outside world, the same divine delirium. He subjected himself to fresh disciplines in order to eradicate greed and lust, the two great impediments to spiritual progress. With a rupee in one hand and some earth in the other, he would reflect on the comparative value of these two for the realization of God, and finding them equally worthless, he would toss them, with equal indifference, into the Ganges. Women he regarded as the manifestations of the Divine Mother. Never even in a dream did he feel the impulses of lust. And to root out of his mind the idea of caste superiority, he cleaned a Piraeus house with his long and neglected hair. When he would sit in meditation, birds would perch on his head and peck in his hair for grains of food. Snakes would crawl over his body, and neither would he aware of the other. Fleep left him altogether. Day and night, visions flitted before him. He saw the sannyasi who had previously killed the sinner in him again coming out of his body, threatening him with the trident and ordering him to concentrate on God. Or the same sannyasi would visit distant places, following a luminous path, and bring him reports of what was happening there. Sri Ramakrishna used to say later that in the case of an advanced devotee the mind itself becomes the guru, living and moving like an embodied being. Rani Rasmani, the foundress of the temple garden, passed away in 1861. After her death her son-in-law Mathur became the sole executor of the estate. He placed himself and his resources at the disposal of Sri Ramakrishna and began to look after his physical comfort. Sri Ramakrishna later spoke of him as one of his five suppliers of stores appointed by the Divine Mother. Whenever a desire arose in his mind, Mathur fulfilled it without hesitation. The Brahmani There came to Dakshins, or at this time, a Brahmin woman who was to play an important part in Sri Ramakrishna's spiritual unfoldment. Born in East Bengal, she was an adept in the Tantric and Vaish, Nava methods of worship. She was slightly over fifty years of age, handsome, and garbed in the orange robe of a nun. Her sole possessions were a few books and two pieces of wearing cloth. Sri Ramakrishna welcomed the visitor with great respect, described to her his experiences and visions, and told her of people's belief that these were symptoms of madness. She listened to him attentively and said, My son, everyone in this world is mad. Some are mad for money, some for creature comforts, some for name and fame, and you are mad for God. She assured him that he was passing through the almost unknown spiritual experience described in the scriptures as Mahabhava, the most exalted rapture of divine love. She told him that this extreme exaltation had been described as manifesting itself through nineteen physical symptoms, including the shedding of tears, a tremor of the body, or a palation, perspiration, and a burning sensation. The Bhakti scriptures, she declared, had recorded only two instances of the experience, namely, those of Sri Radha and Sri Chaitanya. 
Very soon a tender relationship sprang up between Sri Ramakrishna and the Brahmani, she looking upon him as the baby Krishna, and he upon her as mother. Day after day she watched his ecstasy during the curtain and meditation, his samadhi, his mad yearning, and she recognized in him a power to transmit spirituality to others. She came to the conclusion that such things were not possible for an ordinary devotee, not even for a highly developed soul. Only an incarnation of God was capable of such spiritual manifestations. She proclaimed openly that Sri Ramakrishna, like Sri Chaitanya, was an incarnation of God. When Sri Ramakrishna told Mathur what the Brahmani had said about him, Mathur shook his head in doubt. He was reluctant to accept him as an incarnation of God, an avatar comparable to Rama, Krishna, Buddha and Chaitanya, though he admitted Sri Ramakrishna's extraordinary spirituality. Whereupon the Brahmani asked Mathur to arrange a conference of scholars who should discuss the matter with her. He agreed to the proposal and the meeting was arranged. It was to be held in the Natmandir in front of the Kali temple. Two famous pundits of the time were invited, Vaishnav Charan, the leader of the Vaishnava society and Gauri. The first to arrive was Vaishnav Charan, with a distinguished company of scholars and devotees. The Brahmani, like a proud mother, proclaimed her view before him and supported it with quotations from the scriptures. As the pundits discussed the deep theological question, Sri Ramakrishna, perfectly indifferent to everything happening around him, sat in their midst like a child, immersed in his own thoughts, sometimes smiling, sometimes chewing a pinch of spices from a pouch, or again saying to Vaishnav Charan with a nudge, Look here! Sometimes I feel like this too. Presently Vaishnav Charan arose to declare himself in total agreement with the view of the Brahmani. He declared that Sri Ramakrishna had undoubtedly experienced Mahabhava, and that this was the certain sign of the rare manifestation of God in a man. The people assembled there, especially the officers of the temple garden, were struck dumb. Sri Ramakrishna said to Mathur, like a boy, just fancy he too says so. Well, I am glad to learn that, after all, it is not a disease. When, a few days later, Pundit Gauri arrived, another meeting was held, and he agreed with the view of the Brahmani and Vaishnav Charan. To Sri Ramakrishna's remark that Vaishnav Charan had declared him to be an avatar, Gauri replied, Is that all he has to say about you? Then he has said very little. I am fully convinced that you are that mine of spiritual power, only a small fraction of which descends on earth, from time to time in the form of an incarnation. Ah! said Sri Ramakrishna with a smile, you seem to have quite outbid Vaishnav Charan in this matter. What have you found in me that makes you entertain such an idea? Gauri said, I feel it in my heart and I have the scriptures on my side. I am ready to prove it to anyone who challenges me. Well, Sri Ramakrishna said, It is you who say so, but believe me, I know nothing about it. Thus the insane priest was, by verdict of the great scholars of the day, proclaimed a divine incarnation. His visions were not the result of an overheated brain, they had precedent in spiritual history. And how did the proclamation affect Sri Ramakrishna himself? He remained the simple child of the mother that he had been since the first day of his life. Years later, when two of his householder disciples openly spoke of him as a divine incarnation and the matter was reported to him, he said with a touch of sarcasm, Do they think they will enhance my glory that way? One of them is an actor on the stage and the other a physician. What do they know about incarnations? Why years ago pundits like Gauri and Vaishnav Charan declared me to be an avatar. They were great scholars and knew what they said. But that did not make any change in my mind. Sri Ramakrishna was a learner all his life. He often used to quote a proverb to his disciples, Friend, the more I live the more I learn. When the excitement created by the Brahmani's declaration was over, he set himself to the task of practicing spiritual disciplines according to the traditional methods laid down in the Tantra and Vaish Nava scriptures. Hitherto he had pursued his spiritual ideal according to the promptings of his own mind and heart. Now he accepted the Brahmani as his guru and set foot on the traditional highways. Tantra 
According to the Tantra, the ultimate reality is Chit or consciousness which is identical with Sat or being and with Ananda or bliss. This ultimate reality, Satchit Ananda, existence knowledge bliss absolute is identical with the reality preached in the Vedas. And man is identical with this reality, but under the influence of maya or illusion he has forgotten his true nature. He takes to be real a merely apparent world of subject and object, and this error is the cause of his bondage and suffering. The goal of spiritual discipline is the rediscovery of his true identity with the divine reality. For the achievement of this goal the Vedanta prescribes an austere negative method of discrimination and renunciation which can be followed by only a few individuals endowed with sharp intelligence and unshakable willpower. The Tantra takes into consideration the natural weakness of human beings, their lower appetites, and their love for the concrete. Human's philosophy with rituals, meditation with ceremonies, renunciation with enjoyment. The underlying purpose is gradually to train the aspirant to meditate on his identity with the ultimate. The average man wishes to enjoy the material objects of the world. Tantra bids him enjoy these but at the same time discover in them the presence of God. Mystical rites are prescribed by which, slowly, the sense objects become spiritualized and sense attraction is transformed into a love of God. So the very bonds of man are turned into releasers. The very poison that kills is transmuted into the elixir of life. A word renunciation is not necessary. Thus the aim of Tantra is to sublimate boga or enjoyment into yoga or union with consciousness. Where according to this philosophy, the world with all its manifestations is nothing but the sport of Shiva and Sakti, the absolute and its inscrutable power. The disciplines of Tantra are graded to suit aspirants of all degrees. Exercises are prescribed for people with animal, heroic, and divine outlooks. Certain of the rites require the presence of members of the opposite sex. Here the aspirant learns Talak on woman as the embodiment of the goddess Kali, the mother of the universe. The very basis of Tantra is the motherhood of God and the glorification of woman. Every part of a woman's body is to be regarded as incarnate divinity. But the rites are extremely dangerous. The help of a qualified guru is absolutely necessary. An unwary devotee may lose his foothold and fall into a pit of depravity. According to the Tantra, Sakti is the active creative force in the universe. Shiva, the absolute, is a more or less passive principle. Further, Sakti is as inseparable from Shiva as fire's power to burn is from fire itself. Sakti, the creative power, contains in its womb the universe, and therefore is the Divine Mother. All women are her symbols. Kali is one of her several forms. The meditation on Kali, the creative power, is the central discipline of the Tantra. While meditating, the aspirant at first regards himself as one with the Absolute and then thinks that out of that impersonal consciousness emerge two entities, namely, his own self and the living form of the Goddess. He then projects the goddess into the tangible image before him and worships it as the Divine Mother. Sri Ramakrishna set himself to the task of practicing the disciplines of Tantra, and at the bidding of the Divine Mother herself he accepted the Brahmani as his guru. He performed profound and delicate ceremonies in the Panchavati and under the bell tree at the northern extremity of the temple compound. He practiced all the disciplines of the sixty-four principal Tantra books, and it took him never more than three days to achieve the result promised in any one of them. After the observance of a few preliminary rites, he would be overwhelmed with a strange divine fervor and would go into samadhi, where his mind would dwell in exaltation. Evil ceased to exist for him. The word karna lost its meaning. The whole world and everything in it appeared as the Leila, the sport of Shiva and Sakti. He beheld everywhere manifest the power and beauty of the mother, the whole world, animate and inanimate, appeared to him as pervaded with chit, consciousness, and with ananda, bliss. He saw in a vision the ultimate cause of the universe as a huge luminous triangle giving birth, every moment to an infinite number of worlds. He heard the Anahata Sabda, the great Sandam, 
of which the innumerable sounds of the universe are only so many echoes. He acquired the eight supernatural powers of yoga, which make a man almost omnipotent, and these he spurned as of no value whatsoever to the spirit. He had a vision of the divine maya, the inscrutable power of God by which the universe is created and sustained, and into which it is finally absorbed. In this vision he saw a woman of exquisite beauty, about to become a mother, emerging from the Ganges and slowly approaching the Panchavati. Presently she gave birth to a child and began to nurse it tenderly. A moment later she assumed a terrible aspect, seized the child with her grim jaws and crushed it. Swallowing it, Sher entered the waters of the Ganges. But the most remarkable experience during this period was the awakening of the Kundalini Sakti, the serpent power. He actually saw the power, at first lying asleep at the bottom of the spinal column, then waking up and ascending along the mystic Sushama canal and through its six centers, or lotuses, to the Sahasrara, the thousand-petaled lotus in the top of the head. He further saw that as the Kundalini went upward the different lotuses bloomed, and this phenomenon was accompanied by visions and trances. Later on he described to his disciples and devotees the various movements of the kundalini, the fish-like, bird-like, monkey-like, and so on. The awakening of the kundalini is the beginning of spiritual consciousness, and its union with Shiva in the Sahasrara, ending in Samadhi, is the consummation of the tantric disciplines. About this time it was revealed to him that in a short while many devotees would seek his guidance. Vaish Nava Disciplines after completing the tantric set Hana Sri Ramakrishna followed the Brahmani in the disciplines of Vaishnavism. The Vaishnavas are worshippers of Vishnu the all-pervading, the supreme god, who is also known as Hari and Narayana. Of Vishnu's various incarnations the two with the largest number of followers are Rama and Krishna. Vaishnavism is exclusively a religion of Bhakti. Bhakti is intense love of God, attachment to him alone. It is of the nature of bliss and bestows upon the lover immortality and liberation. God, according to Vaishnavism, cannot be realized through logic or reason, and without bhakti, all penances, austerities, and rites are futile. Man cannot realize God by self-exertion alone. For the vision of God his grace is absolutely necessary, and this grace is felt by the pure of heart. The mind is to be purified through bhakti. Your mind then remains forever immersed in the ecstasy of God vision. It is the cultivation of this divine love that is the chief concern of the Vaish, Nava religion. There are three kinds of formal devotion, Tamazic, Rajasic, and Sattvic. If a person, while showing devotion to God, is actuated by malevolence, arrogance, jealousy, or anger, then his devotion is Tamazic, since it is influenced by Tamas, the quality of inertia. If he worships God from a desire for fame or wealth, or from any other worldly ambition, then his devotion is rajasic since it is influenced by rajas, the quality of activity. But if a person loves God without any thought of material gain, if he performs his duties to please God alone and maintains toward all created beings the attitude of friendship, then his devotion is called sattvic, since it is influenced by sattva, the quality of harmony. But the highest devotion transcends the three gunas, or qualities, being a spontaneous, uninterrupted inclination of the mind toward God, the inner soul of all beings, and it wells up in the heart of a true devotee as soon as he hears the name of God or mention of God's attributes. A devotee possessed of this love would not accept the happiness of heaven if it were offered him. His one desire is to love God under all conditions and pleasure and pain, life and death, honor and dishonor, prosperity and adversity. There are two stages of bhakti. The first is known as Vedhai bhakti, or love of God qualified by scriptural injunctions. For the devotees of this stage are prescribed regular and methodical worship, hymns, prayers, the repetition of God's name, and the chanting of His glories. This lower bhakti in course of time matures into para-bhakti, or supreme devotion, known also as prema, the most intense form of divine love. Divine love is an end in itself. It exists potentially in all human hearts, 
but in the case of bound creatures it is misdirected to earthly objects. To develop the devotee's love for God, Vaishnavism humanizes God. God is to be regarded as the devotee's parent, master, friend, child, husband, or sweetheart, each succeeding relationship representing an intensification of love. These bhavas or attitudes toward God are known as Santa, Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya, and Madhur. The rishis of the Vedas, Hanuman, the cowherd boys of Vrindavan, Rama's mother, Kausalya, and Radhika, Krishna's sweetheart, exhibited, respectively, the most perfect examples of these forms. In the ascending scale, the glories of God are gradually forgotten and the devotee realizes more and more the intimacy of divine communion. Finally, he regards himself as the mistress of his beloved, and no artificial barrier remains to separate him from his ideal. No social or moral obligation can bind to the earth his soaring spirit. He experiences perfect union with the Godhead. Unlike the Vedantist, who strives to transcend all varieties of the subject-object relationship, a devotee of the Vaishnava path wishes to retain both his own individuality and the personality of God. To him God is not an intangible absolute, but the pure Shatama, the supreme person. While practicing the discipline of the matter bhava, the male devotee often regards himself as a woman, in order to develop the most intense form of love for Sri Krishna, the only Purusha or man in the universe. This assumption of the attitude of the opposite sex has a deep psychological significance. It is a matter of common experience that an idea may be cultivated to such an intense degree that every idea alien to it is driven from the mind. This peculiarity of the mind may he utilize for the subjugation of the lower desires and the development of the spiritual nature. Now, the idea which is the basis of all desires and passions in a man is the conviction of his indissoluble association with a male body. If he can inoculate himself thoroughly with the idea that he is a woman, he can get rid of the desires peculiar to his male body. Again, the idea that he is a woman may in turn be made to give way to another higher idea, namely, that he is neither man nor woman, but the impersonal spirit. The impersonal spirit alone can enjoy real communion with the impersonal God. Hence the highest realization of the Vaish, Nava draws close to the transcendental experience of the Vedantist. A beautiful expression of the Vaish, Nava worship of God through love, is to be found in the Vrindavan episode of the Bhagavata. The gopis or milkmaids of Vrindavan regarded the six-year-old Krishna as their beloved. They sought no personal gain or happiness from this love. They surrendered to Krishna their bodies, minds, and souls. Of all the gopis, Radhika or Radha, because of her intense love for him, was the closest to Krishna. She manifested Mahabhava and was united with her beloved. This union represents through sensuous language, a supersensuous experience. Sri Chaitanya, also known as Gauranga, Gora, or Nimai, born in Bengal in 1485 and regarded as an incarnation of God, is a great prophet of the Vaish, Nava religion. Vanya declared the chanting of God's name to be the most efficacious spiritual discipline for the Kali Yuga. Sri Ramakrishna, as the monkey Hinuman, had already worshipped God as his master. Through his devotion to Kali he had worshipped God as his mother. He was now to take up the other relationships prescribed by the Vaishnava scriptures. Ramlila about the year 1864 there came to Dakshins where a wandering Vaishnava monk Jadad Hari, whose ideal deity was Rama. He always carried with him a small metal image of the deity, which he called by the endearing name of Ramlila, the boy Rama. Toward this little image he displayed the tender affection of Kauslia for her divine son Rama. As a result of lifelong spiritual practice, he had actually found in the metal image the presence of his ideal. Ramlela was no longer for him a metal image, but the living God. He devoted himself to nursing Rama, feeding Rama, playing with Rama, taking Rama for a walk, and bathing Rama. And he found that the image responded to his love. Sri Ramakrishna, much impressed with his devotion, requested Jadad Hari to spend a few days at Dakshinswar. Soon Ramlala became the favorite companion of Sri Ramakrishna too. 
Later on he described to the devotees how the little image would dance gracefully before him, jump on his back, insist on being taken in his arms, run to the fields in the sun, pluck flowers from the bushes and play pranks like a naughty boy. A very sweet relationship sprang up between him and Ram Lala, for whom he felt the love of a mother. One day Jadad Hari requested Sri Ramakrishna to keep the image and bade him adieu with tearful eyes. He declared that Ram Lala had fulfilled his innermost prayer and that he now had no more need of formal worship. A few days later Sri Ramakrishna was blessed through Ram Lala with a vision of Ramachandra, whereby he realized that the Rama of the Ramayana, the son of Dasaratha, pervades the whole universe as spirit and consciousness, that he is its creator, sustainer, and destroyer, that in still another aspect, he is the transcendental Brahman without form, attribute, or name. While worshipping Ram Lala as the divine child, Sri Ramakrishna's heart became filled with motherly tenderness, and he began to regard himself as a woman. His speech and gestures changed. He began to move freely with the ladies of Mather's family, who now looked upon him as one of their own sex. During this time he worshipped the Divine Mother as her companion or handmaid. In communion with the Divine Beloved, Sri Ramakrishna now devoted himself to scaling the most inaccessible and dizzy heights of dualistic worship, namely the complete union with Sri Krishna as the Beloved of the Heart. He regarded himself as one of the gopis of Vrindavan, mad with longing for her divine sweetheart. At his request Mather provided him with woman's dress and jewelry. In this love pursuit, food and drink were forgotten. Day and night he wept bitterly. The yearning turned into a mad frenzy, for the divine Krishna began to play with him the old tricks he had played with the gopis. He would tease and taunt now and then revealing himself, but always keeping at a distance. Three Ramakrishna's anguish brought on a return of the old physical symptoms, the burning sensation, and oozing of blood through the pores, a loosening of the joints, and the stopping of physiological functions. The Vaishnava scriptures advise one to propitiate Radha and obtain her grace in order to realize Sri Krishna. So the tortured devotee now turned his prayer to her. Within a short time he enjoyed her blessed vision. He saw and felt the figure of Radha disappearing into his own body. He said later on, It is impossible to describe the heavenly beauty and sweetness of Radha. Her very appearance showed that she had completely forgotten herself in her passionate attachment to Krishna. Her complexion was a light yellow. Now one with Radha, he manifested the great ecstatic love, the Mahabhava which had found in her its fullest expression. Later Sri Ramakrishna said, the manifestation in the same individual of the nineteen different kinds of emotion for God is called, in the books on Bhakti, Mahabhava. An ordinary man takes a whole lifetime to express even a single one of these. But in this body meaning himself there has been a complete manifestation of all nineteen. The love of Radha is the precursor of the resplendent vision of Sri Krishna, and Sri Ramakrishna soon experienced that vision. The enchanting form of Krishna appeared to him and merged in his person. He became Krishna, he totally forgot his own individuality in the world, he saw Krishna in himself and in the universe. Thus he attained to the fulfillment of the worship of the personal God. He drank from the fountain of immortal bliss. The agony of his heart vanished forever. He realized Amrita, immortality, beyond the shadow of death. One day, listening to a recitation of the Bhagavata on the veranda of the Radhakanta temple he fell into a divine mood and saw the enchanting form of Krishna. He perceived the luminous rays issuing from Krishna's lotus feet in the form of a stout rope, which touched first the Bhagavata and then his own chest, connecting all three God, the scripture, and the devotee. After this vision, he used to say, I came to realize that Bhagavan Bhakta and Bhagavata God devotee and scripture are in reality, one and the same. Vedanta. The Brahmani was the enthusiastic teacher and astonished beholder of Sri Ramakrishna in his spiritual progress. She became proud of the achievements of her unique pupil. But the pupil himself was not permitted to rest, his destiny beckoned him forward. His Divine Mother would allow him no respite till he had left behind the entire realm of duality with its visions, experiences, and ecstatic dreams. 
but for the new ascent the old tender guides would not suffice. The Brahmani on whom he had depended for three years saw her son escape from her to follow the command of a teacher with masculine strength, a sterner mien, a gnarled physique, and a virile voice. The new Kuru was a wandering monk, the sturdy Todapuri, whom Sri Ramakrishna learnt to address affectionately as Nangta, the naked one, because of his total renunciation of all earthly objects and attachments, including even a piece of wearing cloth. Todapuri was the bearer of a philosophy new to Sri Ramakrishna, the non-dualistic Vedanta philosophy, whose conclusions Todapuri had experienced in his own life. This ancient Hindu system designates the ultimate reality as Brahman, also described as Satchitananda, existence knowledge bliss absolute. Brahman is the only real existence. In it there is no time, no space, no causality, no multiplicity. But through Maya its inscrutable power, time, space and causality are created and the one appears to break into the many. The eternal spirit appears as a manifold of individuals endowed with form and subject to the conditions of time. The immortal becomes a victim of birth and death. The changeless undergoes change. The sinless pure soul, hypnotized by its own maya, experiences the joys of heaven and the pains of hell. But these experiences based on the duality of the subject-object relationship are unreal. Even the vision of a personal God is, ultimately speaking, as illusory as the experience of any other object. Man attains his liberation, therefore, by piercing the veil of Maya and rediscovering his total identity with Brahman. Knowing himself to be one with the universal spirit, he realizes ineffable peace. Only then does he go beyond the fiction of birth and death, only then does he become immortal. And this is the ultimate goal of all religions to hypnotize the soul now hypnotized by its own ignorance. The path of the Vedantic discipline is the path of negation, neti, in which by stern determination, all that is unreal is both negated and renounced. It is the path of jhana, knowledge, the direct method of realizing the absolute. After the negation of everything relative, including the discriminating ego itself, the aspirant merges in the one without a second, in the bliss of nirvikalpa samadhi, where subject and object are alike dissolved. The soul goes beyond the realm of thought. The domain of duality is transcended. Maya is left behind with all its changes and modifications. The real man towers above the delusions of creation, preservation, and destruction. An avalanche of indescribable bliss sweeps away all relative ideas of pain and pleasure, good and evil. There shines in the heart the glory of the eternal Brahman, existence, knowledge, bliss absolute. Knower, knowledge, and known are dissolved in the ocean of one eternal consciousness. Love, lover, and beloved merge in the unbounded sea of supreme felicity. Birth, growth, and death vanish in infinite existence. All doubts and misgivings are quelled forever, the oscillations of the mind are stopped, the momentum of past actions is exhausted. Breaking down the ridge pole of the tabernacle, in which the soul has made its abode for untold ages, stilling the body, calming the mind, drowning the ego, the sweet joy of Brahman wells up in that superconscious state. Space disappears into nothingness, time is swallowed in eternity, and causation becomes a dream of the past. Only existence is. Ah! Who can describe what the soul then feels in its communion with the self? Even when man descends from this dizzy height, he is devoid of ideas of I and mine. He looks on the body as a mere shadow, an outer sheath encasing the soul. He does not dwell on the past, takes no thought for the future, and looks with indifference on the present. He surveys everything in the world with an eye of equality. He is no longer touched by the infinite variety of phenomena. He no longer reacts to pleasure and pain. He remains unmoved whether he that is to say, his body is worshipped by the good or tormented by the wicked, for he realizes that it is the one Brahman that manifests itself through everything. The impact of such an experience devastates the body and mind. Consciousness becomes blasted, as it were, with an excess of light. In the Vedanta books, it is said that after the experience of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, the body drops off like a dry leaf. 
Only those who are born with a special mission for the world can return from this height to the valleys of normal life. They live and move in the world for the welfare of mankind. They are invested with a supreme spiritual power. A divine glory shines through them. Totapuri. Totapuri arrived at the Dakshans or Temple Garden toward the end of 1864. Perhaps born in the Punjab, he was the head of a monastery in that province of India and claimed leadership of 700 sannyasis. Trained from early youth in the disciplines of the Advaita Vedanta, he looked upon the world as an illusion. The gods and goddesses of the dualistic worship were to him mere fantasies of the deluded mind. Prayers, ceremonies, rites, and rituals had nothing to do with true religion, and about these he was utterly indifferent. Exercising self-exertion and unshakable willpower, he had liberated himself from attachment to the sense objects of the relative universe. For forty years he had practiced austere discipline on the bank of the sacred Narmada, and had finally realized his identity with the Absolute. Thenceforward he roamed in the world as an unfettered soul, a lion free from the cage. Clad in a loincloth, he spent his days under the canopy of the sky alike in storm and sunshine, feeding his body on the slender pittance of alms. He had been visiting the estuary of the Ganges. On his return journey along the bank of the sacred river, led by the inscrutable divine will, he stopped at Dakshin's war. Totapuri, discovering at once that Sri Ramakrishna was prepared to be a student of Vedanta, asked to initiate him into its mysteries. With the permission of the Divine Mother, Sri Ramakrishna agreed to the proposal. But Totapuri explained that only a sannyasi could receive the teaching of Vedanta. Sri Ramakrishna agreed to renounce the world, but with the stipulation that the ceremony of his initiation into the monastic order be performed in secret to spare the feelings of his old mother, who had been living with him at Dakshin's war. On the appointed day, in the small hours of the morning, a fire was lighted in the Panchavati. Todapuri and Sri Ramakrishna sat before it. The flame played on their faces. Ramakrishna was a small brown man with a short beard and beautiful eyes, long dark eyes, full of light, obliquely set and slightly veiled, never very wide open, but seeing half closed a great distance both outwardly and inwardly. His mouth was open over his white teeth in a bewitching smile, at once affectionate and mischievous. Of medium height he was thin to emaciation and extremely delicate. His temperament was high-strung, for he was super-sensitive to all the winds of joy and sorrow, both moral and physical. He was indeed a living reflection of all that happened before the mirror of his eyes, a two-sided mirror, turned both out and in. Facing him, the other rose like a rock. He was very tall and robust, a sturdy and tough oak. His constitution and mind were of iron. He was the strong leader of men. In the burning flame before him Sri Ramakrishna performed the rituals of destroying his attachment to relatives, friends, body, mind, sense organs, ego, and the world. The leaping flame swallowed it all, making the initiate free and pure. The sacred thread and the tuft of hair were consigned to the fire, completing his severance from caste, sex, and society. Last of all he burnt in that fire, with all that is holy as his witness, his desire for enjoyment here and hereafter. He uttered the sacred mantras giving assurance of safety and fearlessness to all beings who were only manifestations of his own self. The rites completed, the disciple received from the guru the loincloth and ochre robe, the emblems of his new life. The teacher and the disciple repaired to the meditation room nearby. Todapuri began to impart to Sri Ramakrishna the great truths of Vedanta. Brahman, he said, is the only reality, ever pure, ever illumined, ever free beyond the limits of time, space, and causation. Though apparently divided by names and forms through the inscrutable power of Maya, that enchantress who makes the impossible possible, Brahman is really one and undivided. When a seeker merges in the beatitude of Samadhi, he does not perceive time and space or name and form, the offspring of Maya. Whatever is within the domain of Maya is unreal. Give it up. Destroy the prison house of name and form and rush out of it with the strength of a lion. 
dive deep in search of the self and realize it through samadhi. You will find the world of name and form vanishing into void, and the puny ego dissolving in Brahman consciousness. You will realize your identity with Brahman existence knowledge bliss absolute. Quoting the Upanishad, Todapuri said that knowledge is shallow by which one sees or hears or knows another. What is shallow is worthless and can never give real felicity. But the knowledge by which one does not see another or hear another or know another, which is beyond duality, is great, and through such knowledge one attains the infinite bliss. How can the mind and senses grasp that which shines in the heart of all as the eternal subject? Todapuri asked the disciple to withdraw his mind from all objects of relative world, including the gods and goddesses, and to concentrate on the Absolute. But the task was not easy even for Sri Ramakrishna. He found it impossible to take his mind beyond Kali, the Divine Mother of the Universe. After the initiation, Sri Ramakrishna once said, describing the event, Nangta began to teach me the various conclusions of the Advaita Vedanta and asked me to withdraw the mind completely from all objects and dive deep into the Atman. But in spite of all my attempts, I could not altogether cross the realm of name and form and bring my mind to the unconditioned state. I had no difficulty in taking the mind from all the objects of the world. But the radiant and too familiar figure of the Blissful Mother, the embodiment of the essence of pure consciousness, appeared before me as a living reality. Her bewitching smile prevented me from passing into the great beyond. Again and again I tried, but she stood in my way every time. In despair I said to Nangta, It is hopeless. I cannot raise my mind to the unconditioned state and come face to face with Atman. He grew excited and sharply said, What? You can't do it? But you have to. He cast his eyes around. Finding a piece of glass, he took it up and stuck it between my eyebrows. Concentrate the mind on this point. He thundered. Then with stern determination I again sat to meditate. As soon as the gracious form of the Divine Mother appeared before me, I used my discrimination as a sword and with it clove her in two. The last barrier fell. My spirit at once soared beyond the relative plane and I lost myself in Samadhi. Sri Ramakrishna remained completely absorbed in Samadhi for three days. Is it really true? Todapuri cried out in astonishment. Is it possible that he has attained in a single day what it took me forty years of strenuous practice to achieve? Great God! It is nothing short of a miracle. With the help of Todapuri, Sri Ramakrishna's mind finally came down to the relative plane. Todapuri, a monk of the most orthodox type, never stayed at a place more than three days. But he remained at Dakshin's for eleven months. He too had something to learn. Todapuri had no idea of the struggles of ordinary men and the toils of passion and desire. Having maintained all through life the guilelessness of a child, he laughed at the idea of a man's being led astray by the senses. He was convinced that the world was Maya and had only to be denounced to vanish forever. A born non-dualist, he had no faith in a personal god. He did not believe in the terrible aspect of Kali, much less in her benign aspect. Music and the chanting of God's holy name were to him only so much nonsense. He ridiculed the spending of emotion on the worship of a personal God. Kali and Maya Sri Ramakrishna on the other hand, though fully aware, like his guru, that the world is an illusory appearance, instead of slighting Maya like an orthodox monist acknowledged its power in their relative life. He was all love and reverence for Maya, perceiving in it a mysterious and majestic expression of divinity. To him Maya itself was God, for everything was God. It was one of the faces of Brahman. What he had realized on the heights of the transcendental plane, he also found here below, everywhere about him, under the mysterious garb of names and forms. And this garb was a perfectly transparent sheath, through which he recognized the glory of the divine immanence. Maya, the mighty weaver of the garb, is none other than Kali, the Divine Mother. She is the primordial divine energy, Sakti, and she can no more be distinguished from the Supreme Brahman than can the power of burning be distinguished from fire. She projects the world and again withdraws it. She spins it as the spider spins its web. 
She is the mother of the universe, identical with the Brahman of Vedanta and with the Atman of Yoga. As eternal lawgiver, she makes and unmakes laws. It is by her imperious will that karma yields its fruit. She ensnares men with illusion and again releases them from bondage with a look of her benign eyes. She is the supreme mistress of the cosmic play, and all objects animate and inanimate dance by her will. Even those who realize the absolute in Nirvikalpa Samad, he are under her jurisdiction as long as they still live on the relative plane. Thus after Nirvikalpa Samadhi, Sri Ramakrishna realized Maya in an altogether new role. The binding aspect of Kali vanished from before his vision. He no longer obscured his understanding. The world became a glorious manifestation of the Divine Mother. Maya became Brahman. Transcendental itself broke through the Amanan. Sri Ramakrishna discovered that Maya operates in the relative world in two ways, and he termed these Avidya Maya and Vidya Maya. Avidya Maya represents the dark forces of creation. Sensuous desires, evil passions, greed, lust, cruelty, and so on. It sustains the world system on the lower planes. It is responsible for the round of man's birth and death. It must be fought and vanquished. But Vidya Maya is the higher force of creation, the spiritual virtues, the enlightening qualities, kindness, purity, love, devotion. Vidya Maya elevates man to the higher planes of consciousness. With the help of Vidya, Maya the devotee rids himself of Avidya Maya, he then becomes Maya Taita, free of Maya. The two aspects of Maya are the two forces of creation, the two powers of Kali, and she stands beyond them both. She is like the effulgent sun, bringing into existence and shining through and standing behind the clouds of different colors and shapes, conjuring up wonderful forms in the blue autumn heaven. The Divine Mother asked Sri Ramakrishna not to be lost in the featureless Absolute but to remain in Bhavamukha, on the threshold of relative consciousness, the borderline between the Absolute and the Relative. He was to keep himself at the sixth center of Tantra, from which he could see not only the glory of the seventh, but also the divine manifestations of the Kundalini in the lower centers. He gently oscillated back and forth across the dividing line. Ecstatic devotion to the Divine Mother alternated with serene absorption in the ocean of absolute unity. He thus bridged the gulf between the personal and the impersonal, the immanent and the transcendent aspects of reality. This is a unique experience in the recorded spiritual history of the world. Todapuri's Lesson From Sri Ramakrishna Todapuri had to learn the significance of Kali, the great fact of the relative world, and of Maya, her indescribable power. One day when Kuru and disciple were engaged in an animated discussion about Vedanta, a servant of the temple garden came there and took a coal from the sacred fire that had been lighted by the great ascetic. He wanted it to light his tobacco. Todapiri flew into a rage and was about to beat the man. Sri Ramakrishna rocked with laughter. What a shame! He cried. You are explaining to me the reality of Brahman and the illusoriness of the world, yet now you have so far forgotten yourself as to be about to beat a man in a fit of passion. The power of Maya is indeed inscrutable. Todapiri was embarrassed. About this time Todapiri was suddenly laid up with a severe attack of dysentery. On account of this miserable illness, he found it impossible to meditate. One night the pain became excruciating. He could no longer concentrate on Brahman. But he stood in the way. He became incensed with its demands. A free soul, he did not at all care for the body. So he determined to drown it in the Ganges. Thereupon he walked into the river. But lo! He walks to the other bank. Is there not enough water in the Ganges? Standing dumbfounded on the other bank, he looks back across the water. The trees, the temples, the houses are silhouetted against the sky. Suddenly, in one dazzling moment, he sees on all sides the presence of the Divine Mother. She is in everything, she is everything. She is in the water, she is on land. She is the body, she is the mind. She is pain, she is comfort. She is knowledge, she is ignorance. She is life, she is death. She is everything that one sees, hears, or imagines. 
she turns yea into nay and nay into yea. Without her grace no embodied being can go beyond her realm. Man has no free will. He is not even free to die. Yet, again, beyond the body and mind she resides in her transcendental absolute aspect. She is the Brahman that Todapuri had been worshipping all his life. Todapuri returned to Dakshin's war and spent the remaining hours of the night meditating on the Divine Mother. In the morning he went to the Kali temple with Sri Ramakrishna and prostrated himself before the image of the Mother. He now realized why he had spent eleven months at Dakshin's war. Bidding farewell to the disciple he continued on his way in Lighten. Sri Ramakrishna later described the significance of Todapuri's lessons. When I think of the Supreme Being as an active neither creating nor preserving nor destroying, I call him Brahman or Purusha, the impersonal God. When I think of him as active creating, preserving and destroying, I call him Sakti or Maya or Prakriti, the personal God. But the distinction between them does not mean a difference. The personal and the impersonal are the same thing, like milk and its whiteness, the diamond and its luster, the snake and its wriggling motion. It is impossible to conceive of the one without the other. The Divine Mother and Brahman are one. After the departure of Todapuri, Sri Ramakrishna remained for six months in a state of absolute identity with Brahman. For six months at a stretch, he said, I remained in that state from which ordinary men can never return. Generally the body falls off after three weeks like a sear leaf. I was not conscious of day and night. Flies would enter my mouth and nostrils just as they do a dead body's, but I did not feel them. My hair became matted with dust. His body would not have survived but for the kindly attention of a monk who happened to be at Dakshin's war at that time, and who somehow realized that for the good of humanity Sri Ramakrishna's body must be preserved. He tried various means, even physical violence, to recall the fleeing soul to the prison house of the body, and during the resultant fleeting moments of consciousness he would push a few morsels of food down Sri Ramakrishna's throat. Presently Sri Ramakrishna received the command of the Divine Mother to remain on the threshold of relative consciousness. Soon thereafter he was afflicted with a serious attack of dysentery. Day and night the pain tortured him, and his mind gradually came down to the physical plane. Company of Holy Men and Devotees from now on Sri Ramakrishna began to seek the company of devotees and holy men. He had gone through the storm and stress of spiritual disciplines and visions. Now he realized an inner calmness and appeared to others as a normal person. But he could not bear the company of worldly people or listen to their talk. Fortunately the holy atmosphere of Dakshin's war and the liberality of Mathur attracted monks and holy men from all parts of the country. Sadists of all denominations, monists and dualists, Vaishnavas and Vedantists, Saktas and worshippers of Rama flock there in ever-increasing numbers. Ascetics and visionaries came to seek Sri Ramakrishna's advice. Vaishnavas had come during the period of his Vaishnava Sadhana and Tantrics when he practiced the disciplines of Tantra. Vedantists began to arrive after the departure of Todapuri. In the room of Sri Ramakrishna, who was then in bed with dysentery, the Vedantists engaged in scriptural discussions, and forgetting his own physical suffering, he solved their doubts by referring directly to his own experiences. Many of the visitors were genuine spiritual souls, the unseen pillars of Hinduism, and their spiritual lives were quickened in no small measure by the sage of Dakshin's war. Sri Ramakrishna in turn learned from them anecdotes concerning the ways and the conduct of holy men, which he subsequently narrated to his devotees and disciples. At his request Mathur provided him with large stores of foodstuffs, clothes and so forth for distribution among the wandering monks. Sri Ramakrishna had not read books, yet he possessed an encyclopedic knowledge of religions and religious philosophies. This he acquired from his contacts with innumerable holy men and scholars. He had a unique power of assimilation. Through meditation he made this knowledge a part of his being. Once when he was asked by a disciple about the source of his seemingly inexhaustible knowledge he replied, I have not read, but I have heard the learned. I have made a garland of their knowledge, wearing it round my neck, and I have given it as an offering at the feet of the mother. 
Sri Ramakrishna used to say that when the flower blooms the bees come to it for honey of their own accord. Now many souls began to visit Dakshins, or to satisfy their spiritual hunger. He, the devotee and aspirant, became the master. Gauri, the great scholar who had been one of the first to proclaim Sri Ramakrishna, an incarnation of God, paid the master a visit in 1870, and with the master's blessings renounced the world. Narayan Sastri, another great pundit, who had mastered the six systems of Hindu philosophy and had been offered a lucrative post by the Maharaja of Jaipur, met the master and recognized in him one who had realized in life those ideals which he himself had encountered merely in books. Sri Ramakrishna initiated Narayan Sastri, at his earnest request, into the life of Sanyas. Pundit Padmalakshan, the court pundit of the Maharaja of Burdwan, well known for his scholarship in both the Vedanta and the Nyaya systems of philosophy, accepted the Master as an incarnation of God. Krishna Kishore, a Vedantist scholar, became devoted to the Master. And there arrived Viswanath Upadhyaya, who was to become a favorite devotee. Sri Ramakrishna always addressed him as captain. He was a high officer of the King of Nepal and had received the title of colonel in recognition of his merit. A scholar of the Gita, the Bhagavata, and the Vedanta philosophy, he daily performed the worship of his chosen deity with great devotion. I have read the Vedas and the other scriptures, he said. I have also met a good many monks and devotees in different places. But it is in Sri Ramakrishna's presence that my spiritual yearnings have been fulfilled. To me he seems to be the embodiment of the truths of the scriptures. The knowledge of Brahman in Nirvikalpa Samad he had convinced Sri Ramakrishna that the gods of the different religions are but so many readings of the Absolute and that the ultimate reality could never be expressed by human tongue. He understood that all religions lead their devotees by differing paths to one and the same goal. Now he became eager to explore some of the alien religions, for with him understanding meant actual experience. Islam Toward the end of 1866 he began to practice the disciplines of Islam. Under the direction of his Muslim and guru he abandoned himself to his new sadhana. He dressed as a Muslim and repeated the name of Allah. His prayers took the form of the Islamic devotions. He forgot the Hindu gods and goddesses even Kali and gave up visiting the temples. He took up his residence outside the temple precincts. After three days he saw the vision of a radiant figure, perhaps Muhammad. This figure gently approached him and finally lost himself in Sri Ramakrishna. Thus he realized the Muslim God. Thence he passed into communion with Brahman. The mighty river of Islam also led him back to the ocean of the Absolute. Christianity Eight years later, sometime in November 1874, Sri Ramakrishna was seized with an irresistible desire to learn the truth of the Christian religion. He began to listen to readings from the Bible by Sambucharan Malik, a gentleman of Calcutta and a devotee of the Master. Sri Ramakrishna became fascinated by the life and teachings of Jesus. One day he was seated in the parlor of Jadu Malik's garden house at Dakshinswar when his eyes became fixed on a painting of the Madonna and Child. Intently watching it, he became gradually overwhelmed with divine emotion. The figures in the picture took on life, and the rays of light emanating from them entered his soul. The effect of this experience was stronger than that of the vision of Muhammad. In dismay he cried out, O oh mother, what are you doing to me? And breaking through the barriers of creed and religion, he entered a new realm of ecstasy. Christ possessed his soul. For three days he did not set foot in the Kali temple. On the fourth day, in the afternoon, as he was walking in the Panchavati, he saw coming toward him a person with beautiful large eyes, serene countenance and fair skin. As the two faced each other, a voice rang out in the depths of Sri Ramakrishna's soul, Behold the Christ who shed his heart's blood for the redemption of the world, who suffered a sea of anguish for love of men. It is he, the master yogi, who is in eternal union with God. It is Jesus, love incarnate. The Son of Man embraced the Son of the Divine Mother and merged in him. 
Sri Ramakrishna realized his identity with Christ as he had already realized his identity with Kali, Rama, Hanuman, Radha, Krishna, Brahman, and Muhammad. The master went into Samadhi and communed with the Brahman with attributes. Thus he experienced the truth that Christianity too was a path leading to God consciousness. Till the last moment of his life he believed that Christ was an incarnation of God. But Christ for him was not the only incarnation. There were others Buddha for instance and Krishna. Attitude toward different religions. Sri Ramakrishna accepted the divinity of Buddha and used to point out the similarity of his teachings to those of the Upanishads. He also showed great respect for the Tirthankaras, who founded Jainism, and for the ten gurus of Sikhism. But he did not speak of them as divine incarnations. He was heard to say that the gurus of Sikhism were the reincarnations of King Danaka of ancient India. He kept in his room at Dakshans where a small statue of Tirthankara Mahavira, and a picture of Christ, before which incense was burnt morning and evening. Without being formally initiated into their doctrines, Sri Ramakrishna thus realized the ideals of religions other than Hinduism. He did not need to follow any doctrine. All barriers were removed by his overwhelming love of God. So he became a master who could speak with authority regarding the ideas and ideals of the various religions of the world. I have practiced, said he, all religions Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, and I have also followed the paths of the different Hindu sects. I have found that it is the same God toward whom all are directing their steps, though along different paths. You must try all beliefs and traverse all the different ways once. Wherever I look I see men quarreling in the name of religion Hindus, Mohammedans, Brahmos, Vaish, Navas, and the rest. But they never reflect that he who is called Krishna is also called Shiva, and bears the name of the primal energy, Jesus, and Allah, as well the same Rama with a thousand names. A lake has several jihats. At one the Hindus take water in pitchers and call it jowl. At another, the Muslims take water in leather bags and call it pani. At a third, the Christians call it water. Can we imagine that it is not jowl, but only pani or water? How ridiculous! The substance is one under different names and everyone is seeking the same substance. Only climate, temperament, and name create differences. Let each man follow his own path. If he sincerely and ardently wishes to know God, peace be unto him. He will surely realize him. In 1867, Sri Ramakrishna returned to Kamarpukar to recuperate from the effect of his austerities. The peaceful countryside, the simple and artless companions of his boyhood, and the pure air did him much good. The villagers were happy to get back their playful, frank, witty, kind-hearted, and truthful gad at heart though they did not fail to notice the great change that had come over him during his years in Calcutta. His wife Sarada Divi, now fourteen years old, soon arrived at Kamarpukar. Her spiritual development was much beyond her age, and she was able to understand immediately her husband's state of mind. She became eager to learn from him about God and to live with him as his attendant. The master accepted her cheerfully both as his disciple and as his spiritual companion. Referring to the experiences of these few days, she once said, I used to feel always as if a pitcher full of bliss were placed in my heart. The joy was indescribable. Pilgrimage On January 27, 1868, Mathur Babu with a party of some 125 persons set out on a pilgrimage to the sacred places of northern India. At Vaidyanath in Bihar, when the master saw the inhabitants of a village reduced by poverty and starvation to mere skeletons, he requested his rich patron to feed the people and give each a piece of cloth. Mathur demurred at the added expense. The master declared bitterly that he would not go on to Banaras, but would live with the poor and share their miseries. He actually left Mather and sat down with the villagers. Whereupon Mather had to yield. On another occasion, two years later, Sri Ramakrishna showed a similar sentiment for the poor and needy. He accompanied Mather on a tour to one of the latter's estates at the time of the collection of rents. For two years the harvests had failed and the tenants were in a state of extreme poverty. 
The master asked Mather to remit their rents, distribute help to them, and in addition give the hungry people a sumptuous feast. When Mather grumbled, the master said, You are only the steward of the Divine Mother. They are the mother's tenants. You must spend the mother's money. When they are suffering, how can you refuse to help them? You must help them. Again Mather had to give in. Sri Ramakrishna's sympathy for the poor sprang from his perception of God in all created beings. His sentiment was not that of the humanist or philanthropist. To him the service of man was the same as the worship of God. The party entered holy Benares by boat along the Ganges. When Sri Ramakrishna's eyes fell on this city of Shiva, where had accumulated for ages the devotion and piety of countless worshippers, he saw it to be made of gold, as the scriptures declare. He was visibly moved. During his stay in the city he treated every particle of its earth with utmost respect. At the Manikarnika Ghat, the great cremation ground of the city, he actually saw Shiva, with ash-covered body and tawny matted hair, serenely approaching each funeral pyre and breathing into the ears of the corpses the mantra of liberation, and then the Divine Mother removing from the dead their bonds. Thus he realized the significance of the scriptural statement that anyone dying in Benares attained salvation through the grace of Shiva. He paid a visit to Trilanga Swami, the celebrated monk whom he later declared to be a real Paramahamsa, a veritable image of Shiva. Sri Ramakrishna visited Allahabad at the confluence of the Ganges and the Jamuna, and then proceeded to Vrindavan and Mathura, hallowed by the legends, songs and dramas about Krishna and the gopis. Here he had numerous visions and his heart overflowed with divine emotion. He wept and said, O oh Krishna! Everything here is as it was in the olden days. You alone are absent. He visited the great woman Saint Ganga May, regarded by Vaish, Nava devotees as the reincarnation of an intimate attendant of Radha. She was sixty years old and had frequent trances. She spoke of Sri Ramakrishna as an incarnation of Radha. With great difficulty he was persuaded to leave her. On the return journey Mathur wanted to visit Gaya, but Sri Ramakrishna declined to go. He recalled his father's vision at Gaya before his own birth and felt that in the temple of Vishnu he would become permanently absorbed in God. Mathur, honoring the master's wish, returned with his party to Calcutta. From Vrindavan the master had brought a handful of dust. Part of this he scattered in the Panchavati, the rest he buried in the little hut where he had practiced meditation. Now this place, he said, is as sacred as Vrindavan. In 1870 the master went on a pilgrimage to Nadia, the birthplace of Sri Chaitanya. As the boat by which he traveled approached the sand bank close to Nadia, Sri Ramakrishna had a vision of the two brothers, Sri Chaitanya and his companion Nityananda, bright as molten gold and with halos, rushing to greet him with uplifted hands. There they come! There they come! He cried. They entered his body and he went into a deep trance. Relation with his wife In 1872, Sarada Devi paid her first visit to her husband at Dakshinswar. Four years earlier she had seen him at Kamarpukur and had tasted the bliss of his divine company. Since then she had become even more gentle, tender, introspective, serious and unselfish. He had heard many rumors about her husband's insanity. People had shown her pity in her misfortune. The more she thought, the more she felt that her duty was to be with him, giving him, in whatever measure she could, a wife's devoted service. She was now eighteen years old. Accompanied by her father, she arrived at Dakshinswar having come on foot the distance of eighty miles. She had had an attack of fever on the way. When she arrived at the temple garden the master said sorrowfully, Ah! You have come too late. My Mather is no longer here to look after you. Mather had passed away the previous year. The master took up the duty of instructing his young wife, and this included everything from housekeeping to the knowledge of Brahman. He taught her how to trim a lamp, how to behave toward people according to their differing temperaments, and how to conduct herself before visitors. He instructed her in the mysteries of spiritual life prayer, meditation, japa, deep contemplation, and samadhi. The first lesson that Sarada Devi received was, 
God is everybody's beloved, just as the moon is dear to every child. Everyone has the same right to pray to him. Out of his grace he reveals himself to all who call upon him. You too will see him if you but pray to him. Totapuri, coming to know of the master's marriage, had once remarked, What does it matter? He alone is firmly established in the knowledge of Brahman who can adhere to his spirit of discrimination and renunciation, even while living with his wife. He alone has attained the supreme illumination who can look on man and woman alike as Brahman. A man with the idea of sex may be a good aspirant, but he is still far from the goal. Sri Ramakrishna and his wife live together at Dakshin's war, but their minds always soared above the worldly plane. A few months after Sarada Divi's arrival Sri Ramakrishna arranged on an auspicious day, a special worship of Kali, the Divine Mother. Instead of an image of the deity, he placed on the seat the living image, Sarada Divi herself. The worshipper and the worshipped went into deep samadhi and in the transcendental plane their souls were united. After several hours Sri Ramakrishna came down again to the relative plane, sang a hymn to the great goddess, and surrendered at the feet of the living image himself, his rosary and the fruit of his lifelong sadhana. This is known in Tantra as the Shadasi Puja, the adoration of woman. Sri Ramakrishna realized the significance of the great statement of the Upanishad, O Lord Thou art the woman, Thou art the man, Thou art the boy, Thou art the girl, Thou art the old, tottering on their crutches. Thou pervadest the universe in its multiple forms. By his marriage Sri Ramakrishna admitted the great value of marriage in man's spiritual evolution, and by adhering to his monastic vows he demonstrated the imperative necessity of self-control, purity, and continence in the realization of God. By his unique spiritual relationship with his wife he proved that husband and wife can live together as spiritual companions. Thus his life is a synthesis of the ways of life of the householder and the monk. The Ego of the Master in the Nirvikalpa Samad, he Sri Ramakrishna had realized that Brahman alone is real and the world illusory. By keeping his mind six months on the plane of the non-dual Brahman, he had attained to the state of the Vijani, the knower of truth in a special and very rich sense, who sees Brahman not only in himself and in the transcendental absolute, but in everything of the world. In this state of vijana, sometimes bereft of body consciousness, he would regard himself as one with Brahman. Sometimes conscious of the dual world, he would regard himself as God's devotee, servant or child. In order to enable the Master to work for the welfare of humanity, the Divine Mother had kept in him a trace of ego, which he described according to his mood as the ego of knowledge, the ego of devotion, the ego of a child, or the ego of a servant. In any case this ego of the master consumed by the fire of the knowledge of Brahman was an appearance only like a burnt string. He often referred to this ego as the ripe ego in contrast with the ego of the bound soul, which he described as the unripe or green ego. The ego of the bound soul identifies itself with the body, relatives, possessions, and the world. But the ripe ego illumined by divine knowledge knows the body, relatives, possessions, and the world to be unreal and establishes a relationship of love with God alone. Through this ripe ego Sri Ramakrishna dealt with the world and his wife. One day, while stroking his feet Sarada Devi asked the master, What do you think of me? Quick came the answer. The mother who is worshipped in the temple is the mother who has given birth to my body and is now living in the Nahabat, and it is she again who is stroking my feet at this moment. Indeed, I always look on you as the personification of the blissful mother Kali. Sarada Divi in the company of her husband had rare spiritual experiences. She said, I have no words to describe my wonderful exaltation of spirit as I watched him in his different moods. Under the influence of divine emotion he would sometimes talk on abstruse subjects, sometimes laugh, sometimes weep, and sometimes become perfectly motionless in samadhi. This would continue throughout the night. There was such an extraordinary divine presence in him that now and then I would shake with fear and wonder how the night would pass. Months went by in this way. Then one day he discovered that I had to keep awake the whole night lest, 
during my sleep, he should go into samadhi for it might happen at any moment, and so he asked me to sleep in the Nahabat. Summary of the Master's Spiritual Experiences We have now come to the end of Sri Ramakrishna's Sadhana, the period of his spiritual discipline. As a result of his supersensuous experiences he reached certain conclusions regarding himself and spirituality in general. His conclusions about himself may be summarized as follows. First, he was an incarnation of God, a specially commissioned person, whose spiritual experiences were for the benefit of humanity. Whereas it takes an ordinary man a whole life struggle to realize one or two phases of God, he had in a few years realized God in all his phases. Second, he knew that he had always been a free soul, that the various disciplines through which he had passed were really not necessary for his own liberation, but were solely for the benefit of others. Thus the terms liberation and bondage were not applicable to him. As long as there are beings who consider themselves bound, God must come down to earth as an incarnation to free them from bondage, just as a magistrate must visit any part of his district in which there is trouble. Third, he came to foresee the time of his death. His words with respect to this matter were literally fulfilled. About spirituality in general the following were his conclusions. First, he was firmly convinced that all religions are true, that every doctrinal system represents a path to God. He had followed all the main paths, and all had led him to the same goal. He was the first religious prophet recorded in history to preach the harmony of religions. Second, the three great systems of thought known as dualism, qualified non-dualism, and absolute non-dualism Devaita, Visish, Hedvaita, and Advaita he perceived to represent three stages in man's progress toward the ultimate reality. They were not contradictory but complementary and suited to different temperaments. For the ordinary man with strong attachment to the senses, a dualistic form of religion, prescribing a certain amount of material support, such as music and other symbols, is useful. A man of God realization transcends the idea of worldly duties, but the ordinary mortal must perform his duties, striving to be unattached and to surrender the results to God. The mind can comprehend and describe the range of thought and experience up to the Visist Advaita and no further. The Advaita, the last word in spiritual experience, is something to be felt in samadhi, for it transcends mind and speech. From the highest standpoint, the Absolute and its manifestation are equally real the Lord's name, His abode, and the Lord Himself are of the same spiritual essence. Everything is spirit, the difference being only in form. Third, Sri Ramakrishna realized the wish of the Divine Mother that through him she should found a new order, consisting of those who would uphold the universal doctrines illustrated in his life. Fourth, his spiritual insight told him that those who were having their last birth on the mortal plane of existence, and those who had sincerely called on the Lord even once in their lives must come to him. During this period Sri Ramakrishna suffered several bereavements. The first was the death of a nephew named Akshay. After the young man's death Sri Ramakrishna said, Akshay died before my very eyes. But it did not affect me in the least. I stood by and watched a man die. It was like a sword being drawn from its scabbard. I enjoyed the scene and laughed and sang and danced over it. They removed the body and cremated it. But the next day as I stood there pointing to the southeast veranda of his room, I felt a racking pain for the loss of Akshay as if somebody were squeezing my heart like a wet towel. I wondered at it and thought that the mother was teaching me a lesson. I was not much concerned even with my own body much less with a relative. But if such was my pain at the loss of a nephew, how much more must be the grief of the householders at the loss of their near and dear ones. In 1871 Mathur died, and some five years later Sambhu Malik, who after Mathur's passing away, had taken care of the master's comfort. In 1873 died his elder brother Ramswar, and in 1876 his beloved mother. These bereavements left their imprint on the tender human heart of Sri Ramakrishna, albeit he had realized the immortality of the soul and the illusoriness of birth and death. In March 1875, about a year before the death of his mother, the master met Keshab Chandra Sen. 
The meeting was a momentous event for both Sri Ramakrishna and Keshav. Here the master for the first time came into actual contact with a worthy representative of modern India. Brahmo Samaj Keshab was the leader of the Brahmo Samaj, one of the two great movements that, during the latter part of the 19th century, played an important part in shaping the course of the Renaissance of India. Founder of the Brahmo movement had been the great Roger Ramohan Roy 1007, 174 1833. Though born in an orthodox Brahmin family, Ramohan Roy had shown great sympathy for Islam and Christianity. He had gone to Tibet in search of the Buddhist mysteries. He had extracted from Christianity its ethical system, but had rejected the divinity of Christ as he had denied the Hindu incarnations. The religion of Islam influenced him, to a great extent, in the formulation of his monotheistic doctrines. But he always went back to the Vedas for his spiritual inspiration. The Brahmo Samaj, which he founded in 1828, was dedicated to the worship and adoration of the Eternal, the Unsearchable, the Immutable Being, who is the author and preserver of the universe. The Samaj was open to all without distinction of color, creed, caste, nation, or religion. The real organizer of the Samaj was Devendranath Tagore 1817-1905, the father of the poet Rabindranath. His physical and spiritual beauty, aristocratic aloofness, penetrating intellect, and poetic sensibility made him the foremost leader of the educated Bengalis. These addressed him by the respectful epithet of Maharshi the Great Seer. The Maharshi was a Sanskrit scholar and unlike Roger Ramohan Roy drew his inspiration entirely from the Upanishads. He was an implacable enemy of image worship and also fought to stop the infiltration of Christian ideas into the Samaj. He gave the movement its faith and ritual. Under his influence the Brahmo Samaj professed one self-existent supreme being who had created the universe out of nothing, the God of truth, infinite wisdom, goodness and power, the eternal and omnipotent, the one without a second. Man should love him and do his will, believe in him and worship him, and thus merit salvation in the world to come. By far the ablest leader of the Brahmo movement was Kesh Chandra Sen, 1838-1884. Unlike Raja Ramohan Roy and Devendranath Tagore, Keshab was born of a middle-class Bengali family and had been brought up in an English school. He did not know Sanskrit and very soon broke away from the popular Hindu religion. Even at an early age he came under the spell of Christ and professed to have experienced the special favor of John the Baptist, Christ, and St. Paul. When he strove to introduce Christ to the Brahmo Samaj, a rupture became inevitable with Devendranath. In 1868 Kesha broke with the older leader and founded the Brahmo Samaj of India, Devendra retaining leadership of the first Brahmo Samaj, now called the Adi Samaj. Kesha possessed a complex nature. When passing through a great moral crisis, he spent much of his time in solitude and felt that he heard the voice of God. When a devotional form of worship was introduced into the Brahmo Samaj, he spent hours in singing curtain with his followers. He visited England in 1870 and impressed the English people with his musical voice, his simple English, and his spiritual fervor. He was entertained by Queen Victoria. Returning to India, he founded centers of the Brahmo Samaj in various parts of the country. Not unlike a professor of comparative religion in a European university, he began to discover, about the time of his first contact with Sri Ramakrishna, the harmony of religions. He became sympathetic toward the Hindu gods and goddesses, explaining them in a liberal fashion. Further, he believed that he was called by God to dictate to the world God's newly revealed law, the new dispensation, the Navavitan. In 1878, a schism divided Keshab Samaj. Some of his influential followers accused him of infringing the Brahmo principles by marrying his daughter to a wealthy man before she had attained the marriageable age approved by the Samaj. This group seceded and established the Sadharan Brahmo Samaj, Keshab remaining the leader of the Navavidhan. Keshab now began to be drawn more and more toward the Christ ideal, 
though under the influence of Sri Ramakrishna, his devotion to the Divine Mother also deepened. His mental oscillation between Christ and the Divine Mother of Hinduism found no position of rest. In Bengal and some other parts of India, the Brahmo movement took the form of Unitarian Christianity, scoffed at Hindu rituals, and preached a crusade against image worship. Influenced by Western culture, it declared the supremacy of reason, advocated the ideals of the French Revolution, abolished the caste system among its own members, stood for the emancipation of women, agitate for the abolition of early marriage, sanctioned the remarriage of widows, and encouraged various educational and social reform movements. The immediate effect of the Brahma movement in Bengal was the checking of the proselytizing activities of the Christian missionaries. It also raised Indian culture in the estimation of its English masters. It was an intellectual and eclectic religious ferment born of the necessity of the time. Unlike Hinduism, it was not founded on the deep inner experiences of sages and prophets. Its influence was confined to a comparatively few educated men and women of the country, and the vast masses of the Hindus remained outside it. It sounded monotonously only one of the notes in the rich gamut of the eternal religion of the Hindus. Arya Samaj the other movement playing an important part in the 19th century religious revival of India was the Arya Samaj. The Brahmo Samaj, essentially a movement of compromise with European culture, tacitly admitted the superiority of the West. But the founder of the Arya Samaj was a pugnacious Hindu sannyasi who accepted the challenge of Islam and Christianity, and was resolved to combat all foreign influence in India. Swami Dayananda 1824-1883 launched this movement in Bombay in 1875, and soon its influence was felt throughout western India. The Swami was a great scholar of the Vedas, which he explained as being strictly monotheistic. He preached against the worship of images and established the ancient Vedic sacrificial rites. According to him the Vedas were the ultimate authority on religion, and he accepted every word of them as literally true. The R.E.S. Samaj became a bulwark against the encroachments of Islam and Christianity, and its orthodox flavor appealed to many Hindu minds. It also assumed leadership in many movements of social reform. The caste system became a target of its attack. Women it liberated from many of their social disabilities. Cause of education received from it a great impetus. It started agitation against early marriage and advocated the remarriage of Hindu widows. Its influence was strongest in the Punjab, the battleground of the Hindu and Islamic cultures. A new fighting attitude was introduced into the slumbering Hindu society. Unlike the Brahmo Samaj, the influence of the Arya Samaj was not confined to the intellectuals. It was a force that spread to the masses. It was a dogmatic movement intolerant of those disagreed with its views, and it emphasized only one way, the Arya Samaj way, to the realization of truth. Sri Ramakrishna met Swami Dayananda when the latter visited Bengal. Keshab Chandra Sen Keshab Chandra Sen and Sri Ramakrishna met for the first time in the garden house of Jagapal Sen at Bulgaria, a few miles from Dakshin's war where the great Brahma leader was staying with some of his disciples. In many respects the two were poles apart, though an irresistible inner attraction was to make them intimate friends. The master had realized God as pure spirit and consciousness, but he believed in the various forms of God as well. Keshab, on the other hand, regarded image worship as idolatry and gave allegorical explanations of the Hindu deities. Keshab was an orator and a writer of books and magazine articles. Sri Ramakrishna had a horror of lecturing and hardly knew how to write his own name. Keshab's fame spread far and wide, even reaching the distant shores of England. The master still led a secluded life in the village of Dakshinswar. Keshab emphasized social reforms for India's regeneration. To Sri Ramakrishna God realization was the only goal of life. Keshab considered himself a disciple of Christ and accepted in a diluted form the Christian sacraments and trinity. Sri Ramakrishna was the simple child of Kali, the Divine Mother, though he too in a different way acknowledged Christ's divinity. 
Keshab was a householder and took a real interest in the welfare of his children, whereas Sri Ramakrishna was a Paramahamsa and completely indifferent to the life of the world. Yet as their acquaintance ripened into friendship, Sri Ramakrishna and Keshab held each other in great love and respect. Years later at the news of Keshab's death, the master felt as if half his body had become paralyzed. Keshab's concepts of the harmony of religions and the motherhood of God were deepened and enriched by his contact with Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna, dressed in a red-bordered dhoti, one end of which was carelessly thrown over his left shoulder, came to Jagapal's garden house accompanied by Hride. No one took notice of the unostentatious visitor. Finally the master said to Keshab, People tell me you have seen God, so I have come to hear from you about God. A magnificent conversation followed. The master sang a thrilling song about Kali and forthwith went into Samadhi. When Hride uttered the sacred alm in his ears, he gradually came back to consciousness of the world, his face still radiating a divine brilliance. Keshab and his followers were amazed. The contrast between Sri Ramakrishna and the Brahmo devotees was very interesting. There sat this small man, thin and extremely delicate. His eyes were illumined with an inner light. Good humor gleamed in his eyes and lurked in the corners of his mouth. His speech was Bengali of a homely kind with a slight, delightful stammer, and his words held men enthralled by their wealth of spiritual experience, their inexhaustible store of simile and metaphor, their power of observation, their bright and subtle humor, their wonderful catholicity, their ceaseless flow of wisdom. And around him now were the sophisticated men of Bengal, the best products of Western education with Keshab, the idol of young Bengal as their leader. Keshab's sincerity was enough for Sri Ramakrishna. Henceforth the two saw each other frequently, either at Dakshin's war or at the temple of the Brahmo Samaj. Whenever the master was in the temple at the time of divine service, Keshab would request him to speak to the congregation. And Keshab would visit the saint in his turn, with offerings of flowers and fruits. Other Brahmo Leaders Gradually other Brahmo leaders began to feel Sri Ramakrishna's influence. But they were by no means uncritical admirers of the master. They particularly disapproved of his ascetic renunciation and condemnation of woman and goal. They measured him according to their own ideals of the householder's life. Some could not understand his samadhi and described it as a nervous malady. Yet they could not resist his magnetic personality. Among the Brahma leaders who knew the master closely were Pratap Chandra Mazumdar, Vijay Krishna Goswami, Trelakyanath Sanyal and Shivonath Sastri. Shivonath one day was greatly impressed by the master's utter simplicity and abhorrence of praise. He was seated with Sri Ramakrishna in the latter's room when several rich men of Calcutta arrive. The master left the room for a few minutes. In the meantime Hride, his nephew, began to describe his samadhi to the visitors. The last few words caught the master's ear as he entered the room. He said to Hride, What a mean-spirited fellow you must be to extol me thus before these rich men. You have seen their costly apparel and their gold watches and chains, and your object is to get from them as much money as you can. What do I care about what they think of me? Turning to the gentleman, no, my friends, what he has told you about me is not true. It was not love of God that made me absorbed in God and indifferent to external life. I became positively insane for some time. The sadhas who frequented this temple told me to practice many things. I tried to follow them and the consequence was that my austerities drove me to insanity. This is a quotation from one of Shivanath's books. He took the master's words literally and failed to see their real import. Shivanath vehemently criticized the master for his otherworldly attitude toward his wife. He writes, Ramakrishna was practically separated from his wife who lived in her village home. One day when I was complaining to some friends about the virtual widowhood of his wife, he drew me to one side and whispered in my ear, Why do you complain? It is no longer possible, it is all dead and gone. Another day as I was inveighing against this part of his teaching, and also declaring that our program of work in the Brahmo Samaj includes women, that ours is a social and domestic religion, and that we want to give education and social liberty to women, 
the saint became very much excited, as was his way when anything against his settled conviction was asserted a trait we so much liked in him and exclaimed, Go, thou fool, go and perish in the pit that your women will dig for you. Then he glared at me and said, What does a gardener do with a young plant? Does he not surround it with a fence to protect it from goats and cattle? And when the young plant has grown up into a tree and it can no longer be injured by cattle, does he not remove the fence and let the tree grow freely? I replied, Yes, that is the custom with gardeners. Then he remarked, Do the same in your spiritual life. Become strong, be full grown, then you may seek them. To which I replied, I don't agree with you in thinking that women's work is like that of cattle, destructive. They are our associates and helpers in our spiritual struggles and social progress, a view with which he could not agree, and he marked his dissent by shaking his head. Then referring to the lateness of the hour, he jocularly remarked, It is time for you to depart. Take care, do not be late. Otherwise your woman will not admit you into her room. This evoked hearty laughter. Pradap Chandra Mazumdar, the right-hand man of Keshab and an accomplished Brahmo preacher in Europe and America, bitterly criticized Sri Ramakrishna's use of uncultured language and also his austere attitude toward his wife but he could not escape the spell of the master's personality. In the course of an article about Sri Ramakrishna, Pradap wrote in the Theistic Quarterly Review, What is there in common between him and me? I, the Europeanized, civilized, self-centered, semi-skeptical, so-called educated reasoner, and he, a poor, illiterate, unpolished, half-idolatrous, friendless Hindu devotee, why should I sit long hours to attend to him, I, who have listened to Disraeli and Fawcett, Stanley and Max Muller, and a whole host of European scholars and divines? And it is not I only, but dozens like me, who do the same. He worships Shiva, he worships Kali, he worships Rama, he worships Krishna, and is a confirmed advocate of Vedantic doctrines. He is an idolater, yet is a faithful and most devoted meditator on the perfections of the one formless, absolute, infinite deity. His religion is ecstasy, his worship means transcendental insight, his whole nature burns day and night with a permanent fire and fever of a strange faith and feeling. So long as he is spared to us, gladly shall we sit at his feet to learn from him the sublime precepts of purity, unworldliness, spirituality, and inebriation in the love of God. He by his childlike bhakti, by his strong conceptions of an ever-ready motherhood, helped to unfold it God as our mother in our minds wonderfully. By associating with him we learn to realize better the divine attributes as scattered over the three hundred and thirty millions of deities of mythological India, the gods of the Puranas. The Brahmo leaders received much inspiration from their contact with Sri Ramakrishna. It broadened their religious views and kindled in their hearts the yearning for God-realization. It made them understand and appreciate the rituals and symbols of Hindu religion, convinced them of the manifestation of God in diverse forms, and deepened their thoughts about the harmony of religions. The Master, too, was impressed by the sincerity of many of the Brahmo devotees. He told them about his own realizations and explained to them the essence of his teachings, such as the necessity of renunciation, sincerity in the pursuit of one's own course of discipline, faith in God, the performance of one's duties without thought of results, and discrimination between the real and the unreal. This contact with the educated and progressive Bengalis opened Sri Ramakrishna's eyes to a new realm of thought. Born and brought up in a simple village, without any formal education, and taught by the orthodox holy men of India in religious life, he had had no opportunity to study the influence of modernism on the thoughts and lives of the Hindus. He could not properly estimate the result of the impact of Western education on Indian culture. He was a Hindu of the Hindus, renunciation being to him the only means to the realization of God in life. From the Brahmos he learnt that the new generation of India made a compromise between God and the world. Educated young men were influenced more by the Western philosophers than by their own prophets. But Sri Ramakrishna was not dismayed, for he saw in this too the hand of God. 
and though he expounded to the Brahmos all his ideas about God and austere religious disciplines, yet he bade them accept from his teachings only as much as suited their tastes and temperaments. The Master's Yearning for His Own Devotees Contact with the Brahmos increased Sri Ramakrishna's longing to encounter aspirants who would be able to follow his teachings in their purest form. There was no limit, he once declared, to the longing I felt at that time. During the daytime I somehow managed to control it. The secular talk of the worldly-minded was galling to me, and I would look wistfully to the day when my own beloved companions would come. I hoped to find solace in conversing with them and relating to them my own realizations. Every little incident would remind me of them, and thoughts of them wholly engrossed me. I was already arranging in my mind what I should say to one and give to another and so on. But when the day would come to a close, I would not be able to curb my feelings. The thought that another day had gone by and they had not come oppressed me. When, during the evening service, the temples rang with the sound of bells and conch shells, I would climb to the roof of the kuth I in the garden and writhing in anguish of heart, cry at the top of my voice, Come my children! Oh, where are you? I cannot bear to live without you. A mother never longs so intensely for the sight of her child, nor a friend for his companions, nor a lover for his sweetheart, as I longed for them. Oh, it was indescribable. Shortly after this period of yearning the devotees began to come. In the year 1879 occasional writings about Sri Ramakrishna by the Brahmos in the Brahmo magazines began to attract his future disciples from the educated middle-class Bengalis, and they continued to come till 1884. But others too came feeling the subtle power of his attraction. They were an ever-shifting crowd of people of all castes and creeds, Hindus and Brahmos, Vaish, Navas and Saktas, the educated with university degrees and the illiterate old and young Maharajas and beggars, journalists and artists, pundits and devotees, philosophers and the worldly-minded, Jhanis and Yogis, men of action and men of faith, virtuous women and prostitutes, office holders and vagabonds, philanthropists and self-seekers, dramatists and drunkards, builders up and pullers down. He gave to them all without stint from his illimitable store of realization. No one went away empty-handed. He taught them the lofty knowledge of the Vedanta and the soul-melting love of the Purana. Twenty hours out of twenty-four he would speak without rest or respite. He gave to all his sympathy and enlightenment and touched them with that strange power of the soul which could not but melt even the most hardened. And people understood him according to their powers of comprehension. The Master's method of teaching. But he remained as ever the willing instrument in the hand of God, the child of the Divine Mother, totally untouched by the idea of being a teacher. He used to say that three ideas that he was a guru, a father, and a master pricked his flesh like thorns. Yet he was an extraordinary teacher. He stirred his disciples' hearts more by a subtle influence than by actions or words. He never claimed to be the founder of a religion or the organizer of a sect. Yet he was a religious dynamo. He was the verifier of all religions and creeds. He was like an expert gardener who prepares the soil and removes the weeds, knowing that the plants will grow because of the inherent power of the seeds, producing each its appropriate flowers and fruits. He never thrust his ideas on anybody. He understood people's limitations and worked on the principle that what is good for one may be bad for another. He had the unusual power of knowing the devotees' minds, even their inmost souls, at the first sight. He accepted disciples with the full knowledge of their past tendencies and future possibilities. The life of evil did not frighten him, nor did religious squeamishness raise anybody in his estimation. He saw in everything the unerring finger of the Divine Mother. Even the light that leads astray was to him the light from God. To those who became his intimate disciples the Master was a friend, companion, and playmate. Even the chores of religious discipline would be lightened in his presence. The devotees would be so inebriated with pure joy in his company that they would have no time to ask themselves whether he was an incarnation, a perfect soul, or a yogi. His very presence was a great teaching, words were superfluous. 
In later years his disciples remarked that while they were with him they would regard him as a comrade, but afterwards would tremble to think of their frivolities in the presence of such a great person. They had convincing proof that the Master could, by his mere wish, kindle in their hearts the love of God and give them his vision. Through all this fun and frolic, this merriment and frivolity, he always kept before them the shining ideal of God consciousness and the path of renunciation. He prescribed ascent steep or graded according to the powers of the climber. He permitted no compromise with the basic principles of purity. An aspirant had to keep his body, mind, senses, and soul unspotted, had to have a sincere love for God and an ever-mounting spirit of yearning. The rest would be done by the mother. His disciples were of two kinds, the householders and the young men, some of whom were later to become monks. There was also a small group of women devotees. Householder devotees. For the householders Sri Ramakrishna did not prescribe the hard path of total renunciation. He wanted them to discharge their obligations to their families. Their renunciation was to be mental. Spiritual life could not he acquired by flying away from responsibilities. A married couple should live like brother and sister after the birth of one or two children, devoting their time to spiritual talk and contemplation. He encouraged the householders, saying that their life was, in a way, easier than that of the monk, since it was more advantageous to fight the enemy from inside a fortress than in an open field. He insisted, however, on their repairing into solitude every now and then to strengthen their devotion and faith in God through prayer, japa, and meditation. He prescribed for them the companionship of sadhus. He asked them to perform their worldly duties with one hand, while holding to God with the other, and to pray to God to make their duties fewer and fewer so that in the end they might cling to Him with both hands. He would discourage in both the householders and the celibate use any lukewarmness in their spiritual struggles. He would not ask them to follow indiscriminately the ideal of non-resistance, which ultimately makes a coward of the unwary. Future Monks But to the young men destined to be monks he pointed out the steep path of renunciation, both external and internal. They must take the vow of absolute continence and eschew all thought of greed and lust. By the practice of continence, aspirants develop a subtle nerve through which they understand the deeper mysteries of God. For them self-control is final, imperative, and absolute. The sannyasis are teachers of men, and their lives should be totally free from blemish. They must not even look at a picture which may awaken their animal passions. The master selected his future monks from young men untouched by woman and gold and plastic enough to be cast in his spiritual mold. When teaching them the path of renunciation and discrimination, he would not allow the householders to be anywhere near them. Ram and Manamo and the first two householder devotees to come to Dakshins or were Ram Chandra Dutta and Manamo and Mitra. A medical practitioner and chemist, Ram was skeptical about God and religion and never enjoyed peace of soul. He wanted tangible proof of God's existence. The Master said to him, God really exists. You don't see the stars in the daytime, but that doesn't mean that the stars do not exist. There is butter in milk. But can anybody see it by merely looking at the milk? To get butter you must churn milk in a quiet and cool place. You cannot realize God by a mere wish, you must go through some mental disciplines. By degrees the master awakened Ram's spirituality and the latter became one of his foremost lay disciples. It was Ram who introduced Narendra Nath to Sri Ramakrishna. Narendra was a relative of Ram. Manamohan at first met with considerable opposition from his wife and other relatives who resented his visits to Dakshin's war. But in the end the unselfish love of the master triumphed over worldly affection. It was Manamohan who brought Rakhal to the master. Churandra. Suresh Mitra, a beloved disciple whom the master often addressed as Churandra, had received an English education and held an important post in an English firm. Like many other educated young men of the time, he prided himself on his atheism and led a bohemian life. He was addicted to drinking. He cherished an exaggerated notion about man's free will. A victim of mental depression, he was brought to Sri Ramakrishna by Ramchandra Dutta. 
when he heard the master asking a disciple to practice the virtue of self-surrender to God, he was impressed. But though he tried thenceforth to do so, he was unable to give up his old associates and his drinking. One day the master said in his presence, Well, when a man goes to an undesirable place, why doesn't he take the Divine Mother with him? And as Shurandra himself Sri Ramakrishna said, Why should you drink wine as wine? Offer it to Kali, and then take it as her prasad, as consecrated drink. But see that you don't become intoxicated. You must not reel and your thoughts must not wander. At first you will feel ordinary excitement, but soon you will experience spiritual exaltation. Gradually Shurandra's entire life was changed. The Master designated him as one of those commissioned by the Divine Mother to defray a great part of his expenses. Shurandra's purse was always open for the Master's comfort. Kedar Kedarnath Chatterjee was endowed with a spiritual temperament and had tried various paths of religion, some not very commendable. When he met the Master at Dakshins where he understood the true meaning of religion, it is said that the Master, weary of instructing devotees who were coming to him in great numbers for guidance, once prayed to the goddess Kali, Mother, I am tired of speaking to people. Please give power to Kedar, Jirish, Ram, Vijay, and Mahendra to give them the preliminary instruction, so that just a little teaching from me will be enough. He was aware, however, of Kedar's lingering attachment to worldly things and often warned him about it. Harish Harish, a young man in affluent circumstances, renounced his family and took shelter with the Master, who loved him for his sincerity, singleness of purpose and quiet nature. He spent his leisure time in prayer and meditation, turning a deaf ear to the entreaties and threats of his relatives. Referring to his undisturbed peace of mind, the Master would say, Real men are dead to the world though living. Look at Harish. He is an example. When one day the Master asked him to be a little kind to his wife, Harish said, You must excuse me on this point. This is not the place to show kindness. If I try to be sympathetic to her, there is a possibility of my forgetting the ideal and becoming entangled in the world. Bhavanath Bhavanath Chatterjee visited the Master while he was still in his teens. His parents and relatives regarded Sri Ramakrishna as an insane person and tried their utmost to prevent him from becoming intimate with the Master. The young boy was very stubborn and often spent nights at Dakshin's war. He was greatly attached to Narendra, and the Master encouraged their friendship. The very sight of him often awakened Sri Ramakrishna's spiritual emotion. Balarambos Balarambos came of a wealthy Vaishnava family. From his youth he had shown a deep religious temperament and had devoted his time to meditation, prayer, and the study of the Vaish, Nava scriptures. He was very much impressed by Sri Ramakrishna even at their first meeting. He asked Sri Ramakrishna whether God really existed and if so, whether a man could realize him. The Master said, God reveals himself to the devotee who thinks of him as his nearest and dearest. Because you do not draw a response by praying to him once, you must not conclude that he does not exist. Pray to God, thinking of him as dearer than your very self. He is much attached to his devotees. He comes to a man even before he is sought. There is none more intimate and affectionate than God. Balaram had never before heard God spoken of in such forceful words. Every one of the words seemed true to him. Under the Master's influence he outgrew the conventions of the Vaish, Nava worship and became one of the most beloved of the disciples. It was at his home that the Master slept whenever he spent a night in Calcutta. Mahendra Oram Mahendranath Gupta, known as Mahendra Oram, arrived at Dakshin's War in February 1882. He belonged to the Brahmo Samaj and was headmaster of the Vidyasagar High School at Siambazar, Calcutta. At the very first sight the Master recognized him as one of his marked disciples. Mahendra recorded in his diary Sri Ramakrishna's conversations with his devotees. These are the first directly recorded words in the spiritual history of the world of a man recognized as belonging in the class of Buddha and Christ. The present volume is a translation of this diary. Mahendra was instrumental, through his personal contacts, in spreading the Master's message among many young and aspiring souls. 
Nag Mahashe. Durgachara Nag, also known as Nag Mahashe, was the ideal householder among the late disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. He was the embodiment of the Master's ideal of life in the world, unstained by worldliness. In spite of his intense desire to become a sannyasi, Sri Ramakrishna asked him to live in the world in the spirit of a monk, and the disciple truly carried out this injunction. He was born of a poor family, and even during his boyhood often sacrificed everything to lessen the sufferings of the needy. He had married at an early age and after his wife's death had married a second time to obey his father's command. But he once said to his wife, Love on the physical level never lasts. He is indeed blessed who can give his love to God with his whole heart. Even a little attachment to the body endures for several births. So do not be attached to this cage of bone and flesh. Take shelter at the feet of the mother and think of her alone. Thus your life here and hereafter will he ennobled. The Master spoke of him as a blazing light. He received every word of Sri Ramakrishna in dead earnest. One day he heard the Master saying that it was difficult for doctors, lawyers and brokers to make much progress in spirituality. Of doctors he said, If the mind clings to the tiny drops of medicine, how can it conceive of the infinite? That was the end of Durga Karan's medical practice and he threw his chest of medicines into the Ganges. Sri Ramakrishna assured him that he would not lack simple food and clothing. He bade him serve holy men. On being asked where he would find real holy men, the master said that the sadhus themselves would seek his company. No sannyasi could have lived a more austere life than Durga Karan. Jirish Gosh Jirish Chandra Ghosh was a born rebel against God, a skeptic, a bohemian, a drunkard. He was the greatest Bengali dramatist of his time, the father of the modern Bengali stage. Like other young men he had imbibed all the vices of the West. He had plunged into a life of dissipation and had become convinced that religion was only a fraud. Materialistic philosophy he justified as enabling one to get at least a little fun out of life. But a series of reverses shocked him, and he became eager to solve the riddle of life. He had heard people say that in spiritual life the help of a cure was imperative, and that the cure was to be regarded as God himself. But Jerish was too well acquainted with human nature to see perfection in a man. His first meeting with Sri Ramakrishna did not impress him at all. He returned home feeling as if he had seen a freak at a circus, for the master, in a semi-conscious mood, had inquired whether it was evening, though the lamps were burning in the room. But their paths often crossed, and Jirish could not avoid further encounters. The master attended a performance in Jirish's star theater. On this occasion, too, Jirish found nothing impressive about him. One day, however, Jirish happened to see the master dancing and singing with the devotees. He felt the contagion and wanted to join them, but restrained himself for fear of ridicule. Another day Sri Ramakrishna was about to give him spiritual instruction when Jirish said, I don't want to listen to instructions. I have myself written many instructions. They are of no use to me. Please help me in a more tangible way if you can. This pleased the master, and he asked Jirish to cultivate faith. As time passed, Jirish began to learn that the guru is the one who silently unfolds the disciples in her life. He became a steadfast devotee of the master. He often loaded the master with insults, drank in his presence, and took liberties which astounded the other devotees. But the master knew that at heart Jirish was tender, faithful, and sincere. He would not allow Jirish to give up the theater. And when a devotee asked him to tell Jirish to give up drinking, he sternly replied, That is none of your business. He who has taken charge of him will look after him. Jirish is a devotee of heroic type. I tell you drinking will not affect him. The master knew that mere words could not induce a man to break deep-rooted habits, but that the silent influence of love worked miracles. Therefore he never asked him to give up alcohol, with the result that Jirish himself eventually broke the habit. Sri Ramakrishna had strengthened Jirish's resolution by allowing him to feel that he was absolutely free. One day Jirish felt depressed because he was unable to submit to any routine of spiritual discipline. In an exalted mood the master said to him, 
All right, give me your power of attorney. Henceforth I assume responsibility for you. You need not do anything. Jirish heaved a sigh of relief. He felt happy to think that Sri Ramakrishna had assumed his spiritual responsibilities. But poor Jirish could not then realize that he also on his part had to give up his freedom and make of himself a puppet in Sri Ramakrishna's hands. The master began to discipline him according to this new attitude. One day Jirish said about a trifling matter, Yes, I shall do this. No, no. The master corrected him. You must not speak in that egotistic manner. You should say, God willing, I shall do it. Jirish understood. Thenceforth he tried to give up all idea of personal responsibility and surrender himself to the divine will. His mind began to dwell constantly on Sri Ramakrishna. This unconscious meditation in time chastened his turbulent spirit. The householder devotees generally visited Sri Ramakrishna on Sunday afternoons and other holidays. Thus a brotherhood was gradually formed and the master encouraged their fraternal feeling. Now and then he would accept an invitation to a devotee's home, where other devotees would also be invited. Curtain would be arranged and they would spend hours in dance and devotional music. The master would go into trances or open his heart in religious discourses and in the narration of his own spiritual experiences. Many people who could not go to dactions or participated in these meetings and felt blessed. Such an occasion would be concluded with a sumptuous feast. But it was in the company of his younger devotees, pure souls yet unstained by the touch of worldliness, that Sri Ramakrishna took greatest joy. Among the young men who later embraced the householder's life were Narayan, Paltu, the younger Naran, Tej Chandra and Purna. These visited the master sometimes against strong opposition from home. Purna Purna was a lad of thirteen, whom Sri Ramakrishna described as an Isvara Kodi, a soul born with special spiritual qualities. The master said that Purna was the last of the group of brilliant devotees who, as he once had seen in a trance, would come to him for spiritual illumination. Purna said to Sri Ramakrishna during their second meeting, You are God himself incarnated in flesh and blood. Such words coming from a mere youngster proved of what stuff the boy was made. Mahimakaran and Pratapazra Mahimakaran and Pratapazra were two devotees outstanding for their pretentiousness and idiosyncrasies. But the master showed them his unfailing love and kindness, though he was aware of their shortcomings. Mahimakshiran Chakravarti had met the master long before the arrival of the other disciples. He had had the intention of leading a spiritual life, but a strong desire to acquire name and fame was his weakness. He claimed to have been initiated by Todapuri, and used to say that he had been following the path of knowledge according to his guru's instructions. He possessed a large library of English and Sanskrit books. Though he pretended to have read them, most of the leaves were uncut. The master knew all his limitations, yet enjoyed listening to him recite from the Vedas and other scriptures. He would always exhort Mahima to meditate on the meaning of the scriptural texts and to practice spiritual discipline. Pratapazra, a middle-aged man, hailed from a village near Kemarpukur. He was not altogether unresponsive to religious feelings. On a moment's impulse he had left his home, aged mother, wife and children, and had found shelter in the temple garden at Dakshin's war where he intended to lead a spiritual life. He loved to argue, and the master often pointed him out a sad example of barren argumentation. He was hypercritical of others and cherished an exaggerated notion of his own spiritual advancement. He was mischievous and often tried to upset the minds of the master's young disciples, criticizing them for their happy and joyous life and asking them to devote their time to meditation. The master teasingly compared Hazra to Dyatila and Kutila, the two women who always created obstructions in Krishna's sport with the gopis, and said that Hazra lived at actions, or to thicken the plot by adding complications. Some noted men. Sri Ramakrishna also became acquainted with a number of people whose scholarship or wealth entitled them everywhere to respect. He had met a few years before, Devendranath Tagore famous all over Bengal for his wealth, scholarship, saintly character and social position. 
But the master found him disappointing. For whereas Sri Ramakrishna expected of a saint complete renunciation of the world, Devendranath combined with his saintliness a life of enjoyment. Sri Ramakrishna met the great poet Michael Madhi Sudan, who had embraced Christianity for the sake of his stomach. To him the master could not impart instruction, for the Divine Mother pressed his tongue. In addition he met Maharaja Yatindra Mohan Tagore, a titled aristocrat of Bengal, Christodas Pal, the editor, social reformer and patriot, Iswar Chandra Vidyasagar, the noted philanthropist and educator, Pandit Sasadhar, a great champion of Hindu orthodoxy, a Sweeney Kumardatta, a headmaster, moralist, and leader of Indian nationalism, and Bankam Chatterjee, a deputy magistrate, novelist, and essayist, and one of the fashioners of modern Bengali prose. Sri Ramakrishna was not the man to be dazzled by outward show, glory, or eloquence. A pundit without discrimination he regarded as a mere straw. He would search people's hearts for the light of God, and if that was missing, he would have nothing to do with them. Christodas Pal The Europeanized Christodas Pal did not approve of the Master's emphasis on renunciation and said, Sir, this cant of renunciation has almost ruined the country. It is for this reason that the Indians are a subject nation today. Doing good to others, bringing education to the door of the ignorant, and above all, improving the material conditions of the country, these should be our duty now. The cry of religion and renunciation would, on the contrary, only weaken us. You should advise the young men of Bengal to resort only to such acts as will uplift the country. Sri Ramakrishna gave him a searching look and found no divine light within. You men of poor understanding, Sri Ramakrishna said sharply, you dare to slight in these terms renunciation and piety, which our scriptures describe as the greatest of all virtues. After reading two pages of English you think you have come to know the world. You appear to think you are omniscient. Well have you seen those tiny crabs that are born in the Ganges just when the rain set in? In this big universe you are even less significant than one of those small creatures. How dare you talk of helping the world? The Lord will look to that. You haven't the power in you to do it. After a pause the master continued, Can you explain to me how you can work for others? I know what you mean by helping them. To feed a number of persons, to treat them when they are sick, to construct a road or dig a well isn't that all. These are good deeds no doubt, but how trifling in comparison with the vastness of the universe. How far can a man advance in this line? How many people can you save from famine? Malaria has ruined a whole province, what could you do to stop its onslaught? God alone looks after the world. Let a man first realize him. Let a man get the authority from God and be endowed with his power, then, and then alone may he think of doing good to others. A man should first be purged of all egotism. Then alone will the blissful mother ask him to work for the world. Three Ramakrishna mistrusted philanthropy that presumed to pose as charity. He warned people against it. He saw in most acts of philanthropy nothing but egotism, vanity, a desire for glory, a barren excitement to kill the boredom of life, or an attempt to sue the guilty conscience. True charity, he taught, is the result of love of God's service to man in a spirit of worship. Monastic Disciples The disciples whom the Master trained for monastic life were the following, 1. Narendranath Dutaswami Vivekananda 2. Nityanuranyan Sen Swami Nir and Jananda. 3. Rakul Chandra Gosh Swami Brahmananda. 4. Kali Prasad Chandra Swami Abhedananda. 5. Gopal Chandra Gosh Swami Advaitananda. 6. Haranath Chattopadhyaya Swami Turiyananda. 7. Baburam Gosh Swami Premananda. 8. Sarada Prasanna Swami Triganada Tananda. 9. Taragnath Goshal Swami Shivananda. 10. Gangit Hargadak Swami Akundananda. 11. Jajendranath Chowdhury, Swami Yogananda. 12. Subhad Gosh Swami Subhad Hananda. 13. Sashibhushan Chakravarti Swami Ramakrishnananda. 14. Sarachandra Chakravarti Swami Saradananda. 15. Ariprasana Chatterjee, Swami Vain Anananda. 16. Latu Swami Adhutananda. Laitu.
The first of these young men to come to the master was Latu. Born of obscure parents, in Bihar, he came to Calcutta in search of work and was engaged by Ramchandra Dutta as house boy. Learning of the saintly Sri Ramakrishna, he visited the master at Dakshinswar and was deeply touched by his cordiality. When he was about to leave, the master asked him to take some money and return home in a boat or carriage. But Latu declared he had a few pennies and jingled the coins in his pocket. Sri Ramakrishna later requested Ram to allow Latu to stay with him permanently. Under Sri Ramakrishna's guidance Latu made great progress in meditation and was blessed with ecstatic visions, but all the efforts of the master to give him a smattering of education failed. Latu was very fond of curtain and other devotional songs but remained all his life illiterate. Rackle Even before Rackle's coming to Dakshin's war the master had had visions of him as his spiritual son and as a playmate of Krishna at Vrindavan. Rackle was born of wealthy parents. During his childhood he developed wonderful spiritual traits and used to play at worshipping gods and goddesses. In his teens he was married to a sister of Manamo and Mitra, from whom he first heard of the Master. His father objected to his association with Sri Ramakrishna, but afterwards was reassured to find that many celebrated people were visitors at Dakshin's war. The relationship between the Master and this beloved disciple was that of mother and child. Sri Ramakrishna allowed Rakul many liberties denied to others. But he would not hesitate to chastise the boy for improper actions. At one time Rackle felt a childlike jealousy because he found that other boys were receiving the master's affection. He soon got over it and realized his guru as the guru of the whole universe. The master was worried to hear of his marriage, but was relieved to find that his wife was a spiritual soul who would not be a hindrance to his progress. The Elder Gopal Gopal Chandra Ghosh came to Dakshins or at a rather advanced age and was called the Elder Gopal. He had lost his wife and the master assuaged his grief. Soon he renounced the world and devoted himself fully to meditation and prayer. Some years later Gopal gave the master the ochre cloths with which the latter initiated several of his disciples into monastic life. Narendra To spread his message to the four corners of the earth Sri Ramakrishna needed a strong instrument. With his frail body and delicate limbs he could not make great journeys across wide spaces. And such an instrument was found in Narendranath Dutta, his beloved Naran, later known to the world as Swami Vivekananda. Even before meeting Narendranath, the Master had seen him in a vision as a sage, immersed in the meditation of the Absolute, who at Sri Ramakrishna's request had agreed to take human birth to assist him in his work. Narendra was born in Calcutta on January 12, 1863 of an aristocratic chaos the family. His mother was steeped in the great Hindu epics and his father, a distinguished attorney of the Calcutta High Court, was an agnostic about religion, a friend of the poor, and a mocker at social conventions. Even in his boyhood and youth Narendra possessed great physical courage and presence of mind, a vivid imagination, deep power of thought, keen intelligence, and extraordinary memory, a love of truth, a passion for purity, a spirit of independence, and a tender heart. An expert musician, he also acquired proficiency in physics, astronomy, mathematics, philosophy, history, and literature. He grew up into an extremely handsome young man. Even as a child he practiced meditation and showed great power of concentration. Though free and passionate in word and action, he took the vow of austere religious chastity and never allowed the fire of purity to be extinguished by the slightest defilement of body or soul. As he read in college the rationalistic Western philosophers of the 19th century, his boyhood faith in God and religion was unsettled. He would not accept religion on mere faith, he wanted demonstration of God. But very soon his passionate nature discovered that mere universal reason was cold and bloodless. His emotional nature, dissatisfied with a mere abstraction, required a concrete support to help him in the hours of temptation. He wanted an external power, a guru who by embodying perfection in the flesh would still the commotion of his soul. 
Attracted by the magnetic personality of Keshab, he joined the Brahmo Samaj and became a singer in its choir. But in the Samaj he did not find the Guru who could say that he had seen God. In a state of mental conflict and torture of soul, Narendra came to Sri Ramakrishna at Dakshinswar. He was then eighteen years of age and had been in college two years. He entered the master's room accompanied by some light-hearted friends. At Sri Ramakrishna's request he sang a few songs, pouring his whole soul into them, and the master went into Samadhi. Few minutes later Sri Ramakrishna suddenly left his seat, took Narendra by the hand, and led him to the screen veranda north of his room. They were alone. Addressing Narendra most tenderly, as if he were a friend of long acquaintance, the master said, Ah! You have come very late. Why have you been so unkind as to make me wait all these days? My ears are tired of hearing the futile words of worldly men. Oh, how I have longed to pour my spirit into the heart of someone fitted to receive my message. He talked thus sobbing all the time. Then standing before Narendra with folded hands, he addressed him as Narayana, born on earth to remove the misery of humanity. Grasping Narendra's hand, he asked him to come again, alone and very soon. Narendra was startled. What is this I have come to see? He said to himself. He must be stark mad. Why, I am the son of Viswanath Dutta. How dare he speak this way to me? When they returned to the room and Narendra heard the master speaking to others, he was surprised to find in his words an inner logic, a striking sincerity, and a convincing proof of his spiritual nature. In answer to Narendra's question, Sir, have you seen God? The master said, Yes, I have seen God. I have seen him more tangibly than I see you. I have talked to him more intimately than I am talking to you. Continuing the master said, But my child who wants to see God? People shed jugs of tears for money, wife and children. But if they would weep for God for only one day, they would surely see him. Narendra was amazed. These words he could not doubt. This was the first time he had ever heard a man saying that he had seen God. But he could not reconcile these words of the master with the scene that had taken place on the veranda only a few minutes before. He concluded that Sri Ramakrishna was a monomaniac and returned home rather puzzled in mind. During his second visit, about a month later, suddenly at the touch of the master, Narendra felt overwhelmed and saw the walls of the room and everything around him whirling and vanishing. What are you doing to me? He cried in terror. I have my father and mother at home. He saw his own ego, and the whole universe almost swallowed in a nameless void. With a laugh the master easily restored him. Narendra thought he might have been hypnotized, but he could not understand how a monomaniac could cast a spell over the mind of a strong person like himself. He returned home more confused than ever, resolved to be henceforth on his guard before this strange man. But during his third visit Narendra fared no better. This time at the master's touch he lost consciousness entirely. While he was still in that state, Sri Ramakrishna questioned him concerning his spiritual antecedents and whereabouts, his mission in this world, and the duration of his mortal life. The answers confirmed what the master himself had known and inferred. Among other things, he came to know that Narendra was a sage who had already attained perfection, and that the day he learnt his real nature he would give up his body in yoga by an act of will. A few more meetings completely removed from Narendra's mind the last traces of the notion that Sri Ramakrishna might be a monomaniac or wily hypnotist. His integrity, purity, renunciation and unselfishness were beyond question. But Narendra could not accept a man, an imperfect mortal, as his guru. As a member of the Brahma Samaj, he could not believe that a human intermediary was necessary between man and God. Moreover, he openly laughed at Sri Ramakrishna's visions as hallucinations. Yet in this secret chamber of his heart he bore a great love for the Master. Sri Ramakrishna was grateful to the Divine Mother for sending him one who doubted his own realizations. Often he asked Narendra to test him as the money changers test their coins. He laughed at Narendra's biting criticism of his spiritual experiences and samadhi. When at times Narendra's sharp words distressed him, the Divine Mother herself would console him, saying, Why do you listen to him? 
in a few days he will believe your every word. He could hardly bear Narendra's absences. Often he would weep bitterly for the sight of him. Sometimes Narendra would find the master's love embarrassing, and one day he sharply scolded at him, warning him that such infatuation would soon draw him down to the level of its object. The master was distressed and prayed to the Divine Mother. Then he said to Narendra, You rogue, I won't listen to you any more. Mother says that I love you because I see God in you, and the day I no longer see God in you, I shall not be able to bear even the sight of you. The master wanted to train Narendra in the teachings of the non-dualistic Vedanta philosophy. But Narendra, because of his Brahma upbringing, considered it wholly blasphemous to look on man as one with his creator. One day at the temple garden he laughingly said to a friend, How silly! This jug is God. This cup is God. Whatever we see is God. And we too are God. Nothing could be more absurd. Sri Ramakrishna came out of his room and gently touched him. Spellbound he immediately perceived that everything in the world was indeed God. A new universe opened around him. Returning home in a dazed state he found there too that the food, the plate, the eater himself, the people around him were all God. When he walked in the street he saw that the cabs, the horses, the streams of people, the buildings were all Brahman. He could hardly go about his day's business. His parents became anxious about him and thought him ill. And when the intensity of the experience abated a little, he saw the world as a dream. Walking in the public square, he would strike his head against the iron railings to know whether they were real. It took him a number of days to recover his normal self. He had a foretaste of the great experiences yet to come and realized that the words of the Vedanta were true. The beginning of 1884 Narendra's father suddenly died of heart failure, leaving the family in a state of utmost poverty. There were six or seven mouths to feed at home. Creditors were knocking at the door. Relatives who had accepted his father's unstinted kindness now became enemies, some even bringing suit to deprive Narendra of his ancestral home. Actually starving and barefoot, Narendra searched for a job, but without success. He began to doubt whether anywhere in the world there was such a thing as unselfish sympathy. Two rich women made evil proposals to him and promised to put an end to his distress, but he refused them with contempt. Narendra began to talk of his doubt of the very existence of God. His friends thought he had become an atheist and piously circulated gossip adducing unmentionable motives for his unbelief. His moral character was maligned. Even some of the master's disciples partly believed the gossip, and Narendra told these to their faces that only a coward believed in God through fear of suffering or hell. But he was distressed to think that Sri Ramakrishna too might believe these false reports. His pride revolted. He said to himself, What does it matter? If a man's good name rests on such slender foundations, I don't care. But later on he was amazed to learn that the master had never lost faith in him. To a disciple who complained about Narendra's degradation, Sri Ramakrishna replied, Hush you fool! The mother has told me it can never be so. I will look at you if you speak that way again. The moment came when Narendra's distress reached its climax. He had gone the whole day without food. As he was returning home in the evening, he could hardly lift his tired limbs. He sat down in front of a house in sheer exhaustion, too weak even to think. His mind began to wander. Then, suddenly, a divine power lifted the veil over his soul. He found the solution of the problem of the coexistence of divine justice and misery, the presence of suffering and the creation of a blissful providence. He felt bodily refreshed, his soul was bathed in peace, and he slept serenely. Narendra now realized that he had a spiritual mission to fulfill. He resolved to renounce the world as his grandfather had renounced it, and he came to Sri Ramakrishna for his blessing. But even before he had opened his mouth, the master knew what was in his mind and wept bitterly at the thought of separation. I know you cannot lead a worldly life, he said, but for my sake live in the world as long as I live. One day, soon after, Narendra requested Sri Ramakrishna to pray to the Divine Mother to remove his poverty. Sri Ramakrishna bade him pray to her himself, for she would certainly listen to his prayer. Narendra entered the shrine of Kali. 
As he stood before the image of the mother, he beheld her as a living goddess, ready to give wisdom and liberation. Unable to ask her for petty worldly things, he prayed only for knowledge and renunciation, love and liberation. The master rebuked him for his failure to ask the Divine Mother to remove his poverty and sent him back to the temple. But Narendra, standing in her presence, again forgot the purpose of his coming. Thrice he went to the temple at the bidding of the master, and thrice he returned, having forgotten in her presence why he had come. He was wondering about it when it suddenly flashed in his mind that this was all the work of Sri Ramakrishna, so now he asked the master himself to remove his poverty, and was assured that his family would not lack simple food and clothing. This was a very rich and significant experience for Narendra. It taught him that Sakti, the divine power, cannot be ignored in the world, and that in the relative plane the need of worshipping a personal god is imperative. Sri Ramakrishna was overjoyed with the conversion. The next day, sitting almost on Narendra's lap, he said to a devotee, pointing first to himself, then to Narendra, I see I am this and again that. Really I feel no difference. A stick floating in the Ganges seems to divide the water, but in reality the water is one. Do you see my point? Well, whatever is, is the mother isn't that so. In later years Narendra would say, Sri Ramakrishna was the only person who, from the time he met me, believed in me uniformly throughout. Even my mother and brothers did not. It was his unwavering trust and love for me that bound me to him forever. He alone knew how to love. Worldly people only make a show of love for selfish ends. Tarek Others destined to be monastic disciples of Sri Ramakrishna came to Dakshinswar. Tarek Nath Goshal had felt from his boyhood the noble desire to realize God. Kashab and the Brahma Samaj had attracted him, but proved inadequate. In 1882 he first met the master at Ramchandra's house, and was astonished to hear him talk about Samadhi, a subject which always fascinated his mind. And that evening he actually saw a manifestation of that superconscious state in the master. Tarak became a frequent visitor at Dakshin's war and received the master's grace in abundance. The young boy often felt ecstatic fervor in meditation. He also wept profusely while meditating on God. Sri Ramakrishna said to him, God favors those who can weep for him. Tears shed for God wash away the sins of former births. Aburam. Aburam Gosh came to Dakshin's war accompanied by Rakhal, his classmate. The master, as was often his custom, examined the boy's physiognomy and was satisfied about his latent spirituality. At the age of eight Babiram had thought of leading a life of renunciation, in the company of a monk, in a hut shut out from the public view by a thick wall of trees. The very sight of the Panchavati awakened in his heart that dream of boyhood. Babiram was tender in body and soul. The master used to say that he was pure to his very bones. One day Hazra in his usual mischievous fashion advised Babiram and some of the other young boys to ask Sri Ramakrishna for some spiritual powers and not waste their life in mere gaiety and merriment. The master sending mischief called Babiram to his side and said, What can you ask of me? Isn't everything that I have already yours? Yes, everything I have earned in the shape of realizations is for the sake of you all. So get rid of the idea of begging, which alienates by creating a distance. Rather realize your kinship with me and gain the key to all the treasures. Naranyan Nitya Naranyan Sen was a disciple of heroic type. He came to the master when he was eighteen years old. He was a medium for a group of spiritualists. During his first visit the master said to him, My boy, if you think always of ghosts you will become a ghost, and if you think of God you will become God. Now, which do you prefer? Naranyan severed all connections with the spiritualists. During his second visit, the master embraced him and said warmly, Naranyan, my boy, the days are flitting away. When will you realize God? This life will be in vain if you do not realize him. When will you devote your mind wholly to God? Naranyan was surprised to see the master's great anxiety for his spiritual welfare. He was a young man endowed with unusual spiritual parts. He felt disdain for worldly pleasures and was totally guileless like a child. But he had a violent temper. 
One day as he was coming in a country boat to Daxion's wharf, some of his fellow passengers began to speak ill of the master. Finding his protest futile, Nuringen began to rock the boat, threatening to sink it in midstream. That silenced the offenders. When he reported the incident to the master, he was rebuked for his inability to curb his anger. Jajendra. Jajendra Nath, on the other hand, was gentle to a fault. One day, under circumstances very like those that had evoked Nuranyan's anger, he curbed his temper and held his peace instead of threatening Sri Ramakrishna's abusers. The master, learning of his conduct, scolded him roundly. Thus to each the fault of the other was recommended as a virtue. The guru was striving to develop, in the first instance, composure, and in the second, metal. The secret of his training was to build up by a tactful recognition of the requirements of each given case, the character of the devotee. Jajendranath came of an aristocratic Brahmin family of Dakshin's war. His father and relatives shared the popular mistrust of Sri Ramakrishna's sanity. At a very early age the boy developed religious tendencies, spending two or three hours daily in meditation, and his meeting with Sri Ramakrishna deepened his desire for the realization of God. He had a perfect horror of marriage. But at the earnest request of his mother he had had to yield, and he now believed that his spiritual future was doomed. So he kept himself away from the master. Sri Ramakrishna employed a ruse to bring Jajindra to him. As soon as the disciple entered the room, the master rushed forward to meet the young man. Catching hold of the disciple's hand, he said, What if you have married, haven't I too married? What is there to be afraid of in that? Touching his own chest, he said, If this meaning himself is propitious, then even a hundred thousand marriages cannot injure you. If you desire to lead a householder's life, then bring your wife here one day and I shall see that she becomes a real companion in your spiritual progress. But if you want to lead a monastic life, then I shall eat up your attachment to the world. Jajan was dumbfounded at these words. He received new strength, and his spirit of renunciation was reestablished. Sashi and Sarat Sashi and Sarat were two cousins who came from a pious Brahmin family of Calcutta. At an early age they had joined the Brahmo Samaj and had come under the influence of Keshub Sen. The master said to them at their first meeting, If bricks and tiles are burnt after the trademark has been stamped on them, they retain the mark forever. Similarly, man should be stamped with God before entering the world. Then he will not become attached to worldliness. Fully aware of the future course of their life, he asked them not to marry. The master asked Sashi whether he believed in God with form or in God without form. Sashi replied that he was not even sure about the existence of God, so he could not speak one way or the other. This frank answer very much pleased the master. Sarat so longed for the all-embracing realization of the Godhead. When the master inquired whether there was any particular form of God he wished to see, the boy replied that he would like to see God in all the living beings of the world. But the master demurred, that is the last word in realization. One cannot have it at the very outset. Sarat stated calmly, I won't be satisfied with anything short of that. I shall trudge on along the path till I attain that blessed state. Sri Ramakrishna was very much pleased. Harnath Harnath had led the austere life of a brahmachari even from his early boyhood bathing in the Ganges every day, cooking his own meals, waking before sunrise, and reciting the Gita from memory before leaving bed. He found in the Master the embodiment of the Vedanta scriptures. Aspiring to be a follower of the ascetic Sankara, he cherished a great hatred for women. One day he said to the Master that he could not allow even small girls to come near him. The Master scolded him and said, You are talking like a fool. Why should you hate women? They are the manifestations of the Divine Mother. Regard them as your own mother and you will never feel their evil influence. The more you hate them the more you will fall into their snares. Hari said later that these words completely changed his attitude toward women. The Master knew Hari's passion for Vedanta. But he did not wish any of his disciples to become a dry ascetic or a mere bookworm. So he asked Hari to practice Vedanta in life by giving up the unreal and following the real. But it is not so easy, Sri Ramakrishna said, 
to realize the illusoriness of the world. Study alone does not help one very much. The grace of God is required. Mere personal effort is futile. A man is a tiny creature after all with very limited powers. But he can achieve the impossible if he prays to God for his grace. Whereupon the master sang a song in praise of grace. Hari was profoundly moved and shed tears. Later in life Hari achieved a wonderful synthesis of the ideals of the personal God and the impersonal truth. Gangadhar Gangadhar, Harinath's friend, also led the life of a strict brahmachari, eating vegetarian food cooked by his own hands and devoting himself to the study of the scriptures. He met the master in 1884 and soon became a member of his inner circle. The master praised his ascetic habit and attributed it to the spiritual disciplines of his past life. Gangadhar became a close companion of Narendra. Haraprasana Haraprasana, a college student, visited the master in the company of his friends Sashi and Sarah. Sri Ramakrishna showed him great favor by initiating him into spiritual life. As long as he lived, Haraprasana remembered and observed the following drastic advice of the master. Even if a woman is pure as gold and rolls on the ground for love of God, it is dangerous for a monk ever to look at her. Kali Kali Prasad visited the master toward the end of 1883. Given to the practice of meditation and the study of the scriptures, Kali was particularly interested in yoga. Feeling the need of a guru in spiritual life, he came to the master and was accepted as a disciple. The young boy possessed a rational mind and often felt skeptical about the personal God. The master said to him, your doubts will soon disappear. Others too have passed through such a state of mind. Look at Naran. He now weeps at the names of Radha and Krishna. Kali began to see visions of gods and goddesses. Very soon these disappeared and in meditation he experienced vastness, infinity, and the other attributes of the impersonal Brahman. Subad. Subad visited the Master in 1885. At the very first meeting Sri Ramakrishna said to him, You will succeed. Mother says so. Those whom she sends here will certainly attain spirituality. During the second meeting the master wrote something on Subud's tongue, stroked his body from the navel to the throat and said, Awake mother. Awake. He asked the boy to meditate. At once Subud's latent spirituality was awakened. He felt a current rushing along the spinal column to the brain. Joy filled his soul. Sarada and Chalasi. Two more young men, Sarada Prasanna and Chalasi, complete the small band of the master's disciples later to embrace the life of the wandering monk. With the exception of the elder Gopal, all of them were in their teens or slightly over. They came from middle-class Bengali families and most of them were students in school or college. Their parents and relatives had envisaged for them bright worldly careers. They came to Sri Ramakrishna with pure bodies, vigorous minds, and uncontaminated souls. All were born with unusual spiritual attributes. Sri Ramakrishna accepted them, even at first sight, as his children, relatives, friends, and companions. His magic touch unfolded them. And later each according to his measure reflected the life of the Master, becoming a torch-bearer of his message across land and sea. Woman Devotees With his woman devotees Sri Ramakrishna established a very sweet relationship. He himself embodied the tender traits of a woman. He had dwelt on the highest plane of truth, where there is not even the slightest trace of sex, and his innate purity evoked only the noblest emotion in men and women alike. His woman devotees often said, We seldom looked on Sri Ramakrishna as a member of the male sex. We regarded him as one of us. We never felt any constraint before him. He was our best confidant. They loved him as their child, their friend, and their teacher. In spiritual discipline, he advised them to renounce lust and greed and especially warned them not to fall into the snares of men. Gopalma unsurpassed among the woman devotees of the Master in the richness of her devotion and spiritual experiences was Aghoramani Divi, an orthodox Brahmin woman. 
Widowed at an early age, she had dedicated herself completely to spiritual pursuits. Gopala, the baby Krishna, was her ideal deity, whom she worshipped following the Vatsalya attitude of the Vaish, Nava religion regarding him as her own child. Through him she satisfied her unassuaged maternal love, cooking for him, feeding him, bathing him, and putting him to bed. This sweet intimacy with Gopala won her the sobriquet of Gopal Ma, or Gopala's mother. For forty years she had lived on the bank of the Ganges in a small bare room, her only companions being a threadbare copy of the Ramayana and a bag containing her rosary. At the age of sixty, in 1884, she visited Sri Ramakrishna at Dakshinswar. During the second visit, as soon as the master saw her, he said, Oh, you have come. Give me something to eat. With great hesitation, she gave him some ordinary sweets that she had purchased for him on the way. The master ate them with relish and asked her to bring him simple curries or sweets prepared by her own hands. Gopal Ma thought him a queer kind of monk, for instead of talking of God, he always asked for food. She did not want to visit him again, but an irresistible attraction brought her back to the temple garden. She carried with her some simple curries that she had cooked herself. One early morning at three o'clock, about a year later, Gopal Ma was about to finish her daily devotions when she was startled to find Sri Ramakrishna sitting on her left, with his right hand clenched like the hand of the image of Gopala. She was amazed and caught hold of the hand, whereupon the figure vanished and in its place appeared the real Gopala, her ideal deity. Shakrit aloud with joy. Gopala begged her for butter. She pleaded her poverty and gave him some dry coconut candies. Gopala sat on her lap, snatched away her rosary, jumped on her shoulders, and moved all about the room. As soon as the day broke she hastened to Dakshin's were like an insane woman. Of course Gopala accompanied her, resting his head on her shoulder. She clearly saw his tiny ruddy feet hanging over her breast. She entered Sri Ramakrishna's room. The master had fallen into samadhi. Like a child, he sat on her lap and she began to feed him with butter, cream and other delicacies. After some time he regained consciousness and returned to his bed. The mind of Gopala's mother was still roaming in another plane. She was steeped in bliss. She saw Gopala frequently entering the master's body and again coming out of it. When she returned to her hut, still in a dazed condition, Gopala accompanied her. She spent about two months in uninterrupted communion with God, the baby Gopala never leaving her for a moment. Then the intensity of her vision was lessened. Had it not been, her body would have perished. The Master spoke highly of her exalted spiritual condition and said that such vision of God was a rare thing for ordinary mortals. The fun-loving Master one day confronted the critical Narendra Nath with this simple-minded woman. No two could have presented a more striking contrast. The master knew of Narendra's lofty contempt for all visions, and he asked the old lady to narrate her experiences to Narendra. With great hesitation she told him her story. Now and then she interrupted her maternal chatter to ask Narendra, My son, I'm a poor ignorant woman. I don't understand anything. You are so learned. Now tell me if these visions of Gopala are true. As Narendra listened to the story he was profoundly moved. He said, Yes, mother, they are quite true. Behind his cynicism Narendra too possessed a heart full of love and tenderness. The March of Events In 1882 Hriday was dismissed from service in the Kali Temple for an act of indiscretion and was ordered by the authorities never again to enter the garden. In a way the hand of the Divine Mother may be seen even in this. Having taken care of Sri Ramakrishna during the stormy days of his spiritual discipline, Hride had come naturally to consider himself the sole guardian of his uncle. None could approach the master without his knowledge. And he would be extremely jealous if Sri Ramakrishna paid attention to anyone else. Hride's removal made it possible for the real devotees of the master to approach him freely and live with him in the temple garden. During the weekends the householders, enjoying a respite from their office duties, visited the master. The meetings on Sunday afternoons were of the nature of little festivals. Refreshments were often served. 
professional musicians now and then sang devotional songs. The master and the devotees sang and danced, Sri Ramakrishna frequently going into ecstatic moods. The happy memory of such a Sunday would linger long in the minds of the devotees. Those whom the master wanted for special instruction he would ask to visit him on Tuesdays and Saturdays. These days were particularly auspicious for the worship of Kali. The young disciples destined to be monks, Sri Ramakrishna invited on weekdays, when the householders were not present. The training of the householders and of the future monks had to proceed along entirely different lines. Since Mahendra generally visited the master on weekends, the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna does not contain much mention of the future monastic disciples. Finally, there was a handful of fortunate disciples, householders as well as youngsters, who were privileged to spend nights with the master in his room. They would see him get up early in the morning and walk up and down the room, singing in his sweet voice and tenderly communing with the mother. Injury to the master's arm. One day, in January 1884, the master was going toward the pine grove when he went into a trance. He was alone. There was no one to support him or guide his footsteps. He fell to the ground and dislocated a bone in his left arm. This accident had a significant influence on his mind, the natural inclination of which was to soar above the consciousness of the body. The acute pain in the arm forced his mind to dwell on the body and on the world outside. But he saw even in this a divine purpose, for with his mind compelled to dwell on the physical plane, he realized more than ever that he was an instrument in the hand of the Divine Mother, who had a mission to fulfill through his human body and mind. He also distinctly found that in the phenomenal world God manifests himself, in an inscrutable way, through diverse human beings, both good and evil. Thus he would speak of God in the guise of the wicked, God in the guise of the pious, God in the guise of the hypocrite, God in the guise of the lewd. He began to take a special delight in watching the divine play in the relative world. Sometimes the sweet human relationship with God would appear to him more appealing than the all-effacing knowledge of Brahman. Many a time he would pray, Mother, don't make me unconscious through the knowledge of Brahman. Don't give me Brahmajana, Mother. Am I not your child and naturally timid? I must have my mother. A million salutations to the knowledge of Brahman. Give it to those who want it. Again he prayed, O oh Mother, let me remain in contact with men. Don't make me a dried-up ascetic. I want to enjoy your sport in the world. He was able to taste this very rich divine experience and enjoy the love of God and the company of his devotees because his mind, on account of the injury to his arm, was forced to come down to the consciousness of the body. Again, he would make fun of people who proclaimed him as a divine incarnation by pointing to his broken arm. He would say, Have you ever heard of God breaking his arm? It took the arm about five months to heal. Beginning of his illness. In April 1885, the master's throat became inflamed. Prolonged conversation or absorption in samadhi making the blood flow into the throat would aggravate the pain. Yet when the annual Vaishnava festival was celebrated at Panahati, Sri Ramakrishna attended it against the doctor's advice. With a group of disciples he spent himself in music dance and ecstasy. The illness took a turn for the worse and was diagnosed as clergyman's sore throat. The patient was cautioned against conversation and ecstasies. Though he followed the physician's directions regarding medicine and diet, he could neither control his trances nor withhold from seekers the solace of his advice. Sometimes, like a sulky child, he would complain to the mother about the crowds who gave him no rest day or night. He was overheard to say to her, Why do you bring here all these worthless people, who are like milk diluted with five times its own quantity of water? My eyes are almost destroyed with blowing the fire to dry up the water. My health is gone. It is beyond my strength. Do it yourself if you want it done. This pointing to his own body is but a perforated drum, and if you go on beating it day in and day out, how long will it last? But his large heart never turned anyone away. He said, Let me be condemned to be born over and over again, even in the form of a dog, if I can be of help to a single soul. And he bore the pain, singing cheerfully, 
let the body be preoccupied with illness, but O mind dwell forever in God's bliss. One night he had a hemorrhage of the throat. The doctor now diagnosed the illness as cancer. Narendra was the first to break this heartrending news to the disciples. Within three days the master was removed to Calcutta for better treatment. At Balaram's house he remained a week until a suitable place could be found at Siampukar, in the northern section of Calcutta. During this week he dedicated himself practically without respite to the instruction of those beloved devotees who had been unable to visit him oftener at Dakshin's war. Discourses incessantly flowed from his tongue, and he often went into Samadhi. Dr. Mahendra Sarkar, the celebrated homeopath of Calcutta, was invited to undertake his treatment. Simpukar. In the beginning of September 1885 Sri Ramakrishna was moved to Sampukar. Here Narendra organized the young disciples to attend the Master day and night. At first they concealed the Master's illness from their guardians, but when it became more serious they remained with him almost constantly, sweeping aside the objections of their relatives and devoting themselves wholeheartedly to the nursing of their beloved Guru. These young men, under the watchful eyes of the Master and the leadership of Narendra, became the Antaranga Bhaktas, the devotees of Sri Ramakrishna's inner circle. They were privileged to witness many manifestations of the Master's divine powers. Narendra received instructions regarding the propagation of his message after his death. The Holy Mother So Sarada Divi had come to be affectionately known by Sri Ramakrishna's devotees was brought from Dakshins, or to look after the general cooking and to prepare the special diet of the patient. The dwelling space being extremely limited, she had to adapt herself to cramped conditions. At three o'clock in the morning she would finish her bath in the Ganges and then enter a small covered place on the roof, where she spent the whole day cooking and praying. After eleven at night, when the visitors went away, she would come down to her small bedroom on the first floor to enjoy a few hours sleep. Thus she spent three months working hard, sleeping little, and praying constantly for the Master's recovery. At Siampukar the devotees led an intense life. Their attendance on the Master was in itself a form of spiritual discipline. His mind was constantly soaring to an exalted plane of consciousness. Now and then they would catch the contagion of his spiritual fervor. They sought to divine the meaning of this illness of the Master who most of them had accepted as an incarnation of God. One group, headed by Jirish with his robust optimism and great power of imagination, believed that the illness was a mere pretext to serve a deeper purpose. The Master had willed his illness in order to bring the devotees together and promote solidarity among them. As soon as this purpose was served, he would himself get rid of the disease. A second group thought that the Divine Mother, in whose hand the Master was an instrument, had brought about this illness to serve her own mysterious ends. But the young rationalists, led by Narendra, refused to ascribe a supernatural cause to a natural phenomenon. They believed that the Master's body, a material thing, was subject, like all other material things, to physical laws. Growth, development, decay, and death were laws of nature to which the Master's body could not but respond. But though holding differing views, they all believed that it was to him alone that they must look for the attainment of their spiritual goal. In spite of the physician's efforts and the prayers and nursing of the devotees, the illness rapidly progressed. Pain sometimes appeared to be unbearable. The Master lived only on liquid food and his frail body was becoming a mere skeleton. Yet his face always radiated joy, and he continued to welcome the visitors pouring in to receive his blessing. When certain zealous devotees tried to keep the visitors away, they were told by Jirish, You cannot succeed in it. He has been born for this very purpose to sacrifice himself for the redemption of others. The more the body was devastated by illness, the more it became the habitation of the Divine Spirit. Through its transparency the gods and goddesses began to shine with ever-increasing luminosity. On the day of the Kali Puja, the devotees clearly saw in him the manifestation of the Divine Mother. It was noticed at this time that some of the devotees were making an unbridled display of their emotions. A number of them, particularly among the householders, began to cultivate, 
though at first unconsciously, the art of shedding tears, shaking the body, contorting the face, and going into trances, attempting thereby to imitate the Master. They began openly to declare Sri Ramakrishna, a divine incarnation, and to regard themselves as his chosen people, who could neglect religious disciplines with impunity. Narendra's penetrating eye soon sized up the situation. He found out that some of these external manifestations were being carefully practiced at home, while some were the outcome of malnutrition, mental weakness, or nervous stability. He mercilessly exposed the devotees who were pretending to have visions, and asked all to develop a healthy religious spirit. Narendra sang inspiring songs for the younger devotees, read with them the imitation of Christ and the Gita, and held before them the positive ideals of spirituality. Last days at Kasapur, when Sri Ramakrishna's illness showed signs of aggravation, the devotees, following the advice of Dr. Sarkar, rented a spacious garden house at Kasapur, in the northern suburbs of Calcutta. The master was removed to this place on December 11, 1885. It was at Kasapur that the curtain fell on the varied activities of the master's life on the physical plane. His soul lingered in the body eight months more. It was the period of his great passion, a constant crucifixion of the body and the triumphant revelation of the soul. Here one sees the humanity and divinity of the master passing and repassing across a thin border line. Every minute of those eight months was suffused with touching tenderness of heart and breathtaking elevation of spirit. Every word he uttered was full of pythos and sublimity. It took the group only a few days to become adjusted to the new environment. The Holy Mother, assisted by Sri Ramakrishna's niece Lakshmi Divi, and a few woman devotees took charge of the cooking for the master and his attendants. Jirndra willingly bore the major portion of the expenses, other householders contributing according to their means. Twelve disciples were constant attendants of the master. Narendra, Rakul, Babiram, Naranyan, Jajan, Lai, Tutarak, the elder Gopal, Kali, Sashi, Sarat, and the younger Gopal. Sarada, Harish, Hari, Gangadhar, and Chalasi visited the master from time to time and practiced at Hana at home. Narendra, preparing for his law examination, brought his books to the garden house in order to continue his studies during the infrequent spare moments. He encouraged his brother disciples to intensify their meditation, scriptural studies, and other spiritual disciplines. They all forgot their relatives and their worldly duties. Among the attendants, Sashi was the embodiment of service. He did not practice meditation, japa, or any of the other disciplines followed by his brother devotees. He was convinced that service to the Guru was the only religion for him. He forgot food and rest and was ever ready at the Master's bedside. Pundit Sasadhar one day suggested to the Master that the latter could remove the illness by concentrating his mind on the throat, the scriptures having declared that Yo is had power to cure themselves in that way. The master rebuked the pundit. For a scholar like you to make such a proposal, he said, How can I withdraw the mind from the lotus feet of God and turn it o this worthless cage of flesh and blood? For our sake at least, begged Narendra and the other disciples. But replied Sri Ramakrishna, Do you think I enjoy this suffering? I wish to recover, but that depends on the mother. Narendra, then please pray to her. She must listen to you. Master, but I cannot pray for my body. Narendra, you must do it for our sake at least. Master, very well I shall try. A few hours later the master said to Narendra, I said to her, Mother, I cannot swallow food because of my pain. Make it possible for me to eat a little. She pointed you all out to me and said, What? You are eating enough through all these mouths. Isn't that so? I was ashamed and could not utter another word. This dashed all the hopes of the devotees for the master's recovery. I shall make the whole thing public before I go, the master had said some time before. On January 1, 1886, he felt better and came down to the garden for a little stroll. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon. Some thirty lay disciples were in the hall or sitting about under the trees. 
Sri Ramakrishna said to Jirish, Well, Jirish, what have you seen in me that you proclaim me before everybody as an incarnation of God? Jirish was not the man to be taken by surprise. He knelt before the master and said with folded hands, What can an insignificant person like myself say about the one whose glory even sages like Vyasa and Valmiki could not adequately measure? The master was profoundly moved. He said, What more shall I say? I bless you all. Be illumined. He fell into a spiritual mood. Hearing these words the devotees, one and all, became overwhelmed with emotion. They rushed to him and fell at his feet. He touched them all, and each received an appropriate benediction. Each of them at the touch of the Master experienced ineffable bliss. Some laughed, some wept, some sat down to meditate, some began to pray. Some saw light, some had visions of their chosen ideals, and some felt within their bodies the rush of spiritual power. Narendra, consumed with a terrific fever for realization, complained to the Master that all the others had attained peace, and that he alone was dissatisfied. The Master asked what he wanted. Narendra begged for samadhi, so that he might altogether forget the world for three or four days at a time. You are a fool, the Master rebuked him. There is a state even higher than that. Isn't it you who sing all that exists art thou? First of all settle your family affairs, and then come to me. You will experience a state even higher than samadhi. The master did not hide the fact that he wished to make Narendra his spiritual heir. Narendra was to continue the work after Sri Ramakrishna's passing. Sri Ramakrishna said to him, I leave these young men in your charge. See that they develop their spirituality and do not return home. One day he asked the boys, in preparation for a monastic life, to beg their food from door to door without thought of caste. They hailed the master's order and went out with begging bowls. A few days later he gave the ochre cloth of the sannyasi to each of them, including Jirish, who was now second to none in his spirit of renunciation. Thus the master himself laid the foundation of the future Ramakrishna order of monks. Sri Ramakrishna was sinking day by day. His diet was reduced to a minimum and he found it almost impossible to swallow. He whispered to Mahendra, I am bearing all this cheerfully for otherwise you would be weeping. If you all say that it is better that the body should go rather than suffer this torture, I am willing. The next morning he said to his depressed disciples seated near the bed, do you know what I see? I see that God alone has become everything. Men and animals are only frameworks covered with skin, and it is He who is moving through their heads and limbs. I see that it is God Himself who has become the block, the executioner, and the victim for the sacrifice. He fainted with emotion. Regaining partial consciousness, He said, Now I have no pain. I am very well. Looking at Law too, He said, there sits Latu resting his head on the palm of his hand. To me it is the Lord who is seated in that posture. The words were tender and touching. Like a mother he caressed Narendra and Rakhal, gently stroking their faces. He said in a half-whisper to Mahendra, Had this body been allowed to last a little longer, many more souls would have been illumined. He paused a moment and then said, But mother has ordained otherwise. He will take me away lest, finding me guileless and foolish, people should take advantage of me and persuade me to bestow on them the rare gifts of spirituality. A few minutes later he touched his chest and said, Here are two beings. One is she and the other is her devotee. It is the latter who broke his arm, and it is he again who is now ill. Do you understand me? After a pause he added, Alas! To whom shall I tell all this? Who will understand me? Pain, he consoled them again, is unavoidable as long as there is a body. The Lord takes on the body for the sake of his devotees. Yet one is not sure whether the master's soul actually was tortured by this agonizing disease. At least during his moments of spiritual exaltation which became almost constant during the closing days of his life on earth he lost all consciousness of the body, of illness and suffering. One of his attendants said later on, while Sri Ramakrishna lay sick he never actually suffered pain. He would often say, O oh mind, forget the body, forget the sickness and remain merged in bliss. 
No, he did not really suffer. At times he would be in a state when the thrill of joy was clearly manifested in his body. Even when he could not speak he would let us know in some way that there was no suffering, and this fact was clearly evident to all who watched him. People who did not understand him thought that his suffering was very great. What spiritual joy he transmitted to us at that time. Could such a thing have been possible if he had been suffering physically? It was during this period that he taught us again these truths. Brahman is always unattached. The three gunas are in it, but it is unaffected by them, just as the wind carries odor yet remains odorless. Brahman is infinite being and finite wisdom, infinite bliss. In it there exists no delusion, no misery, no disease, no death, no growth, no decay. The transcendental being and the being within are one and the same. There is one indivisible absolute existence. The Holy Mother secretly went to a Shiva temple across the Ganges to intercede with the deity for the Master's recovery. In a revelation she was told to prepare herself for the inevitable end. One day when Narendra was on the ground floor, meditating, the Master was lying awake in his bed upstairs. In the depths of his meditation Narendra felt as though a lamp were burning at the back of his head. Suddenly he lost consciousness. It was the yearned for, all effacing experience of Nirvikalpa Samadhi when the embodied soul realizes its unity with the Absolute. After a very long time, he regained partial consciousness, but was unable to find his body. He could see only his head. Where is my body? He cried. The elder Gopal entered the room and said, Why, it is here, Naren. But Narendra could not find it. Gopal, frightened, ran upstairs to the master. Sri Ramakrishna only said, Let him stay that way for a time. He has worried me long enough. After another long period Narendra regained full consciousness. Bathed in peace he went to the master who said, Now the mother has shown you everything. But this revelation will remain under lock and key, and I shall keep the key. When you have accomplished the mother's work, you will find the treasure again. Some days later, Narendra being alone with the master, Sri Ramakrishna looked at him and went into Samadhi. Narendra felt the penetration of a subtle force and lost all outer consciousness. Regaining presently the normal mood, he found the master weeping. Sri Ramakrishna said to him, Today I have given you my all and I am now only a poor fakir possessing nothing. By this power you will do immense good in the world and not until it is accomplished will you return. Henceforth the master lived in the disciple. Doubt however dies hard. After one or two days Narendra said to himself, If in the midst of this racking physical pain he declares his Godhead, then only shall I accept him as an incarnation of God. He was alone by the bedside of the master. It was a passing thought, but the master smiled. Gathering his remaining strength, he distinctly said, he who was Rama and Krishna is now in this body, Ramakrishna, but not in your Vedantic sense. Narendra was stricken with shame. Mahasamadhi! Sunday, August 15, 1886. The master's pulse became irregular. The devotee stood by the bedside. Poor dust Sri Ramakrishna had difficulty in breathing. A short time afterwards he complained of hunger. A little liquid food was put into his mouth. Some of it he swallowed and the rest ran over his chin. Two attendants began to fan him. All at once he went into samadhi of a rather unusual type. The body became stiff. Says he burst into tears. But after midnight the master revived. He was now very hungry and helped himself to a bowl of porridge. He said he was strong again. He sat up against five or six pillows which were supported by the body of Sashi, who was fanning him. Narendra took his feet on his lap and began to rub them. Again and again the master repeated to him, Take care of these boys. Then he asked to lie down. Three times in ringing tones he cried the name of Kali, his life's beloved, and lay back. At two minutes past one there was a low sound in his throat, and he fell a little to one side. A thrill passed over his body. His hair stood on end. His eyes became fixed on the tip of his nose. His face was lighted with a smile. The final ecstasy began. 
It was Maha Samadhi total absorption from which his mind never returned. Narendra, unable to bear it, ran downstairs. Dr. Sarkar arrived the following noon and pronounced that life had departed not more than half an hour before. At five o'clock the master's body was brought downstairs, laid on a cot, dressed in ochre clothes and decorated with sandal past and flowers. A procession was formed. The passers-by wept as the body was taken to the cremation ground at the Baranagor Ghat on the Ganges. While the devotees were returning to the garden house, carrying the urn with the sacred ashes, a calm resignation came to their souls and they cried, Victory unto the Guru. The Holy Mother was weeping in her room, not for her husband, but because she felt that Mother Kali had left her. As she was about to put off the marks of a Hindu widow, in a moment of revelation she heard the words of faith, I have only passed from one room to another. Chapter 1 Master and Disciple February 1882 Mahendra's first visit to the Master He was on a Sunday in spring, a few days after Sri Ramakrishna's birthday, that Mahendra met him the first time. Sri Ramakrishna lived at the Kailabari, the temple garden of Mother Kali, on the bank of the Ganges at Dakshin's War. Mahendra, being at leisure on Sundays, had gone with his friend Sidhu to visit several gardens at Baranagor. As they were walking in Prasanna Banerjee's garden, Sidhu said, There is a charming place on the bank of the Ganges where a Paramahamsa lives. Did you like to go there? Mahendra assented and they started immediately for the Dakshans or Temple Garden. They arrived at the main gate at dusk and went straight to Sri Ramakrishna's room. And there they found him seated on a wooden couch facing the east. With a smile on his face he was talking of God. The room was full of people, all seated on the floor, drinking in his words in deep silence. Mahendra stood there speechless and looked on. It was as if he were standing where all the holy places met and as if Sukadva himself were speaking the word of God, or as if Sri Chaitanya were singing the name and glories of the Lord in Puri with Ramananda, Swarup, and the other devotees. Were maladies and essentials of religion. Sri Ramakrishna said, When, hearing the name of Hari or Rama once, you shed tears and your hair stands on end, then you may know for certain that you do not have to perform such devotions as the Sandhya any more. Then only will you have a right to renounce rituals, or rather rituals will drop away of themselves. Then it will be enough if you repeat only the name of Rama or Hari, or even simply Om. Continuing, he said, the Sandhya emerges in the Gayatri, and the Gayatri merges in Om. Mahendra looked around him with wonder and said to himself, What a beautiful place! What a charming man! How beautiful his words are! I have no wish to move from this spot. After a few minutes he thought, Let me see the place first, then I'll come back here and sit down. As he left the room with Sidhu, he heard the sweet music of the evening service arising in the temple from gong, bell, drum and cymbal. He could hear music from the Nahabat too at the south end of the garden. The sounds traveled over the Ganges, floating away and losing themselves in the distance. A soft spring wind was blowing, laden with the fragrance of flowers. The moon had just appeared. It was as if nature and man together were preparing for the evening worship. Mahendra and Siddhu visited the twelve Shiva temples, the Radhakanta temple, and the temple of Bhavatarini. And as Mahendra watched the services before the images his heart was filled with joy. On the way back to Sri Ramakrishna's room the two friends talked. Siddhu told Mahendra that the temple garden had been founded by Rani Rasmani. He said that God was worshipped there daily as Kali, Krishna and Shiva, and that within the gates sadhus and beggars were fed. When they reached Sri Ramakrishna's door again, they found it shut and brinned the maid standing outside. Mahendra, who had been trained in English manners and would not enter a room without permission, asked her, Is the holy man in? Rindra replied, Yes, he's in the room. Mahendra, how long has he lived here? Rind, oh, he has been here a long time. Mahendra, does he read many books? Rind books? Oh, dear, no. They're all on his tongue. Mahendra had just finished his studies in college. It amazed him to hear that Sri Ramakrishna read no books. Mahendra, perhaps it is time for his evening worship. 
May we go into the room? Will you tell him we are anxious to see him? Rind, go right in, children. Go in and sit down. Entering the room, they found Sri Ramakrishna alone, seated on the wooden couch. Incense had just been burnt and all the doors were shut. As he entered, Mahendra with folded hands saluted the master. Then at the master's bidding, he and Sidhu sat on the floor. Sri Ramakrishna asked them, Where do you live? What is your occupation? Why have you come to Baranagor? Mahendra answered the questions, but he noticed that now and then the master seemed to become absent-minded. Later he learned that this mood is called bhava ecstasy. It is like the state of the angler who has been sitting with his rod. The fish comes and swallows the bait, and the float begins to tremble. The angler is on the alert. He grips the rod and watches the float steadily and eagerly. He will not speak to anyone. Such was the state of Sri Ramakrishna's mind. Later Mahendra heard, and himself noticed, that Sri Ramakrishna would often go into this mood after dusk, sometimes becoming totally unconscious of the outer world. Mahendra, perhaps you want to perform your evening worship. In that case may we take our leave? Sri Ramakrishna still in ecstasy, no evening worship. No, it is not exactly that. After a little conversation Mahendra saluted the master and took his leave. Come again, Sri Ramakrishna said. On his way home Mahendra began to wonder, Who is this serene-looking man who is drawing me back to him? Is it possible for a man to be great without being a scholar? How wonderful it is! I should like to see him again. He himself said, Come again. I shall go tomorrow or the day after. Second visit Mahendra's second visit to Sri Ramakrishna took place on the southeast veranda at eight o'clock in the morning. The master was about to be shaved, the barber having just arrived. As the cold season still lingered he had put on a moleskin shawl bordered with red. Seeing Mahendra, the master said, So you have come. That's good. Sit down here. He was smiling. He heard a little when he spoke. Sri Ramakrishna to Mahendra, Where do you live? Mahendra, in Calcutta, sir. Sri Ramakrishna, where are you staying here? Mahendra, I am at Baranagor at my older sister's Ishan Kavarad's house. Three Ramakrishna, O oh, at Ishan's. Well, how is Keshab now? He was very ill. Mahendra, indeed I have heard so too, but I believe he is well now. Master's love for Keshab. Three Ramakrishna, I made a vow to worship the mother with green coconut and sugar on Keshab's recovery. Sometimes in the early hours of the morning I would wake up and cry before her, Mother, please make Keshab well again. If Keshab doesn't live, whom shall I talk with when I go to Calcutta? And so it was that I resolved to offer her the green coconut and sugar. Tell me, do you know of a certain Mr. Cook who has come to Calcutta? Is it true that he is giving lectures? Once Keshab took me on a steamer, and this Mr. Cook too was in the party. Mahendra, yes sir, I have heard something like that, but I have never been to his lectures. I don't know much about him. Sri Ramakrishna on Mahendra's marriage. Sri Ramakrishna, Pradap's brother came here. He stayed a few days. He had nothing to do and said he wanted to live here. I came to know that he had left his wife and children with his father-in-law. He has a whole brood of them. So I took him to task. Just fancy. He is the father of so many children. Will people from the neighborhood feed them and bring them up? He isn't even ashamed that someone else is feeding his wife and children, and that they have been left at his father-in-law's house. I scolded him very hard and asked him to look for a job. Then he was willing to leave here. Are you married? Mahendra, yes sir. Sri Ramakrishna with a shudder, O oh, Ramal. Alas, he is married. Like one guilty of a terrible offense, Mahendra sat motionless, his eyes fixed on the ground. He thought, is it such a wicked thing to get married? The master continued, have you any children? Mahendra this time could hear the beating of his own heart. He whispered in a trembling voice, yes sir, I have children. Very sadly Sri Ramakrishna said, Ami. He even has children. Thus rebuked Mahendra sat speechless. His pride had received a blow. After a few minutes Sri Ramakrishna looked at him kindly and said affectionately, 
you see, you have certain good signs. I know them by looking at a person's forehead, his eyes, and so on. Tell me now, what kind of person is your wife? Has she spiritual attributes, or is she under the power of Avidya? Mahendra, she is all right. But I am afraid she is ignorant. Master with evident displeasure, and you are a man of knowledge. Mahendra had yet to learn the distinction between knowledge and ignorance. Up to this time his conception had been that one got knowledge from books and schools. Later on he gave up this false conception. He was taught that to know God is knowledge, and not to know him, ignorance. When Sri Ramakrishna exclaimed, And you are a man of knowledge, Mahendra's ego was again badly shocked. God with and without form. Master, well, do you believe in God with form or without form? Mahendra, rather surprised, said to himself, How can one believe in God without form when one believes in God with form? And if one believes in God without form, how can one believe that God has a form? Can these two contradictory ideas be true at the same time? Can a white liquid like milk be black? Mahendra, sir, I like to think of God as formless. Master, very good. It is enough to have faith in either aspect. You believe in God without form, that is quite all right. But never for a moment think that this alone is true and all else false. Remember that God with form is just as true as God without form. But hold fast to your own conviction. The assertion that both are equally true amazed Mahendra. He had never learnt this from his books. Thus his ego received a third blow, but since it was not yet completely crushed he came forward to argue with the master a little more. God in the clay image. Mahendra, sir, suppose one believes in God with form. Certainly he is not the clay image. Master interrupting, but why clay? It is an image of spirit. Mahendra could not quite understand the significance of this image of spirit. But sir, he said to the master, one should explain to those who worship the clay image that it is not God, and that, while worshipping it, they should have God in view and not the clay image. One should not worship clay. God the only real teacher. Master sharply, that's the one hobby of you Calcutta people giving lectures and bringing others to the light. Nobody ever stops to consider how to get the light himself. Who are you to teach others? He who is the Lord of the universe will teach everyone. He alone teaches us who has created this universe, who has made the sun and moon, men and beasts and all other beings, who has provided means for their sustenance, who has given children parents and endowed them with love to bring them up. The Lord has done so many things will he not show people the way to worship him? If they need teaching, then he will be the teacher. He is our inner guide. Suppose there is an error in worshipping the clay image, doesn't God know that through it he alone is being invoked? He will be pleased with that very worship. Why should you get a headache over it? You had better try for knowledge and devotion yourself. This time Mahendra felt that his ego was completely crushed. He now said to himself, Yes, he has spoken the truth. What need is there for me to teach others? Have I known God? Do I really love him? I haven't room enough for myself in my bed, and I am inviting my friend to share it with me. I know nothing about God, yet I am trying to teach others. What a shame! How foolish I am! This is not mathematics or history or literature that one can teach it to others. No, this is the deep mystery of God. What he says appeals to me. This was Mahendra's first argument with the Master, and happily his last. Master, you were talking of worshipping the clay image. Even if the image is made of clay, there is need for that sort of worship. God himself has provided different forms of worship. He who is the Lord of the universe has arranged all these forms to suit different men in different stages of knowledge. The mother cooks different dishes to suit the stomachs of her different children. Suppose she has five children. If there is a fish to cook, she prepares various dishes from it palau, pickled fish, fried fish, and so on to suit their different tastes and powers of digestion. Do you understand me? Need of holy company and meditation in solitude Mahendra humbly. Yes, sir. How, sir, may we fix our minds on God? Master, repeat God's name and sing his glories and keep holy company, and now and then visit God's devotees and holy men. The mind cannot dwell on God. 
if it is immersed day and night in worldliness, in worldly duties and responsibilities. It is most necessary to go into solitude now and then and think of God. To fix the mind on God is very difficult in the beginning, unless one practices meditation in solitude. When a tree is young it should be fenced all around, otherwise it may be destroyed by cattle. To meditate, you should withdraw within yourself or retire to a secluded corner or to the forest. And you should always discriminate between the real and the unreal. God alone is real, the eternal substance, all else is unreal that is impermanent. By discriminating thus, one should shake off impermanent objects from the mind. God and worldly duties. Mahendra humbly, how ought we to live in the world? Master, do all your duties but keep your mind on God. Live with all with wife and children, father and mother and serve them. Treat them as if they were very dear to you, but know in your heart of hearts that they do not belong to you. A maid servant in the house of a rich man performs all the household duties, but her thoughts are fixed on her own home in her native village. She brings up her master's children as if they were her own. She even speaks of them as my Rama or my Hari but in her own mind she knows very well that they do not belong to her at all. The tortoise moves about in the water. But can you guess where her thoughts are? They're on the bank where her eggs are lying. Do all your duties in the world, but keep your mind on God. If you enter the world without first cultivating love for God, you will be entangled more and more. You will be overwhelmed with its danger, its grief, its sorrows. And the more you think of worldly things, the more you will be attached to them. First rub your hands with oil and then break open the jackfruit, otherwise they will be smeared with its sticky milk. First secure the oil of divine love, and then set your hands to the duties of the world. But one must go into solitude to attain this divine love. To get butter from milk you must let it set into curd in a secluded spot. If it is too much disturbed milk won't turn into curd. Next, you must put aside all other duties, sit in a quiet spot and churn the curd. Only then do you get butter. Further, by meditating on God in solitude the mind acquires knowledge, dispassion and devotion. But the very same mind goes downward if it dwells in the world. In the world there is only one thought, woman and gold. The world is water and the mind milk. If you pour milk into water they become one. You cannot find the pure milk any more. But turn the milk into curd and churn it into butter. Then when that butter is placed in water it will float. So practice spiritual discipline in solitude and obtain the butter of knowledge and love. Even if you keep that butter in the water of the world the two will not mix. The butter will float. Practice of discrimination. Together with this, you must practice discrimination. Woman and gold is impermanent. God is the only eternal substance. What does a man get with money? Food, clothes, and a dwelling place nothing more. You cannot realize God with its help. Therefore money can never be the goal of life. That is the process of discrimination. You understand? Mahendra, yes sir. I recently read a Sanskrit play called Prabhata Chandradeya. It deals with discrimination. Master, yes discrimination about objects. Consider what is there in money or in a beautiful body. Discriminate and you will find that even the body of a beautiful woman consists of bones, flesh, fat and other disagreeable things. Why should a man give up God and direct his attention to such things? Why should a man forget God for their sake? How to see God? Mahendra, is it possible to see God? Master, yes certainly. Living in solitude now and then, repeating God's name and singing his glories, and discriminating between the real and the unreal these are the means to employ to see him. Longing and yearning. Mahendra, under what conditions does one see God? Master, cry to the Lord with an intensely yearning heart and you will certainly see him. People shed a whole jug of tears for wife and children. They swim in tears for money. But who weeps for God? Cry to him with a real cry. The master sang, cry to your mother Siyama with a real cry, O oh mind. And how can she hold herself from you? How can Siyama stay away? How can your mother Kali hold herself away? 
O oh mine, if you are in earnest, bring her an offering of bell leaves and hibiscus flowers, lay at her feet your offering, and with it mingle the fragrant sandal paste of love. Continuing, he said, Longing is like the rosy dawn. After the dawn out comes the sun. Longing is followed by the vision of God. God reveals himself to a devotee who feels drawn to him by the combined force of these three attractions the attraction of worldly possessions for the worldly man, the child's attraction for its mother, and the husband's attraction for the chaste wife. If one feels drawn to him by the combined force of these three attractions, then through it one can attain him. The point is to love God even as the mother loves her child, the chaste wife her husband, and the worldly man his wealth. Add together these three forces of love, these three powers of attraction, and give it all to God. Then you will certainly see Him. It is necessary to pray to Him with a longing heart. The kid knows only how to call its mother crying meow meow. It remains satisfied wherever its mother puts it. And the mother cat puts the kitten sometimes in the kitchen, sometimes on the floor, and sometimes on the bed. When it suffers it cries only meow meow. That's all it knows. But as soon as the mother hears this cry, wherever she may be, she comes to the kitten. Third Visit It was Sunday afternoon when Mahendra came on his third visit to the master. He had been profoundly impressed by his first two visits to this wonderful man. He had been thinking of the master constantly, and of the utterly simple way he explained the deep truths of the spiritual life. Never before had he met such a man. Sri Ramakrishna was sitting on the small couch. The room was filled with devotees three who had taken advantage of the holiday to come to see the master. Mahendra had not yet become acquainted with any of them, so he took his seat in a corner. The master smiled as he talked with the devotees. Narendra. He addressed his words particularly to a young man of nineteen, named Narendra Nath, who was a college student and frequented the Sadharan Brahma Samaj. His eyes were bright, his words were full of spirit, and he had the look of a lover of God. How the spiritually minded should look upon the worldly Mahendra guessed that the conversation was about worldly men, who look down on those who aspire to spiritual things. The master was talking about the great number of such people in the world, and about how to deal with them. Master Tanarendra, how do you feel about it? Worldly people say all kinds of things about the spiritually minded. But look here. When an elephant moves along the street, any number of curs and other small animals may bark and cry after it, but the elephant doesn't even look back at them. If people speak ill of you, what will you think of them? Narendra, I shall think that dogs are barking at me. God in every being. Master smiling, oh no. You mustn't go that far, my child. Laughter. God dwells in all beings. But you may be intimate only with good people, you must keep away from the evil-minded. God is even in the tiger, but you cannot embrace the tiger on that account. Laughter. You may say why run away from a tiger which is also a manifestation of God. The answer to that is, those who tell you to run away are also manifestations of God, and why shouldn't you listen to them? Parable of the Elephant God Let me tell you a story. In a forest there lived a holy man who had many disciples. One day he taught them to see God in all beings and, knowing this, to bow low before them all. A disciple went to the forest to gather wood for the sacrificial fire. Suddenly he heard an outcry, Get out of the way! A mad elephant is coming! All but the disciple of the holy man took to their heels. He reasoned that the elephant was also God in another form. Then why should he run away from it? He stood still, bowed before the animal, and began to sing its praises. The mahat of the elephant was shouting, Run away! Run away! But the disciple didn't move. The animal seized him with its trunk, cast him to one side, and went on its way. Hurt and bruised, the disciple lay unconscious on the ground. Hearing what had happened, his teacher and his brother disciples came to him and carried him to the hermitage. With the help of some medicine he soon regained consciousness. Someone asked him, You knew the elephant was coming, why didn't you leave the place? But he said, Our teacher has told us that God himself has taken all these forms of animals as well as men. 
Therefore, thinking it was only the elephant god that was coming, I didn't run away. At this the teacher said, Yes, my child, it is true that the elephant god was coming, but the Mahat god forbade you to stay there. Since all are manifestations of God, why didn't you trust the Mahat's words? You should have heeded the words of the Mahat god. Laughter, it is said in the scriptures that water is a form of God. But some water is fit to be used for worship, some water for washing the face, and some only for washing plates or dirty linen. This last sort cannot be used for drinking or for a holy purpose. In like manner, God undoubtedly dwells in the hearts of all holy and unholy, righteous and unrighteous, but a man should not have dealings with the unholy, the wicked, the impure. He must not be intimate with them. With some of them he may exchange words, but with others he shouldn't go even that far. He should keep aloof from such people. How to deal with the wicked? A devotee, sir, if a wicked man is about to do harm, or actually does so, should we keep quiet then? Master, a man living in society should make a show of tamas to protect himself from evil-minded people. But he should not harm anybody in anticipation of harm likely to be done him. Parable of the Snake Listen to a story. Some cowherd boys used to tend their cows in a meadow where a terrible poisonous snake lived. Everyone was on the alert for fear of it. One day a brahmachari was going along the meadow. The boys ran to him and said, Revered sir, please don't go that way. A venomous snake lives over there. What of it, my good children? Said the brahmachari. I am not afraid of the snake. I know some mantras. So saying, he continued on his way along the meadow. But the cowherd boys, being afraid, did not accompany him. In the meantime, the snake moved swiftly toward him with a praised hood. As soon as it came near, he recited a mantra, and the snake lay at his feet like an earthworm. The brahmachari said, Look here. Why do you go about doing harm? Come, I will give you a holy word. By repeating it, you will learn to love God. Ultimately you will realize him and so get rid of your violent nature. Saying this, he taught the snake a holy word and initiated him into spiritual life. The snake bowed before the teacher and said, Revered sir, how shall I practice spiritual discipline? Repeat that sacred word, said the teacher, and do no harm to anybody. As he was about to depart, the brahmachari said, I shall see you again. Some days passed and the cowherd boys noticed that the snake would not bite. They threw stones at it. Still it showed no anger. It behaved as if it were an earthworm. One day one of the boys came close to it, caught it by the tail, and whirling it round and round, dashed it again and again on the ground and threw it away. The snake vomited blood and became unconscious. It was stunned. It could not move. So thinking it dead, the boys went their way. Late at night the snake regained consciousness. Slowly and with great difficulty it dragged itself into its hole. Its bones were broken and it could scarcely move. Many days passed. The snake became a mere skeleton covered with a skin. Now and then at night it would come out in search of food. For fear of the boys it would not leave its hole during the daytime. Since receiving the sacred word from the teacher, it had given up doing harm to others. It maintained its life on dirt, leaves, or the fruit that dropped from the trees. About a year later, the brahmachari came that way again and asked after the snake. How heard boys told him that it was dead. But he couldn't believe them. He knew that the snake would not die before attaining the fruit of the holy word with which it had been initiated. He found his way to the place, and searching here and there, called it by the name he had given it. Hearing the teacher's voice, it came out of its hole and bowed before him with great reverence. How are you? asked the brahmachari. I am well, sir, replied the snake. But the teacher asked, Why are you so thin? The snake replied, Revered, sir, you ordered me not to harm any body. So I have been living only on leaves and fruit. Perhaps that has made me thinner. The snake had developed the quality of sattva. It could not be angry with anyone. It had totally forgotten that the cowherd boys had almost killed it. The brahmachari said, It can't be mere want of food that has reduced you to this state. There must be some other reason. Think a little. 
Then the snake remembered that the boys had dashed it against the ground. It said, Yes, revered sir, now I remember. The boys one day dashed me violently against the ground. They are ignorant after all. They didn't realize what a great change had come over my mind. How could they know I wouldn't bite or harm anyone? The brahmachari exclaimed, What a shame! You are such a fool! You don't know how to protect yourself. I asked you not to bite, but I didn't forbid you to hiss. Why didn't you scare them by hissing? So you must hiss at wicked people. You must frighten them lest they should do you harm. But never inject your venom into them. One must not injure others. In this creation of God there is a variety of things, men, animals, trees, plants. Among the animals some are good, some bad. There are ferocious animals like the tiger. Some trees bear fruit sweet as nectar and others bear fruit that is poisonous. Likewise among human beings, there are the good and the wicked, the holy and the unholy. There are some who are devoted to God and others who are attached to the world. Four Classes of Men Men may be divided into four classes, those bound by the fetters of the world, the seekers after liberation, the liberated, and the ever-free. Among the ever-free we may count sages like Narada. They live in the world for the good of others, to teach men spiritual truth. Those in bondage are sunk in worldliness and forgetful of God. Not even by mistake do they think of God. The seekers after liberation want to free themselves from attachment to the world. Some of them succeed and others do not. The liberated souls, such as the Sadhus and Mahatmas, are not entangled in the world in woman and gold. Their minds are free from worldliness. Besides, they always meditate on the lotus feet of God. Suppose a net has been cast into a lake to catch fish. Some fish are so clever that they are never caught in the net. They are like the ever free. But most of the fish are entangled in the net. Some of them try to free themselves from it, and they are like those who seek liberation. But not all the fish that struggle succeed. A very few do jump out of the net, making a big splash in the water. Then the fishermen shout, Look! There goes a big one! But most of the fish caught in the net cannot escape, nor do they make any effort to get out. On the contrary, they burrow into the mud with the net in their mouths and lie there quietly, thinking, We need not fear any more. We are quite safe here. But the poor things do not know that the fishermen will drag them out with the net. These are like the men bound to the world. The bound souls are tied to the world by the fetters of woman and gold. They are bound hand and foot. Thinking that woman and gold will make them happy and give them security, they do not realize that it will lead them to annihilation. When a man thus bound to the world is about to die, his wife asks, You are about to go, but what have you done for me? Again, such is his attachment to the things of the world that, when he sees the lamp burning brightly, he says, Dim the light. Too much oil is being used. And he is on his deathbed. The bound souls never think of God. If they get any leisure, they indulge in idle gossip and foolish talk, or they engage in fruitless work. If you ask one of them the reason, he answers, Oh, I cannot keep still, so I am making a hedge. When time hangs heavy on their hands, they perhaps start playing cards. There is deep silence in the room. Redeeming power of faith. A devotee, sir, is there no help then for such a worldly person? Master, certainly there is. From time to time he should live in the company of holy men, and from time to time go into solitude to meditate on God. Furthermore he should practice discrimination and pray to God, give me faith and devotion. Once a person has faith he has achieved everything. There is nothing greater than faith. To Kedar you must have heard about the tremendous power of faith. It is said in the Purana that Rama, who was God himself the embodiment of absolute Brahman had to build a bridge to cross the sea to Salam. But Hanuman, trusting in Rama's name, cleared the sea in one jump and reached the other side. He had no need of a bridge. All laugh once a man was about to cross the sea. Bhabhishana wrote Rama's name on a leaf tied it in a corner of the man's wearing cloth and said to him, Don't be afraid. Have faith and walk on the water. But look here the moment you lose faith you will be drowned. The man was walking easily on the water. 
Suddenly he had an intense desire to see what was tied in his cloth. He opened it and found only a leaf with the name of Rama written on it. What is this? He thought. Just the name of Rama. As soon as doubt entered his mind he sank under the water. If a man has faith in God, then even if he has committed the most heinous sins such as killing a cow, a Brahmin or a woman he will certainly be saved through his faith. Let him only say to God, O Lord, I will not repeat such an action, and he need not be afraid of anything. When he had said this, the master sang, If only I can pass away repeating Durga's name, how canst thou then, O blessed one, withhold from me deliverance, wretched though I may be? One may have stolen a drink of wine, or killed a child unborn, or slain a woman or a cow, or even caused a Brahmin's death. But though it all be true, nothing of this can make me feel the least uneasiness. For through the power of thy sweet name my wretched soul may still aspire. Even to Brahmanhood. Parable of the Homa Bird. Pointing to Narendra, the master said, You all see this boy. He behaves that way here. A naughty boy seems very gentle when with his father. But he is quite another person when he plays in the Chani. Narendra and people of his type belong to the class of the ever free. They are never entangled in the world. When they grow a little older they feel the awakening of inner consciousness and go directly toward God. They come to the world only to teach others. They never care for anything of the world. They are never attached to woman and gold. The Vitas speak of the Homa bird. It lives high up in the sky and there it lays its egg. As soon as the egg is laid it begins to fall, but it is so high up that it continues to fall for many days. As it falls it hatches and the chick falls. As the chick falls its eyes open, it grows wings. As soon as its eyes open, it realizes that it is falling and will be dashed to pieces on touching the earth. Then it at once shoots up toward the mother bird high in the sky. At this point Narendra left the room. Kadar, Prankrishna, Mahendra and many others remained. Master praises Narendra. Master, you see Narendra excels in singing, playing on instruments, study and everything. The other day he had a discussion with Kedar and tore his arguments to shreds. All laugh. To Mahendra, is there any book in English on reasoning? Mahendra, yes sir, there is. It is called logic. Master, tell me what it says. Mahendra was a little embarrassed. He said, one part of the book deals with deduction from the general to the particular. For example, all men are mortal. Scholars are men. Therefore scholars are mortal. Another part deals with the method of reasoning from the particular to the general. For example, this crow is black. That crow is black. The crows we see everywhere are black. Therefore all crows are black. But there may be a fallacy in a conclusion arrived at in this way, for on inquiry one may find a white crow in some country. There is another illustration. If there is rain, there is or has been a cloud. Therefore, rain comes from a cloud. Still another example. This man has thirty-two teeth. That man has thirty-two teeth. All the men we see have thirty-two teeth. Therefore, men have thirty-two teeth. English logic deals with such inductions and deductions. Sri Ramakrishna barely heard these words. While listening, he became absent-minded. So the conversation did not proceed far. When the meeting broke up, the devotees sauntered in the temple garden. Mahendra went in the direction of the Panchavati. It was about five o'clock in the afternoon. After a while, he returned to the master's room. There, on the small north veranda, he witnessed an amazing sight. Sri Ramakrishna was standing still, surrounded by a few devotees, and Narendra was singing. Mahendra had never heard anyone except the master sing so sweetly. When he looked at Sri Ramakrishna he was struck with wonder, for the master stood motionless with eyes transfixed. He seemed not even to breathe. A devotee told Mahendra that the master was in Samadhi. Mahendra had never before seen or heard of such a thing. Silent with wonder he thought, Is it possible for a man to be so oblivious of the outer world and the consciousness of God? How deep his faith and devotion must be to bring about such a state. Narendra was singing, Meditate, O my mind, on the Lord Hari, the stainless one, pure spirit through and through. 
How peerless is the light that in him shines! How soul bewitching is his wondrous form! How dear is he to all his devotees! Ever more beauteous and fresh blossoming love! That shames the splendor of a million moons like lightning gleams the glory of his form, raising erect the hair for very joy. The master shuddered when this last line was sung. His hair stood on end, and tears of joy streamed down his cheeks. Now and then his lips parted in a smile. Was he seeing the peerless beauty of God that shames the splendor of a million moons? Was this the vision of God, the essence of spirit? How much austerity and discipline, how much faith and devotion, must be necessary for such a vision? The song went on, Worship his feet in the lotus of your heart, with mind serene and eyes made radiant. With heavenly love behold that matchless sight, again that bewitching smile. Body motionless as before, the eyes half shut as if beholding a strange inner vision. The song drew to a close. Narendra sang the last lines. Caught in the spell of his love's ecstasy immerse yourself forevermore, O mind in him who is pure knowledge and pure bliss. The sight of the Samadhi and the divine bliss he had witnessed left an indelible impression on Mahendra's mind. He returned home deeply moved. Now and then he could hear within himself the echo of those soul-intoxicating lines. Immerse yourself forevermore, O mind, in him who is pure knowledge and pure bliss. Worth visit. The next day, too, was a holiday for Mahendra. He arrived at Dakshin's war at three o'clock in the afternoon. Sri Ramakrishna was in his room. Narendra, Bhavanath, and a few other devotees were sitting on a mat spread on the floor. They were all young men of nineteen or twenty. Seated on the small couch, Sri Ramakrishna was talking with them and smiling. No sooner had Mahendra entered the room than the master laughed aloud and said to the boys there, He has come again. They all joined in the laughter. Mahendra bowed low before him and took a seat. Before this he had saluted the master with folded hands, like one with an English education. But that day he learned to fall down at his feet in orthodox Hindu fashion. The peacock and the opium. Presently the master explained the cause of his laughter to the devotees, he said. A man once fed a peacock with a pill of opium at four o'clock in the afternoon. The next day exactly at that time the peacock came back. It had felt the intoxication of the drug and returned just in time to have another dose. All laugh. Mahendra thought this a very apt illustration. Even at home he had been unable to banish the thought of Sri Ramakrishna for a moment. His mind was constantly at Dakshanswar and he had counted the minutes until he should go again. In the meantime the master was having great fun with the boys, treating them as if they were his most intimate friends. Heels of side-splitting laughter filled the room as if it were a mart of joy. The whole thing was a revelation to Mahendra, he thought. Didn't I see him only yesterday intoxicated with God? Wasn't he swimming then in the ocean of divine love a sight I had never seen before? And today the same person is behaving like an ordinary man. Wasn't it he who scolded me on the first day of my coming here? Didn't he admonish me saying, and you are a man of knowledge? Wasn't it he who said to me that God with form is as true as God without form? Didn't he tell me that God alone is real and all else illusory? Wasn't it he who advised me to live in the world unattached like a maidservant in a rich man's house? Sri Ramakrishna was having great fun with the young devotees. Now and then he glanced at Mahendra, he noticed that Mahendra sat in silence. The master said to Ramal, you see, he is a little advanced in years, and therefore somewhat serious. He sits quiet while the youngsters are making merry. Mahendra was then about twenty-eight years old. Hanuman's devotion to Rama. The conversation drifted to Hanuman, whose picture hung on the wall in the master's room. Three Ramakrishna said, Just imagine Hanuman's state of mind. He didn't care for money on or creature comforts or anything else. He longed only for God. When he was running away with the heavenly weapon that had been secreted in the crystal pillar, Mandadari began to tempt him with various fruits so that he might come down and drop the weapon. But he couldn't be tricked so easily. In reply to her persuasions he sang this song, Am I in need of fruit? I have the fruit that makes this life. Fruitful indeed. 
Within my heart the tree of Rama grows, bearing salvation for its fruit. Under the wish-fulfilling tree of Rama do I sit at ease, plucking whatever fruit I will. But if you speak of fruit, no beggar I for common fruit. Behold I go, leaving a bitter fruit for you. As Sri Ramakrishna was singing this song he went into Samadhi. Again the half-closed eyes and motionless body that one sees in his photograph. Just a minute before, the devotees had been making merry in his company. Now all eyes were riveted on him. Thus for the second time Mahendra saw the master in Samadhi. After a long time the master came back to ordinary consciousness. His face lighted up with a smile, and his body relaxed, his senses began to function in a normal way. He shed tears of joy as he repeated the holy name of Rama. Mahendra wondered whether this very saint was the person who a few minutes earlier had been behaving like a child of five. The master said to Narendra and Mahendra, I should like to hear you speak and argue in English. They both laughed, but they continued to talk in their mother tongue. It was impossible for Mahendra to argue any more before the master. Though Ramakrishna insisted, they did not talk in English. At five o'clock in the afternoon all the devotees except Narendra and Mahendra took leave of the master. As Mahendra was walking in the temple garden, he suddenly came upon the master talking to Narendra on the bank of the goose pond. Sri Ramakrishna said to Narendra, Look here. Come a little more often. You are a newcomer. On first acquaintance people visit each other quite often, as is the case with a lover and his sweetheart. Narendra and Mahendra laugh. So please come, won't you? Narendra, a member of the Brahmo Samaj, was very particular about his promises. He said with a smile, Yes, sir, I shall try. As they were returning to the master's room, Sri Ramakrishna said to Mahendra, When peasants go to market to buy bullocks for their plows, they can easily tell the good from the bad by touching their tails. On being touched there, some meekly lie down on the ground. The peasants recognize that these are without metal and so reject them. They select only those bullocks that frisk about and show spirit when their tails are touched. Narendra is like a bullock of this latter class. He is full of spirit within. The master smiled as he said this and continued, There are some people who have no grit whatever. They are like flattened rice soaked in milk soft and mushy. No inner strength. It was dusk. The master was meditating on God. He said to Mahendra, Go and talk to Narendra. Then tell me what you think of him. Evening worship was over in the temples. Mahendra met Narendra on the bank of the Ganges and they began to converse. Narendra told Mahendra about his studying in college, his being a member of the Brahmo Samaj and so on. It was now late in the evening and time for Mahendra's departure, but he felt reluctant to go and instead went in search of Sri Ramakrishna. He had been fascinated by the master's singing and wanted to hear more. At last he found the master pacing alone in the Natmandir in front of the Kali temple. A lamp was burning in the temple on either side of the image of the Divine Mother. The single lamp in the spacious Nat Mandir blended light and darkness into a kind of mystic twilight, in which the figure of the Master could be dimly seen. Mahendra had been enchanted by the Master's sweet music. With some hesitation he asked him whether there would be any more singing that evening. No, not tonight, said Sri Ramakrishna after a little reflection. Then, as if remembering something, he added, But I'm going soon to Balaram Bose's house in Calcutta. Come there and you'll hear me sing. Mahendra agreed to go. Master, do you know Balaram Bose? Mahendra, no, sir. I don't. Master, he lives in Bospera. Mahendra, well, sir, I shall find him. As Sri Ramakrishna walked up and down the hall with Mahendra, he said to him, Let me ask you something. What do you think of me? Mahendra remained silent. Again Sri Ramakrishna asked, What do you think of me? How many annas of knowledge of God have I? Mahendra, I don't understand what you mean by annas. But of this I am sure. I have never before seen such knowledge, ecstatic love, faith in God, renunciation and Catholicity anywhere. The master laughed. Mahendra bowed low before him and took his leave. 
He had gone as far as the main gate of the temple garden when he suddenly remembered something and came back to Sri Ramakrishna, who was still in the Natmandir. In the dim light the master, all alone, was pacing the hall, rejoicing in the self as the lion lives and roams alone in the forest. In silent wonder Mahendra surveyed that great soul. Master to Mahendra, what makes you come back? Mahendra, perhaps the house you asked me to go to belongs to a rich man. They may not let me in. Hey, I had better not go. I would rather meet you here. Master, oh no. Why should you think that? Just mention my name. Say that you want to see me. Then someone will take you to me. Mahendra nodded his assent and after saluting the master took his leave. Chapter 2 In the Company of Devotees March 11, 1882, Master at Balaram's House About eight o'clock in the morning Sri Ramakrishna went his plan to Balaram Bose's house in Calcutta. It was the day of the Dalayatra. Ram Menamohan, Rakhal, Nityagopal and other devotees were with him. Mahendra too came as bidden by the master. Devotees in trance. The devotees and the master sang and danced in a state of divine fervor. Several of them were in an ecstatic mood. Nityagopal's chest glowed with the upsurge of emotion, and Rakhal lay on the floor in ecstasy, completely unconscious of the world. The master put his hand on Rakhal's chest and said, Peace. Be quiet. This was Rakhal's first experience of ecstasy. He lived with his father in Calcutta and now and then visited the master at Dakshin's war. About this time he had studied a short while in Vidyasagar's school at Sampukar. When the music was over, the devotees sat down for their meal. Balaram stood there humbly like a servant. Nobody would have taken him for the master of the house. Mahendra was still a stranger to the devotees, having met only Narendra at Dakshin's war. A few days later Mahendra visited the master at Dakshin's war. It was between four and five o'clock in the afternoon. The master and he were sitting on the steps of the Shiva temples. Looking at the temple of Radha Kanta, across the courtyard the master went into an ecstatic mood. Since his nephew Hride's dismissal from the temple, Sri Ramakrishna had been living without an attendant. On account of his frequent spiritual moods he could hardly take care of himself. The lack of an attendant caused him great inconvenience. Bigotry condemned. Sri Ramakrishna was talking to Kali, the Divine Mother of the Universe. He said, Mother everyone says my watch alone is right. The Christians, the Brahmos, the Hindus, the Muslims all say my religion alone is true. But Mother the fact is that nobody's watch is right. Who can truly understand thee? But if a man prays to thee with a yearning heart, he can reach thee through thy grace by any path. Mother, show me some time how the Christians pray to thee in their churches. But mother, what will people say if I go in? Suppose they make a fuss. Suppose they don't allow me to enter the Kali temple again. Well then, show me the Christian worship from the door of the church. Mine's inability to comprehend God. Another day the master was seated on the small couch in his room, with his usual beaming countenance. Mahendra arrived with Kalakrishna, who did not know where his friend Mahendra was taking him. He had only been told, if you want to see a grog shop, then come with me. You will see a huge jar of wine there. Mahendra related this to Sri Ramakrishna, who laughed about it. The master said, The bliss of worship and communion with God is the true wine, the wine of ecstatic love. The goal of human life is to love God, bhakti is the one essential thing. To know God through jhana and reasoning is extremely difficult. Then the master sang, Who is there that can understand what Mother Kali is? Even the six darsanas are powerless to reveal her. The master said again, The one goal of life is to cultivate love for God, the love that the milkmaids, the milkmen, and the cowherd boys of Vrindavan felt for Krishna. When Krishna went away to Mathura, the cowherds roamed about weeping bitterly because of their separation from him. Saying this the master sang, with his eyes turned upward. Just now I saw a youthful cowherd with a young calf in his arms there he stood, by one hand holding the branch of a young tree. Where are you brother can I? 
He cried, but can I scarcely could he utter, Ka was as much as he could say. He cried, Where are you, brother? And his eyes were filled with tears. When Mahendra heard this song of the masters, laden with love, his eyes were moist with tears. April 2, 1882, Master's Visit to Keshab Sri Ramakrishna was sitting in the drawing room of Keshab Chandra Sen's house in Calcutta. It was five o'clock in the afternoon. When Keshab was told of his arrival, he came to the drawing room dressed to go out, for he was about to call on a sick friend. Now he cancelled his plan. The master said to him, You have so many things to attend to. Besides, you have to edit a newspaper. You have no time to come to Dakshain's war, so I have come to see you. When I heard of your illness, I vowed green coconut and sugar to the Divine Mother for your recovery. I said to her mother, If something happens to Keshab, with whom shall I talk in Calcutta? Sri Ramakrishna spoke to Pradap and the other Brahmo devotees. Mahendra was seated nearby. Pointing to him, the master said to Keshab, Will you please ask him why he doesn't come to Dakshans or any more? He repeatedly tells me he is not attached to his wife and children. Mahendra had been paying visits to the master for about a month. His absence for a time from Dakshans were called forth this remark. Sri Ramakrishna had asked Mahendra to write to him if his coming were delayed. Pandit Samadhyay was present. The Brahmo devotees introduced him to Sri Ramakrishna as a scholar well versed in the Vedas and the other scriptures. The master said, Yes, I can see inside him through his eyes, as one can see the objects in a room through the glass door. Trelakya sang. Suddenly the master stood up and went into Samadhi, repeating the mother's name. Coming down a little to the plane of sense consciousness, he danced and sang. I drink no ordinary wine, but wine of everlasting bliss as I repeat my mother Kali's name. It so intoxicates my mind that people take me to be drunk. First my guru gives molasses for the making of the wine. My longing is the ferment to transform it. Knowledge, the maker of the wine, prepares it for me then, and when it is done my mind imbibes it from the bottle of the mantra, taking the mother's name to make it pure. Drink of this wine, says Ramprasad, and the four fruits of life are yours. The master looked at Keshab tenderly as if Keshab were his very own. He seemed to fear that Keshab might belong to someone else, that is to say, that he might become a worldly person. Looking at him, the master sang again, We are afraid to speak, and yet we are afraid to keep still. Our minds, O oh Radha, half believe that we are about to lose you. We tell you the secret that we know the secret whereby we ourselves and others, with our help, have passed through many a time of peril. Now it all depends on you. Quoting the last part of the song, he said to Keshab, that is to say, renounce everything and call on God. He alone is real, all else is illusory. Without the realization of God, everything is futile. This is the great secret. The master sat down again and began to converse with the devotees. For a while he listened to a piano recital, enjoying it like a child. Then he was taken to the inner apartments, where he was served with refreshments and the ladies saluted him. As the master was leaving Keshab's house, the Brahma devotees accompanied him respectfully to his carriage. Sunday, April 9, 1882, Sri Ramakrishna was seated with his devotees in the drawing room of Prang Krishna Mukherjee's house in Calcutta. It was between one and two o'clock in the afternoon. Since Colonel Viswanath IV lived in that neighborhood, the master intended to visit him before going to see Keshab at the Lily Cottage. A number of neighbors and other friends of Prang Krishna had been invited to meet Sri Ramakrishna. They were all eager to hear his words. God and his glory and dangers of worldly life master. God and his glory. This universe is his glory. People see his glory and forget everything. They do not seek God whose glory is this world. All seek to enjoy woman and gold. But there is too much misery and worry in that. This world is like the whirlpool of the Vizalaxi. Once a boat gets into it there is no hope of its rescue. Again, the world is like a thorny bush. You have hardly freed yourself from one set of thorns before you find yourself entangled in another. Once you enter a labyrinth you find it very difficult to get out. Living in the world a man becomes seared as it were. 
a devotee, then what is the way, sir? Prayer in holy company and earnest longing. Master, prayer in the company of holy men. You cannot get rid of an ailment without the help of a physician. But it is not enough to be in the company of religious people only for a day. You should constantly seek it for the disease has become chronic. Again, you can't understand the pulse rightly unless you live with a physician. Moving with him constantly, you learn to distinguish between the pulse of phlegm and the pulse of bile. Devotee, what is the good of holy company? Master, it begets yearning for God. It begets love of God. Nothing whatsoever is achieved in spiritual life without yearning. By constant living in the company of holy men, the soul becomes restless for God. This yearning is like the state of mind of a man who has someone ill in the family. His mind is in a state of perpetual restlessness, thinking how the sick person may be cured. Or again, one should feel a yearning for God like the yearning of a man who has lost his job and is wandering from one office to another in search of work. If he is rejected at a certain place which has no vacancy, he goes there again the next day and inquires, Is there in vacancy today? There is another way, earnestly praying to God. God is our very own. We should say to him, O God, what is thy nature? Reveal thyself to me. Thou must show thyself to me, for why else hast thou created me? Some Sikh devotees once said to me, God is full of compassion. I said, but why should we call him compassionate? He is our creator. What is there to be wondered at if he is kind to us? Parents bring up their children. Do you call that an act of kindness? They must act that way. Therefore we should force our demands on God. He is our father and mother, isn't he? If the son demands his patrimony and gives up food and drink in order to enforce his demand, then the parents hand his share over to him three years before the legal time. Or when the child demands some pice from his mother and says over and over again, Mother, give me a couple of pice. I beg you on my knees. Then the mother, seeing his earnestness, and unable to bear it any more, tosses the money to him. There is another benefit from holy company. It helps one cultivate discrimination between the real and the unreal. God alone is the real, that is to say, the eternal substance, and the world is unreal, that is to say, transitory. As soon as a man finds his mind wandering away to the unreal, he should apply discrimination. The moment an elephant stretches out its trunk to eat a plantain tree in a neighbor's garden, it gets a blow from the iron goat of the driver. Explanation of Evil A neighbor, why does a man have sinful tendencies? Master, in God's creation there are all sorts of things. He has created bad men as well as good men. It is he who gives us good tendencies, and it is he again who gives us evil tendencies. Neighbor, in that case we aren't responsible for our sinful actions, are we? Master, sin begets its own result. This is God's law. Won't you burn our tongue if you chew a chili? In his youth Mather six led a rather fast life, so he suffered from various diseases before his death. One may not realize this in youth. I have looked into the hearth in the kitchen of the Kali temple when logs are being burnt. At first the wet wood burns rather well. It doesn't seem then that it contains much moisture. But when the wood is sufficiently burnt, all the moisture runs back to one end. At last water squirts from the fuel and puts out the fire. So one should be careful about anger, passion, and greed. Take for instance the case of Henneman. In a fit of anger he burnt Ceylon. At last he remembered that Sita was living in the Ahsoka Grove. Then he began to tremble lest the fire should injure her. Neighbor, why has God created wicked people? Master, that is his will, his play. In his Maya there exists Avidya as well as Vidya. Darkness is needed too. It reveals all the more the glory of light. There is no doubt that anger, lust, and greed are evils. Why then has God created them? In order to create saints. A man becomes a saint by conquering the senses. Is there anything impossible for a man who has subdued his passions? He can even realize God through his grace. Again see how his whole play of creation is perpetuated through lust. Wicked people are needed too. 
At one time the tenants of an estate became unruly. The landlord had to send Golak Chowdhury who was a ruffian. He was such a harsh administrator that the tenants trembled at the very mention of his name. There is need of everything. Once Sita said to her husband, Rama it would be grand if every house in Ihedia were a mansion. I find many houses old and dilapidated. But my dear, said Rama, if all the houses were beautiful ones, what would the masons do? Laughter. God has created all kinds of things. He has created good trees and poisonous plants and weeds as well. Among the animals there are good, bad and all kinds of creatures, tigers, lions, snakes and so on. Washing away the heart's impurities with tears, neighbor. Sir, is it ever possible to realize God while leading the life of a householder? Master, certainly. But as I said just now, one must live in holy company and pray unceasingly. One should weep for God. When the impurities of the mind are thus washed away, one realizes God. The mind is like a needle covered with mud, and God is like a magnet. The needle cannot be united with the magnet unless it is free from mud. Tears wash away the mud, which is nothing but lust, anger, greed and other evil tendencies, and the inclination to worldly enjoyments as well. As soon as the mud is washed away, the magnet attracts the needle, that is to say, man realizes God. Only the pure in heart see God. A fever patient has an excess of the watery element in his system. What can quinine do for him unless that is removed? Why shouldn't one realize God while living in the world? As I said, one must live in holy company, pray to God, weeping for his grace and now and then go into solitude. Unless the plants on a footpath are protected at first by fences, they are destroyed by cattle. Need of a guru. Neighbor, then householders too will have the vision of God, won't they? Master, everybody will surely be liberated. But one should follow the instructions of the guru. If one follows a devious path, one will suffer in trying to retrace one's steps. It takes a long time to achieve liberation. A man may fail to obtain it in this life. Perhaps he will realize God only after many births. Sages like Janaka performed worldly duties. They performed them, bearing God in their minds, as a dancing girl dances, keeping jars or trays on her head. Haven't you seen how the women in northwest India walk, talking and laughing while carrying water pitchers on their beads? Neighbor, you just referred to the instructions of the Kuru. How shall we find him? Master, anyone and everyone cannot be a Kuru. A huge timber floats on the water and can carry animals as well. But a piece of worthless wood sinks if a man sits on it and drowns him. Therefore in every age God incarnates himself as the Guru, to teach humanity. Satchitananda alone is the Guru. What is knowledge? And what is the nature of this ego? God alone is the doer, and none else that is knowledge. I am not the doer, I am a mere instrument in his hand. Therefore I say, O mother thou art the operator and I am the machine. Thou art the indweller and I am the house. Thou art the driver and I am the carriage. I move as thou movest me. I do as thou makest me do. I speak as thou makest me speak. Not I, not I, but thou, but thou. From praying Krishna's house the master went to Colonel Viswanath's and from there to the lily cottage. Chapter 3 Visit to Vidyasagar August 5, 1882 Pundit Iswar Chandra Vidya Sagar was born in the village of Birsing, not far from Kemarpukar, Sri Ramakrishna's birthplace. He was known as a great scholar, educator, writer and philanthropist. One of the creators of modern Bengali, he was also well versed in Sanskrit grammar and poetry. His generosity made his name a household word with his countrymen, most of his income being given in charity to widows, orphans, indigent students, and other needy people. Nor was his compassion limited to human beings. He stopped drinking milk for years so that the calves should not be deprived of it, and he would not drive in a carriage for fear of causing discomfort to the horses. He was a man of indomitable spirit, which he showed when he gave up the lucrative position of principal of the Sanskrit College of Calcutta because of a disagreement with the authorities. 
his affection for his mother was especially deep. One day, in the absence of a ferry boat, he swam a raging river at the risk of his life to fulfill her wish that he should be present at his brother's wedding. His whole life was one of utter simplicity. The title Vidyasagar, meaning Ocean of Learning, was given him in recognition of his vast erudition. Master's Visit to the Scholar Sri Ramakrishna had long wanted to visit Iswar Chandra Vidyasagar. Learning from Mahendra that he was a teacher at Vidyasagar's school, the master asked, Can you take me to Vidyasagar? I should like very much to see him. Mahendra told Iswar Chandra of Sri Ramakrishna's wish, and the pundit gladly agreed that Mahendra should bring the master some Saturday afternoon at four o'clock. He only asked Mahendra what kind of Paramahamsa the master was, saying, Does he wear an ochre cloth? Mahendra answered, No, sir. He is an unusual person. He wears a red-bordered cloth and polished slippers. He lives in a room in Rani Resmani's temple garden. In his room there is a couch with a mattress and mosquito net. He has no outer indication of holiness. But he doesn't know anything except God. Day and night he thinks of God alone. On the afternoon of August 5 the master left actions were in a hackney carriage accompanied by Bhavanath, Mahendra and Hazara. Vidyasagar lived in Badarbagan in central Calcutta, about six miles from Dakshanswar. On the way Sri Ramakrishna talked with his companions, but as the carriage neared Vidyasagar's house his mood suddenly changed. He was overpowered with divine ecstasy. Not noticing this, Mahendra pointed out the garden house where Raja Ramohan Roy had lived. The master was annoyed and said, I don't care about such things now. He was going into an ecstatic state. The carriage stopped in front of Vidyasagar's house. The master alighted, supported by Mahendra, who then led the way. In the courtyard were many flowering plants. As the master walked to the house, he said to Mahendra, like a child, pointing to his shirt button, my shirt is unbuttoned. Will that offend Vidyasagar? Oh no, said Mahendra, don't be anxious about it. Nothing about you will be offensive. You don't have to button your shirt. He accepted the assurance simply like a child. Vidyasagar was about sixty-two years old, sixteen or seventeen years older than the master. He lived in a two-story house built in the English fashion, with lawns on all sides and surrounded by a high wall. After climbing the stairs to the second floor, Sri Ramakrishna and his devotees entered a room at the far end of which Vidyasagar was seated facing them, with a table in front of him. To the right of the table was a bench. Some friends of their host occupied chairs on the other two sides. Vidyasagar rose to receive the master. Sri Ramakrishna stood in front of the bench, with one hand resting on the table. He gazed at Vidyasagar as if they had known each other before and smiled in an ecstatic mood. In that mood he remained standing a few minutes. Now and then to bring his mind back to normal consciousness he said, I shall have a drink of water. In the meantime the young members of the household and a few friends and relatives of Vidyasagar had gathered around. Sri Ramakrishna, still in an ecstatic mood, sat on the bench. A young man, seventeen or eighteen years old, who had come to Vidyasagar to seek financial help for his education, was seated there. The master sat down at a little distance from the boy, saying in an abstracted mood, Mother, this boy is very much attached to the world. He belongs to thy realm of ignorance. Vidyasagar told someone to bring water and asked Mahendra whether the master would like some sweetmeats also. Since Mahendra did not object, Vidyasagar himself went eagerly to the inner apartments and brought the sweets. They were placed before the master. Bhavanath and Hazra also received their share. When they were offered to Mahendra, Vidyasagar said, Oh, he is like one of the family. We needn't worry about him. Referring to a young devotee, the master said to Vidyasagar, He is a nice young man and is sound at the core. He is like the river Falgu. The surface is covered with sand but if you dig a little you will find water flowing underneath. After taking some of the sweets the master with a smile began to speak to Vidyasagar. Meanwhile the room had become filled with people. Some were standing and others were seated. Master, ah! 
Today at last I have come to the ocean. Up till now I have seen only canals, marshes, or a river at the most. But today I am face to face with the sagar, the ocean. All laugh. Vidyasagar smiling, then please take home some salt water. Laughter. Master, oh no. Why salt water? You aren't the ocean of ignorance. You are the ocean of Vidya knowledge. You are the ocean of condensed milk. All laugh. Vidyasagar, well you may put it that way. The pundit became silent. Sri Ramakrishna said, Your activities are inspired by Sattva. Though they are Rajasic, they are influenced by Sattva. Compassion springs from Sattva. The work for the good of others belongs to Rajas, yet this Rajas has Sattva for its basis, and is not harmful. Sukha and other sages cherished compassion in their minds to give people religious instruction, to teach them about God. You are distributing food and learning. That is good too. If these activities are done in a selfless spirit they lead to God. But most people work for fame or to acquire merit. Their activities are not selfless. Besides, you are already a Sita. Vidyasagar, how is that sir? Master laughing, when potatoes and other vegetables are well cooked, they become soft and tender. And you possess such a tender nature. You are so compassionate. Laughter. Vidyasagar laughing, but when the paste of Kali pulse is boiled it becomes all the harder. Uninspired scholarship condemned. Master, but you don't belong to that class. Your pundits are like diseased fruit that becomes hard and will not ripen at all. Such fruit has neither the freshness of green fruit, nor the flavor of ripe. Vultures soar very high in the sky, but their eyes are fixed on rotten carrion on the ground. The book learned are reputed to be wise, but they are attached to woman and gold. Like the vultures they are in search of carrion. They are attached to the world of ignorance. Compassion, love of God and renunciation are the glories of true knowledge. Vidyasagar listened to these words in silence. The others too gazed at the master and were attentive to every word he said. Vidyasagar was very reticent about giving religious instruction to others. He had studied Hindu philosophy. Once when Mahendra had asked him his opinion of it, Vidyasagar had said, I think the philosophers have failed to explain what was in their minds. But in his daily life he followed all the rituals of Hindu religion and wore the sacred thread of a Brahmin. About God he had once declared, It is indeed impossible to know him. What then, should be our duty? It seems to me that we should live in such a way that, if others followed our example, this very earth would be heaven. Everyone should try to do good to the world. The world of duality and transcendental nature of Brahman Sri Ramakrishna's conversation now turned to the knowledge of Brahman. Master, Brahman is beyond Vidya and Avidya knowledge and ignorance. It is beyond Maya, the illusion of duality. The world consists of the illusory duality of knowledge and ignorance. It contains knowledge and devotion and also attachment to woman and gold, righteousness and unrighteousness, good and evil. But Brahman is unattached to these. Good and evil apply to the jiva, the individual soul, as do righteousness and unrighteousness, but Brahman is not at all affected by them. One man may read the Bhagavata by the light of a lamp, and another may commit a forgery by that very light, but the lamp is unaffected. The sun sheds its light on the wicked as well as on the virtuous. You may ask how then, can one explain misery and sin and unhappiness? The answer is that these apply only to the jiva. Brahman is unaffected by them. There is poison in a snake, but though others may die if bitten by it, the snake itself is not affected by the poison. Brahman cannot be expressed in words. What Brahman is cannot he described. All things in the world, the Vedas, the Puranas, the Tantras, the six systems of philosophy have been defiled like food that has been touched by the tongue, for they have been read or uttered by the tongue. Only one thing has not been defiled in this way, and that is Brahman. No one has ever been able to say what Brahman is. Vidyasagar to his friends, oh, that is a remarkable statement. I have learnt something new today. Master, a man had two sons. 
the fathers sent them to a preceptor to learn the knowledge of Brahman. After a few years they returned from their preceptor's house and bowed low before their father. Wanting to measure the depth of their knowledge of Brahman, he first questioned the older of the two boys. My child, he said, you have studied all the scriptures. Now tell me, what is the nature of Brahman? The boy began to explain Brahman by reciting various texts from the Vedas. The father did not say anything. Then he asked the younger son the same question. But the boy remained silent and stood with eyes cast down. No word escaped his lips. The father was pleased and said to him, My child, you have understood a little of Brahman. What it is cannot be expressed in words. Parable of Ant and Sugar Hill Men often think they have understood Brahman fully. Once an ant went to a hill of sugar. One grain filled its stomach. Taking another grain in its mouth it started homeward. On its way it thought, Next time I shall carry home the whole hill. That is the way shallow minds think. They don't know that Brahman is beyond one's words and thought. However great a man may be, how much can he know of Brahman? Sukadva and sages like him may have been big ants, but even they could carry at the utmost eight or ten grains of sugar. As for what has been said in the Vedas and the Puranas, do you know what it is like? Suppose a man has seen the ocean and somebody asks him, well, what is the ocean like? The first man opens his mouth as wide as he can and says, What a sight! What tremendous waves and sounds! The description of Brahman in the sacred books is like that. It is said in the Vedas that Brahman is of the nature of bliss. It is Satchitananda. Sukha and other sages stood on the shore of this ocean of Brahman and saw and touched the water. According to one school of thought they never plunged into it. Those who do cannot come back to the world again. Parable of Salt All In Samadhi one attains the knowledge of Brahman one realizes Brahman. In that state reasoning stops altogether and man becomes mute. He has no power to describe the nature of Brahman. Once a salt doll went to measure the depth of the ocean. All laugh. It wanted to tell others how deep the water was. But this it could never do, for no sooner did it get into the water than it melted. Now who is there to report the ocean's depth? A devotee, suppose a man has obtained the knowledge of Brahman in Samadhi. Doesn't he speak any more? Master, Sankara Karya retained the ego of knowledge in order to teach others. After the vision of Brahman a man becomes silent. He reasons about it as long as he has not realized it. If you heat butter in a pan on the stove, it makes a sizzling sound as long as the water it contains has not dried up but when no trace of water is left the clarified butter makes no sound. If you put an uncooked cake of flour in that butter it sizzles again. But after the cake is cooked all sound stops. Just so a man established in Samedi comes down to the relative plane of consciousness in order to teach others, and then he talks about God. The bee buzzes as long as it is not sitting on a flower. It becomes silent when it begins to sip the honey but sometimes intoxicated with the honey it buzzes again. An empty pitcher makes a gurgling sound when it is dipped in water. When it fills up it becomes silent. All laugh. But if the water is poured from it into another pitcher, then you will hear the sound again. Laughter. Rishis of ancient India. The Rishis of old attain the knowledge of Brahman. One cannot have this so long as there is the slightest trace of worldliness. How hard the rishis labored. Early in the morning they would go away from the hermitage and would spend the whole day in solitude meditating on Brahman. At night they would return to the hermitage and eat a little fruit or roots. They kept their minds aloof from the objects of sight, hearing, touch, and other things of a worldly nature. Only thus did they realize Brahman as their own inner consciousness. But in the Kali Yuga man being totally dependent on food for life, cannot altogether shake off the idea that he is the body. In this state of mind it is not proper for him to say I am he. When a man does all sorts of worldly things, he should not say I am Brahman. Those who cannot give up attachment to worldly things, and who find no means to shake off the feeling of I, should rather cherish the idea I am God's servant, I am his devotee. One can also realize God by following the path of devotion. Johnny and Vijani.
that Johnny gives up his identification with worldly things, discriminating not this, not this. Only then can he realize Brahman. It is like reaching the roof of a house by leaving the steps behind one by one. But the Vijani who is more intimately acquainted with Brahman realizes something more. He realizes that the steps are made of the same materials as the roof, bricks, lime and brick dust. That which is realized intuitively as Brahman, through the eliminating process of not this, not this, is then found to have become the universe and all its living beings. The Vijani sees that the reality which is Nirguna, without attributes, is also Saguna with attributes. A man cannot live on the roof a long time. He comes down again. Those who realize Brahman and Samadhi come down also and find that it is Brahman that has become the universe and its living beings. In the musical scale, there are the notes Sa, Riga, Ma, Pa, Te, and Nai, but one cannot keep one's voice on Nai a long time. The ego does not vanish altogether. The man coming down from Samadhi perceives that it is Brahman that has become the ego, the universe, and all living beings. This is known as Vijana. Path of love is easy. The path of knowledge leads to truth, as does the path that combines knowledge and love. The path of love too leads to this goal. The way of love is as true as the way of knowledge. All paths ultimately lead to the same truth. But as long as God keeps the feeling of ego in us, it is easier to follow the path of love. The Vijani sees that Brahman is immovable and actionless, like Mount Sumeru. This universe consists of the three Gunasava, Rajas and Tamas. They are in Brahman. But Brahman is unattached. God's supernatural powers. The Vijani further sees that what is Brahman is the Bhagavan, the personal God. He who is beyond the three gunas is the Bhagavan with his six supernatural powers. Living beings, the universe, mind, intelligence, love, renunciation, knowledge, all these are the manifestations of his power. With a laugh, if an aristocrat has neither house nor property, or if he has been forced to sell them, one doesn't call him an aristocrat anymore. All laugh. God is endowed with the six supernatural powers. If he were not, who would obey him? All laugh. Different manifestations of God's power. Just see how picturesque this universe is. How many things there are. The sun, moon and stars and how many varieties of living beings. Big and small, good and bad, strong and weak some endowed with more power some with less. Vidyasagar, has he endowed some with more power and others with less? Master, as the all-pervading spirit he exists in all beings, even in the ant. But the manifestations of his power are different in different beings, otherwise how can one person put ten to flight while another can't face even one? And why do all people respect you? Have you grown a pair of horns? Laughter. You have more compassion and learning. Therefore people honor you and come to pay you their respects. Don't you agree with me? Vidyasagar smiled. The master continued, There is nothing in mere scholarship. The object of study is to find means of knowing God and realizing Him. A holy man had a book. When asked what it contained, he opened it and showed that on all the pages were written the words Om Rama and nothing else. What is the significance of the Gita? It is what you find by repeating the word ten times. It is then reversed into Tagi which means a person who has renounced everything for God. And the lesson of the Gita is, O man, renounce everything and seek God alone. Whether a man is a monk or a householder, he has to shake off all attachment from his mind. Chaitanya set out on a pilgrimage to southern India. One day he saw a man reading the Gita. Another man seated at a distance was listening and weeping. His eyes were swimming in tears. Chaitanyeva asked him, Do you understand all this? The man said, No, revered sir, I don't understand a word of the text. Then why are you crying? asked Chaitanya. The devotee said, I see Arjuna's chariot before me. I see Lord Krishna and Arjuna seated in front of it talking. I see this and I weep. Why does a Vijani keep an attitude of love toward God? The answer is that I consciousness persists. 
It disappears in the state of samadhi, no doubt, but it comes back. In the case of ordinary people, that I never disappears. You may cut down the aswat, the tree, but the next day sprouts shoot up. All laugh. Ego causes our sufferings. Even after the attainment of knowledge, this I consciousness comes up, nobody knows from where. You dream of a tiger. Then you will wake, but your heart keeps on palpitating. All our suffering is due to this I. The cow cries, Hamba, which means I. That is why it suffers so much. It is yoked to the plow and made to work in rain and sun. Then it may be killed by the butcher. From its hide shoes are made and also drums which are mercilessly beaten. Laughter. Still it does not escape suffering. At last strings are made out of its entrails for the bows used in carting cotton. Then it no longer says hamba. Hamba. I. I. But to who? To who? Thou. Thou. Only then are its troubles over. O Lord, I am the servant. Thou art the master. I am the child. Thou art the mother. Once Rama asked Hanuman, How do you look on me? And Hanuman replied, O Rama, as long as I have the feeling of I, I see that thou art the whole and I am a part. Thou art the master and I am thy servant. But when, O Rama, I have the knowledge of truth, then I realize that thou art I and I am thou. The relationship of master and servant is the proper one. Since this I must remain, let the rascal be God's servant. Evil of I and mine, I and mine, these constitute ignorance. My house, my wealth, my learning, my possessions, the attitude that prompts one to say such things comes of ignorance. On the contrary, the attitude born of knowledge is, O God, thou art the master, and all these things belong to thee. House, family, children, attendants, friends are thine. One should constantly remember death. Nothing will survive death. We are born into this world to perform certain duties like the people who come from the countryside to Calcutta on business. If a visitor goes to a rich man's garden, the superintendent says to him, This is our garden, this is our lake, and so forth. But if the superintendent is dismissed for some esteem, he can't carry away even his mango wood chest. He sends it secretly by the gatekeeper. Laughter. God laughs on two occasions. He laughs when the physician says to the patient's mother, Don't be afraid, mother. I shall certainly cure your boy. God laughs, saying to himself, I am going to take his life, and this man says he will save it. The physician thinks he is the master, forgetting that God is the master. God laughs again when two brothers divide their land with a string, saying to each other, This side is mine and that side is your. He laughs and says to himself, the whole universe belongs to me, but they say they own this portion or that portion. Can one know God through reasoning? Be his servant, surrender yourself to him, and then pray to him. To Vidyasagar with a smile, well, what is your attitude? Vidyasagar smiling, someday I shall confide it to you. All laugh, master laughing, God cannot be realized through mere scholarly reasoning. Intoxicated with divine love, the master sang, who is there that can understand what Mother Kali is? Even the six Darsanas are powerless to reveal her. It is she, the scriptures say, that is the inner self of the yogi, who in self discovers all his joy. She that of her own sweet will inhabits every living thing. The macrocosm and microcosm rest in the mother's womb. Now do you see how vast it is? In the Miladhara the yogi meditates on her, and in the Sasrara, who but Shiva has beheld her as she really is. Within the lotus wilderness she sports beside her mate the swan. When man aspires to understand her, Ramprasad must smile. To think of knowing her, he says, is quite as laughable as to imagine one can swim across the boundless sea. But while my mind has understood, alas, my heart has not, though but a dwarf it still would strive to make a captive of the moon. Continuing the master said, Did you notice? The macrocosm and microcosm rest in the mother's womb. Now do you see how vast it is? Again the poet says, Even the six darsanas are powerless to reveal her. She cannot be realized by means of mere scholarship. Power of faith. One must have faith and love. 
let me tell you how powerful faith is. A man was about to cross the sea from Ceylon to India. Bhabhishana said to him, Tie this thing in a corner of your wearing cloth, and you will cross the sea safely. You will be able to walk on the water. But be sure not to examine it or you will sink. The man was walking easily on the water of the sea such as the strength of faith when, having gone part of the way, he thought, What is this wonderful thing by Bishana has given me, that I can walk even on the water? He untied the knot and found only a leaf with the name of Rama written on it. Oh just this! He thought and instantly he sank. There is a popular saying that Hanuman jumped over the sea through his faith in Rama's name, but Rama himself had to build a bridge. If a man has faith in God, then he need not be afraid though he may have committed sin nay, the vilest sin. Then Sri Ramakrishna sang a song glorifying the power of faith, If only I can pass away repeating Durga's name, how canst thou then, O blessed one, withhold from me deliverance, wretched though I may be? The Master continued, Faith and Devotion. One realizes God easily through devotion. He is grasped through ecstasy of love. With these words the Master sang again, How are you trying, O my mind, to know the nature of God? You are groping like a madman locked in a dark room. He is grasped through ecstatic love. How can you fathom him without it? Only through affirmation, never negation, can you know him, neither through Veda nor through Tantra nor the six Darsanas. It is in love's elixir only that he delights, O mind. He dwells in the body's inmost depths in everlasting joy. And for that love, the mighty yogis practice yoga from age to age, when love awakes the Lord like a magnet, draws to him the soul. He it is, says Ramprasad, that I approach his mother, but must I give away this secret here in the marketplace? From the hints I have given, O oh mine, guess what that being is. While singing the master went into Samadhi. He was seated on the bench, facing west, the palms of his hands joined together, his body erect and motionless. Everyone watched him expectantly. Vidyasagar too was speechless and could not take his eyes from the master. Raman and Sakti are identical. After a time Sri Ramakrishna showed signs of regaining the normal state. He drew a deep breath and said with a smile, The means of realizing God are ecstasy of love and devotion that is, one must love God. He who is Brahman is addressed as the mother. He it is, says Ramprasad, that I approach his mother, but must I give away the secret here in the marketplace? From the hints I have given, O oh mind, guess what that being is. Ramprasad asks the mind only to guess the nature of God. He wishes it to understand that what is called Brahman in the Vedas is addressed by him as the mother. He who is attributeless also has attributes. He who is Brahman is also Sakti. When thought of as inactive he is called Brahman, and when thought of as the creator, preserver and destroyer, he is called the primordial energy Kali. Brahman and Sakti are identical like fire and its power to bum. When we talk of fire we automatically mean also its power to burn. Again the fire's power to burn implies the fire itself. If you accept the one you must accept the other. Brahman alone is addressed as the mother. This is because a mother is an object of great love. One is able to realize God just through love. Ecstasy of feeling, devotion, love and faith these are the means. Listen to a song, as is a man's meditation, so is his feeling of love, as is a man's feeling of love, so is his gain, and faith is the root of all. If in the nectar lake of Mother Kali's feet, my mind remains immersed of little use or worship, oblations or sacrifice. Growth of divine love lessens worldly duties. What is needed is absorption in God loving him intensely. The nectar lake is the lake of immortality. A man sinking in it does not die, but becomes immortal. Some people believe that by thinking of God too much the mind becomes deranged, but that is not true. God is the lake of nectar, the ocean of immortality. He is called the immortal in the Vedas. Sinking in it one does not die, but verily transcends death. Of little use are worship, oblations or sacrifice. If a man comes to love God, he need not trouble himself much about these activities. 
One needs a fan only as long as there is no breeze. And may be laid aside if the southern breeze blows. Then what need is there of a fan? To Vidyasagar the activities that you are engaged in are good. It is very good if you can perform them in a selfless spirit renouncing egotism, giving up the idea that you are the doer. Through such action one develops love and devotion to God and ultimately realizes Him. The more you come to love God, the less you will be inclined to perform action. When the daughter-in-law is with child, her mother-in-law gives her less work to do. As time goes by she is given less and less work. When the time of delivery nears, she is not allowed to do any work at all, lest it should hurt the child or cause difficulty at the time of birth. By these philanthropic activities you are really doing good to yourself. If you can do them disinterestedly, your mind will become pure and you will develop love of God. As soon as you have that love you will realize Him. Man cannot really help the world. God alone does that He who has created the sun and the moon, who has put love for their children in parents' hearts, endowed noble souls with compassion, and holy men and devotees with divine love. The man who works for others, without any selfish motive, really does good to himself. There is gold buried in your heart but you are not yet aware of it. It is covered with a thin layer of clay. Once you are aware of it, all these activities of yours will lessen. After the birth of her child, the daughter-in-law in the family busies herself with it alone. Everything she does is only for the child. Her mother-in-law doesn't let her do any household duties. Parable of the Woodcutter Go forward. A woodcutter once entered a forest to gather wood. A brahmachari said to him, Go forward. He obeyed the injunction and discovered some sandalwood trees. After a few days he reflected, the holy man asked me to go forward. He didn't tell me to stop here. So he went forward and found a silver mine. After a few days he went still farther and discovered a gold mine and next mines of diamonds and precious stones. With these he became immensely rich. Through selfless work love of God grows in the heart. Then through his grace one realizes him in course of time. God can be seen. One can talk to him as I am talking to you. In silent wonder they all sat listening to the master's words. It seemed to them that the goddess of wisdom herself, seated on Sri Ramakrishna's tongue was addressing these words not merely to Vidyasagar, but to all humanity for its good. It was nearly nine o'clock in the evening. The master was about to leave. Master to Vidyasagar, with a smile, the words I have spoken are really superfluous. You know all this, you simply aren't conscious of it. There are countless gems in the coffers of Varuna. But he himself isn't aware of them. Vidyasagar with a smile, you may say as you like. Master smiling, oh yes. There are many wealthy people who don't know the names of all their servants and are even unaware of many of the precious things in their houses. All laugh. Everybody was delighted with the master's conversation. Again addressing Vidyasagar, he said with a smile, Please visit the temple garden sometime, I mean the garden of Rasmani. It's a charming place. Vidyasagar, oh of course I shall go. You have so kindly come here to see me, and shall I not return your visit? Master, visit me. Oh never think of such a thing. Vidyasagar, why sir? Why do you say that? May I ask you to explain? Master smiling, you see we are like small fishing boats. All smile. We can ply in small canals and shallow waters and also in big rivers. But you are a ship. You may run aground on the way. All laugh. Vidya Sigur remained silent. Sri Ramakrishna said with a laugh, but even a ship can go there at this season. Vidya Sigur smiling, yes this is the monsoon season. All laugh. Mahendra said to himself, this is indeed the monsoon season of newly awakened love. At such times one doesn't care for prestige or formalities. Sri Ramakrishna then took leave of Vidyasagar, who with his friends escorted the master to the main gate, leading the way with a lighted candle in his hand. Before leaving the room, the master prayed for the family's welfare, going into an ecstatic mood as he did so. 
As soon as the master and the devotees reached the gate, they saw an unexpected sight and stood still. In front of them was a bearded gentleman of fair complexion, aged about thirty-six. He wore his clothes like a Bengali, but on his head was a white turban tied after the fashion of the Sikhs. No sooner did he see the master than he fell prostrate before him, turban and all. When he stood up the master said, Who is this? Balaram? Why so late in the evening? Balaram, I have been waiting here a long time, sir. Master, why didn't you come in? Balaram, all were listening to you. I didn't like to disturb you. The master got into the carriage with his companions. Vidyasagar to Mahendra softly, Shall I pay the carriage higher? Mahendra, oh don't bother please. It is taken care of. Vidyasagar and his friends bowed to Sri Ramakrishna and the carriage started for Dakshinswar. But the little group with the venerable Vidyasagar at their head holding the lighted candle stood at the gate and gazed after the master until he was out of sight. Chapter 4 Advice to Householders August 13, 1882 The master was conversing with Kedar and some other devotees in his room in the temple garden. Kedar was a government official and had spent several years at Dhaka in East Bengal where he had become a friend of Vijay Goswami. The two would spend a great part of their time together, talking about Sri Ramakrishna and his spiritual experiences. Kedar had once been a member of the Brahmo Samaj. He followed the path of Bhakti. Spiritual talk always brought tears to his eyes. It was five o'clock in the afternoon. Kedar was very happy that day, having arranged a religious festival for Sri Ramakrishna. A singer had been hired by Ram, and the whole day passed in joy. Secret of Divine Communion The Master explained to the devotees the secret of communion with God. Master, with the realization of and one goes into Samadhi. Then duties drop away. Suppose I have been talking about the Ostat and he arrives. What need is there of talking about him then? How long does the bee buzz around? So long as it isn't sitting on a flower. But it will not do for the Sadhaka to renounce duties. He should perform his duties such as worship, japa, meditation, prayer, and pilgrimage. If you see someone engaged in reasoning even after he has realized God, you may liken him to a bee which also buzzes a little even while sipping honey from a flower. The master was highly pleased with the Ostad's music. He said to the musician, There is a special manifestation of God's power in a man who has any outstanding gift such as proficiency in music. Musician, sir, what is the way to realize God? Master, bhakti is the one essential thing. To be sure God exists in all beings. Who then is a devotee? He whose mind dwells on God. But this is not possible as long as one has egotism and vanity. The water of God's grace cannot collect on the high mound of egotism. It runs down. I am a mere machine. Master's respect for other faiths to Kedar and the other devotees God can be realized through all paths. All religions are true. The important thing is to reach the roof. You can reach it by stone stairs or by wooden stairs or by bamboo steps or by a rope. You can also climb up by a bamboo pole. Many names of one God. You may say that there are many errors and superstitions in another religion. I should reply, suppose there are. Every religion has errors. Everyone thinks that his watch alone gives the correct time. It is enough to have yearning for God. It is enough to love Him and feel attracted to Him. Don't you know that God is the inner guide? He sees the longing of our heart and the yearning of our soul. Suppose a man has several sons. The older boys address him distinctly as Baba or Papa, but the babies can at best call him Baba or Pa. Now will the father be angry with those who address him in this indistinct way? The father knows that they too are calling him, only they cannot pronounce his name well. All children are the same to the father. Likewise, the devotees call on God alone, though by different names. They call on one person only. God is one, but his names are many. Thursday, August 24, 1882
Sri Ramakrishna was talking to Hazra on the long northeast veranda of his room when Mahendra arrived. He saluted the master reverently. Spiritual disciplines necessary at the beginning. Master, I should like to visit Iswar Chandra Vidyasagar a few times more. The painter first draws the general outlines, and then puts in the details and colors at his leisure. The molder first makes the image out of clay, then plasters it, then gives it a coat of whitewash, and last of all paints it with a brush. All these steps must be taken successively. Vidyasigar is fully ready, but his inner stuff is covered with a thin layer. He is now engaged in doing good works, but he doesn't know what is within himself. Gold is hidden within him. God dwells within us. If one knows that, one feels like giving up all activities and praying to God with a yearning soul. So the master talked with Mahendra now standing, now pacing up and down the long veranda. Master, a little spiritual discipline is necessary in order to know what lies within. Mahendra, is it necessary to practice discipline all through life? Master, no but one must be up and doing in the beginning. After that one need not work hard. The helmsman stands up and clutches the rudder firmly as long as the boat is passing through waves, storms, high wind, or around the curves of a river, but he relaxes after steering through them. As soon as the boat passes the curves and the helmsman feels a favorable wind, he sits comfortably and just touches the rudder. Next he prepares to unfurl the sail and gets ready for a smoke. Likewise, the aspirant enjoys peace and calm after passing the waves and storms of woman and gold. Woman and gold is the obstruction to yoga. Some are born with the characteristics of the yogi, but they too should be careful. It is woman and gold alone that is the obstacle. It makes them deviate from the path of yoga and drags them into worldliness. Perhaps they have some desire for enjoyment. After fulfilling their desire, they again direct their minds to God, and thus recover their former state of mind, fit for the practice of yoga. Have you ever seen the spring trap for fish called the Saka Kal? Mahendra, no sir, I haven't seen it. Master, they use it in our part of the country. One end of a bamboo pole is fastened in the ground, and the other is bent over with a catch. From this end a line with a hook hangs over the water, with bait tied to the hook. When the fish swallows the bait, suddenly the bamboo jumps up and regains its upright position. Again, take a pair of scales for example. If a weight is placed on one side, the lower needle moves away from the upper one. The lower needle is the mind, and the upper one God. The meeting of the two is yoga. Unless the mind becomes steady, there cannot be yoga. It is the wind of worldliness that always disturbs the mind which may be likened to a candle flame. If that flame doesn't move at all, then one is said to have attained yoga. Woman and gold alone is the obstacle to yoga. Always analyze what you see. What is there in the body of a woman? Only such things as blood, flesh, fat, entrails and the like. Why should one love such a body? Sometimes I used to assume a rajasic mood in order to practice renunciation. Once I had the desire to put on a gold embroidered robe, wear a ring on my finger, and smoke a hubble bubble with a long pipe. Mather Babu procured all these things for me. I wore the gold embroidered robe and said to myself after a while, Mind, this is what is called a gold embroidered robe. Then I took it off and threw away. I couldn't stand the robe any more. Again I said to myself, Mind. This is called a shawl, and this a ring, and this smoking a hubble bubble with a long pipe. I threw those things away once for all, and the desire to enjoy them never arose in my mind again. It was almost dusk. The master and Mahendra stood talking alone near the door on the southeast veranda. Master to Mahendra, the mind of the yogi is always fixed on God, always absorbed in the self. You can recognize such a man by merely looking at him. His eyes are wide open with an aimless look like the eyes of the mother bird hatching her eggs. Her entire mind is fixed on the eggs, and there is a vacant look in her eyes. Can you show me such a picture? Mahendra, I shall try to get one. As evening came on, the temples were lighted up. Sri Ramakrishna was seated on his small couch, meditating on the Divine Mother. 
Then he chanted the names of God. Incense was burnt in the room, where an oil lamp had been lighted. Sounds of conch shells and gongs came floating on the air as the evening worship began in the temple of Kali. The light of the moon flooded all the quarters. The master again spoke Kito Mahendra God and worldly duties. Master, perform your duties in an unselfish spirit. The work that Vidyasagar is engaged in is very good. Always try to perform your duties without desiring any result. Mahendra, yes sir. But may I know if one can realize God while performing one's duties? Can Rama and desire coexist? The other day I read in a Hindi couplet, Where Rama is there desire cannot be, Where desire is there Rama cannot be. Master, all without exception perform work. Even to chant the name and glories of God is work, as is the meditation of the non-dualist on I am He. Breathing is also an activity. There is no way of renouncing work altogether. So do your work, but surrender the result to God. God and worldly duties. Mahendra, sir, may I make an effort to earn more money? Master, it is permissible to do so to maintain a religious family. You may try to increase your income, but in an honest way. The goal of life is not the earning of money, but the service of God. Money is not harmful if it is devoted to the service of God. Mahendra, how long should a man feel obliged to do his duty toward his wife and children? Master, as long as they feel pinched for food and clothing. But one need not take the responsibility of a son when he is able to support himself. When the young fledgling learns to pick its own food, its mother pecks it if it comes to her for food. Mahendra, how long must one do one's duty? Master, the blossom drops off when the fruit appears. One doesn't have to do one's duty after the attainment of God, nor does one feel like doing it then. If a drunkard takes too much liquor he cannot retain consciousness. If he takes only two or three glasses he can go on with his work. As you advance nearer and nearer to God, he will reduce your activities little by little. Have no fear. Finish the few duties you have at hand, and then you will have peace. When the mistress of the house goes to bathe after finishing her cooking and other household duties, she won't come back, however, you may shout after her. Different Groups of Devotees Mahendra, sir, what is the meaning of the realization of God? What do you mean by God vision? How does one attain it? Master, according to the Vaishnavas the aspirants and the seers of God may be divided into different groups. These are the Pravartaka, the Sadhaka, the Siddha, and the Siddha of the Siddha. He who has just set foot on the path may be called a Pravartaka. He may be called a Sadhaka who has for some time been practicing spiritual disciplines, such as worship, japa, meditation, and the chanting of God's name and glories. He may be called a Siddha who has known from his inner experience that God exists. An analogy is given in the Vedanta to explain this. The master of the house is asleep in a dark room. Someone is groping in the darkness to find him. He touches the couch and says, No, it is not he. He touches the window and says, No, it is not he. He touches the door and says, No, it is not he. This is known in the Vedanta as the process of neti, neti, not this, not this. At last his hand touches the master's body and he exclaims, Here he is. In other words, he is now conscious of the existence of the master. He has found him, but he doesn't yet know him intimately. There is another type known as the Siddha of the Siddha, the supremely perfect. It is quite a different thing when one talks to the master intimately, when one knows God very intimately through love and devotion. A Siddha has undoubtedly attained God, but the supremely perfect has known God very intimately. Different Moods of Aspirants but in order to realize God, one must assume one of these attitudes, Santa Dasya, Sakya, Vatsliya, or Madar. Santa, the serene attitude. The Rishis of olden times had this attitude toward God. They did not desire any worldly enjoyment. It is like the single-minded devotion of a wife to her husband. She knows that her husband is the embodiment of beauty and love, a veritable man. Dasya, the attitude of a servant toward his master. Hanuman had this attitude toward Rama. He felt the strength of a lion when he worked for Rama. 
A wife feels this mood also. He serves her husband with all her heart and soul. A mother also has a little of this attitude as Yasoda had toward Krishna. Sakya the attitude of friendship. Friends say to one another, come here and sit near me. Thridhamma and other friends sometimes fed Krishna with fruit, part of which they had already eaten and sometimes climbed on his shoulders. Thasaya, the attitude of a mother toward her child. This was Yasoda's attitude toward Krishna. The wife too has a little of this. She feeds her husband with her very life blood as it were. The mother feels happy only when the child has eaten to his heart's content. Yasoda would roam about with butter in her hand in order to feed Krishna. Madder, the attitude of a woman toward her paramour. Radha had this attitude toward Krishna. The wife also feels it for her husband. This attitude includes all the other four. Mahendra, when one sees God does one see him with these eyes? Master, God cannot be seen with these physical eyes. In the course of spiritual discipline one gets a love body, endowed with love eyes, love ears and so on. One sees God with those love eyes. One hears the voice of God with those love ears. One even gets a sexual organ made of love. At these words Mahendra burst out laughing. The master continued, unannoyed, with this love body the soul communes with God. Mahendra again became serious. Seeing God everywhere. Master, but this is not possible without intense love of God. One sees nothing but God everywhere when one loves him with great intensity. It is like a person with jaundice who sees everything yellow. Then one feels I am verily he. A drunkard deeply intoxicated says, Verily I am Kali. The gopis intoxicated with love exclaimed, Verily I am Krishna. One who thinks of God day and night beholds him everywhere. It is like a man seeing flames on all sides after he has gazed fixedly at one flame for some time. But that isn't the real flame flashed through Mahendra's mind. Sri Ramakrishna who could read a man's inmost thoughts said, One doesn't lose consciousness by thinking of him who is all spirit, all consciousness. Jivanath once remarked that too much thinking about God confounds the brain. Thereupon I said to him, How can one become unconscious by thinking of consciousness? Mahendra, yes sir, I realize that. It is like thinking of an unreal object. How can a man lose his intelligence if he always fixes his mind on him, whose very nature is eternal intelligence? Master with pleasure, it is through God's grace that you understand that. The doubts of the mind will not disappear without his grace. Doubts do not disappear without self-realization. But one need not fear anything if one has received the grace of God. It is rather easy for a child to stumble if he holds his father's hand, but there can be no such fear if the father holds the child's hand. A man does not have to suffer any more if God, in his grace, removes his doubts and reveals himself to him. But this grace descends upon him only after he has prayed to God with intense yearning of heart and practiced spiritual discipline. The mother feels compassion for her child when she sees him running about breathlessly. He has been hiding herself, now she appears before the child. But why should God make us run about? Thought M. Immediately Sri Ramakrishna said, It is his will that we should run about a little. Then it is great fun. God has created the world in play as it were. This is called Mahamaya, the great illusion. Therefore one must take refuge in the Divine Mother, the cosmic power itself. It is she who has bound us with the shackles of illusion. The realization of God is possible only when those shackles are severed. Worship of the Divine Mother, the Master continued, one must propitiate the Divine Mother, the primal energy, in order to obtain God's grace. God himself is Mahamaya, who deludes the world with her illusion and conjures up the magic of creation, preservation, and destruction. He has spread this veil of ignorance before our eyes. We can go into the inner chamber only when she lets us pass through the door. Living outside, we see only outer objects, but not that eternal being, existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute. Therefore, it is stated in the Purna that deities like Brahma praised Mahamaya for the destruction of the demons Madhu and Kaitaba. Sakti alone is the root of the universe. 
That primal energy has two aspects, vidya and avidya. Avidya deludes. Avidya conjures up woman in gold which casts the spell. Vidya begets devotion, kindness, wisdom and love which lead one to God. This avidya must be propitiated, and that is the purpose of the rites of Sakti worship. The devotee assumes various attitudes towards Sakti in order to propitiate her, the attitude of a handmaid, a hero or a child. A hero's attitude is to please her even as a man pleases a woman through intercourse. The worship of Sakti is extremely difficult. It is no joke. I passed two years as the handmaid and companion of the Divine Mother. But my natural attitude has always been that of a child toward its mother. I regard the breasts of any woman as those of my own mother. Master's attitude toward women. Women are, all of them, the veritable images of Sakti. In northwest India the bride holds a knife in her hand at the time of marriage, in Bengal, a nut cutter. The meaning is that the bridegroom, with the help of the bride, who is the embodiment of the divine power, will sever the bondage of illusion. This is the heroic attitude. I never worship the Divine Mother that way. My attitude toward her is that of a child toward its mother. The bride is the very embodiment of Sakti. Haven't you noticed at the marriage ceremony how the groom sits behind like an idiot? But the bride she is so bold. His love for Narendra. After attaining God one forgets his external splendor, the glories of his creation. One doesn't think of God's glories after one has seen him. The devotee, once immersed in God's bliss, doesn't calculate any more about outer things. When I see Narendra, I don't need to ask him, What's your name? Where do you live? Where is the time for such questions? Once a man asked Hanuman which day of the fortnight it was. Brother, said Hanuman, I don't know anything of the day of the week or the fortnight or the position of the stars. I think of Rama alone. October 16, 1882, it was Monday a few days before the Durga Puja, the festival of the Divine Mother. Sri Ramakrishna was in a very happy state of mind, for Narendra was with him. Narendra had brought two or three young members of the Brahmo Samaj to the temple garden. Besides these, Rakal, Ramlal, Hazara and Mahendra were with the master. Narendra had his midday meal with Sri Ramakrishna. Afterwards a temporary bed was made on the floor of the master's room so that the disciples might rest a while. A mat was spread over which was placed a quilt covered with a white sheet. A few cushions and pillows completed the simple bed. Like a child the master sat near Narendranath on the bed. He talked with the devotees in great delight. With a radiant smile lighting his face and his eyes fixed on Narendra, he was giving them various spiritual teachings interspersing these with incidents from his own life. Master, after I had experienced some adhi my mind craved intensely to hear only about God. I would always search for places where they were reciting or explaining the sacred books, such as the Bhagavata, the Mahabharata, and the Adhyatma Ramayana. I used to go to Krishna Kishor to hear him read the Adhyatma Ramayana. Krishna Kishor's faith. What tremendous faith Krishna Kishor had! Once while at Vrindavan he felt thirsty and went to a well. Near it he saw a man standing. On being asked to draw a little water for him, the man said, I belong to a low caste, sir. You are a Brahmin. How can I draw water for you? Krishna Kishore said, Take the name of Shiva. By repeating his holy name you will make yourself pure. The low caste man did as he was told and Krishna Kishore, orthodox Brahmin that he was, drank that water. What tremendous faith! Once a holy man came to the bank of the Ganges and lived near the bathing ghat at Ariadaha, not far from Dakshanswar. We thought of paying him a visit. I said to Halad Hari, Krishna Kishore and I are going to see a holy man. Will you come with us? Halad Hari replied, What is the use of seeing a mere human body which is no better than a cage of clay? Halad Hari was a student of the Gita and Vedanta philosophy, and therefore referred to the holy man as a mere cage of clay. I repeated this to Krishna Kishore. With great anger he said, How impudent of Halad Hari to make such a remark! 
How can he ridicule as a cage of clay the body of a man who constantly thinks of God, who meditates on Rama, and has renounced all for the sake of the Lord? Doesn't he know that such a man is the embodiment of spirit? He was so upset by Halit Hari's remarks that he would turn his face away from him whenever he met him in the temple garden and stop speaking to him. Once Krishna Kishore asked me, Why have you cast off the sacred thread? In those days of God vision, I felt as if I were passing through the great storm of a swin, and everything had blown away from me. No trace of my old self was left. I lost all consciousness of the world. I could hardly keep my cloth on my body not to speak of this sacred thread. I said to Krishna Kishore, Ah, you will understand if you ever happen to be as intoxicated with God as I was. And it actually came to pass. He too passed through a God-intoxicated state, when he would repeat only the word Om and shut himself up alone in his room. His relatives thought he was actually mad and called in a physician. Ram Kavraj of Nadagore came to see him. Krishna Kishore said to the physician, Cure me, sir, of my malady, if you please, but not of my arm. All laugh. One day I went to see him and found him in a pensive mood. When I asked him about it, he said, The tax collector was here. He threatened to dispose of my brass pots, my cups, and my few utensils if I didn't pay the tax, so I am worried. I said, But why should you worry about it? Let him take away your pots and pans. Let him arrest your body even. How will that affect you? For your nature is that of Ka. Narendra and the others laugh. He used to say to me that he was the spirit, all pervading as the sky. He had got that idea from the Adhyatma Ramayana. I used to tease him now and then, addressing him as Ka. Therefore I said to him that day with a smile, You are Ka. Taxes cannot move you. Master's outspokenness. In that state of God intoxication I used to speak out my mind to all. I was no respecter of persons. Even to men of position I was not afraid to speak the truth. One day Jatindra came to the garden of Jodhu Malik. I was there too. I asked him, What is the duty of man? Isn't it our duty to think of God? Jatindra replied, We are worldly people. How is it possible for us to achieve liberation? Even King Yudhisthira had to have a vision of hell. This made me very angry. I said to him, What sort of man are you? Of all the incidents of Yudhisthira's life, you remember only his seeing hell. You don't remember his truthfulness, his forbearance, his patience, his discrimination, his dispassion, his devotion to God. I was about to say many more things when Hrude stopped my mouth. After a little while Jatindra left the place, saying he had some other business to attend to. Many days later I went with Captain to see Raja Sarindra Tagore. As soon as I met him I said, I can't address you as Raja or by any such title, for I should be telling a lie. He talked to me a few minutes, but even so our conversation was interrupted by the frequent visits of Europeans and others. A man of Rajasic temperament, Sarindra was naturally busy with many things. Jatindra, his eldest brother, had been told of my coming, but he sent word that he had a pain in his throat and couldn't go out. One day, in that state of divine intoxication, I went to the bathing ghat on the Ganges at Baranagor. There I saw Jaya Mukherjee repeating the name of God, but his mind was on something else. I went up and slapped him twice on the cheeks. At one time Rani Resmani was staying in the temple garden. She came to the shrine of the Divine Mother, as she frequently did when I worshipped Kali, and asked me to sing a song or two. On this occasion, while I was singing, I noticed she was sorting the flowers for worship absent-mindedly. At once I slapped her on the cheeks. She became quite embarrassed and sat there with folded hands. Alarmed at this state of mind myself, I said to my cousin Helad Hari, just see my nature. How can I get rid of it? After praying to the Divine Mother for some time with great yearning, I was able to shake off this habit. His anguish at worldly talk. When one gets into such a state of mind, one doesn't enjoy any conversation but that about God. I used to weep when I heard people talk about worldly matters. When I accompanied Mathur Babu on a pilgrimage, we spent a few days in Benares at Raja Babu's house. 
One day I was seated in the drawing room with Mathur Babu, Raja Babu, and others. Hearing them talk about various worldly things, such as their business losses and so forth, I wept bitterly and said to the Divine Mother, Mother, where have you brought me? I was much better off in the temple garden at Dakshine's war. Here I am in a place where I must bear about woman in gold. But at Dakshine's war I could avoid it. The master asked the devotees, especially Narendra, to rest a while, and he himself lay down on the smaller couch. His ecstasy and curtain. Late in the afternoon Narendra sang. Rakul, Latu, Mahendra, Hazra and Priya Narendra's Brahma friend were present. The singing was accompanied by the drum. Meditate, O my mind, on the Lord Hari, the stainless one, pure spirit through and through. How peerless is the light that in him shines. How soul bewitching is his wondrous form. How dear is he to all his devotees. After the song Narendra sang, O oh, when will dawn for me that day of blessedness when he who is all good, all beauty, and all truth, will light the inmost shrine of my heart? When shall I sink at last, ever beholding him, into that ocean of delight? Lord, as infinite wisdom thou shalt enter my soul, and my unquiet mind, made speechless by thy sight, will find a haven at thy feet. In my heart's firmament, O Lord, thou wilt arise as blissful immortality, and as when the chakra beholds the rising moon, it sports about for very joy, so too shall I be filled with heavenly happiness when thou appearest unto me. Thou one without a second, all peace, the King of kings. At thy beloved feet I shall renounce my life, and so at last shall gain life's goal, one shall enjoy the bliss of heaven while yet on earth. Where else is a boon so rare bestowed? Then shall I see thy glory, pure and untouched by stain. As darkness flees from one eye, so will my darkest sins desert me at thy dawn's approach. Kindle in me, O Lord, the blazing fire of faith to be the pole star of my life, O succor of the weak, fulfill my one desire. Then shall I bathe both day and night in the boundless bliss of thy love, and utterly forget myself, O Lord, attaining thee. Narendra sang again, with beaming face chant the sweet name of God till in your heart the nectar overflows. Drink of it ceaselessly and share it with all. If ever your heart runs dry, parched by the flames of worldly desire, chant the sweet name of God, and heavenly love will moisten your arid soul. Be sure, O mind, you never forget to chant. His holy name, when danger stares in your face, call on him, your father compassionate, with his name's thunder, snap the fetters of sin. Come, let us fulfill our heart's desires. By drinking deep of everlasting joy, made one with him in love's pure ecstasy. Now Narendra and the devotees began to sing curtain, accompanied by the drum and cymbals. They moved round and round the master as they sang. Immerse yourself forevermore, O mine, in him who is pure knowledge and pure bliss. Next they sang, O oh, when will dawn for me that day of blessedness when he who is all good, all beauty, and all truth will light the inmost shrine of my heart. At last Narendra himself was playing on the drums, and he sang with the master, full of joy, with beaming face chant the sweet name of God. When the music was over, Sri Ramakrishna held Narendra in his arms a long time and said, You have made us so happy today. The flood gate of the master's heart was opened so wide that night that he could hardly contain himself for joy. It was eight o'clock in the evening. Intoxicated with divine love, he paced the long veranda north of his room. Now and then he could be heard talking to the Divine Mother. Suddenly he said in an excited voice, what can you do to me? Was the master hinting that Maya was helpless before him, since he had the Divine Mother for his support? Narendra, Mahendra, and Priya were going to spend the night at the temple garden. This pleased the master highly, especially since Narendra would be with him. The Holy Mother, who was living in the Nahabat, had prepared the supper. Chandra bore the greater part of the master's expenses. The meal was ready and the plates were set out on the southeast veranda of the master's room. Near the east door of his room Narendra and the other devotees were gossiping. Narendra, how do you find the young men nowadays? Mahendra, they are not bad, but they don't receive any religious instructions. 
Narendra, but from my experience I feel they are going to the dogs. They smoke cigarettes, indulge in frivolous talk, enjoy foppishness, play truant, and do everything of that sort. I have even seen them visiting questionable places. Mahendra, I didn't notice such things during our student days. Narendra, perhaps you didn't mix with the students intimately. I have even seen them talking with people of immoral character. Perhaps they are on terms of intimacy with them. Mahendra, it is strange indeed. Narendra, I know that many of them form bad habits. It would be proper if the guardians of the boys and the authorities kept their eyes on these matters. They were talking thus when Sri Ramakrishna came to them and asked with a smile, Well, what are you talking about? Narendra, I have been asking Mahendra about the boys in the schools. The conduct of students nowadays isn't all that it should be. The master became grave and said to Mahendra rather seriously, This kind of conversation is not good. It isn't desirable to indulge in any talk but talk of God. You are their senior and you are intelligent. You should not have encouraged them to talk about such matters. Narendra was then about nineteen years old and Mahendra about twenty-eight. Thus admonished, Mahendra felt embarrassed and the others also fell silent. While the devotees were enjoying their meal, Sri Ramakrishna stood by and watched them with intense delight. That night the master's joy was very great. After supper the devotees rested on the mat spread on the floor of the master's room. They began to talk with him. It was indeed a mart of joy. The master asked Narendra to sing the song beginning with the line, In wisdom's firmament the moon of love is rising full. Narendra sang and other devotees played the drums and cymbals, In wisdom's firmament the moon of love is rising full, And love's flood tide, in surging waves, is flowing everywhere. O Lord, how full of bliss Thou art! Victory unto Thee! On every side shine devotees like stars around the moon. Their friend, the Lord All-Merciful, joyously plays with them. Behold! The gates of paradise today are open wide. The soft spring wind of the new day raises fresh waves of joy. Gently it carries to the earth the fragrance of God's love, till all the yogis, drunk with bliss, are lost in ecstasy. Upon the sea of the world unfolds the lotus of the new day, and there the mother sits enshrined in blissful majesty. See how the bees are mad with joy sipping the nectar there. Behold the mother's radiant face, which so enchants the heart and captivates the universe. About her lotus feet bands of ecstatic holy men are dancing in delight. What matchless loveliness is hers! What infinite content pervades the heart when she appears! O oh, brothers, says Prem Daz, I humbly beg you one and all to sing the mother's praise. Three Ramakrishna sang and danced, and the devotees danced around him. A devotee's dream. When the song was over, the master walked up and down the northeast veranda, where Hazra was seated with Mahendra, the master sat down there. He asked a devotee, Do you ever have dreams? Devotee, yes sir. The other day I dreamt a strange dream. I saw the whole world enveloped in water. There was water on all sides. Few boats were visible, but suddenly huge waves appeared and sank them. I was about to board a ship with a few others when we saw a Brahmin walking over that expanse of water. I asked him, How can you walk over the deep? The Brahmin said with a smile, Oh, there is no difficulty about that. There is a bridge under the water. I said to him, Where are you going? To Bawanapur, the city of the Divine Mother, he replied. Wait a little, I cried. I shall accompany you. Master, oh, I am thrilled to hear the story. Devotee, the Brahmin said, I am in a hurry. It will take you some time to get out of the boat. Goodbye. Remember this path and come after me. Master, oh, my hair is standing on end. Please be initiated by a guru as soon as possible. Shortly before midnight Narendra and the other devotees lay down on a bed made on the floor of the master's room. At dawn some of the devotees were up. They saw the master naked as a child, pacing up and down the room, repeating the names of the various gods and goddesses. His voice was sweet as nectar. 
Now he would look at the Ganges, now stop in front of the pictures hanging on the wall and bow down before them, chanting all the while the holy names in his sweet voice. He chanted Veda Purana Tantra, Gita Gayatri, Bhagavata back to Bhagavan. Referring to the Geta, he repeated many times Tagi Tagi Tagi. Now and then he would say, O mother, thou art verily Brahman and thou art verily Sakti. Thou art Purusha and thou art Prakriti. Thou art Virat. Thou art the Absolute and thou dost manifest thyself as the Relative. Thou art verily the twenty-four cosmic principles. In the meantime, the morning service had begun in the temples of Kali and Radhakanta. Sounds of conch shells and cymbals were carried on the air. The devotees came outside the room and saw the priests and servants gathering flowers in the garden for the divine service in the temples. From the Nahabat floated the sweet melody of musical instruments befitting the morning hours. Narendra and the other devotees finished their morning duties and came to the master. With a sweet smile on his lips Sri Ramakrishna was standing on the northeast veranda, close to his own room. Narendra, we notice several sannyasis belonging to the sect of Nanak in the Panchavati. Master, yes, they arrived here yesterday. To Narendra, I'd like to see you all sitting together on the mat. As they sat there, the master looked at them with evident delight. He then began to talk with them. Narendra asked about spiritual discipline. Master, bhakti, love of God, is the essence of all spiritual discipline. Through love one acquires renunciation and discrimination naturally. Disciplines of Tantra Narendra, isn't it true that the Tantra prescribes spiritual discipline in the company of woman? Master, that is not desirable. It is a very difficult path and often causes the aspirant's downfall. There are three such kinds of discipline. One may regard woman as one's mistress or look on oneself as her handmaid or as her child. I look on woman as my mother. To look on oneself as her handmaid is also good, but it is extremely difficult to practice spiritual discipline looking on woman as one's mistress. To regard oneself as her child is a very pure attitude. The sannyasis belonging to the sect of Nanak entered the room and greeted the master saying, Namo Narayanaya. Sri Ramakrishna asked them to sit down. All is possible with God. Master, Nothing is impossible for God. Nobody can describe his nature in words. Everything is possible for him. There lived at a certain place two yoke is who were practicing spiritual discipline. The sage Narada was passing that way one day. Realizing who he was, one of the yogis said, You have just come from God himself. What is he doing now? Narada replied, Why, I saw him making camels and elephants pass and repass through the eye of a needle. This the yogi said, Is that anything to wonder at? Everything is possible for God. The other yogi said, What? Making elephants pass through the eye of a needle, is that ever possible? You have never been to the Lord's dwelling place. At nine o'clock in the morning, while the master was still sitting in his room, Manamo had arrived from Kanagar with some members of his family. In answer to Sri Ramakrishna's kind inquiries, Manamo had explained that he was taking them to Calcutta. The master said, Today is the first day of the Bengali month, an inauspicious day for undertaking a journey. I hope everything will be well with you. With a smile, he began to talk of other matters. When Narendra and his friends had finished bathing in the Ganges, the master said to them earnestly, Go to the Panchavati and meditate there under the banyan tree. Shall I give you something to sit on? Discrimination and Dispassion About half past ten Narendra and his Brahmo friends were meditating in the Panchavati. After a while Sri Ramakrishna came to them. Mandra too was present. The master said to the Brahmo devotees, in meditation one must be absorbed in God. By merely floating on the surface of the water, can you reach the gems lying at the bottom of the sea? Then he sang, taking the name of Kali, dive deep down, O mind, into the heart's fathomless depths, where many a precious gem lies hid. But never believe the bed of the ocean bare of gems if in the first few dives you fail, with firm resolve and self-control. Dive deep and make your way to Mother Kali's realm. 
down in the ocean depths of heavenly wisdom lie the wondrous pearls of peace, O mind, and you yourself can gather them, if you but have pure love and follow the scripture's rule. Within those ocean depths, as well, six alligators lurk lust, anger, and the rest swimming about in search of prey. Smear yourself with the turmeric of discrimination. The very smell of it will shield you from their jaws. Upon the ocean bed lie strewn. Unnumbered pearls and precious gems. Plunge in, says Ramprasad, and gather up handfuls there. Narendra and his friends came down from their seats on the raised platform of the Panchavati and stood near the master. He returned to his room with them. The master continued, When you plunge in the water of the ocean, you may be attacked by alligators. But they won't touch you if your body is smeared with turmeric. There are no doubt six alligators lust, anger, avarice, and so on within you in the heart's fathomless depths. But protect yourself with the turmeric of discrimination and renunciation, and they won't touch you. Utility of mere lecturing. What can you achieve by mere lecturing and scholarship without discrimination and dispassion? God alone is real, and all else is unreal. God alone is substance, and all else is non-entity. That is discrimination. First of all set up God in the shrine of your heart, and then deliver lectures as much as you like. How will the mere repetition of Brahma profit you if you are not imbued with discrimination and dispassion? It is the empty sound of a conchell. There lived in a village a young man named Padmalakan. People used to call him Poto for short. In this village there was a temple in a very dilapidated condition. It contained no image of God. A swatha and other plants sprang up on the ruins of its walls. Bats lived inside, and the floor was covered with dust and the droppings of the bats. The people of the village had stopped visiting the temple. One day after dusk the villagers heard the sound of a conch shell from the direction of the temple. They thought perhaps someone had installed an image in the shrine and was performing the evening worship. One of them softly opened the door and saw Padmalakhtan standing in a corner, blowing the conch. No image had been set up. The temple hadn't been swept or washed. And filth and dirt lay everywhere. Then he shouted to Poto, You have set up no image here within the shrine, O fool! Blowing the conch you simply make. Confusion worse confounded. Day and night eleven bats. Scream there incessantly. Purification of mind. There is no use in merely making a noise if you want to establish the deity in the shrine of your heart if you want to realize God. First of all purify the mind. In the pure heart God takes his seat. One cannot bring the holy image into the temple if the droppings of bats are all around. The eleven bats are our eleven organs, five of action, five of perception and the mind. First of all invoke the deity, and then give lectures to your heart's content. First of all dive deep. Plunge to the bottom and gather up the gems. Then you may do other things. But nobody wants to plunge. People are without spiritual discipline and prayer without renunciation and dispassion. They learn a few words and immediately start to deliver lectures. It is difficult to teach others. Only if a man gets a command from God after realizing him, is he entitled to teach. Thus conversing, the master came to the west end of the veranda. M stood by his side. Three Ramakrishna had repeated again and again that God cannot be realized without discrimination and renunciation. This made Mahendra extremely worried. He had married and was then a young man of twenty-eight, educated in college in the western way. Having a sense of duty he asked himself, do discrimination and dispassion mean giving up woman and gold? He was really at a loss to know what to do. Mahendra to the master, what should one do if one's wife says, You are neglecting me. I shall commit suicide? Master in a serious tone. Give up such a wife if she proves an obstacle in the way of spiritual life. Let her commit suicide or anything else she likes. The wife that hampers her husband's spiritual life is an ungodly wife. Immersed in deep thought, Mahendra stood leaning against the wall. Narendra and the other devotees remained silent a few minutes. The master exchanged several words with them, then suddenly going to Mahendra, he whispered in his ear, But if a man has sincere love for God, 
then all come under his control the king, wicked persons, and his wife. Sincere love of God on the husband's part may eventually help the wife to lead a spiritual life. If the husband is good, then through the grace of God, the wife may also follow his example. This had a most soothing effect on Mahendra's worried mind. All the while he had been thinking, let her commit suicide. What can I do? Mahendra to the master. This world is a terrible place indeed. Master to the devotees. That is the reason Chaitanya said to his companion Nityananda, Listen, brother, there is no hope of salvation for the worldly-minded. On another occasion the master had said to Mahendra privately, Yes, there is no hope for a worldly man if he is not sincerely devoted to God. But he has nothing to fear if he remains in the world after realizing God. Nor need a man have any fear whatever of the world if he attains sincere devotion by practicing spiritual discipline now and then in solitude. Catania had several householders among his devotees, but they were householders in name only, for they lived unattached to the world. It was noon. The worship was over and food offerings had been made in the temple. The doors of the temple were shut. Sri Ramakrishna sat down for his meal, and Narendra and the other devotees partook of the food offerings from the temple. Sunday, October 22, 1882. It was the day of Vajaya, the last day of the celebration of the worship of Durga, when the clay image is immersed in the water of a lake or river. About nine o'clock in the morning Mahendra was seated on the floor of the master's room at Dakshanswar near Sri Ramakrishna, who was reclining on the small couch. Rakul was then living with the master, and Narendra and Bhavanath visited him frequently. Babiram had seen him only once or twice. Master, did you have any holiday during the Durga Puja? Mahendra, yes sir. I went to Keshav's house every day for the first three days of the worship. Master, is that so? Mahendra, I heard there a very interesting interpretation of the Durga Puja. Master, please tell me all about it. Mahendra, Keshab Sen held daily morning prayers in his house lasting till 10 or 11. During these prayers he gave the inner meaning of the Durga Puja. He said that if anyone could realize the Divine Mother, that is to say, could install Mother Durga in the shrine of his heart, then Lakshmi, Sarasvati, Kartika, and Gainsa would come there of themselves. Lakshmi means wealth, Sarasvati knowledge, Kartika strength and Gainsa success. By realizing the Divine Mother within one's heart, one gets all these without any effort whatever. Sri Ramakrishna listened to the description, questioning Mahendra now and then about the prayers conducted by Keshab. At last he said to Mahendra, Don't go hither and thither. Come here alone. Those who belong to the inner circle of my devotees will come only here. Boys like Narendra, Bhavanath and Rakul are my very intimate disciples. They are not to be thought lightly of. Feed them one day. What do you think of Narendra? Mahendra, I think very highly of him, sir. Narendra's many virtues. Master, haven't you observed his many virtues? He is not only well versed in music, vocal and instrumental, but he is also very learned. Besides, he has controlled his passions and declares he will lead a celibate life. He has been devoted to God since his very boyhood. Meditation on God with form. How are you getting along with your meditation nowadays? What aspect of God appeals to your mind with form or without form? Mahendra, sir, now I can't fix my mind on God with form. On the other hand, I can't concentrate steadily on God without form. Master, now you see that the mind cannot be fixed all of a sudden on the formless aspect of God. It is wise to think of God with form during the primary stages. Mahendra, do you mean to suggest that one should meditate on clay images? Master, why clay? These images are the embodiments of consciousness. Mahendra, even so, one must think of hands, feet, and the other parts of body. But again, I realize that the mind cannot be concentrated unless one meditates in the beginning on God with form. You have told me so. Well, God can easily assume different forms. May one meditate on the form of one's own mother? Master, yes, the mother should be adored. She is indeed an embodiment of Brahman. Mahendra sat in silence. 
After a few minutes he asked the master, What does one feel while thinking of God without form? Isn't it possible to describe it? After some reflection the master said, Do you know what it is like? He remained silent a moment and then said a few words to Mahendra about one's experiences at the time of the vision of God with and without form. Master, you see one must practice spiritual discipline to understand this correctly. Suppose there are treasures in a room. If you want to see them and lay hold of them, you must take the trouble to get the key and unlock the door. After that you must take the treasures out. But suppose the room is locked and standing outside the door you say to yourself, Here I have opened the door. Now I have broken the lock of the chest. Now I have taken out the treasure. Such brooding near the door will not enable you to achieve anything. You must practice discipline. Brahman and divine incarnations. The Jhanis think of God without form. They don't accept the divine incarnation. Praising Sri Krishna, Arjuna said, Thou art Brahman Absolute. Sri Krishna replied, Follow me, and you will know whether or not I am Brahman Absolute. So saying, Sri Krishna led Arjuna to a certain place and asked him what he saw there. I see a huge tree, said Arjuna, and on it I notice fruits hanging like clusters of blackberries. Then Krishna said to Arjuna, Come nearer and you will find that these are not clusters of blackberries, but clusters of innumerable Krishnas like me hanging from the tree. In other words, divine incarnations without number appear and disappear on the tree of the Absolute Brahman. Kavardas was strongly inclined to the formless God. At the mention of Krishna's name he would say, Why should I worship him? The gopis would clap their hands while he performed a monkey dance. With a smile, but I accept God with form when I am in the company of people who believe in that ideal, and I also agree with those who believe in the formless God. Mahendra smiling, You are as infinite as he of whom we have been talking. Truly no one can fathom your depth. Master smiling, Ah! I see you have found it out. Let me tell you one thing. One should follow various paths. One should practice each creed for a time. In a game of Satrancha, a piece can't reach the center square until it completes the circle, but once in the square it can't be overtaken by any other piece. Mahendra, that is true, sir. Master, there are two classes of yogis, the Bahudokas and the Kutachakas. The Bahudakas roam about visiting various holy places and have not yet found peace of mind. But the Kutachakas, having visited all the sacred places, have quieted their minds. Feeling serene and peaceful, they settle down in one place and no longer move about. In that one place they are happy. They don't feel the need of going to any sacred place. If one of them ever visits a place of pilgrimage, it is only for the purpose of new inspiration. I had to practice each religion for a time Hinduism, Islam, Christianity. Furthermore I followed the paths of the sect as Vaishnavas and Vedantists. I realize that there is only one God toward whom all are traveling, but the paths are different. While visiting the holy places, I would sometimes suffer great agony. Once I went with Mathur to Raja Babu's drawing room in Benares. I found that they talked there only of worldly matters, money, real estate, and the like. At this I burst into tears. I said to the Divine Mother, weeping, Mother, where hast thou brought me? I was much better off at Dakshain's war. In Allahabad I noticed the same things that I saw elsewhere, the same ponds, the same grass, the same trees, the same tamarind leaves. Master's ecstasy at Vrindavan. But one undoubtedly finds inspiration in a holy place. I accompanied Mathur Babu to Vrindavan. Hriday and the ladies of Mathur's family were in our party. No sooner did I see the Kalya Gat than a divine emotion surged up within me. I was completely overwhelmed. Hriday used to bathe me there as if I were a small child. In the dusk I would walk on the bank of the Dimuna when the cattle returned along the sandy banks from their pastures. At the very sight of those cows the thought of Krishna would flash in my mind. I would run along like a madman crying, Oh where is Krishna? Where is my Krishna? I went to Simakunda and Radhakunda and Apalankin and got out to visit the holy Mount Govardhan. At the very sight of the mount I was overpowered with divine emotion and ran to the top. I lost all consciousness of the world around me. 
the residents of the place helped me to come down. On my way to the sacred pools of Simakunda and Radhakunda, when I saw the meadows, the trees, the shrubs, the birds, and the deer, I was overcome with ecstasy. My clothes became wet with tears. I said, O oh Krishna, everything here is as it was in the olden days. You alone are absent. Seated inside the palanquin, I lost all power of speech. Hurde followed the palanquin. He had warned the bearers to be careful about me. Gangame became very fond of me in Vrindavan. She was an old woman who lived all alone in a hut near the Nidhyavan. Referring to my spiritual condition and ecstasy, she said, He is the very embodiment of Radha. She addressed me as Dulali. When with her I used to forget my food and drink my bath and all thought of going home. On some days Hrita used to bring food from home and feed me. Gangame also would serve me with food prepared by her own hands. Gangame used to experience trances. At such times a great crowd would come to see her. One day, in a state of ecstasy, she climbed on Hrita's shoulders. I didn't want to leave her and return to Calcutta. Everything was arranged for me to stay with her. I was to eat double-boiled rice, and we were to have our beds on either side of the cottage. All the arrangements had been made when Hrita said, You have such a weak stomach. Who will look after you? Why, said Gangame, I shall look after him. I'll nurse him. As Hride dragged me by one hand, and she by the other, I remembered my mother, who was then living alone here in the Nahabat of Temple Garden. I found it impossible to stay away from her, and said to Gangame, No, I must go. I love the atmosphere of Vrindavan. About eleven o'clock the master took his meal, the offerings from Temple of Kali. After taking his noonday rest he resumed his conversation with the devotees. Every now and then he uttered the holy word Om or repeated the sacred names of the deities. After sunset the evening worship was performed in the temples. Since it was the day of Vajaya, the devotees first saluted the Divine Mother and then took the dust of the Master's feet. Tuesday, October 24, 1882, it was three or four o'clock in the afternoon. The master was standing near the shelf where the food was kept when Balaram and Mahendra arrived from Calcutta and saluted him. Sri Ramakrishna said to them with a smile, I was going to take some sweets from the shelf, but no sooner did I put my hand on them than a lizard dropped on my body. At once I removed my hand. All laugh. Oh yes. One should observe all these things. You see Rackle is ill, and my limbs ache too. Do you know what's the matter? This morning as I was leaving my bed I saw a certain person, whom I took for Rackle. I'll laugh. Oh yes. Physical features should be studied. The other day Narendra brought one of his friends, a man with only one good eye, though the other eye was not totally blind. I said to myself, what is this trouble that Narendra has brought with him? A certain person comes here, but I can't eat any food that he brings. He works in an office at a salary of twenty rupees and earns another twenty by writing false bills. I can't utter a word in his presence, because he tells lies. Sometimes he stays here two or three days without going to his office. Can you guess his purpose? It is that I should recommend him to someone for a job somewhere else. Balram comes from a family of devout Vaish Navas. His father, now an old man, is a pious devotee. He has a tuft of hair on his head, a rosary of Tulsi beads round his neck, and a string of beads in his hand. He devotes his time to the repetition of God's name. He owns much property in Orissa and has built temples to Radhakrishna in Kothar, Vrindavan and other places establishing free guest houses as well. To Balaram a certain person came here the other day. I understand he is the slave of that black hag of a wife. Why is it that people do not see God? It is because of the barrier of woman and gold. How impudent he was to say to you the other day, a Paramahamsa came to my father, who fed him with chicken curry. In my present of my mind, I can eat a little fish soup if it has been offered to the Divine Mother beforehand. I can't eat any meat even if it is offered to the Divine Mother, but I taste it with the end of my finger lest she should be angry. Laughter well, can you explain this state of my mind? 
Once I was going from Birdwin to Kemmerpuker in a bullock cart when a great storm arose. Some people gathered near the cart. My companions said they were robbers. So I began to repeat the names of God, calling sometimes on Kali, sometimes on Rama, sometimes on Hanuman. What do you think of that? Was the master hinting that God is one but is addressed differently by different sects? Master de Balaram, my air is nothing but woman and gold. A man living in its midst gradually loses his spiritual alertness. He thinks all is well with him. The scavenger carries a tub of night soil on his head, and in course of time loses his repulsion to it. One gradually acquires love of God through the practice of chanting God's name and glories. To Mahendra one should not be ashamed of chanting God's holy name. As the saying goes, one does not succeed so long as one has these three, shame, hatred and fear. At Kamarpukar they sing curtain very well. The devotional music is sung to the accompaniment of drums. To Balaram have you installed any image at Vrindavan? Balaram, yes sir. We have a grove where Krishna is worshipped. Chapter 5 The Master and Keshayab October 27, 1882, Master's Boat Trip with Keshab. It was Friday, the day of the Lakshmi Puja. Keshab Chandra Sen had arranged a boat trip on the Ganges for Sri Ramakrishna. About four o'clock in the afternoon the steamboat with Keshab and his Brahmo followers cast anchor in the Ganges alongside the Kali Temple at Dakshineswar. The passengers saw in front of them the bathing ghat and the Channi. To their left, in the temple compound, stood six temples of Shiva, and to their right another group of six Shiva temples. The white steeple of the Kali temple, the tree tops of the Panchavati, and the silhouette of pine trees stood high against the blue autumn sky. The gardens between the two Nahabats were filled with fragrant flowers, and along the bank of the Ganges were rows of flowering plants. The blue sky was reflected in the brown water of the river, the sacred Ganges, associated with the most ancient traditions of Aryan civilization. The outer world appeared soft and serene, and the hearts of the Brahmo devotees were filled with peace. Master and Samadhi Sri Ramakrishna was in his room talking with Vijay and Haralal. Some disciples of Keshab entered. Bowing before the Master, they said to him, Sir, the steamer has arrived. Kesha Babu has asked us to take you there. A small boat was to carry the master to the steamer. No sooner did he get into the boat than he lost outer consciousness and samadhi. The jay was with him. Mahendra was among the passengers. As the boat came alongside the steamer, all rushed to the railing to have a view of Sri Ramakrishna. Kesha became anxious to get him safely on board. With great difficulty the master was brought back to consciousness of the world and taken to a cabin in the steamer. Still in an abstracted mood, he walked mechanically, leaning on a devotee for support. Keshab and the others bowed before him, but he was not aware of them. Inside the cabin there were a few chairs and a table. He was made to sit on one of the chairs, Keshab and Vijay occupying two others. Some devotees were also seated, most of them on the floor, while many others had to stand outside. They peered eagerly through the door and windows. Three Ramakrishna again went into deep samadhi and became totally unconscious of the outer world. As the air in the room was stuffy because of the crowd of people, Keshab opened the windows. He was embarrassed to meet Vijay, since they had differed in certain principles of the Brano Samaj, and Vijay had separated himself from Keshab's organization, joining another society. The Brahmo devotees looked wistfully at the master. Gradually he came back to sense consciousness, but the divine intoxication still lingered. He said to himself in a whisper, Mother, why have you brought me here? They are hedged around and not free. Can I free them? Did the master find that the people assembled there were locked within the prison walls of the world? Did their helplessness make the master address these words to the Divine Mother? God dwells in devotee's heart. Sri Ramakrishna was gradually becoming conscious of the outside world. Nilmadhav of Ghazipur and a Brahmo devotee were talking about Pavhari Baba. Another Brahmo devotee said to the master, Sir, these gentlemen visited Pavhari Baba. 
he lives in Ga's poor. He is a holy man like yourself. The master could hardly talk, he only smiled. The devotee continued, Sir, Pafhari Baba keeps your photograph in his room. Pointing to his body, the master said with a smile, Just a pillowcase. The master continued, But you should remember that the heart of the devotee is the abode of God. He dwells, no doubt, in all beings, but he especially manifests himself in the heart of the devotee. A landlord may at one time or another visit all parts of his estate, but people say he is generally to be found in a particular drawing room. The heart of the devotee is the drawing room of God. Attitude of Jhanis and Bhaktas He who is called Brahman by the Jhanis is known as Atman by the Yogis and as Bhagavan by the Bhaktas. The same Brahman is called priest when worshipping in the temple and cook when preparing a meal in the kitchen. The Jhani sticking to the path of knowledge always reasons about the reality saying not this not this. Brahman is neither this nor that, it is neither the universe nor its living beings. Reasoning in this way the mind becomes steady. Then it disappears and the aspirant goes into samadhi. This is the knowledge of Brahman. It is the unwavering conviction of the Jhani that Brahman alone is real and the world illusory. All these names and forms are illusory like a dream. What Brahman is cannot be described. One cannot even say that Brahman is a person. This is the opinion of the Jhanis, the followers of Vedanta philosophy. But the Bhaktas accept all the states of consciousness. They take the waking state to be real also. They don't think the world to be illusory like a dream. They say that the universe is a manifestation of God's power and glory. God has created all these sky, stars, moon, sun, mountains, ocean, men, animals. They constitute His glory. He is within us in our hearts. Again He is outside. The most advanced devotees say that He Himself has become all this the twenty-four cosmic principles, the universe, and all living beings. The devotee of God wants to eat sugar, not to become sugar. All laugh. Do you know how a lover of God feels? His attitude is, O oh God, thou art the master, and I am thy servant. Thou art the mother, and I am thy child. Or again, thou art my father and mother. Thou art the whole, and I am a part. He doesn't like to say I am Brahman. Attitude of Yogis The Yogi seeks to realize the Paramatman, the Supreme Soul. His ideal is the union of the embodied soul and the Supreme Soul. He withdraws his mind from sense objects and tries to concentrate it on the Paramatman. Therefore, during the first stage of his spiritual discipline, he retires into solitude and with undivided attention practices meditation in a fixed posture. But the reality is one and the same. The difference is only a name. He who is Brahman is verily Atman and again he is the Bhagavan. He is Brahman to the followers of the path of knowledge, Paramatman to the yogis, and Bhagavan to the lovers of God. The steamer had been going toward Calcutta, but the passengers with their eyes fixed on the master and their ears given to his nectar-like words were oblivious of its motion. Dakshin's war with its temples and gardens was left behind. The paddles of the boat churned the waters of the Ganges with a murmuring sound. But the devotees were indifferent to all this. Spellbound, they looked on a great yogi, his face lighted with adivine smile, his countenance radiating love, his eyes sparkling with joy a man who had renounced all for God, and who knew nothing but God. Unceasing words of wisdom flowed from his lips. Reasoning of Jhanis Mastier, the Jhanis who adhere to the non-dualistic philosophy of Vedanta, say that the acts of creation, preservation and destruction, the universe itself and all its living beings, are the manifestations of Sakti, the divine power. If you reason it out, you will realize that all these are as illusory as a dream. Brahman alone is the reality, and all else is unreal. Even this very Sakti is unsubstantial like a dream. But though you reason all your life, Unless you are established in Samadhi, you cannot go beyond the jurisdiction of Sakti. Even when you say I am meditating or I am contemplating, still you are moving in the realm of Sakti within its power. Identity of Brahman and Sakti Thus Brahman and Sakti are identical. If you accept the one, you must accept the other. 
it is like fire and its power to burn. If you see the fire, you must recognize its power to burn also. You cannot think of fire without its power to burn, nor can you think of the power to burn without fire. You cannot conceive of the sun's rays without the sun, nor can you conceive of the sun without its rays. What is milk like? Oh, you say it is something white. You cannot think of the milk without the whiteness, and again, you cannot think of the whiteness without the milk. Thus, one cannot think of Brahman without Sakti, or of Sakti without Brahman. One cannot think of the Absolute without the Relative, or of the Relative without the Absolute. The primordial power is ever at play. She is creating, preserving, and destroying in play, as it were. This power is called Kali. Kali is verily Brahman, and Brahman is verily Kali. It is one and the same reality. When we think of it as inactive, that is to say, not engaged in the acts of creation, preservation, and destruction, then we call it Brahman. But when it engages in these activities, then we call it Kali or Sakti. The reality is one and the same. The difference is in name and form. It is like water called in different languages by different names, such as Jal, Pani, and so forth. There are three or four ghats on a lake. The Hindus who drink water at one place call it Jal. The Muslims at another place call it Pani. And the English at a third place call it water. All three denote one and the same thing, the difference being in the name only. In the same way, some address the reality as Allah, some as God, some as Brahman, some as Kali, and others by such names as Rama, Jesus, Durga, Hari. Different manifestations of Kali. Kesha with a smile, describe to us, sir, in how many ways Kali, the Divine Mother, sports in this world. Master with a smile, oh, she plays in different ways. It is she alone who is known as Maha Kali, Nitya Kali, Smasana Kali, Raksha Kali, and Siyama Kali. Maha Kali and Nitya Kali are mentioned in the Tantra philosophy. When there were neither the creation, nor the sun, the moon, the planets, and the earth, and when darkness was enveloped in darkness, then the mother, the formless one, Maha Kali, the great power, was one with Maha Kala, the absolute. Siyama Kali has a somewhat tender aspect and is worshipped in the Hindu households. She is the dispenser of boons and the dispeller of fear. People worship Raksha Kali, the protectress, in times of epidemic, famine, earthquake, drought, and flood. Smasana Kali is the embodiment of the power of destruction. She resides in the cremation ground, surrounded by corpses, jackals, and terrible female spirits. From her mouth flows a stream of blood, from her neck hangs a garland of human heads, and around her waist is a girdle made of human hands. Beginning of a cycle. After the destruction of the universe, at the end of a great cycle, the Divine Mother garners the seeds for the next creation. She is like the elderly mistress of the house, who has a hotchpotch pot in which she keeps different articles for household use. All laugh. Oh yes. Housewives have pots like that where they keep sea foam, blue pills, small bundles of seeds of cucumber, pumpkin and gourd and so on. They take them out when they want them. In the same way, after the destruction of the universe, my Divine Mother, the embodiment of Brahman, gathers together the seeds for the next creation. After the creation, the primal power dwells in the universe itself. She brings forth this phenomenal world and then pervades it. In the Vedas, creation is likened to the spider and its web. The spider brings the web out of itself and then remains in it. God is the container of the universe and also what is contained in it. Is Kali my Divine Mother of a black complexion? She appears black because she is viewed from a distance, but when intimately known she is no longer so. The sky appears blue at a distance, but look at it close by and you will find that it has no color. The water of the ocean looks blue at a distance, but when you go near and take it in your hand, you find that it is colorless. The Master became intoxicated with divine love and sang, is Kali, my mother, really black? The naked one of blackest hue lights the lotus of the heart. The master continued, bondage and liberation are both of her making. By her maya worldly people become entangled in woman and gold, and again, through her grace they attain their liberation. She is called Savior, 
and the remover of the bondage that binds one to the world. Divine Mother's Sport. Then the master sang the following song in his melodious voice. In the world's busy marketplace, O Siyama, thou art flying kites. High up they soar on the wind of hope, held fast by Maya's string. Their frames are human skeletons, their sails of the three gunas made, but all their curious workmanship is merely for ornament. Upon the kite strings thou hast rubbed the mania paste of worldliness, so as to make each straining strand all the more sharp and strong. Out of a hundred thousand kites at best but one or two break free, and thou dost laugh and clap thy hands, O mother, watching them. On favoring winds, says Ramprasad, the kite set loose will speedily be borne away to the infinite across the sea of the world. The master said, the Divine Mother is always playful and sportive. This universe is her play. She is self-willed and must always have her own way. She is full of bliss. She gives freedom to one out of a hundred thousand. A Brahmo devotee, but sir, if she likes she can give freedom to all. Why then, has she kept us bound to the world? Master, that is her will. She wants to continue playing with her created beings. In a game of hide and seek the running about soon stops if in the beginning all the players touch the granny. If all touch her then how can the game go on? That displeases her. Her pleasure is in continuing the game. Therefore the poet said, out of a hundred thousand kites at best but one or two break free, and thou dost laugh and clap thy hands, O mother, watching them. Reassurance to Householders it is as if the Divine Mother said to the human mind in confidence, with a sign from her eye, Go and enjoy the world. How can one blame the mind? The mind can disentangle itself from worldliness if, through her grace, she makes it turn toward herself. Only then does it become devoted to the lotus feet of the Divine Mother. Whereupon Sri Ramakrishna, taking upon himself, as it were, the agonies of all householders, sang a song complaining to the Divine Mother, Mother, this is the grief that sorely grieves my heart, that even with thee for mother, and though I am wide awake, there should be robbery in my house. Many and many a time I vow to call on thee, yet when the time for prayer comes round, I have forgotten. Now I see it is all thy trick. As thou hast never given, so thou receivest not. Am I to blame for this, O mother? Hadst thou but given, Surely then thou hadst received, out of thine own gifts I should have given to thee. Glory and shame, bitter and sweet, are thine alone. This world is nothing but thy play. Then, why, O blissful one, dost thou cause a rift in it? Says Ramprasad, thou hast bestowed on me this mind, and with a knowing wink of thine eye bidden it at the same time to go and enjoy the world. And so I wander here forlorn through thy creation, blasted, as it were, by someone's evil glance, taking the bitter for the sweet, taking the unreal for the real. The master continued, Men are deluded through her maya and have become attached to the world. Says Ramprasad, Thou hast bestowed on me this mind, and with a knowing wink of thine eye bidden it at the same time to go and enjoy the world. Ramo devotee, sir, can't we realize God without complete renunciation? Master with a laugh, of course you can. Why should you renounce everything? You are all right as you are, following the middle path like molasses partly solid and partly liquid. Do you know the game of knacks? Having scored the maximum number of points, I am out of the game. I can't enjoy it. But you are very clever. Some of you have scored ten points, some six and some five. You have scored just the right number, so you are not out of the game like me. The game can go on. Why, that's fine. I'll laugh. I tell you the truth, there is nothing wrong in your being in the world. But you must direct your mind toward God, otherwise you will not succeed. Do your duty with one hand and with the other hold to God. After the duty is over, you will hold to God with both hands. Bondage and liberation are of the mind. It is all a question of the mind. Bondage and liberation are of the mind alone. The mind will take the color you dye it with. It is like white clothes just returned from the laundry. If you dip them in red dye, they will be red. If you dip them in blue or green, they will be blue or green. They will take only the color you dip them in, whatever it may be. Haven't you noticed that if you read a little English, you at once begin to utter English words, 
foot foot at mitt. Then you put on boots and whistle a tune and so on. It all goes together. Or if a scholar studies Sanskrit, he will at once rattle off Sanskrit verses. If you are in bad company, then you will talk and think like your companions. On the other hand, when you are in the company of devotees, you will think and talk only of God. The mind is everything. A man has his wife on one side and his daughter on the other. He shows his affection to them in different ways. But his mind is one and the same. Bondage is of the mind, and freedom is also of the mind. A man is free if he constantly thinks, I am a free soul. How can I be bound whether I live in the world or in the forest? I am a child of God, the King of Kings. Who can bind me? If bitten by a snake, a man may get rid of its venom by saying emphatically, There is no poison in me. In the same way, by repeating with grit and determination, I am not bound, I am free, one really becomes so one really becomes free. When someone gave me a book of the Christians, I asked him to read it to me. It talked about nothing but sin. The Keshab sin is the only thing one hears of at your Brahmo Samaj too. The wretch who constantly says, I am bound, I am bound only succeeds in being bound. He who says day and night, I am a sinner, I am a sinner verily becomes a sinner. Redeeming power of faith. One should have such burning faith in God that one can say, what? I have repeated the name of God, and can sin still cling to me? How can I be a sinner any more? How can I be in bondage any more? If a man repeats the name of God, his body, mind and everything become pure. Why should one talk only about sin and hell and such things? Say but once, O Lord, I have undoubtedly done wicked things, but I will repeat them. And have faith in his name. Sri Ramakrishna became intoxicated with divine love and sang, If only I can pass away repeating Durga's name, how canst thou then, O blessed one, withhold from me deliverance, wretched though I may be? Master's Prayer then he said, To my divine mother I prayed only for pure love. I offered flowers at her lotus feet and prayed to her, Mother, here is thy virtue, here is thy vice. Take them both and grant me only pure love for thee. Here is thy knowledge, here is thy ignorance. Take them both and grant me only pure love for thee. Here is thy purity, here is thy impurity. Take them both, mother, and grant me only pure love for thee. Here is thy dharma, here is thy atharma. Take them both, mother, and grant me only pure love for thee. To the Brahma devotees now listen to a song by Ramprasad. Come, let us go for a walk, O mine, to Kale, the wish-fulfilling tree, and there beneath it gather the four fruits of life. Of your two wives, dispassion and worldliness, bring alone dispassion only on your way to the tree, and ask her son discrimination about the truth. When will you learn to lie, O mind, in the abode of blessedness, with cleanliness and defilement on either side of you. Only when you have found the way to keep these wives contentedly under a single roof will you behold the matchless form of Mother Siyama. Ego and ignorance your parents instantly banish from your sight, and should delusion seek to drag you to its whole manfully cling to the pillar of patience. Tie to the post of unconcern the goats of vice and virtue, killing them with the sword of knowledge if they rebel. With the children of worldliness, your first wife plead from a goodly distance, and if they will not listen, drown them in wisdom's sea. Says Ramprasad, if you do as I say, you can submit a good account, O mine, to the king of death, and I shall be well pleased with you and call you my darling. Why shouldn't one be able to realize God in this world? King Nanaka had such realization. Ramprasad described the world as a mere framework of illusion. But if one loves God's hallowed feet, then this very world is a mansion of mirth. Here I can eat, hear, drink, and make merry. Janaka's might was unsurpassed. What did he lack of the world or the spirit? Holding to one as well as the other, he drank his milk from a brimming cup. All laugh. But one cannot be a king, Janaka, all of a sudden. Janaka at first practiced much austerity and solitude. Solitude for householders. Even if one lives in the world, one must go into solitude now and then. It will be of great help to a man if he goes away from his family, lives alone, and weeps for God even for three days. 
even if he thinks of God for one day in solitude when he has the leisure, that too will do him good. People shed a whole jug of tears for wife and children. But who cries for the Lord? Now and then one must go into solitude and practice spiritual discipline to realize God. Living in the world and entangled in many of its duties, the aspirant, during the first stage of spiritual life, finds many obstacles in the path of concentration. While the trees on the footpath are young, they must be fenced around, otherwise they will be destroyed by cattle. The fence is necessary when the tree is young, but it can be taken away when the trunk is thick and strong. Then the tree won't be hurt even if an elephant is tied to it. Malady of worldly people and its cure. The disease of worldliness is like typhoid. And there are a huge jug of water and a jar of savory pickles in the typhoid patient's room. If you want to cure him of his illness, you must remove him from that room. The worldly man is like the typhoid patient. Various objects of enjoyment are the huge jug of water, and the craving for their enjoyment is his thirst. The very thought of pickles makes the mouth water, you don't have to bring them near. And he is surrounded with them. The companionship of woman is the pickles. Hence treatment in solitude is necessary. One may enter the world after attaining discrimination and dispassion. In the ocean of the world there are six alligators, lust, anger, and so forth. But you need not fear the alligators if you smear your body with turmeric before you go into the water. Discrimination and dispassion are the turmeric. Discrimination is the knowledge of what is real and what is unreal. It is the realization that God alone is the real and eternal substance and that all else is unreal, transitory, impermanent. And you must cultivate intense zeal for God. You must feel love for Him and be attracted to Him. The gopis of Vrindavan felt the attraction of Krishna. Let me sing you a song, listen. The flute has sounded in yonder wood. There I must fly for Krishna waits on the path. Tell me friends will you come along or no? To you my Krishna is merely an empty name, to me he is the anguish of my heart. You hear his flute notes all with your ears, but oh I hear them in my deepest soul. I hear his flute calling, Radha come out. Without you the grove is shorn of its loveliness. The master sang this song with tears in his eyes, and said to Kashab and the other Brahmo devotees, Whether you accept Radha and Krishna or not, please do accept their attraction for each other. Try to create that same yearning in your heart for God. Yearning is all you need in order to realize Him. Gradually the ebb tide set in. The steamboat was speeding toward Calcutta. It passed under the Howrah Bridge and came within sight of the Botanical Garden. The captain was asked to go a little farther down the river. Passengers were enchanted with the master's words, and most of them had no idea of time or of how far they had come. Kesha began to serve some puffed rice and grated coconut. The guests held these in the folds of their wearing cloths and presently started to eat. Everyone was joyful. The master noticed, however, that Keshab and Vijay rather shrank from each other, and he was anxious to reconcile them. Disagreements necessary for enriching life. Master to Keshab, look here. There is Vijay. Your quarrel seems like the fight between Shiva and Rama. Shiva was Rama's S guru. Though they fought with each other, yet they soon came to terms. For the grimaces of the ghosts, the followers of Shiva, and the gibberish of the monkeys, the followers of Rama, would not come to an end. Loud laughter. Such quarrels take place even among one's own kith and kin. Didn't Rama fight with his own sons, Lava and Kusa? Again, you must have noticed how a mother and daughter, living together and having the same spiritual end in view, observe their religious fast separately on Tuesdays, each on her own account as if the welfare of the mother were different from the welfare of the daughter. But what benefits the one benefits the other? In like manner, you have a religious society and Vijay thinks he must have one too. Laughter. But I think all these are necessary. While Sri Krishna, himself God incarnate, played with the gopis at Vrindavan, troublemakers like Dittila and Kitila appeared on the scene. You may ask why. The answer is that the play does not develop without troublemakers. All laugh. There is no fun without Dittila and Kitila. Loud laughter. 
Ramanuja upheld the doctrine of qualified non-dualism. But his Kuru was a pure non-dualist. They disagreed with each other and refuted each other's arguments. That always happens. Still to the teacher the disciple is his own. All rejoiced in the masker's company and his words. Master to Keshab, you don't look into people's natures before you make them your disciples and so they break away from you. All men look alike to be sure but they have different natures. Some have an excess of sattva, others an excess of rajas and still others an excess of tamas. You must have noticed that the cakes known as pili all look alike. But their contents are very different. Some contain condensed milk, some coconut kernel, and others mere boiled kali pulse. All laugh, master's humility. Do you know my attitude? As for myself, I eat, drink, and live happily. The rest the Divine Mother knows. Indeed, there are three words that prick my flesh, Kiru Master and Father. There is only one Kiru, and that is Sachit Ananda. He alone is the teacher. My attitude toward God is that of a child toward its mother. One can get human gurus by the million. All want to be teachers. But who cares to be a disciple? Difficulty of preaching. It is extremely difficult to teach others. A man can teach only if God reveals himself to him and gives the command. Narada Sukhadva and sages like them had such a command from God, and Sankara had it too. Unless you have a command from God, who will listen to your words? Don't you know how easily the people of Calcutta get excited? The milk in the kettle puffs up and boils as long as the fire burns underneath. Take away the fuel and all becomes quiet. The people of Calcutta love sensations. You may see them digging a well at a certain place. They say they want water. But if they strike a stone they give up that place. They begin at another place. And there perchance they find sand. They give up the second place too. Next they begin at a third. And so it goes. But it won't do if a man only imagines that he is God's command. God does reveal himself to man and speak. Only then may one receive his command. How forceful are the words of such a teacher. They can move mountains. But mere lectures. People will listen to them for a few days and then forget them. They will never act upon mere words. At Kemarpukar there is a small lake called the Haldarpukar. Certain people used to befoul its banks every day. Others who came there in the morning to bathe would abuse the offenders loudly. But next morning they would find the same thing. The nuisance didn't stop. All laugh. The villagers finally informed the authorities about it. A constable was sent who put up a notice on the bank which read, Commit no nuisance. This stopped the miscreants at once. All laugh. To teach others one must have a badge of authority, otherwise teaching becomes a mockery. A man who is himself ignorant starts out to teach others like the blind leading the blind. Instead of doing good such teaching does harm. After the realization of God one obtains an inner vision. Only then can one diagnose a person's spiritual malady and give instruction. Without the commission from God, a man becomes vain. He says to himself, I am teaching people. This vanity comes from ignorance, for only an ignorant person feels that he is the doer. A man verily becomes liberated in life if he feels, God is the doer. He alone is doing everything. I am doing nothing. Man's sufferings and worries spring only from his persistent thought that he is the doer. Doing good to others. You people speak of doing good to the world. Is the world such a small thing? And who are you pray to do good to the world? First realize God, see him by means of spiritual discipline. If he imparts power, then you can do good to others, otherwise not. A Brahmo devotee, then sir, we must give up our activities until we realize God. Master, no. Why should you? You must engage in such activities as contemplation, singing his praises and other daily devotions. Brahmo, but what about our worldly duties, duties associated with our earning money and so on? Master, yes you can perform them too but only as much as you need for your livelihood. At the same time, you must pray to God in solitude with tears in your eyes, 
that you may be able to perform those duties in an unselfish manner. You should say to him, O oh God, make my worldly duties fewer and fewer, otherwise, O oh Lord, I find that I forget thee when I am involved in too many activities. I may think I am doing unselfish work, but it turns out to be selfish. People who carry to excess the giving of alms, or the distributing of food among the poor, fall victims to the desire of acquiring name and fame. Sambu Malik once talked about establishing hospitals, dispensaries and schools, making roads, digging public reservoirs and so forth. I said to him, don't go out of your way to look for such works. Undertake only those works that present themselves to you and are of pressing necessity, and those also in a spirit of detachment. It is not good to become involved in many activities. That makes one forget God. Coming to the Calicat temple, some perhaps spend their whole time in giving alms to the poor. They have no time to see the mother in the inner shrine. Laughter. First of all manage somehow to see the image of the Divine Mother, of and by pushing through the crowd. Then you may or may not give alms as you wish. You may give to the poor to your heart's content, if you feel that way. Work is only a means to the realization of God. Therefore I said to Sam who suppose God appears before you, then will you ask him to build hospitals and dispensaries for you? Laughter. A lover of God never says that. He will rather say, O Lord, give me a place at thy lotus feet. Keep me always in thy company. Give me sincere and pure love for thee. Path of devotion most elective for Kali Yuga. Karma Yoga is very hard indeed. In the Kali Yuga, it is extremely difficult to perform the rites enjoined in the scriptures. Nowadays man's life is centered on food alone. He cannot perform any scriptural rites. Suppose a man is laid up with fever. If you attempt a slow cure with the old-fashioned indigenous remedies, before long his life may be snuffed out. He can't stand much delay. Nowadays the drastic degup to mixture is appropriate. In the Kali Yuga, the best way is back to yoga, the path of devotion singing the praises of the Lord and prayer. The path of devotion alone is the religion for this age. To the Brahmo devotees yours also is the path of devotion. Lest you are indeed that you chant the name of Hari and sing the Divine Mother's glories. I like your attitude. You don't call the world a dream like the non-dualists. You are not Brahmajanis like them, you are backed as lovers of God. That you speak of him as a person is also good. You are devotees. You will certainly realize him if you call on him with sincerity and earnestness. The boat cast anchor at Kailagat and the passengers prepared to disembark. On coming outside they noticed that the full moon was up. The trees, the buildings and the boats on the Ganges were bathed in its mellow light. A carriage was hailed for the master and Mahendra and a few devotees got in with him. The master asked for Keshub. Presently the latter arrived and inquired about the arrangements made for the master's return to Dakshin's war. Then he bowed low and took leave of Sri Ramakrishna. The carriage drove through the European quarter of the city. The master enjoyed the sight of the beautiful mansions on both sides of the well-lighted streets. Suddenly he said, I am thirsty. What's to be done? Nandalal Keshab's nephew stopped the carriage before the India Club and went upstairs to get some water. The master inquired whether the glass had been well washed. On being assured that it had been, he drank the water. As the carriage went along, the master put his head out of the window and looked with childlike enjoyment at the people, the vehicles, the horses, and the streets, all flooded with moonlight. Now and then he heard European ladies singing at the piano. He was in a very happy mood. The carriage arrived at the house of Suresh Mitra, who was a great devotee of the master and whom he addressed affectionately as Shurendra. He was not at home. The members of the household opened a room on the ground floor for the master and his party. The cabby fare was to be paid. Shurendra would have taken care of it had he been there. The master said to a devotee, Why don't you ask the ladies to pay the fare? They certainly know that their master visits us at Dakshane's war. I am not a stranger to them. All laugh. Narendra who lived in that quarter of the city, was sent for. In the meantime Sri Ramakrishna and the devotees were invited to the drawing room upstairs. 
The floor of the room was covered with a carpet and a white sheet. A few cushions were lying about. On the wall hung an oil painting especially painted for Shurandra, in which Sri Ramakrishna was pointing out to Keshab the harmony of Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and other religions. On seeing the picture Keshab had once said, Blessed is the man who conceived the idea. Sri Ramakrishna was talking joyously with the devotees when Narendra arrived. This made the master doubly happy. He said to his young disciple, We had a boat trip with Keshab today. Vijay and many other Brahmo devotees were there. Pointing to Mahendra asked him what I said to Keshab and Vijay about the mother and daughter observing their religious fast on Tuesdays, each on her own account, though the welfare of the one meant the welfare of the other. I also said to Keshab that troublemakers like Datila and Kutila were necessary to lend zest to the play. To Mahendra isn't that so? Mahendra, yes sir. Quite so. It was late. Jurandra had not yet returned. The master had to leave for the temple garden and a cab was brought for him. Mahendra and Narendra saluted him and took their leave. Sri Ramakrishna's carriage started for Dakshans where through the moonlit streets. Chapter 6 The Master with the Brahmo Devotee's Eye October 28, 1882, it was Saturday. The semi-annual Brahmo festival, celebrated each autumn and spring, was being held in Benimithev Pal's beautiful garden house at Synthi, about three miles north of Calcutta. The house stood in a secluded place suited for contemplation. Trees laden with flowers, artificial lakes with grassy banks, and green arbors enhanced the beauty of the grounds. Just as the fleecy clouds were turning gold in the light of the setting sun, the master arrived. Many devotees had attended the morning devotions, and in the afternoon people from Calcutta and the neighboring villages joined them. Shivanath, the great Brahmo devotee whom the master loved dearly, was one of the large gathering of members of the Brahmo Samaj who had been eagerly awaiting Sri Ramakrishna's arrival. When the carriage bringing the master and a few devotees reached the garden house, the assembly stood up respectfully to receive him. There was a sudden silence, like that which comes when the curtain in a theater is about to be rung up. People who had been conversing with one another now fixed their attention on the master's serene face, eager not to lose one word that might fall from his lips. Master's Joy on Seeing Shivanath At the sight of Shivanath the master cried out joyously, Ah! Here is Shivanath. You see, you are a devotee of God. The very sight of you gladdens my heart. One hemp smoker feels very happy to meet another. Very often they embrace each other in an exuberance of joy. The devotees burst out laughing. Worldly people's indifference to spiritual life master, many people visit the temple garden at Dakshane's war. If I see some among the visitors indifferent to God, I say to them, you had better sit over there. Or sometimes I say, go and see the beautiful buildings. Laughter Sometimes I find that the devotees of God are accompanied by worthless people. Their companions are immersed in gross worldliness and don't enjoy spiritual talk at all. Since the devotees keep on for a long time talking with me about God, the others become restless. Finding it impossible to sit there any longer, they whisper to their devotee friends, When shall we be going? How long will you stay here? The devotees say, Wait a bit. We shall go after a little while. Then the worldly people say in a disgusted tone, Well then, you can talk. We shall wait for you in the boat. All laugh. Power of God's name. Worldly people will never listen to you if you ask them to renounce everything and devote themselves wholeheartedly to God. Therefore Chaitanya and Nittai, after some deliberation, made an arrangement to attract the worldly. They would say to such persons, Come, repeat the name of Hari, and you shall have a delicious soup of magar fish in the embrace of a young woman. Many people, attracted by the fish and the woman, would chant the name of God. After tasting a little of the nectar of God's hallowed name, they would soon realize that the fish soup really meant the tears they shed for love of God, while the young woman signified the earth. The embrace of the woman meant rolling on the ground in the rapture of divine love. Nit, I would employ any means to make people repeat Hari's name. Titania said, 
the name of God has very great sanctity. It may not produce an immediate result but one day it must bear fruit. It is like a seed that has been left on the cornice of a building. After many days the house crumbles and the seed falls on the earth, germinates, and at last bears fruit. Three Classes of Devotees As worldly people are endowed with sattva, rajas, and tamas, so also is bhakti characterized by the three guinas. Do you know what a worldly person endowed with sattva is like? Perhaps his house is in a dilapidated condition here and there. He doesn't care to repair it. The worship hall may be strewn with pigeon droppings and the courtyard covered with moss, but he pays no attention to these things. The furniture of the house may be old, he doesn't think of polishing it and making it look neat. He doesn't care for dress at all, anything is good enough for him. But the man himself is very gentle, quiet, kind and humble, he doesn't injure anyone. Again, among the worldly there are people with the traits of rajas. Such a man has a watch and chain, and two or three rings on his fingers. The furniture of his house is all spick and span. On the walls hang portraits of the Queen, the Prince of Wales and other prominent people. The building is whitewashed and spotlessly clean. His wardrobe is filled with a large assortment of clothes, even the servants have their livery and all that. The traits of a worldly man endowed with tamas are sleep, lust, anger, egotism, and the like. Three kinds of bhakti. Similarly bhakti devotion has its sattva. A devotee who possesses it meditates on God in absolute secret, perhaps inside his mosquito net. Others think he is asleep. Since he is late in getting up, they think perhaps he has not slept well during the night. His love for the body goes only as far as appeasing his hunger, and that only by means of rice and simple greens. There is no elaborate arrangement about his meals, no luxury in clothes, and no display of furniture. Besides, such a devotee never flatters anybody for money. An aspirant possessed of Rajasic Bhakti puts a tilak on his forehead and a necklace of holy Rudraksha beads, interspersed with gold ones, around his neck. All laugh. At worship he wears a silk cloth. A man endowed with Tamazic Bhakti has burning faith. Such a devotee literally extorts boons from God, even as a robber falls upon a man and plunders his money. Bind. Beat. Kill. That is his way, the way of the Dakwaits. Utilizing Thomas for spiritual welfare saying this, the master began to sing in a voice sweet with rapturous love, his eyes turned upward, Why should I go to Ganga or Gaya, to Kasi, Kanchi or Prabhas, so long as I can breathe my last with Kali's name upon my lips. What need of rituals has a man, what need of devotions any more, if he repeats the mother's name at the three holy hours? Rituals may pursue him close, but never can they overtake him. Charity, vows, and giving of gifts do not appeal to Madden's mind. The blissful mother's lotus feet are his whole prayer and sacrifice. Who could ever have conceived the power her name possesses? Jiva himself, the god of gods, sings her praise with his five mouths. The master was beside himself with love for the Divine Mother. He sang with fiery enthusiasm, If only I can pass away repeating Durga's name, how canst thou then, O blessed one, withhold from me deliverance, wretched though I may be? Then he said, One must take the firm attitude, what? I have chanted the Mother's name. How can I be a sinner any more? I am her child heir to her powers and glories. If you can give a spiritual turn to your tamas, you can realize God with its help. Force your demands on God. He is by no means a stranger to you. He is indeed your very own. Illustration of Physicians Again you see the quality of tamas can be used for the welfare of others. There are three classes of physicians, superior, mediocre and inferior. The physician who feels the patient's pulse and just says to him, take the medicine regularly belongs to the inferior class. He doesn't care to inquire whether or not the patient has actually taken the medicine. The mediocre physician is he who in various ways persuades the patient to take the medicine and says to him sweetly, my good man, how will you be cured unless you use the medicine? Take this medicine. I have made it for you myself. 
but he who, finding the patient stubbornly refusing to take the medicine, forces it down his throat, going so far as to put his knee on the patient's chest, is the best physician. This is the manifestation of the tamas of the physician. It doesn't injure the patient, on the contrary, it does him good. Three types of gurus like the physicians, there are three types of religious teachers. The inferior teacher only gives instruction to the disciples but makes no inquiries about their progress. The mediocre teacher, for the good of the student, makes repeated efforts to bring the instruction home to him, begs him to assimilate it, and shows him love in many other ways. But there is a type of teacher who goes to the length of using force when he finds the student persistently unyielding. I call him the best teacher. No finality about God's nature. A Brahmo devotee, sir, has God forms or has he none? Master, no one can say with finality that God is only this and nothing else. He is formless and again he has forms. For the Bhakta he assumes forms. But he is formless for the Jani, that is, for him who looks on the world as a mere dream. The Bhakta feels that he is one entity and the world another. Therefore God reveals himself to him as a person. But the Jani the Vedantist, for instance, always reasons, applying the process of not this, not this. Through this discrimination he realizes, by his inner perception, that the ego and the universe are both illusory, like a dream. Then the Jani realizes Brahman in his own consciousness. He cannot describe what Brahman is. Do you know what I mean? Think of Brahman, existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute, as a shoreless ocean. Through the cooling influence, as it were, of the Bhakta's love, the water has frozen at places into blocks of ice. In other words, God now and then assumes various forms for his lovers and reveals himself to them as a person. But with the rising of the sun of knowledge, the blocks of ice melt. Then one doesn't feel any more that God is a person, nor does one see God's forms. What he is cannot be described. Who will describe him? He who would do so disappears. He cannot find his eye any more. Illusoriness of eye if one analyses oneself, one doesn't find any such thing as I. Take an onion for instance. First of all you peel off the red outer skin, then you find thick white skins. Peel these off one after the other and you won't find anything inside. In that state a man no longer finds the existence of his ego. And who is there left to seek it? Who can describe how he feels in that state in his own pure consciousness about the real nature of Brahman? Once a salt all went to measure the depth of the ocean. No sooner was it in the water than it melted. Now who was to tell the depth? Sign of perfect knowledge. There is a sign of perfect knowledge. Man becomes silent when it is attained. Then the eye, which may be likened to the salt doll, melts in the ocean of existence knowledge bliss absolute and becomes one with it. Not the slightest trace of distinction is left. As long as his self-analysis is not complete, man argues with much ado. But he becomes silent when he completes it. When the empty pitcher has been filled with water, when the water inside the pitcher becomes one with the water of the lake outside, no more sound is heard. Sound comes from the pitcher as long as the pitcher is not filled with water. People used to say in olden days that no boat returns after having once entered the black waters of the ocean. All trouble and botheration come to an end when the eye dies. You may indulge in thousands of reasoning, but still that eye doesn't disappear. For people like you and me, it is good to have the feeling I am a lover of God. Personal God for devotees. The Saguna Brahman is meant for the Bhaktas. In other words, a Bhakta believes that God has attributes and reveals himself to men as a person, assuming forms. It is he who listens to our prayers. The prayers that you utter are directed to him alone. You are Bhaktas, not Jhanis or Vedantists. It doesn't matter whether you accept God with form or not. It is enough to feel that God is a person who listens to our prayers, who creates, preserves, and destroys the universe, and who is endowed with infinite power. It is easier to attain God by following the path of devotion. Brahmo devotee, sir, is it possible for one to see God? If so, why can't we see him? Master, yes, he can surely be seen. One can see his forms and his formless aspect as well. How can I explain that to you? 
Intense longing enables one to see God. Brahmo devotee, what are the means by which one can see God? Master, can you weep for him with intense longing of heart? Men shed a jug full of tears for the sake of their children, for their wives, or for money. But who weeps for God? So long as the child remains engrossed with its toys, the mother looks after her cooking and other household duties. But when the child no longer relishes the toys, it throws them aside and yells for its mother. Then the mother takes the rice pot down from the hearth, runs in haste, and takes the child in her arms. Why so much controversy about God? Brahmo devotee, sir, why are there so many different opinions about the nature of God? Some say that God has form, while others say that he is formless. Again, those who speak of God with form tell us about his different forms. Why all this controversy? Master, a devotee thinks of God as he sees him. In reality, there is no confusion about God. God explains all this to the devotee if the devotee only realizes him somehow. You haven't set your foot in that direction. How can you expect to know all about God? Parable of the Chameleon Listen to a story. Once a man entered a wood and saw a small animal on a tree. He came back and told another man that he had seen a creature of a beautiful red color on a certain tree. The second man replied, When I went into the wood, I also saw that animal. But why do you call it red? It is green. Another man who was present contradicted them both and insisted that it was yellow. Presently others arrived and contended that it was gray, violet, blue, and so forth and so on. At last they started quarreling among themselves. To settle the dispute they all went to the tree. They saw a man sitting under it. On being asked he replied, Yes I live under this tree and I know the animal very well. All your descriptions are true. Sometimes it appears red, sometimes yellow, and at other times blue, violet, gray, and so forth. It is a chameleon. And sometimes it has no color at all. Now it has a color and now it has none. In like manner, one who constantly thinks of God can know his real nature. He alone knows that God reveals himself to seekers in various forms and aspects. God has attributes, then again he has none. Only the man who lives under the tree knows that the chameleon can appear in various colors, and he knows further that the animal at times has no color at all. It is the others who suffer from the agony of futile argument. Kabir used to say the formless absolute is my father, and God with form is my mother. God reveals himself in the form which his devotee loves most. His love for the devotee knows no bounds. It is written in the Purana that God assumed the form of Rama for his heroic devotee Hanuman. Vedantic Non-Dualism The forms and aspects of God disappear when one discriminates in accordance with the Vedanta philosophy. The ultimate conclusion of such discrimination is that Brahman alone is real and this world of names and forms illusory. It is possible for a man to see the forms of God, or to think of him as a person, only so long as he is conscious that he is a devotee. From the standpoint of discrimination this ego of a devotee keeps him a little away from God. Do you know why images of Krishna or Kali are three and a half cubits high? Because of distance. Again on account of distance the sun appears to be small. But if you go near it you will find the sun so big that you won't be able to comprehend it. Why have images of Krishna and Kali a dark blue color? That too is on account of distance, like the water of a lake which appears green, blue or black from a distance. Go near, take the water in the palm of your hand, and you will find that it has no color. The sky also appears blue from a distance. Go near and you will see that it has no color at all. Therefore I say that in the light of Vedantic reasoning Brahman has no attributes. The real nature of Brahman cannot be described. But so long as your individuality is real, the world also is real, and equally real are the different forms of God and the feeling that God is a person. Yours is the path of bhakti. That is very good, it is an easy path. Who can fully know the infinite God? And what need is there of knowing the infinite? Having attained this rare human birth, my supreme need is to develop love for the lotus feet of God. 
If a jug of water is enough to remove my thirst, why should I measure the quantity of water in a lake? I become drunk one than half a bottle of wine. What is the use of my calculating the quantity of liquor in the tavern? What need is there of knowing the infinite? The various states of mind of the Brahmajani are described in the Vedas. The path of knowledge is extremely difficult. One cannot obtain jhana if one has the least trace of worldliness and the slightest attachment to woman and gold. This is not the path for the Kaliyuga. Seven Planes of the Mind The Vedas speak of seven planes where the mind dwells. When the mind is immersed in worldliness it dwells in the three lower planes at the navel, the organ of generation, and the organ of evacuation. In that state the mind loses all its higher visions it broods only on woman and gold. The fourth plane of the mind is at the heart. When the mind dwells there, one has the first glimpse of spiritual consciousness. One sees light all around. Such a man perceiving the divine light becomes speechless with wonder and says, Ah! What is this? What is this? His mind does not go downward to the objects of the world. The fifth plane of the mind is at the throat. When the mind reaches this, the aspirant becomes free from all ignorance and illusion. He does not enjoy talking or hearing about anything but God. If people talk about worldly things, he leaves the place at once. The sixth plane is at the forehead. When the mind reaches it, the aspirant sees the form of God day and night. But even then a little trace of ego remains. At the sight of that incomparable beauty of God's form, one becomes intoxicated and rushes forth to touch and embrace it. But one doesn't succeed. It is like the light inside a lantern. One feels as if one could touch the light, but one cannot on account of the pane of glass. In the top of the head is the seventh plane. When the mind rises there one goes into samadhi. Then the Brahmajani directly perceives Brahman. But in that state his body does not last many days. He remains unconscious of the outer world. If milk is poured into his mouth it runs out. Dwelling on this plane of consciousness, he gives up his body in twenty-one days. That is the condition of the Brahmajani. But yours is the path of devotion. That is a very good and easy path. Once a man said to me, Sir, can you teach me quickly the thing you call samadhi? I'll laugh. Duties drop away with deepening of spiritual mood after a man has attained samadhi, all his actions drop away. All devotional activities such as worship, japa, and the like as well as all worldly duties cease to exist for such a person. At the beginning there is much ado about work. As a man makes progress toward God, the outer display of his work becomes less and less so much so that he cannot even sing the name and glories of God. To Shivanath as long as you were not here at the meeting, people talked a great deal about you and discussed your virtues. But no sooner did you arrive here than all that stopped. Now the very sight of you makes everyone happy. People now simply say, Ah! Here is Shivanath Babu. All other talk about you has stopped. What happens after Samadhi? After attaining Samadhi, I once went to the Ganges to perform Tarpan. But as I took water in the palm of my hand, it trickled down through my fingers. Weeping I said to Halad Hari cousin, What is this? Halad Hari replied, It is called Galatahes, da in the holy books. After the vision of God, such duties as the performance of Tarpan drop away. In the curtain the devotee first sings, Nit, I am Ramada Hattie. As the devotional mood deepens he simply sings, Hattie. Hattie. Next all he can sing is Hattie. And last of all he simply sings, Ha! And goes into Samadhi. The man who has been singing all the while then becomes speechless. Again at a feast given to the Brahmins one at first hears much noise of talking. When the guests sit on the floor with leaf plates in front of them, much of the noise ceases. Then one hears only the cry, bring some luchi. As they partake of the luchi and other dishes, three quarters of the noise subsides. When the curd, the last course, appears, one hears only the sound soup, soup as the guests eat the curd with their fingers. Then there is practically no noise. Afterwards all retire to sleep, and absolute silence reigns. 
Therefore I say, at the beginning of religious life a man makes much ado about work, but as his mind dives deeper into God he becomes less active. Last of all comes the renunciation of work, followed by samadhi. Generally the body does not remain alive after the attainment of samadhi. The only exceptions are such sages as Narada, who keep their bodies alive in order to bring spiritual light to others. It is also true of divine incarnations like Chaitanya. After the well is dug, one generally throws away the spade and the basket, and keep them in order to help their neighbors. The great souls who retain their bodies after samadhi feel compassion for the suffering of others. They are not so selfish as to be satisfied with their own illumination. You are well aware of the nature of selfish people. If you ask them to spit at a particular place, they won't lest it should do you good. If you ask them to bring a sweetmeat worth a cent from the store, they will perhaps lick it on the way back. All laugh. But the manifestations of divine power are different in different beings. Ordinary souls are afraid to teach others. A piece of worthless timber may itself somehow float across the water, but it sinks even under the weight of a bird. Sages like Narada are like a heavy log of wood, which not only floats on the water but also can carry men, cows and even elephants. To Shivanath and the other Brahmo devotees can you tell me why you dwell so much on the powers and glories of God? I ask the same thing of Keshab Sen. One day Keshab and his party came to the temple garden at Dakshane's war. I told them I wanted to hear how they lectured. A meeting was arranged in the paved courtyard above the bathing gat on the Ganges, where Keshab gave a talk. He spoke very well. I went into a trance. After the lecture I said to Keshab, Why do you so often say such things as, O oh God, what beautiful flowers thou hast made! O oh God, thou hast created the heavens, the stars, and the ocean! And so on? Those who love splendor themselves are fond of dwelling on God's splendor. Once a thief stole the jewels from the images in the temple of Radha Kanta. Mathur Babu entered the temple and said to the deity, What a shame, O oh God! You couldn't save your own ornaments. The idea! I said to Mathur, Does he who has lacked me for his handmaid and attendant ever lack any splendor? Those jewels may be precious to you, but to God they are no better than lumps of clay. Shame on you! You shouldn't have spoken so meanly. What riches can you give to God to magnify his glory? Therefore I say, a man seeks the person in whom he finds joy. What need has he to ask where that person lives, the number of his houses, gardens, relatives and servants, or the amount of his wealth? I forget everything when I see Narendra. Never, even unwittingly, have I asked him where he lived, what his father's profession was, or the number of his brothers. Dive deep in the sweetness of God's bliss. What need have we of his infinite creation and unlimited glory? The Master sang, Dive deep, O oh mind, dive deep in the ocean of God's beauty. If you descend to the uttermost depths, there you will find the gem of love. Go seek, O oh mind, go seek Vrindavan in your heart, where with his loving devotees Sri Krishna sports eternally. Light up, O oh mind, light up true wisdom's shining lamp, and let it burn with steady flame unceasingly within your heart. Who is it that steers your boat across the solid earth? It is your guru, says Kubir. Meditate on his holy feet. Sri Ramakrishna continued, It is also true that after the vision of God, the devotee desires to witness his leela. After the destruction of Ravana at Rama's hands, Nikasha, Ravana's mother, began to run away for fear of her life. Lakshmana said to Rama, Revered brother, please explain this strange thing to me. This Nikasha is an old woman who has suffered a great deal from the loss of her many sons, and yet she is so afraid of losing her own life that she is taken to her heels. Rama bade her come near, gave her assurance of safety, and asked her why she was running away. Nikasha answered, O oh Rama, I am able to witness all this Leela of yours because I am still alive. I want to live longer, so that I may see the many more things you will do on this earth. All laugh. To Shivanath I like to see you. How can I live unless I see pure soul devotees? He was if they had been my friends in a former incarnation. Reincarnation of soul and inscrutability of God's ways of Brahmo devotee. Sir, do you believe in the reincarnation of the soul? 
Master, yes they say there is something like that. How can we understand the ways of God through our small intellects? Many people have spoken about reincarnation, therefore I cannot disbelieve it. As Bhishma lay dying on his bed of arrows, the Pandava brothers and Krishna stood around him. They saw tears flowing from the eyes of the great hero. Arjuna said to Krishna, Friend, how surprising it is. Even such a man as our grandsire Bhishma truthful, self-restrained, supremely wise, and one of the eight Vasis weeps, through Maya at the hour of death. Three Krishna asked Bhishma about it. Bhishma replied, O Krishna, you know very well that this is not the cause of my grief. I am thinking that there is no end to the Pandava sufferings, though God himself is their charioteer. A thought like this makes me feel that I have understood nothing of the ways of God, and so I weep. It was about half past eight when the evening worship began in the prayer hall. Soon the moon rose in the autumn sky and flooded the trees and creepers of the garden with its light. After prayer the devotees began to sing. Sri Ramakrishna was dancing, intoxicated with love of God. The Brahmo devotees danced around him to the accompaniment of drums and cymbals. All appeared to be in a very joyous mood. They echoed and rechoed with God's holy name. When the music had stopped, Sri Ramakrishna prostrated himself on the ground and making salutations to the Divine Mother again and again said, Bhagavata back to Bhagavan. My salutations at the feet of the Janis. My salutations at the feet of the Bhaktas. I salute the Bhaktas who believe in God with form, and I salute the Bhaktas who believe in God without form. I salute the knowers of Brahman of olden times. And my salutations at the feet of the modern knowers of Brahman of the Brahmo Samaj. Then the master and the devotees enjoyed a supper of delicious dishes, which Benimit have, their host, had provided. Wednesday, November 15, 1882, Master at the Circus. Sri Ramakrishna, accompanied by Rakal and several other devotees, came to Calcutta in a carriage and called for Mahendra at the school where he was teaching. Then they all set out for the maiden. Sri Ramakrishna wanted to see the Wilson Circus. As the carriage rolled along the crowded Chitpur Road, his joy was very great. Like a little child he leaned first out of one side of the carriage, and then out of the other, talking to himself as if addressing the passers-by. To Mahendra he said, I find the attention of the people fixed on earthly things. They are all rushing about for the sake of their stomachs. No one is thinking of God. They arrived at the circus. Tickets for the cheapest seats were purchased. The devotees took the master to a high gallery, and they all sat on a bench. He said joyfully, Ha! This is a good place. I can see the show well from here. There were exhibitions of various feats. A horse raced around a circular track over which large iron rings were hung at intervals. The circus rider, an Englishwoman, stood on one foot on the horse's back, and as the horse passed under the rings, she jumped through them, always alighting on one foot on the horse's back. The horse raced around the entire circle, and the woman never missed the horse or lost her balance. When the circus was over, the master and the devotees stood outside in the field near the carriage. Since it was a cold night he covered his body with his green shawl. Necessity of Spiritual Discipline Sri Ramakrishna said to Mahendra, Did you see how that English woman stood on one foot on her horse, while it ran like lightning? How difficult a feat that must be! She must have practiced a long time. The slightest carelessness and she would break her arms or legs, she might even be killed. One faces the same difficulty leading the life of a householder. A few succeed in it through the grace of God, and as a result of their spiritual practice. But most people fail. Entering the world, they become more and more involved in it. They drown in worldliness and suffer the agonies of death. A few only, like Yanaka, have succeeded through the power of their austerity in leading the spiritual life as householders. Therefore spiritual practice is extremely necessary. Otherwise one cannot rightly live in the world. The master got into the carriage with the devotees and went to Balaram Bose's house. He was taken with his companions to the second floor. 
It was evening and the lamps were lighted. The master described the feats he had seen at the circus. Gradually other devotees gathered, and soon he was engaged in spiritual talk with them. Master on caste system. The conversation turned to the caste system. Sri Ramakrishna said, The caste system can be removed by one means only, and that is the love of God. Lovers of God do not belong to any caste. The mind, body, and soul of a man become purified through divine love. Chaitanya and Nityananda scattered the name of Hari to everyone, including the pariah, and embraced them all. A Brahmin without this love is no longer a Brahmin, and a pariah with the love of God is no longer a pariah. Through bhakti and untouchable becomes pure and elevated. Entanglement of Householders Speaking of householders entangled in worldliness, the Master said, They are like the silkworm. They can come out of the cocoon of their worldly life if they wish. But they can't bear to, for they themselves have built the cocoon with great love and care. So they die there. Or they are like the fish in a trap. They can come out of it by the way they entered, but they sport inside the trap with other fish and hear the sweet sound of the murmuring water and forget everything else. They don't even make an effort to free themselves from the trap. The lisping of children is the murmur of the water, and the other fish are relatives and friends. Only one or two make good their escape by running away. They are the liberated souls. The Master then sang, When such delusion veils the world, through Mahamaya's spell, that Brahma is bereft of sense, and Vishnu loses consciousness, what hope is left for men? The narrow channel first is made, and there the trap is set, but open though the passage lies, the fish once safely through the gate, do not come out again. The silkworm patiently prepares its closely spun cocoon, yet even though a way leads forth, encased within its own cocoon, the worm remains to die. The master continued, man may be likened to grain. He has fallen between the millstones and is about to be crushed. Only the few grains that stay near the peg escape. Therefore men should take refuge at the peg, that is to say in God. Call on him. Sing his name. Then you will be free. Otherwise you will be crushed by the king of death. The master sang again, Mother! Mother! My boat is sinking, here in the ocean of this world. Fiercely the hurricane of delusion rages on every side. Clumsy is my helmsman, the mind, stubborn my six oarsmen, the passions, into a pitiless wind. I sailed my boat and now it is sinking. Split is the rudder of devotion, tattered is the sail of faith, into my boat the waters are pouring. Tell me what shall I do? For with my failing eyes, alas, nothing but darkness do I see. Here in the waves I will swim, O mother, and cling to the raft of thy name. Mr. Viswas had been sitting in the room a long time, he now left. He had once been wealthy but had squandered everything in an immoral life. Finally he had become indifferent to his wife and children. Referring to Mr. Viswas, the master said, He is an unfortunate wretch. A householder has his duties to discharge, his debts to pay, his debt to the gods, his debt to his ancestors, his debt to the rishis, and his debt to wife and children. If a wife is chaste, then her husband should support her, he should also bring up their children until they are of age. Only a monk must not save, the bird and the monk do not provide for the morrow. But even a bird provides when it has young. It brings food in its bill for its chicks. Balaram, Mr. Viswas now wants to cultivate the company of holy people. Master with a smile, a monk's Kamandalu goes to the four principal holy places with him, but it still tastes bitter. Likewise, it is said that the Malaya breeze turns all trees into sandalwood. But there are a few exceptions, such as the cotton tree, the aswatha, and the hog plum. Some frequent the company of holy men in order to smoke hemp. Many monks smoke it, and these householders stay with them, prepare the hemp, and partake of the prasad. Thursday, November 16, 1882, the master had come to Calcutta. In the evening he went to the house of Raj Mohan, a member of the Brahmo Samaj, where Narendra and some of his young friends used to meet and worship according to the Brahmo ceremonies. Sri Ramakrishna wanted to see their worship. 
He was accompanied by Mahendra and a few other devotees. The master was very happy to see Narendra and expressed a desire to watch the young men at their worship. Narendra sang and then the worship began. One of the young men conducted it. He prayed, O Lord, may we give up everything and be absorbed in Thee. Possibly the youth was inspired by the master's presence and so talked of utter renunciation. Sri Ramakrishna remarked in a whisper, Much likelihood there is of that. Raj Mohan served the master with refreshments. Sunday, November 19, 1882. It was the auspicious occasion of the Jagadatri Puja, the festival of the Divine Mother. Sri Ramakrishna was invited to Shurndra's house in Calcutta, but first he went to the house of Manamohan in the neighborhood. The master was seated in Manamohan's parlor. He said, God very much relishes the bhakti of the poor and the lowly just as the cow relishes fodder mixed with oil cake. King Duryodhana showed Krishna the splendor of his wealth and riches, but Krishna accepted the hospitality of the poor Vidura. God is fond of his devotees. He runs after the devotee as the cow after the calf. The master sang, and for that love the mighty yogis practice yoga from age to age, when love awakes the Lord like a magnet, draws to him the soul. Then he said, Tadhani used to shed tears of joy at the very mention of Krishna's name. God alone is the real substance, all else is illusory. Man can realize God if he wants to, but he madly craves the enjoyment of woman and gold. The snake has a precious stone in its head, but it is perfectly satisfied to eat a mere frog. Bhakti is the one essential thing. Who can ever know God through reasoning? I want love of God. What do I care about knowing His infinite glories? One bottle of wine makes me drunk. What do I care about knowing how many gallons there are in the grog shop? One jar of water is enough to quench my thirst. I don't need to know the amount of water there is on earth. Three Ramakrishna arrived at Shurndra's house. Many devotees had assembled there, including Shurndra's elder brother, who was a judge. Futility of reasoning. Master to Shurndra's brother, you are a judge. That is very good. But remember, everything happens through God's power. It is He who has given you your high position. That is how you became a judge. People think it is they who are great. The water from the roof flows through a spout that is shaped like a lion's head. It looks as if the lion were bringing the water out through its mouth. But look at the source of the water. A cloud gathers in the sky and rain falls on the roof. Then the water flows through the pipe and at last comes out through the spout. Chandra's brother, the Brahmo Samaj, preaches the freedom of women and the abolition of the caste system. What do you think about these matters? Master, men feel that way when they are just beginning to develop spiritual yearning. Storm raises clouds of dust, and one cannot distinguish between the different trees the mango, the hog plum, and the tamarind. But after the storm blows over, one sees clearly. After the first storm of divine passion is quelled, one gradually understands that God alone is the highest good, the eternal substance, and that all else is transitory. One cannot grasp this without tapasya and the company of holy men. What is the use of merely reciting the written parts for the drum? It is very difficult to put them into practice on the instrument. What can be accomplished by a mere lecture? It is austerity that is necessary. By that alone can one comprehend. You asked about caste distinctions. There is only one way to remove them, and that is by love of God. Lovers of God have no caste. Through this divine love the untouchable becomes pure, the pariah no longer remains a pariah. Tatanya embraced all, including the pariahs. The members of the Brahmo Samaj sing the name of Hari. That is very good. Through earnest prayer one receives the grace of God and realizes Him. God can be realized by means of all paths. The same God is invoked by different names. Master on Theosophy Chandra's brother, sir, what do you think of Theosophy? Master, I have heard that man can acquire superhuman powers through it and perform miracles. I saw a man who had brought a ghost under control. The ghost used to procure various things for his master. What shall I do with superhuman powers? Can one realize God through them? 
If God is not realized then everything becomes false. November 1882 It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when Sri Ramakrishna arrived in Calcutta to attend the annual festival of the Brahma Samaj, which was to be celebrated at Manal Malik's house. Besides Mahendra and other devotees of the Master, Vijay Goswami and a number of Brahmas were present. Elaborate arrangements had been made to make the occasion a success. Vijay was to conduct the worship. The Kathak recited the life of Prahlada from the Purana. Its substance was as follows, Hiranyakasipu Prahlada's father was king of the demons. He bore great malice toward God and put his own son through endless tortures for leading a religious life. Afflicted by his father, Prahlada prayed to God, O God, please give my father holy inclinations. At these words the master wept. He went into an ecstatic mood. Afterwards he began to talk to the devotees. Master, bhakti is the only essential thing. One obtains love of God by constantly chanting his name and singing his glories. Ah! What a devotee Shivanath is! He is soaked in the love of God like a cheesecake in syrup. One should not think my religion alone is the right path and other religions are false. God can be realized by means of all paths. It is enough to have sincere yearning for God. Infinite are the paths and infinite the opinions. Here in heart see God let me tell you one thing. God can be seen. The Vedas say that God is beyond mind and speech. The meaning of this is that God is unknown to the mind attached to worldly objects. Vaishnav Charan used to say, God is known by the mind and intellect that are pure. Therefore it is necessary to seek the company of holy men, practice prayer, and listen to the instruction of the Guru. These purify the mind. Then one sees God. Dirt can be removed from water by a purifying agent. Then one sees one's reflection in it. One cannot see one's face in a mirror if the mirror is covered with dirt. After the purification of the heart one obtains divine love. Then one sees God through His grace. One can teach others if one receives that command from God after seeing Him. Before that one should not lecture. There is a song that says, You have set up no image here within the shrine, O fool! Blowing the conch you simply make. Confusion worse confounded. You should first cleanse the shrine of your heart. Then you should install the deity and arrange worship. As yet nothing has been done. What can you achieve by blowing the conch shell and simply making a loud noise? Vijay sat on a raised stool and conducted the worship according to the rules of the Brahmo Samaj. Afterwards he sat by the master. Master to Vijay, will you tell me one thing? Why did you harp so much on sin? By repeating a hundred times I am a sinner, one verily becomes a sinner. One should have such faith as to be able to say what? I have taken the name of God, how can I be a sinner? God is our father and mother. Tell him O Lord I have committed sins, but I will repeat them. Chant his name and purify your body and mind. Purify your tongue by singing God's holy name. December 1882 in the afternoon Sri Ramakrishna was seated on the west porch of his room in the temple garden at Dakshinswar. Among others Babura, Ramdale and Mahendra were present. These three were going to spend the night with the master. Mahendra intended to stay the following day also, for he was having his Christmas holidays. Babura had only recently begun to visit the master. Master to the devotees. A man becomes liberated even in this life when he knows that God is the doer of all things. Once Keshab came here with Samhu Malik. I said to him, not even a leaf moves except by the will of God. Where is man's free will? All are under the will of God. Nangtu was a man of great knowledge, yet even he was about to drown himself in the Ganges. He stayed here eleven months. At one time he suffered from stomach trouble. The excruciating pain made him lose control over himself, and he wanted to drown himself in the river. There was a long shoal near the bathing gat. However far he went into the river, he couldn't find water above his knees. Then he understood everything and came back. At one time I was very ill and was about to cut my throat with a knife. 
Therefore I say, O mother, I am the machine and thou art the operator. I am the chariot and thou art the driver. I move as thou movest me, I do as thou makest me do. The devotees sing curtain in the master's room. Dwell, O Lord, O lover of bhakti, in the vrindavan of my heart and my devotion unto thee. Will be thy rata dearly loved. My body will be Nanda's home, my tenderness will be a soda, my longing for deliverance. Will be thy gentle gopi maids. Lift the govardhan of my sin and slay my six unyielding passions, fierce as the demons sent by Kamja. Sweetly play the flute of thy grace, charming the milch cow of my mind, abide in the pasture of my soul. Well by the Dyamuna of my yearning, under the banyan of my hope, forever gracious to thy servant, and, if not but the cowherd's love, can hold thee in Vrindavan's veil, then, Lord, let Dasarathi too become thy cowherd and thy slave. Again they sang, Sing, O bird that nestles deep within my heart. Sing, O bird that sits on the Kalpa tree of Brahman. Sing God's everlasting praise. Taste, O bird, of the four fruits of the Kalpa tree, Dharma, Artha, Kama Moksha. Sing, O bird, he alone is the comfort of my soul. Sing, O bird, he alone is my life's enduring joy. O thou wondrous bird of my life, sing aloud in my heart. Unceasingly sing, O bird. Sing forevermore, even as the thirsty chaddock. Sings for the raindrop from the cloud. A devotee from Nand and Bhagan entered the room with his friends. The master looked at him and said, Everything inside him can be seen through his eyes, as one sees the objects in a room through a glass door. This devotee and his brothers always celebrated the anniversary of the Brahmo Samaj at their house in Nandanbhagan. Sri Ramakrishna had taken part in these festivals. The evening worship began in the temples. The master was seated on the small couch in his room, absorbed in meditation. He went into an ecstatic mood and said a little later, Mother, please draw him to thee. He is so modest and humble. He has been visiting thee. Was the master referring to Babiram, who later became one of his foremost disciples? Why so much suffering in God's creation? The master explained the different kinds of samadhi to the devotees. The conversation then turned to the joy and suffering of life. Why did God create so much suffering? Mahendra, once Vidyasagar said in a mood of pique, What is the use of calling on God? Just think of this incident. At one time Chain, his Khan plundered a country and imprisoned many people. The number of prisoners rose to about a hundred thousand. The commander of his army said to him, Your Majesty, who will feed them? It is risky to keep them with us. It will be equally dangerous to release them. What shall I do? Chang, his Khan said, That's true. What can be done? Well, have them killed. The order was accordingly given to cut them to pieces. Now God saw this slaughter, didn't he? But he didn't stop it in any way. Therefore I don't need God, whether he exists or not. I don't derive any good from him. Master, is it possible to understand God's action and his motive? He creates, he preserves, and he destroys. Can we ever understand why he destroys? I say to the Divine Mother, O oh Mother, I do not need to understand. Please give me love for thy lotus feet. The aim of human life is to attain bhakti. As for other things, the mother knows best. I have come to the garden to eat mangoes. What is the use of my calculating the number of trees, branches, and leaves? I only eat the mangoes, I don't need to know the number of trees and leaves. Babiram Mahendra and Ramdeel slept that night on the floor of the master's room. It was an early hour of the morning, about two or three o'clock. The room was dark. Sri Ramakrishna was seated on his bed and now and then conversed with the devotees. Compassion and Attachment Master, remember that Dia, compassion and Maya, attachment, are two different things. Attachment means the feeling of my nest toward one's relatives. It is the love one feels for one's parents, one's brother, one's sister, one's wife and children. Compassion is the love one feels for all beings of the world. It is an attitude of equality. If you see anywhere an instance of compassion as in Vidyasagar, know that it is due to the grace of God. Through compassion one serves all beings. Maya also comes from God. 
Through Maya God makes one serve one's relatives. But one thing should be remembered, Maya keeps us in ignorance and entangles us in the world, whereas Daya makes our hearts pure and gradually unties our bonds. God cannot be realized without purity of heart. One receives the grace of God by subduing the passions lust, anger and greed. Then one sees God. I tried many things in order to conquer lust. When I was ten or eleven years old and lived at Kamarpukur, I first experienced Samadhi. As I was passing through a paddy field, I saw something and was overwhelmed. There are certain characteristics of God vision. One sees light, feels joy, and experiences the upsurge of a great current in one's chest like the bursting of a rocket. The next day Babiram and Ramdeel returned to Calcutta. Mahendra spent the day and the night with the Master. December 1882, it was afternoon. The Master was sitting in his room at Dakshinswar with Mahendra and one or two other devotees. Several Marwari devotees arrived and saluted the Master. They requested Sri Ramakrishna to give them spiritual instruction. He smiled. Master to the Marwari devotees, you see the feeling of I and mine is the result of ignorance. But to say, O God, thou art the doer, all these belong to thee is the sign of knowledge. How can you say such a thing as mine? The superintendent of the garden says, This is my garden. But if he is dismissed because of some misconduct, then he does not have the courage to take away even such a worthless thing as his mango wood box. Anger and lust cannot be destroyed. Turn them toward God. If you must feel desire and temptation, then desire to realize God, feel tempted by Him. Discriminate and turn the passions away from worldly objects. When the elephant is about to devour a plantain tree in someone's garden, the Mahat strikes it with his iron-tipped goad. You are merchants. You know how to improve your business gradually. Some of you start with a castor oil factory. After making some money at that, you open a cloth shop. In the same way, one makes progress toward God. It may be that you go into solitude now and then, and devote more time to prayer. But you must remember that nothing can be achieved, except in its proper time. Some persons must pass through many experiences and perform many worldly duties before they can turn their attention to God, so they have to wait a long time. If an abscess is lanced before it is soft, the result is not good. The surgeon makes the opening when it is soft and has come to a head. Once a child said to its mother, Mother, I am going to sleep now. Please wake me up when I feel the call of nature. My child, said the mother, when it is time for that, you will wake up yourself. I shan't have to wake you. The Marwari devotees generally brought offerings of fruit, candy and other sweets for the master. But Sri Ramakrishna could hardly eat them. He would say, they earn their money by falsehood. I can't eat their offerings. He said to the Marwaris, you see, one can't strictly adhere to truth in business. There are ups and downs in business. Nanak once said, I was about to eat the food of unholy people when I found it stained with blood. A man should offer only pure things to holy men. He shouldn't give them food earned by dishonest means. God is realized by following the path of truth. One should always chant his name. Even while one is performing one's duties, the mind should be left with God. Suppose I have a carbuncle on my back. I perform my duties, but the mind is drawn to the carbuncle. It is good to repeat the name of Rama. Thim Rama, who was the son of King Dasaratha, has created this world. Again, as spirit, he pervades all beings. He is very near us. He is both within and without. Chapter 7 The Master and Vijay Goswami Thursday, December 14, 1882, it was afternoon. Sri Ramakrishna was sitting on his bed after a short noonday rest. Vijay Balaram, Mahendra, and a few other devotees were sitting on the floor with their faces toward the Master. They could see the sacred river Ganges through the door. Since it was winter all were wrapped up in warm clothes. Vijay had been suffering from colic and had brought some medicine with him. Vijay the Brahmo Preacher Vijay was a paid preacher in the Sadharan Brahmo Samaj, but there were many things about which he could not agree with the Samaj authorities. 
He came from a very noble family of Bengal noted for its piety and other spiritual qualities. Advaita Goswami, one of his remote ancestors, had been an intimate companion of Sri Chaitanya. Thus the blood of a great lover of God flowed in Vijay's veins. As an adherent of the Brahma Samaj, Vijay no doubt meditated on the formless Brahman, but his innate love of God, inherited from his distinguished ancestors, had merely been waiting for the proper time to manifest itself in all its sweetness. Thus Vijay was irresistibly attracted by the God-intoxicated state of Sri Ramakrishna, and often sought his company. He would listen to the Master's words with great respect, and they would dance together in an ecstasy of divine love. It was a weekday. Generally devotees came to the Master in large numbers on Sundays, hence those who wanted to have intimate talks with him visited him on weekdays. Tendencies from Previous Births a boy named Vishnu, living in Ariadaha, had recently committed suicide by cutting his throat with a razor. The talk turned to him. Master, I felt very badly when I heard of the boy's passing away. He was a pupil in a school and he used to come here. He would often say to me that he couldn't enjoy worldly life. He had lived with some relatives in the western provinces and at that time used to meditate in solitude in the meadows, hills and forests. He told me he had visions of many divine forms. Perhaps this was his last birth. He must have finished most of his duties in his previous birth. The little that had been left undone was perhaps finished in this one. One must admit the existence of tendencies inherited from previous births. There is a story about a man who practiced the Sava Sathana.l He worshipped the Divine Mother in a deep forest. First he saw many terrible visions. Finally a tiger attacked and killed him. Another man, happening to pass and seeing the approach of the tiger, had climbed a tree. Afterwards he got down and found all the arrangements for worship at hand. He performed some purifying ceremonies and seated himself on the corpse. No sooner had he done a little japa than the Divine Mother appeared before him and said, My child, I am very much pleased with you. Accept a boon for me. He bowed low at the lotus feet of the goddess and said, May I ask you one question, mother? I am speechless with amazement at your action. The other man worked so hard to get the ingredients for your worship and tried to propitiate you for such a long time, but you didn't condescend to show him your favor. And I, who don't know anything of worship, who have done nothing, who have neither devotion nor knowledge nor love, and who haven't practiced any austerities, am receiving so much of your grace. The Divine Mother said with a laugh, My child, you don't remember your previous births. For many births you tried to propitiate me through austerities. As a result of those austerities, all these things have come to hand, and you have been blessed with my vision. Now ask me your boon. Suicide after the vision of God. A devotee, I am frightened to hear of the suicide. Master, suicide is a heinous sin, undoubtedly. A man who kills himself must return again and again to this world and suffer its agony. But I don't call it suicide if a person leaves his body after having the vision of God. There is no harm in giving up one's body that way. After attaining knowledge some people give up their bodies. After the gold image has been cast in the clay mold, you may either preserve the mold or break it. Many years ago a young man of about twenty used to come to the temple garden from Baranagor. His name was Gopal Sen. In my presence he used to experience such intense ecstasy that Hride had to support him for fear he might fall to the ground and break his limbs. That young man touched my feet one day and said, Sir, I shall not be able to see you any more. Let me bid you goodbye. A few days later I learnt that he had given up his body. Four classes of men. It is said that there are four classes of human beings the bound, those aspiring after liberation, the liberated and the ever perfect. Parable of the fish and the net. This world is like a fishing net. Men are the fish and God, whose Maya has created this world, is the fisherman. When the fish are entangled in the net, some of them try to tear through its meshes in order to get their liberation. They are like the men striving after liberation. But by no means all of them escape. Only a few jump out of the net with a loud splash, and then people say, Ah! 
There goes a big one. In like manner, three or four men attain liberation. Again, some fish are so careful by nature that they are never caught in the net. Some beings of the ever perfect class, like Narada, are never entangled in the meshes of worldliness. Most of the fish are trapped, but they are not conscious of the net and of their imminent death. No sooner are they entangled than they run headlong, net and all, trying to hide themselves in the mud. They don't make the least effort to get free. On the contrary, they go deeper and deeper into the mud. These fish are like the bound men. They are still inside the net, but they think they are quite safe there. A bound creature is immersed in worldliness, in woman and gold, having gone deep into the mire of degradation. But still he believes he is quite happy and secure. The liberated and the seekers after liberation look on the world as a deep well. They do not enjoy it. Therefore after the attainment of knowledge, the realization of God, some give up their bodies. But such a thing is rare indeed. Worldly-minded forget their lessons. The bound creatures entangled in worldliness will not come to their senses at all. They suffer so much misery and agony, they face so many dangers, and yet they will not wake up. The camel loves to eat thorny bushes. The more it eats the thorns, the more the blood gushes from its mouth. Still it must eat thorny plants, and will never give them up. The man of worldly nature suffers so much sorrow and affliction, but he forgets it all in a few days and begins his old life over again. Suppose a man has lost his wife or she has turned unfaithful. Lo! He marries again. Or take the instance of a mother. Her son dies and she suffers bitter grief, but after a few days she forgets all about it. The mother, so overwhelmed with sorrow a few days before, now attends to her toilet and puts on her jewelry. A father becomes bankrupt through the marriage of his daughters, yet he goes on having children year after year. People are ruined by litigation, yet they go to court all the same. There are men who cannot feed the children they have, who cannot clothe them or provide decent shelter for them, yet they have more children every year. Again, the worldly man is like a snake trying to swallow a mole. The snake can neither swallow the mole nor give it up. The bound soul may have realized that there is no substance to the world, that the world is like a hog plum, only stone and skin, but still he cannot give it up and turn his mind to God. I once met a relative of Keshab Sen, fifty years old. He was playing cards. As if the time had not yet come for him to think of God. There is another characteristic of the bound soul. If you remove him from his worldly surroundings to a spiritual environment, he will pine away. The worm that grows in filth feels very happy there. It thrives in filth. It will die if you put it in a pot of rice. All remain silent. Bondage removed by strong renunciation vijay. What must the bound soul's condition of mind be in order to achieve liberation? Master, he can free himself from attachment to woman and gold if, by the grace of God, he cultivates a spirit of strong renunciation. What is this strong renunciation? One who has only a mild spirit of renunciation says, Well, all will happen in the course of time. Let me now simply repeat the name of God. But a man possessed of a strong spirit of renunciation feels restless for God, as the mother feels for her own child. A man of strong renunciation seeks nothing but God. He regards the world as a deep well and feels as if he were going to be drowned in it. He looks on his relatives as venomous snakes, he wants to fly away from them. And he does go away. He never thinks, let me first make some arrangement for my family and then I shall think of God. He has great inward resolution. Parable of the Two Farmers Let me tell you a story about strong renunciation. At one time there was a drought in a certain part of the country. Farmers began to cut long channels to bring water to their fields. One farmer was stubbornly determined. He took a vow that he would not stop digging until the channel connected his field with the river. He set to work. The time came for his bath, and his wife sent their daughter to him with oil. Father, said the girl, it is already late. Rub your body with oil and take your bath. Go away, thundered the farmer. I have too much to do now. 
It was past midday, and the farmer was still at work in his field. He didn't even think of his bath. Then his wife came and said, "Why haven't you taken your bath? The food is getting cold. You overdo everything. You can finish the rest tomorrow or even today after dinner." The farmer scolded her furiously and ran at her, spade in hand, crying, "What? Have you no sense? There's no rain. The crops are dying." What will the children eat? You'll all starve to death. I have taken a vow not to think of bath and food today before I bring water to my field. The wife saw his state of mind and ran away in fear. Through a whole day's back-breaking labor, the farmer managed by evening to connect his field with the river. Then he sat down and watched the water flowing into his field with a murmuring sound. His mind was filled with peace and joy. He went home, called his wife, and said to her, "Now give me some oil and prepare me a smoke." With serene mind, he finished his bath and meal and retired to bed, where he snored to his heart's content. The determination he showed is an example of strong renunciation. Now there was another farmer who was also digging a channel to bring water to his field. His wife too came to the field and said to him, "It's very late. Come home. It isn't necessary to overdo things." The farmer didn't protest much, but put aside his spade and said to his wife, "Well, I'll go home since you ask me to." All laugh that man never succeeded in irrigating his field. This is a case of mild renunciation, as without strong determination, the farmer cannot bring water to his field. So also without intense yearning, a man cannot realize God. Devije, why don't you come here now as frequently as before? Vijay, sir, I wish to very much, but I am not free. I have accepted work in the Brahmo Samaj. Attachment to woman creates bondage, master. It is woman and gold that binds man and robs him of his freedom. It is woman that creates the need for gold. For woman, one man becomes the slave of another, and so loses his freedom. Then he cannot act as he likes. Story of Govindaji's priests. The priests in the temple of Govindaji at Jaipur were celibates at first, and at that time they had fiery natures. Once the king of Jaipur sent for them, but they didn't obey him. They said to the messenger, "Ask the king to come to see us." After consultation, the king and his ministers arranged marriages for them. From then on, the king didn't have to send for them. They would come to him of themselves and say, "Your Majesty, we have come with our blessings." Here are the sacred flowers of the temple. Deign to accept them. They came to the palace, for now they always wanted money for one thing or another: the building of a house, the rice-taking ceremony of their babies, or the rituals connected with the beginning of their children's education. Story of twelve hundred netas. There is the story of the twelve hundred netas and thirteen hundred netis. Virabhadra, the son of Nityananda Goswami, had thirteen hundred shaven-headed disciples. They attained great spiritual powers. That alarmed their teacher. My disciples have acquired great spiritual powers, thought Virabhadra. Whatever they say to people will come to pass. Wherever they go, they may create alarming situations. For people offending them unwittingly will come to grief. Thinking thus, Virabhadra one day called them to him and said. See me after performing your daily devotions on the bank of the Ganges. These disciples had such a high spiritual nature that, while meditating, they would go into samadhi and be unaware of the river water flowing over their heads during the flood tide. Then the ebb tide would come, and still they would remain absorbed in meditation. Now, one hundred of these disciples had anticipated what their teacher would ask of them, lest they should have to disobey his injunctions. They had quickly disappeared from the place before he summoned them. So they did not go to Virabhadra with the others. The remaining twelve hundred disciples went to the teacher after finishing their meditation. Virabhadra said to them, "These thirteen hundred nuns will serve you. I ask you to marry them, as you please, revered sir." They said, "The one hundred of us have gone away. Thenceforth, each of these twelve hundred disciples had a wife. Consequently, they all lost their spiritual power. Their austerities did not have their original fire." Company of women robbed them of their spirituality because it destroyed their freedom. Degrading effect of serving others to vijay you yourself perceive how far you have gone down by being a servant of others. 
Again, one finds that people with many university degrees, scholars with their vast English education, accept service under their English masters and are daily trampled under their boots. The one cause of all this is woman. They have married and set up a gay fair with their wives and children. Now they cannot go back much as they would like to. Hence all these insults and humiliations, all this suffering from slavery. Once a man realizes God through intense dispassion, he is no longer attached to woman. Even if he must lead the life of a householder, he is free from fear of an attachment to woman. Suppose there are two magnets, one big and the other small. Which one will attract the iron? The big one, of course. God is the big magnet. Compared to him, woman is a small one. What can woman do? Worshipping woman as divine mother. A devotee, sir, shall we hate women then? Master, he who has realized God does not look upon a woman with the eye of lust, so he is not afraid of her. He perceives clearly that women are but so many aspects of the divine mother. He worships them all as the mother herself. Vijay, come here now and then. I like to see you very much. Vijay, I have to do my various duties in the Brahmo Samaj, that is why I can't always come here. But I shall visit you whenever I find it possible. Difficulties of preaching. Master to Vijay, the task of a religious teacher is indeed difficult. One cannot teach man without a direct command from God. People won't listen to you if you teach without such authority. Such teaching has no force behind it. One must first of all attain God through spiritual discipline or some other means. Thus armed with authority from God, one can deliver lectures. After receiving the command from God, one can be a teacher and give lectures anywhere. He who receives authority from God also receives power from Him. Only then can he perform the difficult task of a teacher. An insignificant tenant was once engaged in a lawsuit with a big landlord. People realized that there was a powerful man behind the tenant. Perhaps another big landlord was directing the case from behind. Man is an insignificant creature. He cannot fulfill the difficult task of a teacher without receiving power direct from God. Vijay, don't the teachings of the Brahmo Samaj bring men salvation? Master, how is it ever possible for one man to liberate another from the bondage of the world? God alone, the creator of this world bewitching Maya, can save men from Maya. There is no other refuge but that great teacher Satchitananda. How is it ever possible for men who have not realized God or received his command, and who are not strengthened with divine strength, to save others from the prison house of the world? One day as I was passing Panchavati on my way to the pine grove, I heard a bullfrog croaking. I thought it must have been seized by a snake. After some time as I was coming back, I could still hear its terrified croaking. I looked to see what was the matter, and found that a water snake had seized it. The snake could neither swallow it nor give it up. So there was no end to the frog's suffering. I thought that had it been seized by a cobra it would have been silenced after three croaks at the most. As it was only a water snake, both of them had to go through this agony. A man's ego is destroyed after three croaks as it were, if he gets into the clutches of a real teacher. But if the teacher is an unripe one, then both the teacher and the disciple undergo endless suffering. The disciple cannot get rid either of his ego or of the shackles of the world. If a disciple falls into the clutches of an incompetent teacher, he doesn't attain liberation. Ego alone the cause of bondage. The J, sir, why are we bound like this? Why don't we see God? Master, Meyer is nothing but the egotism of the embodied soul. This egotism has covered everything like a veil. All troubles come to an end when the ego dies. If by the grace of God a man but once realizes that he is not the doer, then he at once becomes a jivan mukta. Though living in the body, he is liberated. He has nothing else to fear. This maya, that is to say the ego, is like a cloud. The sun cannot be seen on account of a thin patch of cloud. When that disappears, one sees the sun. If by the grace of the guru one's ego vanishes, then one sees God. Rama, who is God himself, was only two and a half cubits ahead of Lakshmana. But Lakshmana couldn't see him because Sita stood between them. 
Lakshmana may be compared to the Jiva and Seda to Maya. Man cannot see God on account of the barrier of Maya. Just look, I am creating a barrier in front of my face with this towel. Now you can't see me even though I am so near. Likewise, God is the nearest of all, but we cannot see him on account of this covering of Maya. Maya creates you pad his. The Jiva is nothing but the embodiment of Satchit and Nanda. But since Maya or ego has created various upad his, he has forgotten his real self. Each upad he changes man's nature. If he wears a fine black bordered cloth, you will at once find him humming Nidhu Babu's love songs. Then playing cards and a walking stick follow. If even a sickly man puts on high boots, he begins to whistle and climbs the stairs like an Englishman, jumping from one step to another. If a man but holds a pen in his hand, he scribbles on any paper he can get hold of such as the power of the pen. Money is also a great upadhi. The possession of money makes such a difference in a man. He is no longer the same person. A Brahmin used to frequent the temple garden. Outwardly he was very modest. One day I went to Kanagar with Hride. No sooner did we get off the boat than we noticed the Brahmin seated on the bank of the Ganges. We thought he had been enjoying the fresh air. Looking at us he said, Hello there priest. How do you do? I marked his tone and said to Hride, The man must have got some money. That's why he talks that way. Hride laughed. A frog had a rupee which he kept in his hole. One day an elephant was going over the hole and the frog, coming out in a fit of anger, raised his foot as if to kick the elephant and said, How dare you walk over my head? Such is the pride that money begets. One can get rid of the ego after the attainment of knowledge. On attaining knowledge one goes into samadhi, and the ego disappears. But it is very difficult to obtain such knowledge. Seven Planes of the Mind It is said in the Vedas that a man experiences samadhi when his mind ascends to the seventh plane. The ego can disappear only when one goes into samadhi. Where does the mind of a man ordinarily dwell? In the first three planes. These are at the organs of evacuation and generation, and at the navel. Then the mind is immersed only in worldliness, attached to woman and gold. A man sees the light of God when his mind dwells in the plane of the heart. He sees the light and exclaims, Ah! What is this? What is this? The next plane is at the throat. When the mind dwells there he likes to hear and talk only of God. When the mind ascends to the next plane in the forehead, between the eyebrows he sees the form of Satchit Ananda and desires to touch and embrace it. But he is unable to do so. It is like the light in a lantern which you can see but cannot touch. You feel as if you were touching the light, but in reality you are not. When the mind reaches the seventh plane, then the ego vanishes completely and the man goes into samadhi. Indescribability of highest plane. Vijay, what does a man see when he attains the knowledge of Brahman after reaching the seventh plane? Master, what happens when the mind reaches the seventh plane cannot be described. Once a boat enters the black waters of the ocean, it does not return. Nobody knows what happens to the boat after that. Therefore the boat cannot give us any information about the ocean. Once a salt doll went to measure the depth of the ocean. No sooner did it enter the water than it melted. Now who could tell how deep the ocean was? That which could have told about its depth had melted. Reaching the seventh plane the mind is annihilated, man goes into samadhi. What he feels then cannot be described in words. The wicked eye the eye that makes one a worldly person and attaches one to woman and gold is the wicked eye. The intervention of this ego creates the difference between jiva and atman. Water appears to be divided into two parts if one puts a stick across it. But in reality there is only one water. It appears as two on account of the stick. This eye is the stick. Remove the stick and there remains only one water as before. Now what is this wicked eye? It is the ego that says, what? Don't they know me? I have so much money. Who is wealthier than I? If a thief robs such a man of only ten rupees, first of all he wrings the money out of the thief, then he gives him a good beating. But the matter doesn't end there. 
the thief is handed over to the police and is eventually sent to jail. The wicked eye says, what? Doesn't the rogue know whom he has robbed? To steal my ten rupees. How dare he? Vijay, if without destroying the eye a man cannot get rid of attachment to the world and consequently cannot experience samadhi, then it would be wise for him to follow the path of Brahmajana to attain samadhi. If thy persists in the path of devotion, then one should rather choose the path of knowledge. The servant I. Master, it is true that one or two can get rid of the eye through samadhi, but these cases are very rare. You may indulge in thousands of reasonings, but still the eye comes back. You may cut the people tree to the very root today, but you will notice a sprout springing up tomorrow. Therefore, if thy must remain, let the rascal remain as the servant I. As long as you live, you should say, O God, thou art the master and I am thy servant. Thy that feels, I am the servant of God, I am his devotee does not injure one. Sweet things cause acidity of the stomach, no doubt, but sugar candy is an exception. The path of knowledge is very difficult. One cannot obtain knowledge unless one gets rid of the feeling that one is the body. In the Kali Yuga, the life of man is centered on food. He cannot get rid of the feeling that he is the body and the ego. Therefore the path of devotion is prescribed for this cycle. This is an easy path. You will attain God if you sing his name and glories and pray to him with a longing heart. There is not the least doubt about it. Suppose you draw a line on the surface of water with a bamboo stick. The water appears to be divided into two parts, but the line doesn't remain for any length of time. The servant I or the devotee I or the child I is only a line drawn with the ego and is not real. The ego of a devotee. Vijay to the master, Sir you ask us to renounce the wicked I. Is there any harm in the servant I? Master, the servant I that is the feeling I am the servant of God, I am the devotee of God does not injure one. On the contrary it helps one to realize God. Vijay, well sir, what becomes of the lust, anger and other passions of one who keeps the servant I? Master, if a man truly feels like that, then he has only the semblance of lust, anger and the like. If, after attaining God, he looks on himself as the servant or the devotee of God, then he cannot injure anyone. By touching the philosopher's stone a sword is turned into gold. It keeps the appearance of a sword but cannot injure. When the dry branch of a coconut palm drops to the ground, it leaves only a mark on the trunk indicating that once there was a branch at that place. In like manner, he who has attained God keeps only an appearance of ego, there remains in him only a semblance of anger and lust. He becomes like a child. A child has no attachment to the three gunasava, rajas and tamas. He becomes as quickly detached from a thing as he becomes attached to it. You can cajole him out of a cloth worth five rupees with a doll worth an anna, though at first he may say with great determination, No, I won't give it to you. My daddy bought it for me. Again, all persons are the same to a child. He has no feeling of high and low in regard to persons. Though he doesn't discriminate about caste. If his mother tells him that a particular man should be regarded as an elder brother, the child will eat from the same plate with him, though the man may belong to the low caste of a blacksmith. The child doesn't know hate or what is holy or unholy. Even after attaining samadhi some retain the servant ego or the devotee ego. The Bhakti keeps this eye consciousness. He says, O God, Thou art the master and I am Thy servant. Thou art the Lord and I am Thy devotee. He feels that way even after the realization of God. His eye is not completely effaced. Again by constantly practicing this kind of eye consciousness, one ultimately attains God. This is called Bhakti Yoga. One can attain the knowledge of Brahman too by following the path of bhakti. God is all-powerful. He may give his devotee Brahmajana also if he so wills. But the devotee generally doesn't seek the knowledge of the Absolute. He would rather have the consciousness that God is the master and he the servant or that God is the Divine Mother and he the child. Vijay, but those who discriminate according to the Vedanta philosophy also realize him in the end, don't they? path of bhakti is easy. Master, 
Yes, one may reach him by following the path of discrimination too, that is called Jana Yoga. But it is an extremely difficult path. I have told you already of the seven planes of consciousness. On reaching the seventh plane the mind goes into samadhi. If a man acquires the firm knowledge that Brahman alone is real and the world illusory, then his mind merges in samadhi. But in the Kali Yuga, the life of a man depends entirely on food. How can he have the consciousness that Brahman alone is real and the world illusory? In the Kali Yuga, it is difficult to have the feeling, I am not the body, I am not the mind, I am not the twenty-four cosmic principles, I am beyond pleasure and pain, I am above disease and grief, old age and death. However, you may reason and argue, the feeling that the body is identical with the soul will somehow crop up from an unexpected quarter. You may cut a people tree to the ground and think it is dead to its very root, but the next morning you will find a new sprout shooting up from the dead stump. One cannot get rid of this identification with the body, therefore the path of bhakti is best for the people of the Kali Yuga. It is an easy path. And I don't want to become sugar, I want to eat it. I never feel like saying I am Brahman. I say thou art my lord and I am thy servant. It is better to make the mind go up and down between the fifth and sixth planes, like a boat racing between two points. I don't want to go beyond the sixth plane and keep my mind a long time in the seventh. My desire is to sing the name and glories of God. It is very good to look on God as the master and oneself as his servant. Further you see, people speak of the waves as belonging to the Ganges, but no one says that the Ganges belongs to the waves. The feeling I am he is not wholesome. A man who entertains such an idea, while looking on his body as the self, causes himself great harm. He cannot go forward in spiritual life, he drags himself down. He deceives himself as well as others. He cannot understand his own state of mind. From a bhakti. But it isn't any and every kind of bhakti that enables one to realize God. One cannot realize God without prima bhakti. Another name for prima bhakti is raga bhakti. God cannot be realized without love and longing. Unless one has learnt to love God, one cannot realize Him. There is another kind of bhakti, known as Vedhibhakti, according to which one must repeat the name of God a fixed number of times, fast, make pilgrimages, worship God with prescribed offerings, make so many sacrifices, and so forth and so on. By continuing such practices a long time one gradually acquires raga bhakti. God cannot be realized until one has Raga Bhakti. One must love God. In order to realize God one must be completely free from worldliness and direct all of one's mind to Him. But some acquire Raga Bhakti directly. It is innate in them. They have it from their very childhood. Even at an early age they weep for God. An instance of such Bhakti is to be found in Prahlada. Vaidhya Bhakti is like moving a fan to make a breeze. One needs the fan to make the breeze. Similarly, one practices japa, austerity and fasting in order to acquire love of God. But the fan is set aside when the southern breeze blows of itself. Such actions as japa and austerity drop away when one spontaneously feels love and attachment for God. Who indeed will perform the ceremonies enjoined in the scriptures when mad with love of God? Devotion to God may be said to be green so long as it doesn't grow into love of God, but it becomes ripe when it has grown into such love. A man with green bhakti cannot assimilate spiritual talk and instruction, but one with ripe bhakti can. The image that falls on a photographic plate covered with black film 5 is retained. On the other hand, thousands of images may be reflected on a bare piece of glass, but not one of them is retained. As the object moves away, the glass becomes the same as it was before. One cannot assimilate spiritual instruction unless one has already developed love of God. Vijay, is bhakti alone sufficient for the attainment of God for his vision? Master, yes one can see God through bhakti alone. But it must be right bhakti, prima bhakti and raga bhakti. When one has that bhakti, one loves God even as the mother loves the child, the child the mother, or the wife the husband. When one has such love and attachment for God, 
one doesn't feel the attraction of Maya to wife, children, relatives, and friends. One retains only compassion for them. To such a man, the world appears a strange land, a place where he has merely to perform his duties. It is like a man's having his real home in the country, but coming to Calcutta for work, he has to rent a house in Calcutta for the sake of his duties. When one develops love of God, one completely gets rid of one's attachment to the world and worldly wisdom. One cannot see God if one has even the slightest trace of worldliness. Matchsticks, if damp, won't strike fire though you rub a thousand of them against the matchbox. You only waste a heap of sticks. The mind soaked in worldliness is such a damp matchstick. Once Sri Radha said to her friends that she saw Krishna everywhere, both within and without. The friends answered, Why, we don't see him at all. Are you delirious? Radha said, Friends, paint your eyes with the colirium of divine love, and then you will see him. To Vijay, it is said in a song of your Brahmo Samaj. O Lord, is it ever possible to know thee without love, however much one may perform worship and sacrifice? If the devotee but once feels this attachment and ecstatic love for God, this mature devotion and longing, then he sees God in both his aspects, with form and without form. Purity of heart. Vijay, how can one see God? Master, one cannot see God without purity of heart. Through attachment to woman and gold the mind has become stained covered with dirt, as it were. A magnet cannot attract a needle if the needle is covered with mud. Wash away the mud and the magnet will draw it. Likewise, the dirt of the mind can be washed away with the tears of our eyes. This stain is removed if one sheds tears of repentance and says, O oh God, I shall never again do such a thing. Thereupon God, who is like the magnet, draws to himself the mind, which is like the needle. Then the devotee goes into samadhi and obtains the vision of God. God's grace is the ultimate help. You may try thousands of times, but nothing can be achieved without God's grace. One cannot see God without his grace. Is it an easy thing to receive the grace of God? One must altogether renounce egotism. One cannot see God as long as one feels, I am the doer. Suppose in a family, a man has taken charge of the store room, then if someone asks the master, Sir, will you yourself kindly give me something from the store room? The master says to him, There is already someone in the store room. What can I do there? God doesn't easily appear in the heart of a man who feels himself to be his own master. But God can be seen the moment his grace descends. He is the son of knowledge. One single ray of his has illumined the world with the light of knowledge. That is how we are able to see one another and acquire varied knowledge. One can see God only if he turns his light toward his own face. The police sergeant goes his rounds in the dark of night with a lantern six in his hand. No one sees his face, but with the help of that light the sergeant sees everybody's face and others too can see one another. If you want to see the sergeant, however, you must pray to him, Sir, please turn the light on your own face. Let me see you. In the same way one must pray to God, O Lord, be gracious and turn the light of knowledge on thyself, that I may see thy face. A house without light indicates poverty. So one must light the lamp of knowledge in one's heart. As it is said in a psalm, Lighting the lamp of knowledge in the chamber of your heart, behold the face of the mother, Brahman's embodiment. As Vijay had brought medicine with him, the master asked a devotee to give him some water. He was indeed a fountain of infinite compassion. He had arranged for Vijay's boat fare since the latter was too poor to pay it. Vijay, Balaram, Mahendra and the other devotees left for Calcutta in a country boat. Monday, January 1, 1883, at 8 o'clock in the morning Sri Ramakrishna was seated on a mat spread on the floor of his room at Dakshanswar. Since it was a cold day, he had wrapped his body in his moleskin shawl. Prankrishna and Mahendra were seated in front of him. Rakul too was in the room. Prankrishna was a high government official and lived in Calcutta. Since he had had no offspring by his first wife, with her permission he had married a second time. By the second wife he had a son. Because he was rather stout, the master addressed him now and then as the fat Brahmin. He had great respect for Sri Ramakrishna. 
Though a householder, praying Krishna studied the Vedanta and had been heard to say, Brahman alone is real and the world illusory. I am he. The master used to say to him, In the Kali Yuga the life of a man depends on food. The path of devotion prescribed by Narada is best for this age. A devotee had brought a basket of jalebi for the master, which the latter kept by his side. Eating a bit of the sweets he said to Prang Krishna with a smile, You see I chant the name of the Divine Mother, so I get all these good things to eat. Laughter. But she doesn't give such fruits as gourd or pumpkin. She bestows the fruit of amrita, immortality, knowledge, love, discrimination, renunciation, and so forth. A boy six or seven years old entered the room. The master himself became like a child. He covered the contents of the basket with the palm or his hand, as a child does to conceal sweets from another child lest the latter should snatch them. Then he put the basket aside. Suddenly the master went into samadhi and sat thus a long time. His body was transfixed, his eyes wide open and unwinking, his breathing hardly perceptible. After a long time he drew a deep breath, indicating his return to the world of sense. Vision of Divine Mother Master to Prang Krishna My Divine Mother is not only formless, she has forms as well. One can see her forms. One can behold her incomparable beauty through feeling and love. The Mother reveals herself to her devotees in different forms. I saw her yesterday. She was clad in a seamless ochre-colored garment, and she talked with me. She came to me another day as a Muslim girl six or seven years old. She had a tilak on her forehead, and was naked. She walked with me joking and frisking like a child. At Hriday's house I had a vision of Goranga. He wore a black bordered cloth. Halit Hari used to say that God is beyond both being and non-being. I told the mother about it and asked her then is the divine form an illusion? The divine mother appeared to me in the form of Radhi's mother and said, Do thou remain in Bhava, I repeated this to Halit Hari. Now and then I forget her command and suffer. Once I broke my teeth because I didn't remain in bhava. So I shall remain in bhava unless I receive a revelation from heaven or have a direct experience to the contrary. I shall follow the path of love. What do you say? Prankrishna, yes sir. Master, but why should I ask you about it? There is someone within me who does all these things through me. At times I used to remain in a mood of godhood, and would enjoy no peace of mind unless I was being worshipped. I am the machine and God is the operator. I act as he makes me act. I speak as he makes me speak. Keep your wrath, says Ramprasad, afloat on the sea of life, drifting up with the flood tide, drifting down with the ebb. It is like the cast-off leaf before a gale. Sometimes it is blown to a good place and sometimes into the gutter, according to the direction of the wind. As the weaver said in the story, the robbery was committed by the will of Rama, I was arrested by the police by the will of Rama and again by the will of Rama, I was set free. Hanuman once said to Rama, O Rama, I have taken refuge in thee. Bless me that I may have pure devotion to thy lotus feet and that I may not be caught in the spell of thy world bewitching Maya. Once a dying bullfrog said to Rama, O Rama, when caught by a snake I cry for your protection. But now I am about to die, struck by your arrow. Hence I am silent. God's nature like that of a child. I used to see God directly with these very eyes, just as I see you. Now I see divine visions and trance. After realizing God a man becomes like a child. One acquires the nature of the object one meditates upon. The nature of God is like that of a child. As a child builds up his toy house and then breaks it down, so God acts while creating, preserving, and destroying the universe. Further, as the child is not under the control of any guna, so God is beyond the three guna sava, rajas, and tamas. That is why paramahamsas keep five or ten children with them, that they may assume their nature. Sitting on the floor in the room was a young man from Agarpara about twenty-two years old. Whenever he came to the temple garden he would take the master aside, by a sign, and whisper his thoughts to him. He was a newcomer. That day he was sitting on the floor near the master. Master to the young man. 
a man can change his nature by imitating another's character. He can get rid of a passion like lust by assuming the feminine mood. He gradually comes to act exactly like a woman. I have noticed that men who take female parts in the theater speak like women or brush their teeth like women while bathing. Come again on a Tuesday or Saturday. To prank Krishna Brahman and Sakti are inseparable. Unless you accept Sakti, you will find the whole universe unreal I, you house buildings and family. The world stands solid because the primordial energy stands behind it. If there is no supporting pole, no framework can be made, and without the framework there can be no beautiful image of Durga. Without giving up worldliness a man cannot awaken his spiritual consciousness, nor can he realize God. He cannot but be a hypocrite as long as he has even a trace of worldly desire. God cannot be realized without guilelessness. Cherish love within your heart, abandon cunning and deceit, through service, worship, selflessness, does Rama's blessed vision come. Even those engaged in worldly activities, such as office work or business, should hold to the truth. Truthfulness alone is the spiritual discipline in the Kaliyuga. Prankrishna. Yes, sir. It is said in the Mahanirvana Tantra, O oh Goddess, this religion enjoins it upon one to be truthful, self-controlled, devoted to the welfare of others, unagitated, and compassionate. Master, yes. But these ideas must be assimilated. Sri Ramakrishna was sitting on the small couch. He was in an ecstatic mood and looked at Rakul. Suddenly he was filled with the tender feeling of parental love toward his young disciple and spiritual child. Presently he went into Samadhi. The devotees sat speechless, looking at the master with wondering eyes. Regaining partial consciousness, the master said, Why is my spiritual feeling kindled at the sight of Rakul? The more you advance toward God, the less you will see of his glories and grandeur. The aspirant at first has a vision of the goddess with ten arms eight there is a great display of power in that image. The next vision is that of the deity with two arms. There are no longer ten arms holding various weapons and missiles. Then the aspirant has a vision of Gopala, in which there is no trace of power. It is the form of a tender child. Beyond that there are other visions also. The aspirant then sees only light. Reasoning and discrimination vanish after the attainment of God and communion with Him in Samadhi. How long does a man reason and discriminate? As long as he is conscious of the manifold, as long as he is aware of the universe, of embodied beings, of I and you. He becomes silent when he is truly aware of unity. This was the case with Trilanga Swami. Have you watched a feast given to the Brahmins? At first there is a great uproar. In his lessons as their stomachs become more and more filled with food. When the last course of curd and sweets is served, one hears only the sound soup, soup as they scoop up the curd in their hands. There is no other sound. Next is the stage of sleep samadhi. There is no more uproar. To Mahendra and Prankrishna many people talk of Brahmajana, but their minds are always preoccupied with lower things. House buildings, money name and sense pleasures. As long as you stand at the foot of the monument ten so long do you see horses, carriages, Englishmen and Englishwomen. But when you climb to its top, you behold the sky and the ocean stretching to infinity. Then you do not enjoy buildings, carriages, horses or men. They look like ants. All such things as attachment to the world and enthusiasm for woman and gold disappear after the attainment of the knowledge of Brahman. Then comes the cessation of all passions. When the log burns, it makes a crackling noise and one sees the flame. But when the burning is over and only ash remains, then no more noise is heard. Thirst disappears with the destruction of attachment. Finally comes peace. The nearer you come to God, the more you feel peace. Peace, 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 supreme peace. The nearer you come to the Ganges, the more you feel its coolness. You will feel completely soothed when you plunge into the river. But the universe and its created beings, and the twenty-four cosmic principles, all exist because God exists. Nothing remains if God is eliminated. The number increases if you put many zeros after the figure one, but the zeros don't have any value if the one is not there. 
The master continued, There are some who come down as it were after attaining the knowledge of Brahman after Samadhi and retain the ego of knowledge or the ego of devotion, just as there are people who of their own sweet will, stay in the marketplace after the market breaks up. This was the case with sages like Narada. They kept the ego of devotion for the purpose of teaching men. Sankarakarya kept the ego of knowledge for the same purpose. God cannot be realized if there is the slightest attachment to the things of the world. A thread cannot pass through the eye of a needle if the tiniest fiber sticks out. The anger and lust of a man who has realized God are only appearances. They are like a burnt string. It looks like a string, but a mere puff blows it away. God is realized as soon as the mind becomes free from attachment. Whatever appears in the pure mind is the voice of God. That which is pure mind is also pure Buddhai, that again is pure Atman because there is nothing pure but God. But in order to realize God one must go beyond Dharma and Adharma. The Master sang in his melodious voice, Come, let us go for a walk, O mind, to Kali, the wish-fulfilling tree, and there beneath it gather the four fruits of life. Three Ramakrishna went out on the southeast veranda of his room and sat down. Prankrishna and the other devotees accompanied him. Hazra too was sitting there. The master said to Prankrishna with a smile, Hazra is not a man to be trifled with. If one finds the big Darga here, then Hazra is the smaller Darga. All laughed at the master's words. A certain gentleman, Navakumar by name, came to the door and stood there. At sight of the devotees he immediately left. Oh! Egotism incarnate! Sri Ramakrishna remarked. About half past nine in the morning Prankrishna took leave of the master. Soon afterwards a minstrel sang some devotional songs to the accompaniment of a stringed instrument. The master was listening to the songs when Kadar Chatterjee, a householder devotee, entered the room clad in his office clothes. He was a man of devotional temperament and cherished the attitude of the gopis of Vrindavan. Words about God would make him weep. The sight of Kedar awakened in the master's mind the episode of Vrindavan and Sri Krishna's life. Intoxicated with divine love the master stood up and sang addressing Kedar, Tell me friend how far is the grove? Where Krishna my beloved dwells? His fragrance reaches me even here, but I am tired and can walk no farther. Sri Ramakrishna assumed the attitude of Sri Radha to Krishna and went into deep samadhi while singing the song. He stood there, still as a picture on canvas, with tears of divine joy running down his cheeks. Kedar knelt before the master. Touching his feet, he chanted a hymn. We worship the Brahman consciousness in the lotus of the heart, the undifferentiated, who is adored by Hari, Hara and Brahma, who is attained by yogis in the depths of their meditation the scatterer of the fear of birth and death, the essence of knowledge and truth, the primal seed of the world. After a time the master regained consciousness of the relative world. Soon Kedar took his leave and returned to his office in Calcutta. At midday Ramal brought the master a plate of food that had been offered in the Kali temple. Like a child he ate a little of everything. Later in the afternoon several Marwari devotees entered the master's room where Rakal and Mahendra also were seated. Amar worried devotee, sir, what is the way? Two ways of God realization. Master, there are two ways. One is the path of discrimination, the other is that of love. Discrimination means to know the distinction between the real and the unreal. God alone is the real and permanent substance. All else is illusory and impermanent. The magician alone is real. His magic is illusory. This is discrimination. Discrimination and renunciation. Discrimination means to know the distinction between the real and the unreal. Renunciation means to have dispassion for the things of the world. One cannot acquire them all of a sudden. They must be practiced every day. One should renounce woman and gold mentally at first. Then by the will of God, one can renounce it both mentally and outwardly. It is impossible to ask the people of Calcutta to renounce all for the sake of God. One has to tell them to renounce mentally. Constant practice urge. 
Through the discipline of constant practice one is able to give up attachment to woman and gold. That is what the Gita says. By practice one acquires uncommon power of mind. Then one doesn't find it difficult to subdue the sense organs and to bring anger, lust, and the like under control. Such a man behaves like a tortoise which, once it has tucked in its limbs, never puts them out. You cannot make the tortoise put its limbs out again, though you chop it to pieces with an axe. Marwari devotee, revered sir, you just mentioned two paths. What is the other path? Master, the path of bhakti or zealous love of God. Weep for God in solitude with a restless soul and ask him to reveal himself to you. Cry to your mother Siyama with a real cry, O oh mind! And how can she hold herself from you? Marwari devotee, sir, what is the meaning of the worship of the personal God? And what is the meaning of God without form or attribute? Master, as you recall your father by his photograph, so likewise the worship of the image reveals in a flash the nature of reality. Do you know what God with form is like? Like bubbles rising on an expanse of water, various divine forms are seen to rise out of the great akasa of consciousness. The incarnation of God is one of these forms. The primal energy sports, as it were, through the activities of a divine incarnation. What is there in mere scholarship? God can be attained by crying to him with a longing heart. There is no need to know many things. He who is an acharya has to know different things. One needs a sword and shield to kill others, but to kill oneself a needle or a nail knife suffices. One ultimately discovers God by trying to know who this I is. Is this I the flesh, the bones, the blood or the marrow? Is it the mind or the buddhi? Analyzing thus, you realize at last that you are none of these. This is called the process of neti neti, not this, not this. One can neither comprehend nor touch the Atman. It is without qualities or attributes. But according to the path of devotion, God has attributes. To a devotee Krishna is spirit, his abode is spirit, and everything about him is spirit. The Marwari devotees saluted the master and took their leave. At the approach of evening Sri Ramakrishna went out to look at the sacred river. The lamp was lighted in his room. The master chanted the hallowed name of the Divine Mother and meditated on her. Then the evening worship began in the various temples. The sound of gongs floating on the air mingled with the murmuring voice of the river. Peace and blessedness reigned everywhere. Chapter 8 The Master's Birthday Celebration at Dakshan's War Sunday, February 18, 1883, Sri Ramakrishna arrived at Govinda Mukherjee's house at Bulgaria near Calcutta. Besides Narendra Ram and other devotees, some of Govinda's neighbors were present. The master first sang and danced with the devotees. After the curtain they sat down. Many saluted the master. Now and then he would say, Bow before God. Master's attitude toward the wicked. It is God alone, he said, who has become all this. But in certain places, for instance, in a holy man, there is a greater manifestation than in others. You may say there are wicked men also. That is true, even as there are tigers and lions, but one need not hug the tiger god. One should keep away from him and salute him from a distance. Take water, for instance. Some water may be drunk, some may be used for worship, some for bathing, and some only for washing dishes. Paths of Knowledge and Devotion a neighbor, revered sir, what are the doctrines of Vedanta? Master, the Vedantist says I am he. Brahman is real and the world illusory. Even thy is illusory. Only the supreme Brahman exists. But thy cannot be got rid of. Therefore it is good to have the feeling I am the servant of God, his son, his devotee. For the Kali Yuga, the path of bhakti is especially good. One can realize God through bhakti too. As long as one is conscious of the body, one is also conscious of objects. Form, taste, smell, sound and touch these are the objects. It is extremely difficult to get rid of the consciousness of objects. And one cannot realize I am he as long as one is aware of objects. The sannyasi is very little conscious of worldly objects. But the householder is always engrossed in them. 
therefore it is good for him to feel I am the servant of God. God's name destroys sin. Neighbor, sir, we are sinners. What will happen to us? Master, all the sins of the body fly away if one chants the name of God and sings his glories. The birds of sin dwell in the tree of the body. Singing the name of God is like clapping your hands. As at a clap of the hands, the birds in the tree fly away, so do our sins disappear at the chanting of God's name and glories. Again, you find that the water of a reservoir dug in a meadow is evaporated by the heat of the sun. Likewise, the water of the reservoir of sin is dried up by the singing of the name and glories of God. You must practice it every day. The other day at the circus I saw a horse running at top speed with an Englishwoman standing on one foot on its back. How much she must have practiced to acquire that skill. Weep at least once to see God. These then are the two means, practice and passionate attachment to God, that is to say, restlessness of the soul to see him. Sri Ramakrishna began his midday meal with the devotees. It was about one o'clock. A devotee sang in the courtyard below, Awake, mother! Awake! How long thou hast been asleep in the lotus of the Muladhara! Fulfill thy secret function, mother! Rise to the thousand-petaled lotus within the head, where mighty Shiva has his dwelling. Swiftly pierce the six lotuses. And take away my grief, O essence of consciousness! Hearing the song, Sri Ramakrishna went into Samadhi. His whole body became still and his hand remained touching the plate of food. He could eat no more. After a long time his mind came down partially to the plane of the sense world and he said, I want to go downstairs. A devotee led him down very carefully. Still in an abstracted mood he sat near the singer. The song had ended. The master said to him very humbly, Sir, I want to hear the chanting of the mother's name again. The musician sang, Awake, mother! Awake! How long thou hast been asleep in the lotus of the Muladhara? The master again went into ecstasy. February 25, 1883 After his noon meal the master conversed with the devotees. Ram Kedar, Nitya Gopal, Mahendra and others had arrived from Calcutta. Rakhul, Harish, Latu and Hazra were living with the master. Mr. Chowdhury, who had three or four university degrees and was a government officer, was also present. He had recently lost his wife and had visited the master several times for peace of mind. Master Taram and the other devotees, devotees like Rakhal, Narendra, and Bhavanath may be called Nityasaita. Their spiritual consciousness has been awake since their very birth. They assume human bodies only to impart spiritual illumination to others. There is another class of devotees, known as Kripasiddha, that is to say, those on whom the grace of God descends all of a sudden and who at once attain his vision and knowledge. Such people may be likened to a room that has been dark a thousand years, which when a lamp is brought into it becomes light immediately, not little by little. Mystery of God's Ways Those who lead a householder's life should practice spiritual discipline. They should pray eagerly to God in solitude. To Mr. Chowd, your God cannot be realized through scholarship. Who indeed can understand the things of the Spirit through reason? No, all should strive for devotion to the lotus feet of God. Infinite are the glories of God. How little can you fathom them? Can you ever find out the meaning of God's ways? Bhishma was none other than one of the eight Vasis, but even he shed tears on his bed of arrows. He said, How astonishing! God himself is the companion of the Pandava brothers and still there is no end to their troubles and sorrows. Who can ever understand the ways of God? A man thinks I have practiced a little prayer and austerity, so I have gained a victory over others. But victory and defeat lay with God. I have seen a prostitute dying in the Ganges and retaining consciousness to the end. God vision through pure love. Mr. Chowdhury, how can one see God? Master, not with these eyes. God gives one divine eyes, and only then can one behold him. God gave Arjuna divine eyes so that he might see his universal form. Your philosophy is mere speculation. It only reasons. God cannot be realized that way. 
God cannot remain unmoved if you have raga bhakti that is, love of God with passionate attachment to Him. Do you know how fond God is of His devotee's love? It is like the cow's fondness for fodder mixed with oil cake. The cow gobbles it down greedily. Raga bhakti is pure love of God, a love that seeks God alone, and not any worldly end. Pralada had it. Suppose you go to a wealthy man every day, but you seek no favor of him, you simply love to see him. If he wants to show you favor you say, No sir, I don't need anything. I came just to see you. Such is love of God for its own sake. You simply love God and don't want anything from him in return. Saying this the master sang, Though I am never loath to grant salvation, I hesitate indeed to grant pure love. Whoever wins pure love surpasses all he's adored by men. He triumphs over the three worlds. He continued, The gist of the whole thing is that one must develop passionate yearning for God and practice discrimination and renunciation. Guru Anishta Mr. Chowdhury, Sir, is it not possible to have the vision of God without the help of a guru? Master, Sachidananda himself is the guru. At the end of the Shava said Hena, just when the vision of the Ish, to is about to take place, the Giru appears before the aspirant and says to him, Behold, there is your Ishta. Saying this, the Giru merges in the Ishta. He who is the Giru is also the Ishta. The Giru is the thread that leads to God. Women perform a ritualistic worship known as the Ananda Vrata, the object of worship being the infinite. But actually the deity worshipped is Vishnu. In him are the infinite forms of God. To Ram and the other devotees, if you ask me which form of God you should meditate upon, I should say, fix your attention on that form which appeals to you most, but know for certain that all forms are the forms of one God alone. Never harbor malice toward anyone. Shiva, Kali, and Hari are but different forms of that one. He is blessed indeed who has known all as one. Outwardly he appears as Shiva's devotee, but in his heart he worships Kali, the blissful mother, and with his tongue he chants aloud Lord Hari's name. The body does not endure without a trace of lust, anger, and the like. You should try to reduce them to a minimum. Looking at Kedar the master said, He is very nice. He accepts both the absolute and the relative. He believes in Brahman, but he also accepts the gods and divine incarnations in human form. In Kedar's opinion Sri Ramakrishna was such an incarnation. Looking at Nityagopal, the master said to the devotees he is in a lofty mood. To Nityagopal don't go there too often. You may go once in a while. She may be a devotee, but she is a woman too. Therefore I warn you. The sannyasi must observe very strict discipline. He must not look even at the picture of a woman. But this rule doesn't apply to householders. An aspirant should not associate with a woman, even though she is very much devoted to God. A sannyasi, even though he may have subdued his passions, should follow this discipline to set an example to householders. Worldly people learn renunciation by seeing the complete renunciation of a monk, otherwise they sink more and more. A sannyasi is a world teacher. Friday, March 9, 1008 183. Life of Worldliness About nine o'clock in the morning the master was seated in his room with Rakal, Mahendra and a few other devotees. It was the day of the new moon. As usual with him on such days, Sri Ramakrishna entered again and again into communion with the Divine Mother. He said to the devotees, God alone exists and all else is unreal. The Divine Mother has kept all deluded by her maya. Look at men. Most of them are entangled in worldliness. They suffer so much but still they have the same attachment to woman and gold. The camel eats thorny shrubs and blood gushes from its mouth, still it will eat thorns. While suffering pain at the time of delivery, a woman says, Ah, I shall never go to my husband again. But afterwards she forgets. The truth is that no one seeks God. There are people who eat the prickly leaves of the pineapple and not the fruit. Devotee, sir, why has God put us in the world? Master, the world is the field of action. Through action one acquires knowledge. 
the Guru instructs the disciple to perform certain works and refrain from others. Again, he advises the pupil to perform action without desiring the result. The impurity of the mind is destroyed through the performance of duty. It is like getting rid of a disease by means of medicine, under the instruction of a competent physician. Why doesn't God free us from the world? Ah, He will free us when the disease is cured. He will liberate us from the world when we are through with the enjoyment of woman and gold. Once a man registers his name in the hospital, he cannot run away. The doctor will not let him go away unless his illness is completely cured. Master's love for Rackle. During these days Sri Ramakrishna's heart overflowed with motherly love like the love Yasoda felt for Krishna. So he kept Rackle with him. Rackle fell toward the master, as a child feels toward its mother. He would sit leaning on the master's lap as a young child leans on its mother while sucking her breast. Rackle was thus seated by the master when a man entered the room and said that a high tide was coming in the Ganges. The master and the devotees ran to the Panchavati to see it. At the sight of a boat being tossed by the tide, Sri Ramakrishna exclaimed, Look! Look! I hope nothing happens to it. They all sat in the Panchavati. The master asked Mahendra to explain the cause of the tide. Mahendra drew on the ground the figures of the sun, moon and earth and tried to explain gravitation, ebb tide, flood tide, new moon, full moon, eclipse and so forth. Master to Mahendra, stop it. I can't follow you. It makes me dizzy. My head is aching. Well, how can they know of things so far off? You see, during my childhood, I could paint well, but arithmetic would make my head spin. I couldn't learn simple arithmetic. Sri Ramakrishna returned to his room with the devotees. Looking at a picture of Yasoda on the wall, he said, It is not well done. She looks like a garland seller. At Har's first visit, the master enjoyed a nap after his noon meal. At Har and other devotees gradually gathered. This was at Har's first visit. He was a deputy magistrate and about thirty years old. Much reasoning condemned. At heart to the master, Sir, I have a question to ask. Is it good to sacrifice animals before the deity? Thirdly involves killing. Master, the sastra prescribes sacrifice on special occasions. Such sacrifice is not harmful. Take, for instance, the sacrifice of a goat on the eighth day of the full or new moon. I am now in such a state of mind that I cannot watch a sacrifice. Also I cannot eat meat offered to the Divine Mother. Therefore I first touch my finger to it, then to my head, lest she should be angry with me. Again in a certain state of mind I see God in all beings, even in an ant. At that time, if I see a living being die, I find consolation in the thought that it is the death of the body, the soul being beyond life and death. One should not reason too much. It is enough if one loves the lotus feet of the mother. Too much reasoning throws the mind into confusion. You get clear water if you drink from the surface of a pool. Put your hand deeper and stir the water and it becomes muddy. Therefore pray to God for devotion. Behind Druva's devotion there was desire. He practiced austerities to gain his father's kingdom. A prolata's love for God was motiveless, a love that sought no return. A devotee, how can one realize God? Master, through that kind of love. But one must force one's demand on God. One should be able to say, O oh God, wilt thou not reveal thyself to me? I will cut my throat with a knife. This is the tamas of bhakti. Devotee, can one see God? Master, yes, surely. One can see both aspects of God, God with form and without form. One can see God with form, the embodiment of spirit. Again, God can be directly perceived in a man with a tangible form. Seeing an incarnation of God is the same as seeing God himself. God is born on earth as man in every age. March 11, 1883, Master's Birthday Celebration. It was Sri Ramakrishna's birthday. Many of his disciples and devotees wanted to celebrate the happy occasion at the Daxons or Temple Garden. From early morning the devotees streamed in, alone or in parties. After the morning worship in the temple sweet music was played in the Nehabat. 
It was springtime. The trees, creepers, and plants were covered with new leaves and blossoms. The very air seemed laden with joy, and the hearts of the devotees were glad on this auspicious day. Mahendra arrived early in the morning and found the master talking smilingly to Bhavanath, Rakul, and Kali Krishna. Mahendra prostrated himself before him. Master to Mahendra, I am glad you have come. To the devotees one cannot be spiritual as long as one has shame, hatred, or fear. Great will be the joy today. Those fools who will not sing or dance mad with God's name will never attain God. How can one feel any shame or fear when the names of God are sung? Now sing all of you. Bhavanath and his friend Kalakrishna sang. Thrice blessed is this day of joy. May all of us unite, O Lord, to preach thy true religion here. In India's holy land, thou dwellest in each human heart, thy name resounding everywhere, fills the four corners of the sky. Today thy devotees proclaim, thy boundless majesty. We seek not wealth or friends or fame, O Lord. No other hope is ours. For thee alone thy devotees, long with unflagging love, safe at thy feet what fear have we of death or danger. We have found the fount of immortality. To thee the victory, O Lord. To thee the victory. As Sri Ramakrishna listened to the song with folded hands, his mind soared to a far-off realm. He remained absorbed in meditation a long time. After a while Kalakrishna whispered something to Bhavanath. Then he bowed before the master and rose. Sri Ramakrishna was surprised. He asked, Where are you going? Bhavanath, he is going away on a little business. Master, what is it about? Bhavanath, he is going to the Baranagor Working Men's Institute. Master, it's his bad luck. A stream of bliss will flow here today. He could have enjoyed it. But how unlucky. Sri Ramakrishna did not feel well, so he decided not to bathe in the Ganges. About nine o'clock a few jars of water were taken from the river, and with the help of the devotees he finished his bath on the veranda east of his room. After bathing the master put on a new wearing cloth, all the while chanting the name of God. Accompanied by one or two disciples he walked across the courtyard to the temple of Kali, still chanting her hallowed name. His eyes had an indrawn look like that of a bird hatching her eggs. On entering the temple, he prostrated himself before the image and worshipped the Divine Mother. But he did not observe any ritual of worship. Now he would offer flowers and sandal paste at the feet of the image, and now he would put them on his own head. After finishing the worship in his own way, he asked Bhavanath to carry the green coconut that had been offered to the mother. He also visited the images of Radha and Krishna in the Vishnu temple. When the master returned to his room, he found that other devotees had arrived, among them Ram, Nityagopal, and Kedar. They all saluted the master, who greeted them cordially. He asked Nityagopal, Will you eat something now? Yes, the devotee answered. Nityagopal, who was twenty-three or twenty-four years old and unmarried, was like a child. His mind was always soaring in the spiritual realm. He visited the master sometimes alone and sometimes in Ram's company. The master had observed the spiritual state of his mind and had become very fond of him. He remarked now and then that Nityagopal was in the state of a Paramahamsa. Warning to Monks after Nityagopal had finished eating, the master took him aside and gave him various instructions. A certain woman, about thirty-one years old and a great devotee, often visited Sri Ramakrishna and held him in high respect. She had been much impressed by Nityagopal's spiritual state and looking upon him as her own son, often invited him to her house. Master to Nityagopal, do you go there? Nityagopal like a child, yes I do. She takes me. Master, beware, holy man. Go there once in a great while, but not frequently, otherwise you will slip from the ideal. My heir is nothing but woman and gold. A holy man must live away from woman. All sink there. Even Brahma and Vishnu struggle for life in that whirlpool. Nityagopal listened to these words attentively. Mahendra to himself, how strange. This young man has developed the state of a Paramahamsa. That is what the master says now and then. 
Is there still a possibility of his falling into danger in spite of his high spiritual state? What an austere rule is laid in for a sadhu. He may slip from his ideal by associating intimately with women. How can an ordinary man expect to attain liberation unless such a high ideal is set by holy men? The woman in question is very devout, but still there is danger. Now I understand why Chaitanya punished his disciple, the younger Haridas, so severely. In spite of his teacher's prohibition, Haridas conversed with a widow devotee. But he was a sannyasi. Therefore Chaitanya banished him. What a severe punishment! How hard is the rule for one who has accepted the life of renunciation? Again, what love the master cherishes for this devotee? He is warning him even now, lest he should run into danger in the future. Beware, holy man! These words of the master echoed in the hearts of the devotees, like the distant rumbling of thunder. The master went with the devotees to the northeast veranda of his room. Among them was a householder from the village of Daxonswar, who studied Vedanta philosophy at home. He had been discussing Om with Kedar before the Master. He said, This eternal word, the Anahata Sabda, is ever present both within and without. Master, but the word is not enough. There must be something indicated by the word. Can your name alone make me happy? Complete happiness is not possible for me unless I see you. Devotee, that eternal word itself is Brahman. Master de Kedar, oh don't you understand? He upholds the doctrine of the rishis of olden times. They once said to Rama, O oh Rama, we know you only as the son of Dasaratha. Let sages like Bharadvaja worship you as God incarnate. We want to realize Brahman, the indivisible existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute. At these words Rama smiled and went away. Kadar, those rishis could not recognize Rama as an incarnation of God. They must have been fools, Master, seriously. Please don't say such a thing. People worship God according to their tastes and temperaments. The mother cooks the same fish differently for her children, that each one may have what suits his stomach. For some she cooks the rich dish of palau, but not all the children can digest it. For those with weak stomachs she prepares soup. Some, again, like fried fish or pickled fish. It depends on one's taste. Carnation of God. The rishis followed the path of jhana. Therefore they sought to realize Brahman, the indivisible existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute. But those who follow the path of devotion seek an incarnation of God to enjoy the sweetness of bhakti. The darkness of the mind disappears when God is realized. In the Purana it is said that it was as if a hundred suns were shining when Rama entered the court. Why then weren't the courtiers burned up? It was because the brilliance of Rama was not like that of a material object. As the lotus blooms when the sun rises, so the lotus of the heart of the people assembled in the court burst into blossom. As the master uttered these words, standing before the devotees, he suddenly fell into an ecstatic mood. His mind was withdrawn from external objects. No sooner did he say the lotus of the heart burst into blossom, than he went into deep samadhi. He stood motionless, his countenance beaming and his lips parted in a smile. After a long time he returned to the normal consciousness of the world. He drew a long breath and repeatedly chanted the name of Rama, every word showering nectar into the hearts of the devotees. The master sat down, the others seating themselves around him. Master to the devotees, ordinary people do not recognize the advent of an incarnation of God. He comes in secret. Only a few of his intimate disciples can recognize him. That Rama was both Brahman Absolute and a perfect incarnation of God in human form was known only to twelve rishis. The other sages said to him, Rama, we know you only as Dasaratha's son. Can everyone comprehend Brahman, the indivisible existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute? He alone has attained perfect love of God who, having reached the absolute, keeps himself in the realm of the relative in order to enjoy the divine Leela. A man can describe the ways and activities of the queen if he has previously visited her in England. Only then will his description of the queen be correct. Sages like Bharadvajya adored Rama and said, O Rama, you are nothing but the indivisible Satchitananda. 
You have appeared before us as a human being, but you look like a man because you have shrouded yourself with your own Maya. These rishis were great devotees of Rama, and had supreme love for God. Masters different spiritual moods presently some devotees from Kanagar arrived, singing curtain to the accompaniment of drums and cymbals. As they reached the northeast veranda of Sri Ramakrishna's room, the master joined in the music, dancing with them intoxicated with divine joy. Now and then he went into samadhi, standing still as a statue. While he was in one of these states of divine unconsciousness, the devotees put thick garlands of jasmine around his neck. The enchanting form of the master reminded the devotees of Chaitanya, another incarnation of God. The master passed alternately through three moods of divine consciousness, the inmost when he completely lost all knowledge of the outer world, the semi-conscious when he danced with the devotees in an ecstasy of love, and the conscious when he joined them in loud singing. It was indeed a sight for the gods to see the master standing motionless in samadhi with fragrant garlands hanging from his neck, his countenance beaming with love and the devotees singing and dancing around him. When it was time for his noon meal, Sri Ramakrishna put on a new yellow cloth and sat on the small couch. His golden complexion, blending with his yellow cloth, enchanted the eyes of the devotees. After his meal Sri Ramakrishna rested a little on the small couch. Inside and outside his room crowded the devotees, among them Kedar, Suresh, Ram, Manamohan, Jirindra, Rakhal, Bhavanath, and Mahendra Rakhal's father was also present. Efficacy of Ernest Japa Avesh Navagoswami was seated in the room. The master said to him, Well, what do you say? What is the way? Goswami, sir, the chanting of God's name is enough. The scriptures emphasize the sanctity of God's name for the Kali Yuga. Master, yes, there is no doubt about the sanctity of God's name. But can a mere name achieve anything without the yearning love of the devotee behind it? One should feel great restlessness of soul for the vision of God. Suppose a man repeats the name of God mechanically, while his mind is absorbed in woman and gold. Can he achieve anything? Mere muttering of magic words doesn't cure one of the pain of a spider or scorpion's sting. One must also apply the smoke of burning cow dung. Guswami, but what about Ajamila then? He was a great sinner. There was no sin he had not indulged in. But he uttered the name of Narayana on his deathbed, calling his son, who also had that name. And thus he was liberated. Master, perhaps Ajamila had done many spiritual things in his past births. It is also said that he once practiced austerity. Besides, those were the last moments of his life. What is the use of giving an elephant a bath? It will cover itself with dirt and dust again and become its former self. But if someone removes the dust from its body and gives it a bath just before it enters the stable, then the elephant remains clean. Suppose a man becomes pure by chanting the holy name of God, but immediately afterwards commits many sins. He has no strength of mind. He doesn't take a vow not to repeat his sins. A bath in the Ganges undoubtedly absolves one of all sins, but what does that avail? They say that the sins perch on the trees along the bank of the Ganges. No sooner does the man come back from the holy waters than the old sins jump on his shoulders from the trees. All laugh. The same old sins take possession of him again. He is hardly out of the water before they fall upon him. Therefore I say, chant the name of God, and with it pray to him that you may have love for him. Pray to God that your attachment to such transitory things as wealth, name, and creature comforts may become less and less every day. Dogmatism condemned to the Goswami with sincerity and earnestness one can realize God through all religions. The Vaishnavas will realize God and so will the Saktas, the Vedantists, and the Brahmos. The Muslims and Christians will realize Him too. All will certainly realize God if they are earnest and sincere. Some people indulge in quarrels, saying, One cannot attain anything unless one worships our Krishna, or nothing can be gained without the worship of Kali, our Divine Mother, or one cannot be saved without accepting the Christian religion. This is pure dogmatism. The dogmatist says, 
my religion alone is true, and the religions of others are false. This is a bad attitude. God can be reached by different paths. Further, some say that God has form and is not formless. Thus they start quarreling. Avesh Nava quarrels with a Vedantist. One can rightly speak of God only after one has seen him. He who has seen God knows really and truly that God has form, and that he is formless as well. He has many other aspects that cannot be described. Parable of the Elephant and the Blind Men Once some blind men chanced to come near an animal that someone told them was an elephant. They were asked what the elephant was like. Blind men began to feel its body. One of them said the elephant was like a pillar, he had touched only its leg. Another said it was like a winnowing fan, he had touched only its ear. In this way the others, having touched its tail or belly, gave their different versions of the elephant. Just so, a man who has seen only one aspect of God limits God to that alone. It is his conviction that God cannot be anything else. Illustration of the ocean and the ice to the Goswami How can you say that the only truth about God is that he has form? It is undoubtedly true that God comes down to earth in a human form as in the case of Krishna. And it is true as well that God reveals himself to his devotees in various forms. But it is also true that God is formless. He is the indivisible existence knowledge bliss absolute. He has been described in the Vedas both as formless and as endowed with form. He is also described there both as attributeless and as endowed with attributes. Do you know what I mean? Sachidananda is like an infinite ocean. Intense cold freezes the water into ice, which floats on the ocean in blocks of various forms. Likewise, through the cooling influence of bhakti, one sees forms of God in the ocean of the Absolute. These forms are meant for the bhaktas, the lovers of God. But when the sun of knowledge rises, the ice melts, it becomes the same water it was before. Water above and water below, everywhere nothing but water. Therefore, a prayer in the Bhagavata says, O Lord, Thou hast form, and Thou art also formless. Thou walkest before us, O Lord, in the shape of a man. Again, Thou hast been described in the Vedas as beyond words and thought. But you may say that for certain devotees, God assumes eternal forms. There are places in the ocean where the ice doesn't melt at all. It assumes the form of quartz. Kadar. It is said in the Bhagavata that Vyasa asked God's forgiveness for his three transgressions. He said, O Lord, thou art formless, but I have thought of thee in my meditation as endowed with form, thou art beyond speech, but I have sung thee hymns. Thou art the all pervading spirit, but I have made pilgrimages to sacred places. Be gracious, O Lord, and forgive these three transgressions of mine. Master, yes, God has form and he is formless too. Further, he is beyond both form and formlessness. No one can limit him. Rackle's father was sitting in the room. At that time Rackle was staying with the master. After his mother's death his father had married a second time. Now and then he came to Daxon's or because of Rackle's being there. He did not raise much objection to his sons living with the master. Being a wealthy man of the world, he was always involved in litigation. There were lawyers and deputy magistrates among Sri Ramakrishna's visitors. Rakul's father found it profitable to cultivate their acquaintance, since he expected to be benefited by their counsels in worldly matters. Now and then the master cast a glance at Rakul's father. It was his cherished desire that Rakul should live with him permanently at Daxon's war. Rakul's inborn spiritual nature. Master to Rakul's father and the devotees, ah, what a nice character Rakul has developed. Look at his face and every now and then you will notice his lips moving. Inwardly he repeats the name of God, and so his lips move. Parable of the Homa Bird Youngsters like him belong to the class of the ever-perfect. They are born with God-consciousness. No sooner do they grow a little older than they realize the danger of coming in contact with the world. There is the parable of the Homa Bird in the Vedas. The bird lives high up in the sky and never descends to earth. It lays its egg in the sky, and the egg begins to fall. But the bird lives in such a high region that the egg hatches while falling. 
The fledgling comes out and continues to fall. But it is still so high that while falling it grows wings and its eyes open. Then the young bird perceives that it is dashing down toward the earth and will be instantly killed. The moment it sees the ground, it turns and shoots up toward its mother in the sky. Then its one goal is to reach its mother. Youngsters like Rackle are like that bird. From their very childhood they are afraid of the world, and their one thought is how to reach the mother, how to realize God. You may ask, how is it possible for these boys, born of worldly parents and living among the worldly-minded, to develop such knowledge and devotion? It can be explained. If a pea falls into a heap of dung, it germinates into a pea plant nonetheless. The peas that grow on that plant serve many useful purposes. Because it was sown in dung, will it produce another kind of plant? Ah, what a sweet nature Rackle has nowadays. And why shouldn't it be so? If the M is a good one, its shoots also become good. All laugh. Like father, like son. Mahendra aside to Jurindra, how well he has explained God with and without form. Do the Vaish Navas believe only in God with form? Jurindra, perhaps so. They are one-sided. Mahendra, did you understand what he meant by the eternal form of God? That quartz? I couldn't grasp it well. Master to Mahendra, what were you talking about? Mahendra and Jurindra smiled and remained silent. Later in the afternoon the devotees were singing in the Panchavati, where the master joined them. They sang together in praise of the Divine Mother. High in the heaven of the mother's feet, my mind was soaring like a kite, when came a blast of sin's rough wind that drove it swiftly toward the earth. Maya disturbed its even flight by bearing down upon one side, and I could make it rise no more. Entangled in the twisting string of love for children and for wife, alas! My kite was rent in twain. It lost its crest of wisdom soon and downward plunged as I let it go. How could it hope to fly again, when all its top was torn away? Though fastened with devotion's cord, it came to grief in playing here. Its six opponents worsted it. Now Nershinder rues this game of smiles and tears, and thinks it better. Never to have played at all. The singing continued. Sri Ramakrishna danced with the devotees. They sang, The black bee of my mind is drawn in sheer delight to the blue lotus flower of Mother Siyama's feet, the blue flower of the feet of Kali, Shiva's consort, tasteless to the bee are the blossoms of desire. My mother's feet are black and black too is the bee, black is made one with black. This much of the mystery my mortal eyes behold, then hastily retreat. But Kamala Kanta's hopes are answered in the end. He swims in the sea of bliss, unmoved by joy or pain. The curtain went on. O oh mother, what a machine is this that thou hast made? What pranks thou playest with this toy? Three and a half cubits high. Hiding thyself within thou holdest the guiding string. But the machine, not knowing it, still believes it moves by itself. Whoever finds the mother remains a machine no more. Yet some machines have even bound the mother herself with the string of love. It was a very happy day for all. The master accompanied by Mahendra was coming back to his room when he met Trilakya, a Brahmo devotee on the way. Trilakya bowed before the master. Master, they are singing in the Panchavati. Won't you go there? Trilakya, what shall I do there? Master, why, you will enjoy the music. Trilakya, I have been there already. Master, well, well. That's good. It was about six o'clock in the evening. The master was sitting with the devotees on the southeast veranda of his room. Master, a holy man who has renounced the world will of course chant the name of God. That is only natural. He has no other duties to perform. If he meditates on God it shouldn't surprise anybody. On the other hand, if he fails to think of God or chant his holy name, then people will think ill of him. But it is a great deal to his credit if a householder utters the name of the Lord. Think of King Anaka. What courage he had indeed. He fenced with two swords, the one of knowledge and the other of work. He possessed the perfect knowledge of Brahman and also was devoted to the duties of the world. An unchaste woman attends to the minutest duties of the world, but her mind always dwells on her paramour. 
the constant company of holy men is necessary. The holy man introduces one to God. Kedar, yes sir. The great soul is born in the world for the redemption of humanity. He leads others to God, just as a locomotive engine takes along with it a long train of carriages. Or again, he is like a river or lake that quenches the thirst of many people. The devotees were ready to return home. One by one they saluted the master. At the sight of Bhavanasri Ramakrishna said, Don't go away today. The very sight of you inspires me. Bhavanath had not yet entered into worldly life. A youth of twenty he had a fair complexion and handsome features. He shed tears of joy on hearing the name of God. The master looked on him as the embodiment of Narayana. Thursday, March 29, 1883, the master had taken a little rest after his noon meal, when a few devotees arrived from Calcutta, among them Amrita, and the well-known singer of the Brahma Samad, Trelakya. Rakal was not feeling well. The master was greatly worried about him and said to the devotees, You see, Rakal is not well. Will soda water help him? What am I to do now? Rakal, please take the prasad from the Jagannath temple. Even as he spoke these words the master underwent a strange transformation. He looked at Rakal with the infinite tenderness of a mother and affectionately uttered the name of Govinda. Did he see in Rakal the manifestation of God himself? The disciple was a young boy of pure heart who had renounced all attraction to lust and greed. And Sri Ramakrishna was intoxicated day and night with love of God. At the sight of Rakal, his eyes expressed the tender feelings of a mother, a love like that which had filled the heart of Mother Yasoda at the sight of the baby Krishna. The devotees gazed at the master in wonder as he went into deep samadhi. As his soul soared into the realm of divine consciousness, his body became motionless, his eyes were fixed on the tip of his nose, and his breathing almost ceased. Renunciation false and true. An unknown Bengali, dressed in the ochre cloth of a monk, entered the room and sat on the floor. The master's mind was coming down to the ordinary plane of consciousness. Presently he began to talk, though the spell of samadhi still lingered. Master at the sight of the ochre cloth, why this jirwa? Did one put on such a thing for a mere fancy? A man once said, I have exchanged the shandy for a drum. At first he used to sing the holy songs of the shandy, now he beats the drum. All laugh. There are three or four varieties of renunciation. Afflicted with miseries at home, one may put on the ochre cloth of a monk, but that renunciation doesn't last long. Again, a man out of work puts on an ochre wearing cloth and goes off to Benier's. After three months he writes home, I have a job here. I shall come home in a few days. But worry about me. Again a man may have everything he wants. He lacks nothing, yet he does not enjoy his possessions. He weeps for God alone. That is real renunciation. No lie of any sort is good. A false garb even though a holy one is not good. If the outer garb does not correspond to the inner thought, it gradually brings ruin. Uttering false words or doing false deeds, one gradually loses all fear. Far better is the white cloth of a householder. Attachment to worldliness, occasional lapses from the ideal, and an outer garb of Jeriwa, how dreadful! It is not proper for a righteous person to tell a lie or do something false even in a dramatic performance. Once I went to Keshab's house to see the performance of a play called Navavrindavan. They brought something on the stage which they called the cross. Another actor sprinkled water, which they said was the water of peace. I saw a third actor staggering and reeling in the role of a drunkard. A Brahmo devotee, it was K. Master, it is not good for a devotee to play such parts. It is bad for the mind to dwell on such subjects for a long while. The mind is like white linen fresh from the laundry, it takes the color in which you dip it. If it is associated with falsehood for a long time, it will be stained with falsehood. Another day I went to Keshab's house to see the play called Nimesanyas. Some flattering disciples of Keshab spoiled the whole performance. One of them said to Keshab, You are the Chaitanya of the Kaliyuga. 
Kesha pointed to me and asked with a smile, Then who is he? I replied, Why, I am the servant of your servant. I'm a speck of the dust of your feet. Keshub had a desire for name and fame. To Amrita and Trelakia youngsters like Narendra and Rakhal are ever perfect. Every time they're born they are devoted to God. An ordinary man acquires a little devotion after austerities and a hard struggle. But these boys have love of God from the very moment of their birth. They are like the natural image of Shiva, which springs forth from the earth and is not set up by human hands. Nature of the Ever-Perfect The Ever-Perfect form a class by themselves. Not all birds have crooked beaks. The Ever-Perfect are never attached to the world. There is the instance of Pralada. Ordinary people practice spiritual discipline and cultivate devotion to God, but they also become attached to the world and are caught in the glamour of woman and gold. They are like flies, which sit on a flower or a sweetmeat and light on filth as well. But the ever-perfect are like bees, which light only on flowers and sip the honey. The ever-perfect drink only the nectar of divine bliss. They are never inclined to worldly pleasures. The devotion of the ever-perfect is not like the ordinary devotion that one acquires as a result of strenuous spiritual discipline. Ritualistic devotion consists in repeating the name of God and performing worship in a prescribed manner. It is like crossing a rice field in a roundabout way along the balk. Again, it is like reaching a nearby village by boat in a roundabout way along a winding river. One does not follow the injunctions of ceremonial worship when one develops raga bhakti, when one loves God as one's own. Then it is like crossing a rice field after the harvest. You don't have to walk along the balk. You can go straight across the field in any direction. When the country is flooded deep with water, one doesn't have to follow the winding river. Then the fields are deep under water. You can row your boat straight to the village. Without this intense attachment, this passionate love, one cannot realize God. Master's Experiences in Samadhi Amrita, sir, how do you feel in Samadhi? Master, you may have heard that the cockroach by intently meditating on the Brahmara, is transformed into a Brahmara. Do you know how I feel then? I feel like a fish released from a pot into the water of the Ganges. Amrita, don't you feel at that time even a trace of ego? Master, yes generally a little of it remains. However hard you may rub a grain of gold against a grindstone, still a bit of it always remains. Or again take the case of a big fire, the ego is like one of its sparks. In Samadhi I lose outer consciousness completely, but God generally keeps a little trace of ego in me for the enjoyment of divine communion. Enjoyment is possible only when I and you remain. Again sometimes God effaces even that trace of I. Then one experiences Jada Samadhi or Nirvikalpa Samadhi. That experience cannot be described. A salt doll went to measure the depth of the ocean, but before it had gone far into the water it melted away. It became entirely one with the water of the ocean. Then who was to come back and tell the ocean's depth? Chapter 9 Advice to the Brahmos Saturday, April 7, 1883, Sri Ramakrishna was visiting Balaram in Calcutta with Narendra, Bhavanath, Rakhal, Mahendra and others. Balaram at the Master's bidding had invited some of the young devotees to lunch. Sri Ramakrishna often said to him, Feed them now and then, that will confer on you the merit of feeding holy men. The master looked on his young disciples, yet untouched by woman and gold, as veritable embodiments of God. A few days earlier Sri Ramakrishna had been to Keshab's house with Narendra and Rakhal to see a performance of the play entitled Nava Vrindavan. Narendra had taken part in the performance, in which Keshab had played the role of Pavhari Baba. Master, Keshab came on the stage in the role of a holy man and sprinkled the water of peace. But I didn't like it. The idea of sprinkling such water on a theatrical stage after a performance. Another gentleman played the part of sin. That is not good either. One should not commit sin, one should not even feign it. Narendra's music. The master wanted to hear Narendra sing. 
The young disciple was not feeling well, but at the master's earnest request he sang to the accompaniment of the tampora, Sing, O bird that nestles deep within my heart. Sing, O bird that sits on the kalpa tree of Brahman. Sing God's everlasting praise. Then he sang, Brahman, joy of the whole universe, supreme effulgence, God beginningless, Lord of the world, the very life of life. And again, O King of kings, reveal thyself to me. I crave thy mercy. Cast on me thy glance. At thy dear feet I dedicate my life, seared in the fiery furnace of this world. My heart, alas, is deeply stained with sin, ensnared in Maya, I am all but dead. Compassionate Lord, revive my fainting soul, with the life-giving nectar of thy grace. Narendra continued, Upon the tray of the sky blaze bright the lamps of sun and moon, like diamonds shine the glittering stars. To deck thy wondrous form, the sweet Malaya breeze blows soft, for fragrant incense smoke. The moving air sways to and fro the fan before thy holy face, like gleaming votive lights. The fresh and flowery groves appear. How wonderful thy worship is, O slayer of birth and death! The sacred alm from space arisen is the resounding drum. My mind craves nectar day and night. At Hari's lotus feet, O shower the waters of thy grace. On thirsty Nanak, bless Lord, and may thy hallowed name become his everlasting home. He sang again, in wisdom's firmament the moon of love is rising full and love's flood tide, in surging waves, is flowing everywhere. O Lord, how full of bliss thou art! Victory unto thee! Then at the Master's bidding Bhavanath sang, Where is a friend like thee, O essence of mercy? Where is another friend like thee? Hand by me through pain and pleasure? Who among all my friends, forgives my failings, bringing me comfort for my grief, soothing my spirit in its terror. Thou art the helmsman who dost dear life's craft across the world's perilous sea. Thy grace it is alone, O Lord, that silences my raging passion's storm. Thou pourest out the waters of peace. Upon my burning, penitent soul, and thine is the bosom that will shelter me. When every other friend I own deserts me in my dying hour. True renunciation. Narendra said to the master with a smile, referring to Bhavanath, he has given up fish and betel leaf. Master, why so? What is the matter with fish and betel leaf? They aren't harmful. The renunciation of woman and gold is the true renunciation. Where is Rakhal? A devotee, he is asleep, sir. Master with a smile. Once a man went to a certain place to see a theatrical performance, carrying a mat under his arm. Hearing that it would be some time before the performance began, he spread the mat on the floor and fell asleep. When he woke up it was all over. All laugh. Then he returned home with the mat under his arm. Ramdale was very ill and lay in bed in another room. The master went there to inquire about him. About four o'clock in the afternoon some members of the Brahmo Samaj arrived. The master began to converse with them. Study of scriptures for the beginner. Abramo, sir, have you read the Panchadasi? Master, at first one should hear books like that and indulge in reasoning. But later on cherish my precious mother Siyama. Tenderly within, O oh mind, may you and I alone behold her, letting no one else intrude. One should hear the scriptures during the early stages of spiritual discipline. After attaining God there is no lack of knowledge. Then the Divine Mother supplies it without fail. A child spells out every word as he writes, but later on he writes fluently. The goldsmith is up and doing while melting gold. As long as the gold hasn't melted, he works the bellows with one hand, moves the fan with the other, and blows through a pipe with his mouth. But the moment the gold melts and is poured into the mold, he is relieved of all anxiety. Mere reading of the scriptures is not enough. A person cannot understand the true significance of the scriptures if he is attached to the world. Though with intense delight I learnt many poems and dramas, I have forgotten them all, entrapped in Krishna's love. Keshab enjoys the world and practices yoga as well. Living in the world he directs his mind to God. A devotee described the convocation of Calcutta University, saying that the meeting looked like a forest of human heads. Master, 
the feeling of the divine is awakened in me when I see a great crowd of people. Had I seen that meeting, I should have been overwhelmed with spiritual fervor. Sunday, April 8, 1883. It was Sunday morning. The master, looking like a boy, was seated in his room, and near him was another boy, his beloved disciple Rakhal. Mahendra entered and saluted the master. Ramlal also was in the room and Kishori, Manalal Malik and several other devotees gathered by and by. Manalal Malik, a businessman, had recently been to Benares where he owned a bungalow. Pralanga Swami and Bhaskarananda. Master, so you have been to Benares. Did you see any holy men there? Manalal, yes sir. I paid my respects to Trilanga Swami, Bhaskarananda and others. Master, tell us something about them. Manalal, Trilanga Swami is living in the same temple where he lived before on the Manakarnika Ghat, near the Benimadhav Minaret. People say he was formerly in a more exalted spiritual state. He could perform many miracles. Now he has lost much of that power. Master, that is the criticism of worldly people. Manalal, Trilanga Swami keeps a strict vow of silence. Unlike him, Bhaskarananda is friendly with all. Master, did you have any conversation with Bhaskarananda? Manalal, yes, sir. We had a long talk. Among other things, we discussed the problem of good and evil. He said to me, Don't follow the path of evil. Give up sinful thoughts. That is how God wants us to act. Perform only those duties that are virtuous. The seer of God transcends good and evil. Master, yes, that is also a path meant for worldly minded people. But those whose spiritual consciousness has been awakened, who have realized that God alone is real and all else illusory, cherish a different ideal. They are aware that God alone is the doer and others are his instruments. Those whose spiritual consciousness has been awakened never make a false step. They do not have to reason in order to shun evil. They are so full of love of God that whatever action they undertake is a good action. They are fully conscious that they are not the doers of their actions, but mere servants of God. They always feel, I am the machine and he is the operator. I do as he does through me. He as he speaks through me. I move as he moves me. Fully awakened souls are beyond virtue and vice. They realize that it is God who does everything. Seeing God in everything. There was a monastery in a certain place. The monks residing there went out daily to beg their food. One day a monk, while out for his alms, saw a landlord beating a man mercilessly. The compassionate monk stepped in and asked the landlord to stop. But the landlord was filled with anger and turned his wrath against the innocent monk. He beat the monk till he fell unconscious on the ground. Someone reported the matter to the monastery. The monks ran to the spot and found their brother lying there. Four or five of them carried him back and laid him on a bed. He was still unconscious. The other monks sat around him sad at heart. Some were fanning him. Finally someone suggested that he should be given a little milk to drink. When it was poured into his mouth he regained consciousness. He opened his eyes and looked around. One of the monks said, Let us see whether he is fully conscious and can recognize us. Shouting into his ear, he said, Revered sir, who is giving you milk? Brother, replied the holy man in a low voice, He who beat me is now giving me milk. But one does not attain such a state of mind without the realization of God. Manalal, sir, what you have just said applies to a man of a very lofty spiritual state. I talked on such topics in a general way with Bhaskarananda. Master, does he live in a house? Manalal, yes, sir. He lives with a devotee. Master, how old is he now? Manalal, about fifty-five. Master, did you talk about anything else? Manalal, I asked him how to cultivate bhakti. He said, chant the name of God. Repeat the name of Rama. Master, that is very good. The worship was over in the temples and the bells rang for the food offerings in the shrines. As it was a summer noon the sun was very hot. The flood tide began in the Ganges and a breeze came up from the south. Sri Ramakrishna was resting in his room after his meal. The people of Baser had Rakhal's birthplace had been suffering from a severe drought during the summer months. 
Master to Manal, Rackle says that the people in his native village have been suffering seriously from a scarcity of water. Why don't you build a reservoir there? That will do the people good. Smiling, you have so much money, what will you do with all your wealth? But they say that tellies are very calculating. All laugh. Manal was truly a calculating man, though he suffered no lack of money. In later years he set up an endowment of 25,000 rupees for the maintenance of poor students. Manalo made no answer to these words of the master about his caste characteristics. Later on in the course of the conversation he remarked casually, Sir, you referred to a reservoir. You might as well have confined yourself to that suggestion. Why allude to the oil man caste and all that? Some of the devotees smiled to themselves. The master laughed. Presently a few elderly members of the Brahmo Samaj arrived. The room was full of devotees. Sri Ramakrishna was sitting on his bed, facing the north. He kept smiling and talked to the Brahmo devotees in a joyous mood. Characteristics of Divine Love Master, you talk glibly about prema. But is it such a commonplace thing? There are two characteristics of prema. First it makes one forget the world. So intense is one's love of God that one becomes unconscious of outer things. Pitanya had this ecstatic love. He took a wood for the sacred grove of Rindavan and the ocean for the dark waters of the Damuna. Second, one has no feeling of my nest toward the body which is so dear to man. One wholly gets rid of the feeling that the body is the soul. Indications of God Realization There are certain signs of God Realization. The man in whom longing for God manifests its glories is not far from attaining him. What are the glories of that longing? They are discrimination, dispassion, compassion for living beings, serving holy men, loving their company, chanting the name and glories of God, telling the truth and the like. When you see those signs of longing in an aspirant, you can rightly say that for him the vision of God is not far to seek. The state of a servant's house will tell you unmistakably whether his master has decided to visit it. First, the rubbish and jungle around the house are cleared up. Second, the soot and dirt are removed from the rooms. Third, the courtyard floors and other places are swept clean. Finally, the master himself sends various things to the house such as a carpet, a hubble bubble for smoking and the like. When you see these things arriving, you conclude that the master will very soon come a devotee, sir, should one first practice discrimination to attain self-control. Master, that is also a path. It is called the path of achara, reasoning. But the inner organs three are brought under control naturally through the path of devotion as well. It is rather easily accomplished that way. Since pleasures appear more and more tasteless as love for God grows. Can carnal pleasure attract a grief-stricken man and woman the day their child has died? Efficacy of Japa and Prayer Devotee, how can I develop love for God? Master, repeat his name and sins will disappear. Thus you will destroy lust anger, the desire for creature comforts and so on. Devotee, how can I take delight in God's name? Master, pray to God with a yearning heart that you may take delight in his name. He will certainly fulfill your heart's desire. So saying, the master sang a song in his sweet voice, pleading with the Divine Mother to show her grace to suffering men. O oh Mother, I have no one else to blame, alas! I sink in the well these very hands have dug. With the six passions for my spade, I dug a pit in the sacred land of earth, and now the dark water of death gushes forth. How can I save myself, O oh my Redeemer? Truly I have been my own enemy. How can I now ward off this dark water of death? Behold, the waters rise to my chest. How can I save myself? O oh, mother, save me. Thou art my only refuge. With thy protecting glance take me across to the other shore of the world. The master sang again, What a delirious fever is this that I suffer from. O oh, mother, thy grace is my only cure. False pride is the fever that racks my wasted form, I and mine are my cry. Oh, what a wicked delusion! My quenchless thirst for wealth and friends is never ceasing, how then shall I sustain my life? Talk about things unreal, 
this is my wretched delirium, and I indulge in it always, O giver of all good fortune. My eyes in seeming sleep are closed, my stomach is filled with the vile worms of cruelty. Alas! I wander about absorbed in unmeaning deeds, even for thy holy name I have no taste, O mother. I doubt that I shall ever be cured of this malady. Then the master said, even for thy holy name I have no taste. A typhoid patient has very little chance of recovery if he loses all taste for food, but his life need not be despaired of if he enjoys food even a little. That is why one should cultivate a taste for God's name. Any name will do Durga, Krishna or Shiva. Then if through the chanting of the name, one's attachment to God grows day by day, and joy fills the soul, one has nothing to fear. The delirium will certainly disappear. The grace of God will certainly descend. Parable of the two friends as is a man's feeling of love, so is his gain. Once two friends were going along the street, when they saw some people listening to a reading of the Bhagavata. Come friend, said the one to the other. Let us hear this sacred book. So saying he went in and sat down. The second man peeped in and went away. He entered a house of ill fame. But very soon he felt disgusted with the place. Shame on me. He said to himself. My friend has been listening to the sacred word of Hari and see where I am. But the friend who had been listening to the Bhagavata also became disgusted. What a fool I am. He said. I have been listening to this fellow's blah blah and my friend is having a grand time. In course of time they both died. The messenger of death came for the soul of the one who had listened to the Bhagavata and dragged it off to hell. The messenger of God came for the soul of the one who had been to the house of prostitution and led it up to heaven. Verily, the Lord looks into a man's heart and does not judge him by what he does or where he lives. Krishna accepts a devotee's inner feeling of love. In the Kartapaja sect, the teacher, while giving initiation, says to the disciple, Now everything depends on your mind. According to this sect, he who has the right mind finds the right way and also achieves the right end. It was through the power of his mind that Hanuman leapt over the sea. I am the servant of Rama. I have repeated the holy name of Rama. Is there anything impossible for me? That was Hanuman's faith. Ignorance lasts as long as one has ego. There can be no liberation so long as the ego remains. O God, Thou art the doer and not I that is knowledge. By being lowly one can rise high. The Chaddock bird makes its nest on low ground, but it soars very high in the sky. Cultivation is not possible on high land. In low land water accumulates and makes cultivation possible. One must take the trouble to seek the company of holy persons. In his own home a man hears only worldly talk. The disease of worldliness has become chronic with him. The caged parrot sitting on its perch repeats Rama. Rama. But let it fly to the forest, and it will squawk in its usual way. Mere possession of money doesn't make a nobleman. One sign of the mansion of a nobleman is that all the rooms are lighted. The poor cannot afford much oil and consequently cannot have so many lights. This shrine of the body should not be left dark, one should illumine it with the lamp of wisdom. Lighting the lamp of knowledge in the chamber of your heart, behold the face of the mother, Brahman's embodiment. Everyone can attain knowledge. There are two entities, Jivatma the individual soul and Paramatma the supreme soul. Through prayer all individual souls can be united to the supreme soul. Every house has a connection for gas, and gas can be obtained from the main storage tank of the gas company. Apply to the company, and it will arrange for your supply of gas. Then your house will be lighted. In some people's spiritual consciousness has already been awakened, but they have special marks. They do not enjoy hearing or talking about anything but God. They are like the Chadak, which prays for rain water though the seven oceans, the Ganges, the Diamuna, and the rivers near it are all filled with water. It won't drink anything but rain water, even though its throat is burning with thirst. The master wanted to hear a few songs. Ramal and a Brahmin official of the temple garden sang, Dwell, O Lord, O lover of bhakti, in the Vrindavan of my heart, and my devotion unto thee will be thy Radha dearly loved. 
and again the dark cloud of the summer storm fades into nothingness when flute in hand and a smile on his lips lighting the world with his loveliness, Krishna, the dark one, appears. His dazzling yellow robe outgleams even the lightning's glare, a wreath of wild flowers interwoven gently swings from his youthful breast, and softly kisses his feet. See, there he stands, the Lord of Life, the moon of Nanda's line, outshining all the moons in heaven, and with the splendor of his rays flooding the Damuna's bank. He stands there, stealing the maiden's hearts, he lures them from hearth and home. Krishna enters my own heart's shrine, and with his flute note steals away. My wisdom, life, and soul. To whom shall Ganga Narana pour out his tale of woe? Ah, friend, you might have understood. Had you but gone to the Damuna's bank to fill your water jar. Again they sang. High in the heaven of the mother's feet, my mind was soaring like a kite, when came a blast of sin's rough wind that drove it swiftly toward the earth. Zeal for the Lord destroys sin. Master to the devotees. As the tiger devours other animals, so does the tiger of zeal for the Lord eat up lust, anger, and the other passions. Once this zeal grows in the heart, lust and the other passions disappear. The gopis of Vrindavan had that state of mind because of their zeal for Krishna. Again this zeal for God is compared to Kalirium. Radha said to her friends, I see Krishna everywhere. They replied, Friend, you have painted your eyes with the Kalirium of love, that is why you see Krishna everywhere. They say that when your eyes are painted with calyrium made from the ashes of a frog's head you see snakes everywhere. Traits of bound souls. They are indeed bound souls who constantly dwell with woman in gold and do not think of God even for a moment. How can you expect noble deeds of them? They are like mangoes pecked by a crow, which may not be offered to the deity in the temple, and which even men hesitate to eat. Bound souls worldly people are like silkworms. The worms can cut through their cocoons if they want, but having woven the cocoons themselves they are too much attached to them to leave them. And so they die there. Free souls are not under the control of woman and gold. There are some silk worms that cut through the cocoon they have made with such great care. But they are few and far between. It is Maya that deludes. Only a few become spiritually awakened and are not deluded by the spell of Maya. They do not come under the control of woman and gold. Two classes of perfect souls. There are two classes of perfect souls. Those who attain perfection through spiritual practice and those who attain it through the grace of God. Some farmers irrigate their fields with great labor. Only then can they grow crops. But there are some who do not have to irrigate at all. Their fields are flooded by rain. They don't have to go to the trouble of drawing water. One must practice spiritual discipline laboriously in order to avoid the clutches of Maya. Those who attain liberation through the grace of God do not have to labor. But they are few indeed. The ever-perfect. Then there is the class of the ever-perfect. They are born in each life with their spiritual consciousness already awakened. Think of a spring whose outlet is obstructed. While looking after various things in the garden, the plumber accidentally clears it and the water gushes out. Yet people are amazed to see the first manifestations of an ever-perfect soul's zeal for God. They say, where was all this devotion and renunciation and love? The conversation turned to the spiritual zeal of devotees, as illustrated in the earnestness of the gopis of Vrindavan. Ramal saying, Thou art my all in all, O Lord. The life of my life, the essence of essence. In the three worlds I have none else but thee to call my own. Thou art my peace, my joy, my hope. Thou my support, my wealth, my glory. Thou my wisdom and my strength. Thou art my home, my place of rest. My dearest friend, my next of kin. My present and my future thou. My heaven and my salvation. Thou art my scriptures, my commandments. Thou art my ever gracious Kuru. Thou the spring of my boundless bliss. Thou art the way and thou the goal, thou the adorable one, O Lord. Thou art the mother tender-hearted, thou the chastising father, thou the creator and protector, thou the helmsman who dost dear. My craft across the sea of life. Master to the devotees, ah! What a beautiful song! 
Thou art my all in all. Ramel sang again, this time describing the pangs of the gopis on being separated from their beloved Krishna. Hold not, hold not the chariot's wheels. Is it the wheels that make it move? The mover of its wheels is Krishna, by whose will the worlds are moved. The master went into deep samadhi. His body was motionless. He sat with folded hands as in his photograph. Tears of joy flowed from the corners of his eyes. After a long time his mind came down to the ordinary plane of consciousness. He mumbled something, of which only a word now and then could be heard by the devotees in the room. He was saying, Thou art I, and I am thou, thou eatest thou I eat. What is this confusion thou hast created? Continuing the master said, I see everything like a man with jaundiced eyes. I see thee alone everywhere. O Krishna, friend of the lowly! O eternal consort of my soul! O Govinda! As he uttered the words eternal consort of my soul and Govinda, the master again went into samadhi. There was complete silence in the room. The eager and unsatiated eyes of the devotees were fixed on the master, a god-man of infinite moods. Adhar Sen arrived with several of his friends. He was a deputy magistrate about thirty years old. This was his second visit to the master. He was accompanied by his friend Saradaksharan, who was extremely unhappy because of the death of his eldest son. A retired deputy inspector of schools, Saradaksharan devoted himself to meditation and prayer. Adhar had brought his friend to the master for consolation in his afflicted state of mind. Coming down from Samadhi, the master found the eyes of the devotees fixed on him. He muttered to himself, still in an abstracted mood. Worldly peoples lack perseverance. Then addressing the devotees, Sri Ramakrishna said, The spiritual wisdom of worldly people is seen only on rare occasions. It is like the flame of a candle. No, it is rather like a single ray of the sun passing through a chink in a wall. Worldly people chant the name of God, but there is no zeal behind it. It is like children swearing by God, having learnt the word from the quarrels of their aunts. Worldly people have no grit. If they succeed in an undertaking, it is all right, but if they don't succeed, it scarcely bothers them at all. When they need water, they begin to dig a well. But as soon as they strike a stone, they give up digging there and begin at another place. Perhaps they come to a bed of sand. Finding nothing but sand, they give that place up too. How can they succeed in getting water unless they continue to dig persistently where they started? Man reaps the harvest of his own past actions. Hence he read in the song, O oh mother, I have no one else to blame, alas! I sink in the well these very hands have dug. I am mine that is ignorance. By discriminating you will realize that what you call I is really nothing but Atman. Reason it out. Are you the body or the flesh or something else? At the end you will know that you are none of these. You are free from attributes. Then you will realize that you have never been the doer of any action, that you have been free from virtue and faults alike, that you are beyond righteousness and unrighteousness. From ignorance a man says, This is gold and this is brass. But a man of knowledge says it is all gold. Reasoning stops when one sees God. But there are instances of people who have realized God and who still continue to reason. Again, there are people who, even after having seen God, chant his name with devotion and sing his glories. How long does a child cry? So long as it is not sucking at its mother's breast. As soon as it is nursed, it stops crying. Then the child feels only joy. Joyously, it drinks the milk from its mother's breast. But it is also true that while drinking, the child sometimes plays and laughs. It is God alone who has become everything. But in man he manifests himself the most. God is directly present in the man who has the pure heart of a child and who laughs and cries and dances and sings in divine ecstasy. By this time Sri Ramakrishna had become better acquainted with Adhar, who related the cause of his friend's grief. The master sang as if to himself, To arms! To arms, O oh man! Death storms your house in battle array. Bearing the quiver of knowledge, mount the chariot of devotion. 
bend the bow of your tongue with the bow string of love, and aim at him the shaft of Mother Kale's holy name. Here is a ruse for the fray. You need no chariot or charioteer. Fight your foe from the Ganges bank, and he is easily slain. Master Consul's a buried father. Then he said, What can you do? Be ready for death. Death has entered the house. You must fight him with the weapon of God's holy name. God alone is the doer. I say, O Lord, I do as thou dost through me. He as thou speakest through me. I am the machine and thou art the operator. I am the house and thou art the indweller. I am the engine and thou art the engineer. Give your power of attorney to God. One doesn't come to grief through letting a good man assume one's responsibilities. Let his will be done. But isn't your grief for your son only natural? The son is one's own self reborn. Lakshmana ran to Ravana when the latter fell dead on the battlefield. Looking at Ravana's body, he found that every one of his bones was full of holes. Thereupon he said to Rama, O oh Rama, glory be to your arrows. There is no spot in Ravana's body that they have not pierced. Brother, replied Rama, the holes you see in his bones are not for my arrows. Grief or his sons has pierced them through and through. These holes are the marks of his grief. It has penetrated his very bones. But house, wife, and children are all transitory. They have only a momentary existence. The palm tree alone is real. One or two fruits have dropped off. Why lament? God is engaged in three kinds of activity, creation, preservation, and destruction. Death is inevitable. All will be destroyed at the time of dissolution. Nothing will remain. At that time the Divine Mother will gather up the seeds for the future creation, even as the elderly mistress of the house keeps in her hodgepodge pot little bags of cucumber seeds, sea foam, blue pills, and other miscellaneous things. The Divine Mother will take her seeds out again at the time of the new creation. Sri Ramakrishna began to talk with Adhar on the veranda north of his room. Master to Adhar, you are a deputy magistrate. Remember that you have obtained your position through the grace of God. Do not forget him, but remember that all men must one day walk down the same path. We stay in the world only a couple of days. This world is our field of activity. We are born here to perform certain duties. People have their homes in the country but come to Calcutta to work. It is necessary to do a certain amount of work. This is a kind of discipline. But one must finish it speedily. While melting gold, the goldsmith uses everything the bellows, the fan, and the pipe so that he may have the hot fire he needs to melt the metal. After the melting is over, he relaxes and asks his attendant to prepare a smoke for him. All this time his face has been hot and perspiring, but now he can smoke. One must have stern determination. Then alone is spiritual practice possible. One must make a firm resolve. There is great power in this seed of God's name. It destroys ignorance. A seed is tender and the sprout soft, still it pierces the hard ground. The ground breaks and makes way for the sprout. The mind becomes very much distracted if one lives long in the midst of woman and gold. Therefore one must be very careful. The monks do not have much to fear. The real sannyasi lives away from woman and gold. Therefore, through the practice of spiritual discipline, he can always fix his mind on God. True sannyasis, those who are able to devote their minds constantly to God, are like bees which light only on flowers and sip their honey. Those who live in the world, in the midst of woman and gold, may direct their attention to God, but sometimes their minds dwell also on woman and gold. They are like common flies which light on a piece of candy than on a sore of filth. Always keep your mind fixed on God. In the beginning you must struggle a little. Later on you will enjoy your pension. Sunday, April 15, 1883. Shurndra, a beloved lay disciple of the Master, had invited him to his house on the auspicious occasion of the Annapurna Puja. It was about six o'clock when Sri Ramakrishna arrived there with some of his devotees. The image of the Divine Mother had been installed in the worship hall. At her feet lay hibiscus flowers and vilwa leaves, from her neck hung a garland of flowers. 
Sri Ramakrishna entered the hall and bowed down before the image. Then he went to the open courtyard where he sat on a carpet, surrounded by his devotees and disciples. A few bolsters lay on the carpet, which was covered with a white linen sheet. He was asked to lean against one of these, but he pushed it aside. Difficulty of overcoming vanity. Master to the devotees, to lean against a bolster. You see, it is very difficult to give up vanity. You may discriminate, saying that the ego is nothing at all, but still it comes nobody knows from where. A goat's legs jerk for a few moments even after its head has been cut off. Or perhaps you are frightened in a dream. You shake off sleep and are wide awake, but still you feel your heart palpitating. Egotism is exactly like that. You may drive it away, but still it appears from somewhere. Then you look sullen and say, What? I have not been shown proper respect. Kedar, one should be lowlier than a straw and patient as a tree. Master, as for me, I consider myself as a speck of the dust of the devotee's feet. Vedianath arrived. He was a well educated man, a lawyer of the High Court of Calcutta. With folded hands, he saluted the master and took his seat at one side. Chandra to the master, he is one of my relatives. Master, yes, I see he has a nice nature. Chandra, he has come here because he wants to ask you a question or two. Different manifestations of divine power. Master to Vedianath, all that you see is the manifestation of God's power. No one can do anything without this power. But you must remember that there is not an equal manifestation of God's power in all things. Vidyasagar once asked me whether God endowed some with greater power than others. I said to him, If there are no greater and lesser manifestations of his power, then why have we taken the trouble to visit you? Have you grown two horns? So it stands to reason that God exists in all beings as the all-pervasive power, but the manifestations of his power are different in different beings. Free will and God's will. Vedianath, sir, I have a doubt. People speak of free will. They say that a man can do either good or evil according to his will. Is it true? Are we really free to do whatever we like? Master, everything depends on the will of God. The world is his play. He has created all these different things great and small, strong and weak, good and bad, virtuous and vicious. This is all his maya, his sport. You must have observed that all the trees in a garden are not of the same kind. As long as a man has not realized God, he thinks he is free. It is God himself who keeps this error in man. Otherwise sin would have multiplied. Man would not have been afraid of sin, and there would have been no punishment for it. But do you know the attitude of one who has realized God? He feels, I am the machine and thou, O Lord, art the operator. I am the house and thou art the indweller. I am the chariot and thou art the driver. I move as thou movest me, I speak as thou makest me speak. To Vedianath, it is not good to argue. Isn't that so? Vedianath, yes sir. The desire to argue disappears when a man attains wisdom. The master, out of his stock of a dozen English words said thank you. In the most charming way and all laughed. Master to Vedianath, you will make spiritual progress. People don't trust a man when he speaks about God. Even if a great soul affirms that he has seen God, still the average person will not accept his words. He says to himself, If this man has really seen God, then let him show him to me. But can a man learn to feel a person's pulse in one day? He must go about with a physician for many days, only then can he distinguish the different pulses. He must be in the company of those with whom the examination of the pulse has become a regular profession. Can anyone and everyone pick out a yarn of a particular count? If you are in that trade, you can distinguish in a moment a forty-count thread from a forty-one. The curtain was about to begin. Some Vaishnavas were seated on one side with their emridangas and cymbals. A drummer began to play on his instrument preparatory to the singing. The sweet and melodious sound of the Emridanga filled the courtyard, calling to mind the ecstatic curtain of Sri Garanga. The master passed into a deep spiritual state. Now and then he looked at the drummer and said, Ah! Ah! My hair is all standing on end. The singers asked what kind of song they should sing.
The master said humbly something about Garanga, if you please. The curtain began. They sang about the celestial beauty of Sri Garanga. The beauty of Garanga's face glows brighter than the brightest gold. His smile illumines all the world. Who cares for even a million moons? Shining in the blue autumn sky? The chief musician added improvised lines as they sang. Oh friend, his face shines like the full moon. But it does not wane or has it any stain. It illumines the devotee's heart. Again he improvised. His face is bathed with the essence of a million moons. At these words the master went into deep samadhi. After a short while he regained consciousness of the sense world. Then he suddenly stood up, overpowered by his spiritual mood and sang improvised lines with the professionals, thinking himself to be a milk, made of Rindavan gone mad with the beauty of Sri Krishna's form. Whose fault is it my mind's or his beauties? In the three worlds I see nothing but my beloved Krishna. The master danced and sang. All remained spellbound as they watched. The chief musician sang the words of a gopi, O oh flute, pray stop. Can you not go to sleep? One of the musicians added a new line. How can it sleep? It rests on Krishna's lips. The master sat down. The music went on. They sang, assuming the mood of Radha, my eyes are blinded. My ears are deaf. I have lost the power of smell. All my senses are paralyzed. But alas, why am I left alone? Finally, the musicians sang of the union of Radha and Krishna. Radha and Krishna are joined at last in the nid who grove of Vrindavan. Incomparable their beauty and limitless their love. The one half shines like yellow gold, the other like bluest sapphire. Round the neck, on one side, a wild flower garland hangs, and on the other, there swings a necklace of precious gems. A ring of gold adorns one ear, a ring of shell the other. Half of the brow is bright as the blazing midday sun, the other softly gleams with the glow of the rising moon. Upon one half of the head a graceful peacock feather stands, and from the other half, there hangs a braid of hair. As the music came to a close the master said, Bhagavata back to Bhagavan and bowed low to the devotees seated on all sides. He touched with his forehead the ground made holy by the singing of the sacred music. It was now about half past nine in the evening. Jurndra entertained the master and the devotees with a sumptuous feast. When it was time to take leave of their host, the master, the devotees and Shurndra entered the worship hall and stood before the image. Jurndra to the master, no one has sung anything about the Divine Mother today. Master pointing to the image, ah! Look at the beauty of the hall. The light of the Divine Mother seems to have lighted the whole place. Such a sight fills the heart with joy. Grief and desire for pleasure disappear. But can one not see God as formless reality? Of course one can but not if one has the slightest trace of worldliness. The rishis of olden times renounced everything and then contemplated Satchitananda, the indivisible Brahman. The Brahmajanis of modern times sing of God as immutable, homogeneous. It sounds very dry to me. It seems as if the singers themselves don't enjoy the sweetness of God's bliss. One doesn't want a refreshing drink made with sugar candy if one is satisfied with mere coarse treacle. To see how happy you are looking at this image of the deity. But those who always cry after the formless reality do not get anything. They realize nothing either inside or outside. The Master sang a song to the Divine Mother, O Mother, ever blissful as thou art, do not deprive thy worthless child of bliss. My mind knows nothing but thy lotus feet. The king of death scowls at me terribly. Tell me, mother, what shall I say to him? It was my heart's desire to sail my boat across the ocean of this mortal life, O Durga, with thy name upon my lips. I never dreamt that thou wouldst drown me here in the dark waters of this shoreless sea. Both day and night I swim among its waves, chanting thy saving name, yet even so. There is no end, O mother, to my grief. If I am drowned this time in such a plight, no one will ever chant thy name again. Again he sang, Repeat, O mind, my mother Durga's hallowed name. Whoever treads the path, repeating Durga. Durga. Shiva himself protects with his almighty trident. 
Thou art the day, O mother. Thou art the dusk and the night. Sometimes thou art man, and sometimes woman art thou. Thou mayest even say to me, Step aside. Go away. Yet, I shall cling to thee, O Durga. Unto thy feet as thine anklets I shall cling, making their tinkling sound. Mother, when as the kite thou soarest in the sky there, in the water beneath, as a minnow I shall be swimming, upon me thou wilt pounce and pierce me through with thy claws. Thus when the breath of life forsakes me in thy grip, do not deny me the shelter of thy lotus feet. The master saluted the divine image. As he came down the steps, he called softly to Rackle, Where are my shoes? Are they missing? As the master got into the carriage, Shurndra and the other devotees bowed down before him. Then the carriage started for Dakshin's war. The moon still lighted the streets. Chapter 10 The Master with the Brahmo Devotees Roman 2 April 22, 1883 Master's Visit to Brahmo Festival Sri Ramakrishna paid a visit to Benimadhev Powell's Garden House at Synthe, near Calcutta on the occasion of the semi-annual festival of the Brahmo Samaj. Many devotees of the Samaj were present and sat around the Master. Now and then some of them asked him questions. Love and prayer. A Brahmo devotee, sir, what is the way? Master, attachment to God, or in other words, love for him. And secondly, prayer. Brahmo devotee, which one is the way, love or prayer? Master, first love and then prayer. The master sang, cry to your mother Siyama with a real cry, O oh mind. And how can she hold herself from you? How can Siyama stay away? Continuing, the master said, and one must always chant the name and glories of God and pray to him. An old metal pot must be scrubbed every day. What is the use of cleaning it only once? Further, one must practice discrimination and renunciation. One must be conscious of the unreality of the world. Brahmo, is it good to renounce the world? Master, not for all. Those who have not yet come to the end of their enjoyments should not renounce the world. Can one get drunk on two annas worth of wine? How to lead a householder's life? Ramo, then should they lead a worldly life? Master, yes they should try to perform their duties in a detached way. Before you break the jackfruit open rub your hands with oil so that the sticky milk will not smear them. The maidservant in a rich man's house performs all her duties, but her mind dwells on her home in the country. This is an example of doing duty in a detached way. You should renounce the world only in mind. But a sannyasi should renounce the world both inwardly and outwardly. Brahmo, what is the meaning of the end of enjoyments? Master, I mean the enjoyment of woman in gold. It is risky to put a typhoid patient in a room where pitchers of water and jugs of pickled tamarind are kept. Most people don't feel any longing for God unless they have once passed through the experience of wealth name fame creature comforts and the like, that is to say, unless they have seen through these enjoyments. Brahmo, who is really bad man or woman? Master, as there are women endowed with vidya sakti so also there are women with avidya sakti. A woman endowed with spiritual attributes leads a man to God but a woman who is the embodiment of delusion makes him forget God and drowns him in the ocean of worldliness. This universe is created by the Mahamaya of God. Mahamaya contains both Vidya Maya, the illusion of knowledge, and Avidya Maya, the illusion of ignorance. Through the help of Vidya Maya one cultivates such virtues as the taste for holy company, knowledge, devotion, love, and renunciation. Avidya Maya consists of the five elements and the objects of the five senses form, flavor, smell, touch and sound. These make one forget God. Why there is evil in the world? Brahmo, if the power of Avidya is the cause of ignorance, then why has God created it? Master, that is his play. The glory of light cannot be appreciated without darkness. Happiness cannot be understood without misery. Knowledge of good is possible because of knowledge of evil. Further, the mango grows and ripens on account of the covering skin. You throw away the skin when the mango is fully ripe and ready to be eaten. It is possible for a man to attain gradually to the knowledge of Brahman because of the covering skin of Maya. 
Mayer in its aspects of vidya and avidya may be likened to the skin of the mango. Both are necessary. Brahmo, sir, is it good to worship God with form and image of the deity made of clay? Master, you do not accept God with form. That is all right. The image is not meant for you. For you it is good to deepen your feeling toward your own ideal. From the worshippers of the personal God you should learn their yearning for instance, Sri Krishna's attraction for Radha. You should learn from the worshippers of the personal God their love for their chosen ideal. When the believers in the personal God worship the images of Kali and Durga, with what feeling they cry from the depths of their souls, Mother! O oh Mother! How much they love the deity! You should accept that feeling. You don't have to accept the image. Brahmo, how does one cultivate the spirit of dispassion? Why don't all attain it? Master, dispassion is not possible unless there is satiety through enjoyment. You can easily cajole a small child with candies or toys. But after eating the candies and finishing its plate it cries, I want to go to my mother. Unless you take the child to its mother, it will throw away the toy and scream at the top of its voice. The members of the Brahma Samaj are opposed to the traditional guru system of orthodox Hinduism. Therefore the Brahma devotee asked the master about it. The need of a guru. Brahma, is spiritual knowledge impossible without a guru? Master, Satchitananda alone is the guru. If a man in the form of a guru awakens spiritual consciousness in you, then know for certain that it is God the Absolute who has assumed that human form for your sake. The Guru is like a companion who leads you by the hand. After the realization of God, one loses the distinction between the Guru and the disciple. That creates a very difficult situation. There the Guru and the disciple do not see each other. It was for this reason that Yanaka said to Sukhadva, Give me first my teacher's fee if you want me to initiate you into the knowledge of Brahman. For the distinction between the teacher and the disciple ceases to exist after the disciple attains to Brahman. The relationship between them remains as long as the disciple does not see God. It was dusk. Some of the Brahmo devotees said to the Master, Perhaps it is time for your evening devotions. Master, no, it isn't exactly that. One should pass through these disciplines in the beginning. Later one doesn't need the rituals of formal worship or to follow the injunctions. After dusk the preacher of the Brahmo Samaj conducted the service from the pulpit. The service was interspersed with recitations from the Upanishads and the singing of Brahmo songs. After the service the master and the preacher conversed. Personal God and formless deity. Master, well it seems to me that both the formless deity and God with form are real. What do you say? Preacher, sir, I compare the formless God to the electric current, which is not seen with the eyes but can be felt. Master, yes, both are true. God with form is as real as God without form. Do you know what describing God as being formless only is like? It is like a man's playing only a monotone on his flute, though it has seven holes. But on the same instrument another man plays different melodies. Likewise, in how many ways the believers in a personal God enjoy Him. They enjoy Him through many different attitudes. The serene attitude, the attitude of a servant, a friend, a mother, a husband, or a lover. You see, the thing is somehow or other to get into the lake of the nectar of immortality. Suppose one person gets into it by propitiating the deity with hymns and worship, and you are pushed into it. The result will be the same. Both of you will certainly become immortal. I give the Brahmos the illustration of water and ice. Satchitananda is like an endless expanse of water. The water of the great ocean in cold regions freezes into blocks of ice. Similarly, through the cooling influence of divine love, Satchitananda assumes forms for the sake of the Bhaktas. The Rishis had the vision of the supersensuous spirit form and talked with it. But devotees acquire a love body and with its help they see the spirit form of the Absolute. It is also said in the Vedas that Brahman is beyond mind and words. The heat of the sun of knowledge melts the ice like form off the personal God. On attaining the knowledge of Brahman and communing with it in Nirvikalpa Samadhi, one realizes Brahman the infinite without form or shape and beyond mind and words. God's true nature cannot be described. 
The nature of Brahman cannot be described. About it one remains silent. Who can explain the infinite in words? However high a bird may soar, there are regions higher still. What do you say? Preacher, yes sir, it is so stated in the Vedanta philosophy. Master, once a salt doll went to the ocean to measure its depth, but it could not come back to give a report. According to one school of thought, sages like Sukadva saw and touched the ocean of Brahman, but did not plunge into it. Once I said to Vidyasagar, everything else but Brahman has been polluted as it were, like food touched by the tongue. In other words, no one has been able to describe what Brahman is. A thing once uttered by the tongue becomes polluted. Vidyasagar, great pundit though he was, was highly pleased with my remarks. It is said that there are places near Kedar that are covered with eternal snow. He who climbs too high cannot come back. Those who have tried to find out what there is in the higher regions or what one feels there have not come back to tell us about it. After having the vision of God, man is overpowered with bliss. He becomes silent. Who will speak? Who will explain? The king lives beyond seven gates. At each gate sits a man endowed with great power and glory. At each gate the visitor asks, Is this the king? The gatekeeper answers, No. Not this, not this. The visitor passes through the seventh gate and becomes overpowered with joy. He is speechless. This time he doesn't have to ask, Is this the king? The mere sight of him removes all doubts. Preacher, Yes, sir, it is so described in Vedanta. Master, when the Godhead is thought of as creating, preserving, and destroying, it is known as the personal God Saguna Brahman or the primal energy Adiyasakti. Again, when it is thought of as beyond the three gunas, then it is called the attributeless reality, Nirguna Brahman beyond speech and thought. This is the supreme Brahman Parabrahman. The three gunas. Under the spell of God's Maya man forgets his true nature. He forgets that he is heir to the infinite glories of his father. This divine Maya is made up of three gunas. And all three are robbers, for they rob man of all his treasures and make him forget his true nature. The three gunas are Sava, Rajas and Tamas. Of these, Sava alone points the way to God. But even Sava cannot take a man to God. Parable of the Three Robbers Let me tell you a story. Once a rich man was passing through a forest, when three robbers surrounded him and robbed him of all his wealth. After snatching all his possessions from him, one of the robbers said, What's the good of keeping the man alive? Kill him. Saying this, he was about to strike their victim with his sword when the second robber interrupted and said, There's no use in killing him. Let us bind him fast and leave him here. Then he won't be able to tell the police. Accordingly, the robbers tied him with a rope, left him, and went away. After a while, the third robber returned to the rich man and said, Ah, you're badly hurt, aren't you? Come, I'm going to release you. The third robber set the man free and led him out of the forest. When Dathe came near the highway, the robber said, Follow this road and you will reach home easily. But you must come with me too, said the man. You have done so much for me. We shall all be happy to see you at our home. No, said the robber, it is not possible for me to go there. The police will arrest me. So saying, he left the rich man after pointing out his way. Now the first robber who said, What's the good of keeping the man alive? Kill him as Thomas. It destroys. The second robber is Rajas, which binds a man to the world and entangles him in a variety of activities. Rajas makes him forget God. Sava alone shows the way to God. It produces virtues like compassion, righteousness, and devotion. Again, Sava is like the last step of the stairs. Next to it is the roof. The supreme Brahman is man's own abode. One cannot attain the knowledge of Brahman unless one transcends the three gunas. Preacher, you have given us a fine talk, sir. Master with a smile, do you know the nature of devotees? When one devotee meets another, he says, Let me speak and you listen, and when you speak I shall listen. You are a preacher and teach so many people. You are a steamship and I am a mere fishing boat. I'll laugh. Wednesday, May 2, 
1883. About five o'clock in the afternoon Sri Ramakrishna arrived at the temple of the Brahmo Samaj in Nandan Bhagan, accompanied by Mahendra, Rakal, and a few other devotees. At first the master sat in the drawing room on the ground floor, where the Brahmo devotees gradually assembled. Rabindranath Tagore and a few other members of the Tagore family were present on this occasion. Sri Ramakrishna was asked to go to the worship hall on the second floor. A dais had been built on the eastern side of the room. There were a few chairs and a piano in the hall. The Brahma worship was to begin at dusk. Why temples are holy? As soon as the master entered the worship hall, he bowed low before the dais. Having taken his seat, he said to Mahendra and the other devotees, Narendra once asked me, What good is there in bowing before the Brahma Samaj temple? The sight of the temple recalls to my mind God alone, then God consciousness is kindled in my mind. God is present where people talk about him. One feels there the presence of all the holy places. Places of worship recall God alone to my mind. Once a devotee was overwhelmed with ecstasy at the sight of a babla tree. The idea flashed in his mind that the handle of the axe used in the garden of the temple of Radhakanta was made from the wood of the babla. Another devotee had such devotion for his guru that he would be overwhelmed with divine feeling at the sight of his guru's neighbors. Krishna consciousness would be kindled in Radha's mind at the sight of a cloud, a blue dress or a painting of Krishna. She would become restless and cry like a mad person, Krishna, where art thou? Gozal, but madness is not desirable. Master, what do you mean? Was Radha's madness the madness that comes from brooding over worldly objects and makes one unconscious? One attains that madness by meditating on God. Haven't you heard of love madness and knowledge madness? A Brahmo devotee, how can one realize God? Master, by directing your love to Him and constantly reasoning that God alone is real in the world illusory. The Aswatha tree alone is permanent, its fruit is transitory. How to spiritualize the passions. Brahmo, we have passions like anger and lust. What shall we do with these? Master, direct the six passions to God. The impulse of lust should be turned into the desire to have intercourse with Atman. Feel angry at those who stand in your way to God. Feel greedy for Him. If you must have the feeling of I in mind, then associate it with God. Say for instance, my Rama, my Krishna. If you must have pride, then feel like by Bhishana who said, I have touched the feet of Rama with my head, I will not bow this head before anyone else. Responsibility for sins. Ramo, if it is God that makes me do everything then I am not responsible for my sins. Master with a smile, yes Duryodhana also said that. O Krishna I do what thou seated in my heart makest me do. If a man has the firm conviction that God alone is the doer and he is his instrument, then he cannot do anything sinful. He who has learned to dance correctly never makes a false step. One cannot even believe in the existence of God until one's heart becomes pure. Sri Ramakrishna looked at the devotees assembled in the worship hall and said, It is very good to gather in this way now and then and think of God and sing his name in glories. But the worldly man's yearning for God is momentary. It lasts as long as a drop of water on a red-hot frying pan. Brahma Worship The worship was about to begin, and the big hall was filled with Brahma devotees. Some of the Brahma ladies sat on chairs with music books in their hands. The songs of the Brahma Samaj were sung to the accompaniment of harmonium and piano. Sri Ramakrishna's joy was unbounded. The invocation was followed by a prayer, and then the worship began. The Acharyas, seated on the platform, recited from the Vedas, Om. Thou art our Father. Give us right knowledge, do not destroy us. We bow to Thee. The Brahmo devotees chanted in chorus with the Acharyas, Om. Brahman is truth, knowledge, infinity. It shines as bliss and immortality. Brahman is peace, blessness, and the one without a second. It is pure and unstained by sin. The Acharyas chanted in praise of God, Om. Um. O reality, cause of the universe, we bow to thee. Then the Acharyas chanted their prayer together, 
From the unreal lead us to the real, from darkness lead us to light, from death lead us to immortality. Reach us through and through, O Rudra, and protect us evermore with thy compassionate face. As Sri Ramakrishna heard these hymns, he went into a spiritual mood. After this an Acharya read a paper. The worship was over. Most of the devotees went downstairs or to the courtyard for fresh air while the refreshments were being made ready. It was about nine o'clock in the evening. The hosts were so engrossed with the other invited guests that they forgot to pay any attention to Sri Ramakrishna. Master Tarakal and the other devotees, what's the matter? Nobody is paying any attention to us. Rakal angrily, Sir, let us leave here and go to Dakshin's war. Master with a smile, keep quiet. The carriage hire is three rupees and two annas. Who will pay that? Stubbornness won't get us anywhere. You haven't a penny and you are making these empty threats. Besides, where shall we find food at this late hour of the night? After a long time dinner was announced. The devotees were asked to take their seats. The master, with Rackle and the others, followed the crowd to the second floor. No room could be found for him inside the hall. Finally, with great difficulty, a place was found for him in a dusty corner. A Brahmin woman served some curry, but Sri Ramakrishna could not eat it. He ate luch, I with salt, and took some sweets. There was no limit to the master's kindness. The hosts were mere youngsters. How could he be displeased with them, even though they did not show him proper respect? Further, it would have been inauspicious for the household if a holy man had left the place without taking food. Finally the feast had been prepared in the name of God. Sri Ramakrishna got into a carriage, but who was to pay the hire? The hosts could not be found. Referring to this incident afterwards, the master said to the devotees jokingly, The boys went to our host for the carriage hire. First they were put out but at last they managed to get together three rupees. Our hosts refused to pay the extra two annas and said, No, that will do. Sunday, May 13, 1883, the master paid a visit to the Hari Bhakti Pradayini Sabha of Kancharapira in Calcutta on the anniversary day of that religious society. Curtain and other forms of devotional music had been arranged for the occasion. The songs centered round the Vrindavan episode of Sri Krishna's life. The theme was Radha's peak because of Sri Krishna's having visited Chandravali, another of the gopis of Vrindavan. Radha's friends tried to console her and said to her, Why are you peaked? It seems you are not thinking of Krishna's happiness, but only of your own. Radha said to them, I am not angry at his going to Chandravali's grove. But why should he go there? He doesn't know how to take care of him. May 21,883 The following Sunday a curtain was arranged at the house of Ram, one of the master's householder devotees. Sri Ramakrishna graced the occasion with his presence. The musicians sang about Radha's pangs at her separation from Krishna. Radha said to her friends, I have loved to see Krishna from my childhood. My fingernails are worn off from counting the days on them till I shall see him. Once he gave me a garland. Look, it has withered, but I have not yet thrown it away. Alas! Where has the moon of Krishna risen now? Has that moon gone away from my firmament, afraid of the Rahu of my peak? Alas! Shall I ever see Krishna again? O oh, my beloved Krishna, I have never been able to look at you to my heart's complete satisfaction. I have only one pair of eyes, they blink and so hinder my vision. And further, on account of streams of tears, I could not see enough of my beloved. The peacock feather on the crown of his head shines like arrested lightning. The peacocks, seeing Krishna's dark cloud complexion, would dance in joy, spreading their tails. O oh friends, I shall not be able to keep my life breath. After my death, place my body on a branch of the dark tamala tree and inscribe on my body Krishna's sweet name. The master said, God and his name are identical. That is the reason Radha said that. There is no difference between Rama and his holy name. May 27, 1883, Sri Ramakrishna was in his room at Dakshinswar, conversing with the devotees. It was about nine o'clock in the morning. Religious quarrels condemned. Master to Mahendra, 
and the other devotees, it is not good to harbor malice. The Saktas, the Vaishnavas, and the Vedantists quarrel among themselves. That is not wise. Padmalakshan was court pundit of the Maharaja of Burdwan. Once at a meeting the pundits were discussing whether Shiva was superior to Brahma or Brahma to Shiva. Padmalakshan gave an appropriate reply. I don't know anything about it, said he. I haven't talked either to Shiva or to Brahma. Single-minded devotion. If people feel sincere longing, they will find that all paths lead to God. But one should have nishtha, single-minded devotion. It is also described as chase and unswerving devotion to God. It is like a tree with only one trunk shooting straight up. Promiscuous devotion is like a tree with five branches. Such was the single-minded devotion of the gopis to Krishna that they didn't care to look at anyone but the Krishna they had seen at Vrindavan the shepherd Krishna, bedecked with a garland of yellow wild flowers and wearing a peacock feather on his crest. At the sight of Krishna at Mathura with a turban on his head and dressed in royal robes, the gopis pulled down their veils. They would not look at his face. Who is this man? They said. Should we violate our chaste love for Krishna by talking to him? The devotion of the wife to her husband is also an instance of unswerving love. She feeds her brothers-in-law as well and looks after their comforts, but she has a special relationship with her husband. Likewise, one may have that single-minded devotion to one's own religion, but one should not on that account hate other faiths. On the contrary, one should have a friendly attitude toward them. The master bathed in the Ganges and then went to the Kali temple with Mahendra. He sat before the image and offered flowers at the feet of the Divine Mother. Now and then he put flowers on his own head and meditated. After a long time he stood up. He was in a spiritual mood and danced before the image, chanting the name of Kali. Now and again he said, O Mother! O Destroyer of Suffering! O Remover of Grief and Agony! Was he teaching people thus to pray to the Mother of the Universe with a yearning heart, in order to get rid of the suffering inevitable in physical life? Sri Ramakrishna returned to his room and sat on the west porch. Rakul Mahendra Nakar Vaishnav and other devotees were with him. Nakar had been known to the Master for about twenty-five years. He was a devotee of Garanga and had a small shop which Sri Ramakrishna had often visited when he first came to Calcutta from Kamapukar. Still overpowered with divine ecstasy, the master sang, O Kali, my mother full of bliss, Enchantress of the Almighty Shiva, In thy delirious joy thou dancest, clapping thy hands together. Eternal One, thou great first cause, clothed in the form of the void. Thou wearest the moon upon thy brow, where didst thou find thy garland of heads before the universe was made? Thou art the mover of all that move, and we are but thy helpless toys. We move alone as thou movest us and speak as through us thou speakest. But worthless Kamala Kanta says, fondly berating thee, Confound dress! With thy flashing sword thoughtlessly thou hast put to death my virtue and my sin alike. He sang again, Mother, thou art our sole redeemer, Thou the support of the three guinas, higher than the Most High. Thou art compassionate, I know, who takest away our bitter grief. Sandhya art thou in Gayatri, thou dost sustain this universe. Mother the help art thou. Of those that have no help but thee, O eternal beloved of Shiva. Thou art in earth, in water thou, thou least at the root of all. In me in every creature, thou hast thy home, though clothed with form, yet art thou formless reality. The master sang a few more songs in praise of the Divine Mother. Then he said to the devotees, It is not always best to tell householders about the sorrows of life. They want bliss. Those who suffer from chronic poverty can go without food for a day or two. But it is not wise to talk about the sorrows and miseries of life to those who suffer if their food is delayed a few minutes. Vaishnav Charan used to say, why should one constantly dwell on sin? Be merry. While the master was resting after his midday meal, Manohar Goswami, a singer of curtain, arrived. He sang about the ecstatic love of Garanga and the divine episode of Vrindavan. The master was absorbed in a deep spiritual mood. 
He tore off his shirt and said, to the melody of the curtain assuming the attitude of Radha, O Krishna, my beloved! O friends, bring Krishna to me. Then you will be real friends. Or take me to him, and I will be your slave forever. The musician sat spellbound at Sri Ramakrishna's ecstasy. Then he said with folded hands, Won't you please rid me of my worldliness? Master, you are like the holy man who went about the city after first finding a lodging. You are a sweet person and express many sweet ideas. Musician, sir, I am like the bullock that only carries the bag of sugar but cannot taste it. Alas, I myself do not enjoy the sweetness of divine bliss. The melodious music went on, and all were filled with joy. Saturday, June 2, 1883 Sri Ramakrishna had been invited to visit the homes of his devotees Balaram, Adhar and Ram in Calcutta. Devotional music had been arranged by Adhar and Ram. The master was accompanied in the carriage by Rakal Mahendra and others. As they drove along Sri Ramakrishna said to the devotees, You see, sin flies away when love of God grows in a man's heart, even as the water of the reservoir dug in a meadow dries up under the heat of the sun. But one cannot love God if one feels attracted to worldly things, to woman and gold. Merely taking the vow of monastic life will not help a man if he is attached to the world. It is like swallowing your own spittle after spitting it out on the ground. After a few minutes the master continued, The members of the Brahmo Samaj do not accept God with form. Narendra says that God with form is a mere idol. He says further, What? He still goes to the Kali temple. Sri Ramakrishna and his party arrived at Balaram's house. Yajanath of Nand and Bhagan came to invite the master to his house at four o'clock in the afternoon. Sri Ramakrishna agreed to go if he felt well. After Yajanath's departure the master went into an ecstatic mood. He said to the Divine Mother, Mother, what is all this? Stop! What are these things thou art showing to me? What is it that thou dost reveal to me through Rakhal and others? The form is disappearing. But Mother, what people call man is only a pillow case, nothing but a pillow case. Consciousness is thine alone. The modern Brahmajanis have not tasted thy sweet bliss. Their eyes look dry and so do their faces. They won't achieve anything without ecstatic love of God. Mother, once I asked thee to give me a companion just like myself. Is that why thou hast given me Rakhal? The master went to Adhar's house where arrangements were being made for the curtain. Many devotees and neighbors had gathered in Adhar's drawing room, anxious to listen to the master's words. Spiritual inspiration comes from God. Master to the devotees, both worldliness and liberation depend on God's will. It is God alone who has kept man in the world in a state of ignorance, and man will be free when God, of his own sweet will, calls him to himself. It is like the mother calling the child at mealtime when he is out playing. When the time comes for setting a man free, God makes him seek the company of holy men. Further, it is God who makes him restless for spiritual life. Anijibur, what kind of restlessness, sir? Master, like the restlessness of a clerk who has lost his job. He makes the round of the offices daily and asks whether there is any vacancy. When that restlessness comes, man longs for God. A fop seated comfortably with one leg over the other, chewing betel leaf and twirling his mustache as a carefree dandy, cannot attain God. Neighbor, can one get this longing for God through frequenting the company of holy men? Master, yes it is possible, but not for a confirmed scoundrel. A sannyasi's kamandalu, made of bitter gourd, travels with him to the four great places of pilgrimage, but still does not lose its bitterness. The curtain began. The musician sang of Sri Krishna's life in Vrindavan, Radha, friend, I am about to die. Give me back my Krishna. Friend, but Radha, the cloud of Krishna was ready to burst into rain. It was yourself who blew it away with the strong wind of your peak. You are certainly not happy to see Krishna happy, or why were you piqued? Radha, but this pride was not mine. My pride has gone away with him who made me proud. After the music Sri Ramakrishna conversed with the devotees. Master, 
the gopis worshipped Kadyayani in order to be united with Sri Krishna. Everyone is under the authority of the Divine Mother Mahamaya, the primal energy. Even the incarnations of God accept the help of Maya to fulfill their mission on earth. Therefore they worship the primal energy. Don't you see how bitterly Rama wept for Seda? Raman weeps ensnared in the meshes of Maya. Vishnu incarnated himself as a so in order to kill the demon her in Yaksha. After killing the demon, the so remained quite happy with her young ones. Forgetting her real nature, she was suckling them very contentedly. The gods in heaven could not persuade Vishnu to relinquish his so's body and return to the celestial regions. He was absorbed in the happiness of his beast form. After consulting among themselves, the gods sent Shiva to the so. Shiva asked the so, why have you forgotten yourself? Vishnu replied through the so's body, why, I am quite happy here. Thereupon with a stroke of his trident Shiva destroyed the so's body, and Vishnu went back to heaven. Ramchandra Dutta From Adhara's house Sri Ramakrishna went to Ram's house. Ramchandra Dutta, one of the chief householder disciples of the Master, lived in Calcutta. He had been one of the first to announce the Master as an incarnation of God. The Master had visited his house a number of times and unstintingly praised the devotion and generosity of this beloved disciple. A few of the Master's disciples made Ram's house virtually their own dwelling place. Ram had arranged a special festival to celebrate the Master's visit. The small courtyard was nicely decorated. A Kathak seated on a raised platform was reciting from the Bhagavata when the Master arrived. Ram greeted him respectfully and seated him near the reader. The disciple was extremely happy. The Kathak was in the midst of the story of King Harishandra. Story of Harishchandra The great King Harishandra of the Purana was the embodiment of generosity. No one ever went away from him empty-handed. Now the sage Viswamitra, wanting to test the extent of the king's charity, extracted from him a promise to grant any boon that he might ask. Then the sage asked for the gift of the sea-girt world, of which Harishandra was king. Without the slightest hesitation the king gave away his kingdom. Then Viswamitra demanded the auxiliary fee which alone makes charity valid and meritorious. The Kathak continued his recitation. Viswamitra said to the king, O king, you have given away the entire world which was your kingdom. It now belongs to me. You cannot claim any place here. But you may live in Benares which belongs to Shiva. I shall lead you there with your wife Sabia and Ro, Hitasa your son. There you can procure the auxiliary fee that you owe me. The royal family, accompanied by the sage, reached Benares and visited the temple of Shiva. At the very mention of Shiva, the master went into spiritual mood and repeated the holy name several times indistinctly. Kathak continued, the king could not procure the fee and was compelled to sell Sabia, his royal consort, to a Brahmin. With her went Prince Rohitasva. But since even that was not enough to redeem his pledge to the sage, Harishandra sold himself to an untouchable who kept a cremation ground. He was ordered to supervise the cremations. One day, while plucking flowers for his Brahmin master, Prince Rohitasva was bitten by a venomous snake and that very night died. The cruel Brahmin would not leave his bed to help the poor mother cremate the body. The night was dark and stormy. Lightning rent the black clouds. Sabia started for the cremation ground alone, carrying the body of her son in her arms. Smitten with fear and overpowered with grief, Tekken filled heaven and earth with her wailing. Arriving at the cremation ground, she did not recognize her husband, who demanded the usual fee for the cremation. Sabia was penniless and wept bitterly at her unending misfortunes. The impenetrable darkness was illumined only by the terrible flames of the cremation pyres. Above her the thunder roared, and before her the uncouth guardian of the cremation ground demanded his fee. She who had once been queen of the world sat there with her only child dead and cold on her lap. The devotees burst into tears and loudly lamented this tragic episode of a royal life. And what was the master doing? He was listening to the recital with rapt attention. Teardrops appeared in his eyes, and he wiped them away. 
the Catholic continued, when the queen, wailing bitterly, uttered the name of her husband, Harish Chandra at once recognized his wife and son. Then the two wept for the dead prince. Yet in all these misfortunes the king never once uttered a word of regret for his charity. Finally the sage Viswamitra appeared and told them that he had only wanted to put the king's charitable impulses to a crucial test. Then, through his spiritual power, the sage brought the prince back to life and returned to the king his lost kingdom. Story of Adava Sri Ramakrishna asked the Kathak to recite the episode of Adava, the friend and devotee of Krishna. At the request of Krishna, Adava had gone to Vrindavan to console the cowherds and the gopis who were sore at heart because of their separation from their beloved Krishna. The Kathak said, when Adava arrived at Vrindavan, the gopis and cowherd boys ran to him eagerly and asked him, How is our Krishna? Has he forgotten us altogether? Doesn't he even speak our names? So saying, some of them wept. Others accompanied him to various places in Vrindavan still filled with Krishna's sweet memory. They said, Here it was that Krishna lifted up Mount Govardhan, and here he killed the demons sent by the evil-minded Kamsa. In this meadow he tended his cows, here on the bank of the Damuna he sported with the gopis. Here he played with the cowherd boys, and here in these groves he met the gopis secretly. Adava said to them, Why are you so grief-stricken at Krishna's absence? He resides in all beings as their indwelling spirit. He is God himself, and nothing can exist without God. But, said the gopis, we do not understand all that. We can neither read nor write. We know only our Krishna of Vrindavan who played with us here in so many ways. Adava said, Krishna is God himself. By meditating on him, man escapes from birth and death in the world and attains liberation. The gopis said, We do not understand big words like liberation. We want to see the Krishna of our hearts. The master listened to the story from the Bhagavata with great attention and said at last, Yes, the gopis were right. Then he sang, Though I am never loath to grant salvation, I hesitate indeed to grant pure love. Whoever wins pure love surpasses all. He is adored by men. He triumphs over the three worlds. Listen, Chandravali. I shall tell you of love. Mukti a man may gain, but rare is bhakti. Solely for pure love's sake did I become. King Vali's door keep her down in his realm in the nether world. Alone in Vrindavan can pure love be found its secret none but the gopas and gopis know. For pure love's sake I dwelt in Nanda's house. Taking him as my father, I carried his burdens on my head. The master said to the Kathak, The gopis had ecstatic love, unswerving and single-minded devotion to one ideal. Do you know the meaning of devotion that is not loyal to one ideal? It is devotion tinged with intellectual knowledge. It makes one feel, Krishna has become all these. He alone is the supreme Brahman. He is Rama, Shiva and Sakti. But this element of knowledge is not present in ecstatic love of God. Once Hanuman came to Dwaraka and wanted to see Sita and Rama. Krishna said to Rukmini, his queen, you had better assume the form of Sita. Otherwise there will be no escape from the hands of Hanuman. Once the Pandava brothers performed the Rajasuya sacrifice. All the kings placed Yudhisthira on the royal throne and bowed low before him in homage. But by Bishana, the king of Salan said, I bow down to Narayana and to none else. At these words the Lord Krishna bowed down to Yudhisthira. Only then did by Bishana prostrate himself crown and all before him. Do you know what devotion to one ideal is like? It is like the attitude of a daughter-in-law in the family. She serves all the members of the family, her brothers-in-law, father-in-law, husband, and so forth, bringing them water to wash their feet, fetching their towels, arranging their seats, and the like. But with her husband, she has a special relationship. Characteristics of Divine Love There are two elements in this ecstatic love, I Ness and My Ness. Yasoda used to think, who would look after Gopala if I did not? He will fall ill if I do not serve him. She did not look on Krishna as God. The other element is my ness. It means to look on God as one's own my Gopala. Adava said to Yasoda, Mother your Krishna is God himself. 
He is the Lord of the universe and not a common human being. Oh! exclaimed Yasoda. I am not asking you about your Lord of the universe. I want to know how my Gopala fares. Not the Lord of the universe but my Gopala. How faithful to Krishna the gopis were. After many entreaties to the doorkeeper the gopis entered the royal court in Mathura where Krishna was seated as king. The doorkeeper took them to him, but at the sight of King Krishna wearing the royal turban the gopis bent down their heads and said among themselves, Who is this man with a turban on his head? Should we violate our chaste love for Krishna by talking to him? Where is our beloved Krishna with the yellow robe and the bewitching crest with the peacock feather? Did you observe the single-minded love of the gopis for Krishna? The ideal of Vrindavan is unique. I am told that the people of Dwaraka worship Krishna, the companion of Arjuna, but reject Radha, a devotee, which is the better ecstatic love or love mixed with knowledge. Parable of the Three Friends Master, it is not possible to develop ecstatic love of God unless you love him very deeply and regard him as your very own. Listen to a story. Once three friends were going through a forest, when a tiger suddenly appeared before them. Brothers, one of them exclaimed, We are lost. Why should you say that? Said the second friend. Why should we be lost? Come, let us pray to God. The third friend said, No. Why should we trouble God about it? Come, let us climb this tree. The friend who said, We are lost, did not know that there is a God who is our protector. The friend who asked the others to pray to God was a Johnny. He was aware that God is the creator, preserver, and destroyer of the world. The third friend who didn't want to trouble God with prayers and suggested climbing the tree had ecstatic love of God. It is the very nature of such love that it makes a man think himself stronger than his beloved. He is always alert lest his beloved should suffer. The one desire of his life is to keep his beloved from even being pricked in the foot by a thorn. Ram served the master and the devotees with delicious sweets. Chapter 11 With the Devotees at Dakshanswarai Monday, June 4, 1883 about nine o'clock in the morning the devotees began to arrive at the temple garden. Sri Ramakrishna was sitting on the porch of his room facing the Ganges. Mahendra who had spent the previous night with the master sat near him. Balaram and several other devotees were present. Rakul lay on the floor, resting his head on the master's lap. For the past few days the master had been regarding Rakul as the baby Krishna. Seeing Trailakya passing on his way to the Kali temple, Sri Ramakrishna asked Rakul to get up. Trelakya bowed to the master. Master to Trelakya, was there no yatra performance last night? Trelakya, no sir. We couldn't conveniently arrange it. Master, what is done is done. But please, see that this doesn't happen again. The traditions of the temple should be properly observed. Trelakya gave a suitable reply and went on his way. After a while Ram Chatterjee, the priest of the Vishnu temple came up to Sri Ramakrishna. Master, well Ram, I told Trelakya that the Yatra performance should not be omitted again. Was I right in saying that? Ram, what of it sir? Of course you were right. The traditions should be observed. The master asked Balaram to stay for his midday meal. Before the meal Sri Ramakrishna described to the devotees the days of his god intoxication. Rakul Mahendra Ramal and a few others were present. Master's attitude toward young disciples. Master, now and then Hazra comes forward to teach me. He says to me, why do you think so much about the youngsters? One day as I was going to Balaram's house in a carriage, I felt greatly troubled about it. I said to the Divine Mother, Mother, Hazra admonishes me for worrying about Narendra and the other young boys. He asks me why I forget God and think about these youngsters. No sooner did this thought arise in my mind than the Divine Mother revealed to me in a flash that it is she herself who has become man. But she manifests herself most clearly through a pure soul. At this vision I went into Samadhi. Afterwards, I felt angry with Hazra. I said to myself that rascal made me miserable. Then I thought, but why should I blame the poor man? How is he to know? His yearning for Narendra. 
I know these youngsters to be Narayana himself. At my first meeting with Narendra, I found him completely indifferent to his body. When I touched his chest with my hand, he lost consciousness of the outer world. Regaining consciousness, Narendra said, Oh, what have you done to me? I have my father and mother at home. The same thing happened at Jadu Malik's house. As the days passed, I longed more and more to see him. My heart yearned for him. One day at that time, I said to Balanath, Can you tell me why I should feel this way? There is a boy called Narendra, the Kayas, the caste. Why should I feel so restless for him? Balanath said, You will find the explanation in the Mahabharata. On coming down to the plane of ordinary consciousness, a man established in Samadhi enjoys himself in the company of Savic people. He feels peace of mind at the sight of such men. When I heard this my mind was set at ease. Now and then, I would sit alone and weep for the sight of Narendra. Reminiscences of his God-intoxicated state. Oh, what a state of mind I passed through. When I first had that experience, I could not perceive the coming and going of day or night. People said I was insane. What else could they say? They made me marry. I was then in a state of God intoxication. At first I felt worried about my wife. Then I thought she too would eat and drink and live like me. I visited my father-in-law's house. They arranged a curtain. It was a great religious festival, and there was much singing of God's holy name. Now and then I would wonder about my future. I would say to the Divine Mother, Mother, I shall take my spiritual experiences to be real if the landlords of the country show me respect. They too came of their own accord and talked with me. Oh, what an ecstatic state it was! Even the slightest suggestion would awaken my spiritual consciousness. I worshipped the beautiful in a girl fourteen years old. I saw that she was the personification of the Divine Mother. At the end of the worship I bowed before her and offered a rupee at her feet. One day, I witnessed a Ram Leela performance. I saw the performers to be the actual seat of Rama, Lakshmana, Hanuman, and Bibishana. Then I worshipped the actors and actresses who played those parts. At that time I used to invite maidens here and worship them. I found them to be embodiments of the Divine Mother herself. One day, I saw a woman in blue standing near the bakal tree. She was a prostitute. But she instantly kindled in me the vision of Sita. I forgot the woman. I saw that it was Sita herself on her way to meet Rama after her rescue from Ravana in Ceylon. For a long time I remained in Samadhi, unconscious of the outer world. Another day I had gone to the maiden in Calcutta for fresh air. A great crowd had assembled there to watch a balloon ascension. Suddenly, I saw an English boy leaning against a tree. As he stood there his body was bent in three places. The vision of Krishna came before me in a flash. I went into Samadhi. Once at Sihor I fed the cowherd boys. I put sweetmeats into their hands. I saw that these boys were actually the cowherd boys of Rindavan, and I partook of the sweetmeats from their hands. At that time I was almost unconscious of the sea outer world. Mathur Babu kept me at his Jan Bazar mansion a few days. While living there I regarded myself as the handmaid of the Divine Mother. The ladies of the house didn't feel at all bashful with me. They felt as free before me as women feel before a small boy or girl. I used to escort Mather's daughter to her husband's chamber with the maidservant. Even now the slightest thing awakens God consciousness in me. Rakul used to repeat the name of God half aloud. At such times I couldn't control myself. It would rouse my spiritual consciousness and overwhelm me. Sri Ramakrishna went on describing the different experiences he had had while worshipping the Divine Mother as her handmaid. He said, Once I imitated a professional woman singer for a man singer. He said my acting was quite correct and asked me where I had learned it. The master repeated his imitation for the devotees, and they burst into laughter. After his noon meal the master took a short rest. Manalal Malik, an old member of the Brahma Samaj, entered the room and sat down after saluting the master, who was still lying on his bed. Manalal asked him questions now and then, and the master, still half asleep, answered with a word or two. Manalal said that Shivanath admired Nityagopal's spiritual state. 
The master asked in a sleepy tone what they thought of Hazara. Then Sri Ramakrishna sat up on his bed and told Manal about Bhavanath's devotion to God. Master, ah, what an exalted state he is in. He has hardly begun to sing about God before his eyes fill with tears. The very sight of Harish made him ecstatic. He said that Harish was very lucky. He made the remark because Harish was spending a few days here now and then away from his home. Sri Ramakrishna asked Mahendra, Well, what is the cause of bhakti? Why should the spiritual feeling of young boys like Bhavanath be awakened? Mahendra remained silent. Master, the fact is all men may look alike from the outside but some of them have fillings of condensed milk. Cakes may have fillings of condensed milk or powdered black grams, but they all look alike from the outside. The desire to know God, ecstatic love of Him, and such other spiritual qualities are the condensed milk. Reassurance to the devotees and parable of the tigress, Sri Ramakrishna spoke reassuringly to the devotees. Master to Mahendra, some think, Oh, I am a bound soul. I shall never acquire knowledge and devotion. But if one receives the Guru's grace, one has nothing to fear. Once a tigress attacked a flock of goats. As she sprang on her prey, she gave birth to a cub and died. Cub grew up in the company of the goats. The goats ate grass and the cub followed their example. They bleated, the cub bleated too. Gradually it grew to be a big tiger. One day another tiger attacked the same flock. It was amazed to see the grass-eating tiger. Running after it, the wild tiger at last seized it, whereupon the grass-eating tiger began to bleat. The wild tiger dragged it to the water and said, Look at your face in the water. It is just like mine. Here is a little meat. Eat it. Saying this it thrust some meat into its mouth. But the grass-eating tiger would not swallow it and began to bleed again. Gradually, however, it got the taste for blood and came to relish the meat. Then the wild tiger said, Now you see there is no difference between you and me. Come along and follow me into the forest. So there can be no fear if the Kuru's grace descends on one. He will let you know who you are and what your real nature is. If the devotee practices spiritual discipline a little, the Kuru explains everything to him. Then the disciple understands for himself what is real and what is unreal. God alone is real, and the world is illusory. Parable of the False Ascetic one night a fisherman went into a garden and cast his net into the lake in order to steal some fish. The owner heard him and surrounded him with his servants. They brought lighted torches and began to search for him. In the meantime the fisherman smeared his body with ashes and sat under a tree, pretending to be a holy man. The owner and his men searched a great deal but could not find the thief. All they saw was a holy man covered with ashes, meditating under a tree. The next day the news spread in the neighborhood that a great sage was staying in the garden. People gathered there and saluted him with offerings of fruit, flowers and sweets. Many also offered silver and copper coins. How strange! thought the fisherman. I am not a genuine holy man, and still people show such devotion to me. I shall certainly realize God if I become a true sadhu. There is no doubt about it. If a mere pretense of religious life can bring such spiritual awakening, you can imagine the effect of real sadhana. In that state you will surely realize what is real and what is unreal. God alone is real and the world is illusory. The world is a dream. One of the devotees said to himself, Is the world unreal then? The fisherman to be sure renounced worldly life. What then will happen to those who live in the world? Must they too renounce it? Sri Ramakrishna, who could see into a man's innermost thought, said very tenderly, Suppose an office clerk has been sent to jail. He undoubtedly leads a prisoner's life there. But when he is released from jail, does he cut capers in the street? Not at all. He gets a job as a 